The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, The Bastille. Book 1, The Death of Louis XV. Chapter 1, Louis the Well-Beloved. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 1. Louis the Well-Beloved. President Hainaut, remarking on royal surnames of honour, how difficult it often is to ascertain not only why, but even when they were conferred, takes occasion, in his sleek official way, to make a philosophical reflection. The surname of bien Name, well-beloved, says he, which Louis XV bears, will not leave posterity in the same doubt. This prince, in the year 1744, while hastening from one end of his kingdom to the other, and suspending his conquests in Flanders that he might fly to the assistance of Alsace, was arrested at Metz by a malady which threatened to cut short his days. At the news of this, Paris, all in terror, seemed a city taken by storm. The churches resounded with supplications and groans. The prayers of priests and people were every moment interrupted by their sobs and it was from an interest so dear and tender that this surname of bien fashioned itself, a title higher still than all the rest which this great prince has earned. So stands it written in lasting memorial of that year, 1744. Thirty other years have come and gone, and this great prince again lies sick, but in how altered circumstances now! Churches resound not with excessive groanings. Paris is stoically calm. Sobs interrupt no prayers, for indeed none are offered, except priests' litanies read or chanted at fixed money rate per hour, which are not liable to interruption. The shepherd of the people has been carried home from little Trianon, heavy of heart, and been put to bed in his own chateau of Versailles. The flock knows it and heeds it not. At most in the immeasurable tide of French speech, which ceases not day after day and only ebbs towards the short hours of night, may this of the royal sickness emerge from time to time as an article of news. Bets are doubtless depending, nay, some people express themselves loudly in the streets. But for the rest, on green field and steepled city, the May sun shines out, the May evening fades, and men ply their useful or useless business as if no Louis lay in danger. Dame du Barry indeed might pray if she had a talent for it. Duke d'Aguillon too, Marpeo and the Parlement Marpeo, these as they sit in their high places with France harnessed under their feet, know well on what basis they continue there. Look to it, Daiguillon, sharply as thou didst from the mill of Saint-Cast, on Quiberon and the invading English. Thou covered, if not with glory, yet with meal. Fortune was ever accounted inconstant, and each dog has but his day. Forlorn enough languished Duc d'Aguillon, some years ago, covered, as we said, with meal, nay, with worse. For La Chalotte, the Breton parlementeer, accused him not only of poltroonery and tyranny, but even of concussion, official plunder of money, which accusations it was easier to get quashed by backstairs influence than to get answered. Neither could the thoughts or even the tongues of men be tied. Thus, under disastrous eclipse, had this grand nephew of the great Richelieu to glide about, unworshipped by the world. Resolute Choiseul, the abrupt, proud man, disdaining him, or even forgetting him. Little prospect but to glide into Gascony, to rebuild Chateau there, and die in glorious killing game. However, in the year 1770, a certain young soldier, Dumouriez by name, returning from Corsica, could see, with sorrow, at Compiègne, the old king of France, on foot, with doffed hat, in sight of his army, at the side of a magnificent phaeton, doing homage to the Dubarry. Much lay therein. Thereby, for one thing, could Daguignon postpone the rebuilding of his chateau, and rebuild his fortunes first. For stout Chauzet would discern in the Dubarry nothing but a wonderfully dizzened scarlet woman, 
and go on his way as if she were not. Intolerable. The source of sighs, tears, of pettings and pouting, which would not end till France, La France, as she named her royal valet, finally mustered heart to see Choiseul, and with that quivering in the chin, tremblement du menton, natural in such case, faltered out a dismissal, dismissal of his last substantial man, but pacification of his scarlet woman. Thus Daiguillon rose again and culminated. And with him there rose Mapio, the banisher of Parlement, who plants you a refractory president, a croix in Combray, on the top of steep rocks, inaccessible except by litters, there to consider himself. Likewise there rose Abbe Terray, dissolute financier, paying eightpence in the shilling, so that wits exclaim in some press at the playhouse, Where is Abbe Terray, that he might reduce us to two-thirds? And so have these individuals, verily, by black art, built them a Dom Daniel, or enchanted Du Barrydom, call it an Armida place, where they dwell pleasantly. Chancellor Mappeo playing blind man's buff with the scarlet enchantress, or gallantly presenting her with dwarf negroes, and a most Christian king has unspeakable peace within doors, whatever he may have without. My Chancellor is a scoundrel, but I cannot do without him. Beautiful Amida Palace, where the inmates live enchanted lives, lapped in soft music of adulation, waited on by the splendours of the world, which nevertheless hangs wondrously as by a single hair. Should the most Christian king die, or even get seriously afraid of dying, for alas, had not the fair haughty Chateau to fly, with wet cheeks and flaming heart, from that fever scene at Metz, driven forth by sour shavelings? She hardly returned when fever and shavelings were both swept into the background. Pompadour, too, when Damien wounded royalty slightly under the fifth rib, and her drive to Trianon went off futile in shrieks and madly shaken torches, had to pack and be in readiness yet did not go, the wound not proving poisoned. For his majesty has religious faith, believes at least in a devil. And now a third peril, and who knows what may be in it, for the doctors look grave, ask privily if his majesty had not the smallpox long ago, and doubt it may have been a false kind. Yes, Marpeo, pucker those sinister brows of thine, and peer out on it with thy malign rat eyes. It is a questionable case. Sure, only that man is mortal, that with the life of one mortal snaps irrevocably the wonderfulest talisman, and all you buried him rushes off with tumult into infinite space, and ye, as subterranean apparitions are wont, vanish utterly, leaving only a smell of sulphur. These, and what holds of these may pray, to Beelzebub, or whoever will hear them, but from the rest of France there comes, as was said, no prayer, or one of an opposite character, expressed openly in the street. Chateau or hotel, where an enlightened philosophism scrutinise many things, is not given to prayer. Neither are Rosbach victories, Terray finances, nor say only 60,000 lettres de cachet, which is Marpeau's share, persuasives towards that. Oh, hey no, prayers? from a French smitten by black art with plague after plague, and lying now in shame and pain, with a harlot's foot on its neck, what prayers can come? Those lank scarecrows that prowl hunger-stricken through all highways and byways of French existence, will they pray? The dull millions that, in the workshop or furrow-field, grind fordone at the wheel of labour like halted gin-horses, if blind so much the quieter? or they that in the Bicetra hospital ate to a bed lie waiting their manumission? Dim are those heads of theirs, dull stagnant those hearts. To them the great sovereign is known mainly as the great regrater of bread. If they hear of his sickness, they will answer with a dull tant pis pour lui, or with the question, will he die? Yes, will he die? That is now for all France the grand question and hope, whereby alone the king's sickness has still some interest. End of Book One, Chapter One.
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 1, The Death of Louis XV. Chapter 2, Realised Ideals. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 2, Realised Ideals. Such a changed France, have we, and a changed Louis. Changed, truly, and further than thou yet seest. To the eye of history many things in that sick room of Louis are now visible, which to the courtiers there present were invisible. For indeed, it is well said, in every object there is inexhaustible meaning, the eye sees in it what the eye brings means of seeing. To Newton and to Newton's dog diamond, what a different pair of universes, while the painting on the optical retina of both was most likely the same. Let the reader here in this sick room of Louis... Endeavour to look with the mind, too. Time was when men could, so to speak, of a given man, by nourishing and decorating him with fit appliances to the due pitch, make themselves a king almost as the bees do, and what was still more to the purpose, loyally obey him when made. The man so nourished and decorated, thenceforth named royal, does verily bear rule, and is said and even thought to be, for example, prosecuting conquests in Flanders, when he lets himself like luggage be carried thither, and no light luggage covering miles of road. For he has his unblushing chateau with her band boxes and rouge pots at his side, so that at every new station a wooden gallery must be run up between their lodgings. He has not only his maison bouche and vitae without end, but his very troop of players with their pasteboard coulisses, thunder barrels, their kettles, fiddles, stage wardrobes, portable larders, and chaffering and quarrelling enough, all mounted in wagons, tumbrils, second-hand chaises, sufficient not to conquer Flanders, but the patience of the world. With such a flood of loud jingling appurtenances does he lumber along, prosecuting his conquests in Flanders, wonderful to behold. So nevertheless it was and had been. To some solitary thinkers it might seem strange, but even to him inevitable, not unnatural. For ours is a most fictile world, and man is the most fingent plastic of creatures. A world not fixable, not fathomable, an unfathomable somewhat which is not we, which we can work with and live amidst and model miraculously in our miraculous being and name world. But if the very rocks and rivers, as metaphysic teachers are, in strict language, made by those outward senses of ours, how much more by the inward sense are all phenomena of the spiritual kind, dignities, authorities, holies, unholies, which inward sense, moreover, is not permanent like the outward ones, but forever growing and changing? Does not the black African take of sticks and old clothes, say, exported Monmouth Street cast clothes, what will suffice, and of these, cunningly combining them, fabricate for himself an eidolon, idol or thing seen, and name it mumbo-jumbo, which he can thenceforth pray to with upturned or struck eye, not without hope? The white European mocks, but ought rather to consider and see whether he at home could not do the like a little more wisely. So it was, we say, in those conquests of Flanders thirty years ago, but so it no longer is. Alas, much more lies sick than poor Louis, not the French king only, but the French king's ship. This too, after long rough tear and wear, is breaking down. The world is also changed. So much that seemed vigorous has sunk decrepit. So much that was not is beginning to be. Born over the Atlantic to the closing ear of Louis, king by the grace of God, what sounds are these? Muffled, ominous, new in our centuries. Boston Harbour is black with unexpected tea. Behold, a Pennsylvanian Congress gather, and ere long on Bunker Hill, democracy announcing in rifle volleys, death-winged under her star banner, to the tune of Yankel Doodle Doo, that she is born and whirlwind-like, will envelop the whole world. Sovereigns die, and sovereignties. How all dies, and is for a time only, is a time phantasm yet reckons itself real. 
the Merovingian kings slowly wending on their bullet carts through the streets of Paris with their long hair flowing, have all wended slowly on into eternity. Charlemagne sleeps at Salzburg with truncheon grounded, only fable expecting that he will awaken. Charles the Hammer, Pepin, Bow-Legged, where now is their eye of menace, their voice of command? Rollo and his shaggy Northmen cover not the Seine with ships, but have sailed off on a longer voyage. The hair of Towhead, Ted de Toop, now needs no combing. Iron cutter, Taillefer, cannot cut a cobweb. Shrill Fredegonda, Shrill Brunhilde have had out their hot life scold and lie silent, their hot life frenzy cooled. Neither from that black towered nail descends now darkling the doomed gallant in his sack to the sane waters plunging into night. For Dame de Nail now cares not for this world's gallantry, heeds not this world's scandal. Dame de Nail is herself gone into night. They are all gone, sunk down, down, with the tumult they made, and the rolling and the trampling of ever new generations passes over them, and they hear it not any more forever. And yet, withal, has there not been realised somewhat? Consider, to go no further, these stone edifices and what they hold. Mud town of the borderers, Lutetia Parisiorum or Parisiorum, has paved itself, has spread over the Seine islands, and far and wide on each bank, and become city of Paris, sometimes boasting to be Athens of Europe, and even capital of the universe. Stone towers frown aloft, long-lasting, grim with a thousand years. Cathedrals are there, and a creed, or memory of a creed, in them. Palaces and estate and law. Thou seest the smoke vapour, unextinguished breath as of a thing living. Labour's thousand hammers ring on her anvils. Also a more miraculous labour works noiselessly, not with the hand, but with the thought. How have cunning workmen in all crafts, with their cunning head and right hand, tamed the four elements to be their ministers, yoking the winds to their sea chariot, making the very stars their nautical timepiece, and written and collected a bibliothèque du roi, amongst whose books is the Hebrew book? A wondrous race of creatures, these have been realised, and what of skill is in these? Call not the past time, with all its confused wretchedness, a lost one. Observe, however, that of man's whole terrestrial possessions and attainments, unspeakably the noblest are his symbols, divine or divine-seeming, under which he marches and fights with victorious assurance in this life-battle what we can call his realised ideals. Of which realised ideals, omitting the rest, consider only these two, his church or spiritual guidance, his kingship or temporal one. The church, what a word was there, richer than Golconda and the treasures of the world. In the heart of the remotest mountains rises the little kirk, the dead all slumbering round it under their white memorial stones, in hope of a happy resurrection. Dull wert thou, O reader, if never in any hour, say of moaning midnight, when such kirk hangs spectral in the sky, and being was as if swallowed up of darkness, it spoke to thee things unspeakable, that went into thy soul's soul. Strong was thee that had a church, what we can call a church. He stood thereby, though in the centre of immensities, in the conflux of eternities, yet manlike towards God and man, the vague, shoreless universe had become for him a firm city and dwelling which he knew. Such virtue was in belief. In these words, well spoken, I believe. Well might men prize their credo, and raise stateliest temples to it, and reverend hierarchies, and give it the tithe of their substance it was worth living for, and dying for. Neither was that an inconsiderable moment when wild-armed men first raised their strongest aloft on the buckler throne, and with clanging armour and hearts said solemnly, Be thou our acknowledged strongest. In such acknowledged strongest, well-named king, cognic, kenning, or man that was able, what a symbol shone now for them, 
significant with the destinies of the world, a symbol of true guidance in return for loving obedience, properly, if he knew it, the prime want of man, a symbol which might be called sacred, for is there not, in reverence for what is better than we, an indestructible sacredness? On which ground, too, it was well said, there lay in the acknowledged strongest a divine right, as surely there might in the strongest, whether acknowledged or not, considering who it was that made him strong. And so, in the midst of confusions and unutterable incongruities, as all growth is confused, did this of royalty, with loyalty environing it, spring up and grow mysteriously, subduing and assimilating, for a principle of life was in it, till it also had grown world great and was among the main fact of our modern existence. Such a fact that Louis XIV, for example, could answer the expostulatory magistrate with his L'État c'est moi, the state, I am the state, and be replied to by silence and abashed looks. So far had accident and forethought, had your Louis Eleventh and the leaden virgin in their hatband and torture wheels and canonical oubliettes, man-eating under their feet, your Henry Force and their prophesied social millennium, when every peasant should have his fowl in the pot, and on the whole the fertility of this most fertile existence, named of good and evil, brought it in the manner of the kingship. Wondrous, concerning which may we not again say that in the huge mass of evil as it rolls and swells there is ever some good working imprisoned working towards deliverance and triumph how such ideals do realize themselves and grow wondrously from amid the incongruous ever fluctuating chaos of the actual this is what world history if it teach anything has to teach us how they grow and after long stormy growth Bloom out, mature, supreme, then quickly, for the blossom is brief, fall into decay, sorrowfully dwindle and crumble down, or rush down noisily or noiselessly disappearing. The blossom is so brief as of some centennial cactus flower, which after a century of waiting shines out for hours. Thus from the day when rough Clovis in the Champ de Mars, in sight of his whole army, had to cleave retributively the head of that rough Frank with sudden battle-axe and the fierce words, It was thus thou clavest the vase, St. Remy's and mine, as Soissons, forward to Louis the Grand and his l'état c'est moi, we count some twelve hundred years. And now this very next Louis is dying, and so much dying with him. Nay, Thus, too, if Catholicism, with and against feudalism, but not against nature and her bounty, gave us English a Shakespeare and era of Shakespeare, and so produced a blossom of Catholicism, it was not till Catholicism itself, so far as law could abolish it, had been abolished here. But of those decadent ages in which no ideal either grows or blossoms, when belief and loyalty have passed away and only the cant and false echo of them remains, and all solemnity has become pageantry, and the creed of persons in authority has become one of two things, an imbecility or a Machiavellism. Alas, of these ages world history can take no notice. They have to become compressed more and more, and finally suppressed in the annals of mankind, blotted out to spurious, which indeed they are. Hapless ages, wherein, if ever in any, it is an unhappiness to be born. To be born and to learn only by every tradition and example that God's universe is Balliol's and a lie, and the supreme quack, the hierarch of men. In which mournfulest faith, nevertheless, do we not see whole generations, two and sometimes even three successively, live what they call living and vanish without chance of reappearance. In such a decadent age, or one fast verging that way, had our poor Louis been born. Grant also that if the French kingship had not, by course of nature, long to live, he of all men was the man to accelerate nature. The blossom of French royalty, cactus-like, has accordingly made an astonishing progress. In those Metz days it was still standing with all its petals, though bedimmed by Orléans regents and Rouet ministers and cardinals, but now, in 1774, we behold it bold 
and the virtue nigh gone out of it. Disastrous indeed does it look with those same realised ideals, one and all. The church, which in its palmy season, 700 years ago, could make an emperor wait barefoot in penance shift three days in the snow, has for centuries seen itself decaying, reduced even to forget old purposes and enmities and join interest with the kingship. On this younger strength it would fain stay its decrepitude, and these two will henceforth stand and fall together. Alas, the Sorbonne still sits there in its old mansion, but mumbles only jargon of dotage, and no longer leads the consciences of men. Not the Sorbonne, it is encyclopaedie, philosophy, and who knows what nameless innumerable multitudes of ready writers, profane singers, romancers, players, disputators and pamphleteers that now form the spiritual guidance of the world. The world's practical guidance, too, is lost or has glided into the same miscellaneous hands. Who is it that the king, able man, named also Wa, Rex, or director, now guides? His own huntsmen and prickers. When there is to be no hunt, it is well said, Le Ra ne fera rien. Today his majesty will do nothing. He lives and lingers there because he is living there, and none has yet laid hands on him. The nobles, in like manner, have nearly ceased either to guide or misguide, and are now, as their master is, little more than ornamental figures. It is long since they have done with butchering one another or their king. The workers, protected, encouraged by majesty, have ages ago built walled towns, and there ply their crafts. Will permit no robber baron to live by the saddle, but maintain a gallows to prevent it. Ever since that period of the Fronde, the noble has changed his fighting sword into a court rapier and now loyally attends his king as ministering satellite, divides the spoil not now by violence and murder but by soliciting and finesse. These men call themselves supports of the throne, singular gilt pasteboard caryatides in that singular edifice. For the rest, their privileges every way are now much curtailed. That law authorising a seigneur as he returned from hunting to kill not more than two serfs and refresh his feet in their warm blood and bowels has fallen into perfect desuetude and even into incredibility. For if Deputy La Poule can believe in it and call for the abrogation of it, so cannot we. No charola for these last fifty years, though never so fond of shooting, has been in use to bring down slaters and plumbers and see them roll from their roofs, but contents himself with partridges and grouse. Close viewed, their industry and function is that of dressing gracefully and eating sumptuously. As for their debauchery and depravity, is perhaps unexampled since the era of Tiberius and Commodus. Nevertheless, one has still partly a feeling with the Lady Maréchale. Depend upon it, sir, God thinks twice before damning a man of that quality. These people of old surely had virtues, uses, or they could not have been there. Nay, one virtue they are still required to have, for mortal man cannot live without a conscience, the virtue of perfect readiness to fight duels. Such are the shepherds of the people. And now how fares it with the flock? With the flock, as is inevitable, it fares ill and ever worse. They are not tended, they are only regularly shorn. They are sent for to do statute labour, to pay statute taxes, to fatten battlefields named bed of honour with their bodies, in quarrels which are not theirs. Their hand and toil is in every possession of man, but for themselves they have little or no possession. Untaught, uncomforted, unfed, to pine dully in thick obscuration, in squalid destitution and obstruction. This is the lot of the millions. Purple teable et corveable, a merci et miséricorde. In Brittany they once rose in revolt at the first introduction of pendulum clocks, thinking it had something to do with the gabelle. Paris requires to be cleared out periodically by the police and the horde of hunger-stricken vagabonds to be sent wandering again over space for a time. During one such periodical clearance, says Lacretelle, 
in May 1750, the police had presumed with all to carry off some reputable people's children in the hope of exhorting ransoms for them. The mothers filled the public places with cries of despair. Crowds gather, get excited. So many women in distraction run about exaggerating the alarm. An absurd and horrible fable arises among the people. It is said that the doctors have ordered a great person to take baths in young human blood for the restoration of his own, all spoiled by debaucheries. Some of the rioters, adds Lacretel quite coolly, were hanged on the following days. The police went on. O ye poor naked wretches, and this then is your inarticulate cry to heaven as of a dumb, tortured animal crying from uttermost depths of pain and debasement? Do these azure skies, like a dead crystalline vault, only reverberate the echo of it on you? Respond to it only by hanging on the following days? Not so, not for ever. Ye are heard in heaven, and the answer too will come in a horror of great darkness and shakings of the world and a cup of trembling which all the nations shall drink. Remark, meanwhile, how from amid the wrecks and dust of this universal decay new powers are fashioning themselves, adapted to the new time and its destinies. Besides the old noblesse, originally of fighters, there is a new recognised noblesse of lawyers, whose gala day and proud battle day even now is. An unrecognised noblesse of commerce, powerful enough with money in its pocket. Lastly, powerfulest of all, least recognised of all, a noblesse of literature, without steel on their thigh, without gold in their purse, but with the grand thaumaturgic faculty of thought in their head. French philosophism has arisen, in which little word how much do we include? Here, indeed, lies properly the cardinal symptom of the whole widespread malady. Faith is gone out, scepticism is come in. Evil abounds and accumulates. No man has faith to withstand it, to amend it, to begin by amending himself. It must even go on accumulating while hollow languor and vacuity is the lot of the upper, and want and stagnation of the lower, and universal misery is very certain, what other thing is certain? That a lie cannot be believed. Philosophism knows only this. Her other belief is mainly that, in spiritual supersensual matters, no belief is possible. Unhappy! Nay, as yet the contradiction of a lie is some kind of belief, but the lie with its contradiction once swept away, what will remain? The five unsatiated senses will remain, the sixth insatiable sense of vanity. The whole demonic nature of man will remain, hurled forth to rage blindly without rule or reign, savage itself, yet with all the tools and weapons of civilization, a spectacle new in history. In such a France, as in a powder tower, where fire unquenched and now unquenchable is smoking and smouldering all around, has Louis XV lain down to die. With Pompadourism and Dubarryism, his fleur-de-lis has been shamefully struck down in all lands and in all seas. Poverty invades even the royal exchequer, and tax farming can squeeze out no more. There is a quarrel of twenty-five years standing with the Parlement. Everywhere want, dishonesty, unbelief, and hot-brained skylists for state physicians. It is a portentous hour. Such things can the eye of history see in this sick room of King Louis, which were invisible to the courtiers there. It is twenty years gone Christmas Day since Lord Chesterfield, summing up what he had noted of this same France, wrote and sent off by post the following words that have become memorable. In short, all the symptoms which I have ever met with in history, previous to great changes and revolutions in government, now exist and daily increase in France. End of Book 1, Chapter 2《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 1, The Death of Louis XV, Chapter 3, 
Viaticum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 3, Viaticum. For the present, however, the grand question with the governors of France is, shall extreme unction, or other ghostly viaticum, to Louis, not to France, be administered? It is a deep question. For, if administered, if so much as spoken of, must not, on the very threshold of the business, which do Barry vanish, hardly to return, should Louis even recover? With her vanishes Duc d'Aiguillon and company, and all their amis de palace, as was said. Chaos swallows the whole again, and there is left nothing but a smell of brimstone. But then, on the other hand, what will the Dauphinists and Choiseulists say? Nay, what may the royal martyr himself say, should he happen to get deadly worse without getting delirious? For the present he still kisses the Dubarry hand. So we from the anteroom can note. But afterwards? Doctors' bulletins may run as they are ordered, but it is confluent smallpox, of which, as is whispered too, the gatekeeper's once so buxom daughter lies ill. And Louis XV is not a man to be trifled with in his viaticum. Was he not wont to catechise his very girls in the Parc aux Cerf and pray with and for them that they might preserve their orthodoxy? A strange fact, not an unexampled one, for there is no animal so strange as man. For the moment, indeed, it were all well could Archbishop Beaumont be prevailed upon to wink with one eye. Alas, Beaumont would himself so fain do it, for, singular to tell, the Church too, the whole posthumous hope of Jesuitism, now hangs by the apron of this same unmentionable woman. But then, the force of public opinion? Rigorous Christophe de Beaumont, who has spent his life in persecuting hysterical Jansenists and incredulous non-confessors, or even their dead bodies, if no better might be, how shall he now open heaven's gate and give absolution with the corpus delicti still under his nose? Our grand armoner Rochemont, for his part, will not higgle with the royal sinner about turning of the key. But there are other churchmen. There is a king's confessor, foolish Abbe Moudon, and fanaticism and decency are not yet extinct. On the whole, what is to be done? The doors can be well watched, the medical bulletin adjusted and much, as usual, be hoped for from time and chance. The doors are well watched, no improper figure can enter. Indeed, few wish to enter, for the putrid infection reaches even to the oeil de boeuf, so that more than fifty fall sick and ten die. Mesdames and princesses alone wait at the loathsome sick bed, impelled by filial piety. The three princesses, Grai, Schiff, Koch, Rag, snip, pig, as he was wont to name them, are assiduous there, when all have fled. The fourth princess, Locke, dud, as we guess, is already in the nunnery, and can only give her orisons. Poor Grey and sisterhood, they have never known a father, such as the hard bargain grandeur must make. Scarcely at the debotter, when royalty took off its boots, could they snatch up their enormous hoops, gird the long train round their waists, huddle on their black cloaks of taffeta up to the very chin, and so, in fit appearance of full dress, every evening at six, walk majestically in, receive their royal kiss on the brow, and then walk majestically out again, to embroidery, small scandal, prayers and vacancy. If Majesty came some morning with coffee of its own making and swallowed it with them hastily while the dogs were uncoupling for the hunt, it was received as a grace of heaven. Poor withered ancient women, in the wild tossings that yet await your fragile existence before it be crushed and broken, as ye fly through hostile countries over tempestuous seas, are almost taken by the Turks, and wholly in the sanscalotic earthquake, know not your right hand from your left, be this always an assured place in your remembrance, for the act was good and loving. To us also it is a little sunny spot in that dismal howling waste where we hardly find another. Meanwhile, what shall an impartial prudent courtier do? 
in these delicate circumstances, while not only death or life, but even sacrament or no sacrament is a question, the skilfulest may falter. Few are so happy as the Duc d'Orléans and the Prince de Condé, who can themselves with volatile salts attend the king's antechamber, and at the same time send their brave sons, Duc de Chartres, Egalité that is to be, Duc de Bourbon one day, Condé too, and famous among dotards, to wait upon the Dauphin. With another few it is a resolution taken. Yacta estalia. Old Richelieu, when Beaumont, driven by public opinion, is at last for entering the sick room, will twitch himself by the rocher into a recess, and there, with his old dissipated mastiff face and the oiliest vehemence, be seen pleading, and even as we judge by Beaumont's change of colour, prevailing, that the king be not killed by a proposition in divinity. Duc de Fransac, son of Richelieu, can follow his father, When the curé of Versailles whimpers something about sacraments, he will threaten to throw him out of the window if he mentions such a thing. Happy these, we may say, but to the rest that hover between two opinions, is it not trying? He who would understand to what a pass Catholicism, and much else, had now got, and how the symbols of the holiest have become gambling dice of the basest, must read the narrative of those things by Bessonval and Soulevy and other court newsmen of the time. He will see the Versailles galaxy all scattered asunder, grouped into new, ever-shifting constellations. There are nods and sagacious glances, go-betweens, silk dowagers mysteriously gliding with smiles for this constellation, sighs for that. There is a tremor of hope or desperation in several hearts. There is the pale, grinning shadow of death, ceremoniously ushered along by another grinning shadow of etiquette. At intervals the growl of chapel organs, like prayer by machinery, proclaiming as in a kind of horrid, diabolic horse laughter, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. End of Book One, Chapter Three The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 1, The Death of Louis XV. Chapter 4, Louis the Unforgotten. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 4, Louis the Unforgotten. Poor Louis. With these it is a hollow phantasmagory, where, like mimes, they mope and mowl, and utter false sounds for hire, but with thee it is frightful earnest. Frightful to all men is death, from of old named king of terrors. Our little compact home of an existence, where we dwelt complaining, yet as in a home, is passing, in dark agonies, into an unknown of separation, foreignness, unconditioned possibility. The heathen emperor asks of his soul, Into what places art thou now departing? The Catholic king must answer, To the judgment bar of the Most High God. Yes, it is a summing up of life, A final settling, And giving in the account of the deeds done in the body. They are done now, And lie there unalterable, And do bear their fruits, Long as eternity shall last. Louis XV had always the kingliest abhorrence of death. Unlike that praying Duke of Orléans, Egalité's grandfather, for indeed several of them had a touch of madness, who honestly believed that there was no death, he, if the court newsman can be believed, started up once on a time, glowing with sulphurous contempt and indignation on his poor secretary, who had stumbled on the words, Ferra l'Espagne, the late King of Spain. Ferra, monsieur? Monseigneur, hastily answered the trembling but adroit man of business. C'est un titre qui au prénom. Tis a title they take. Louis, we say, was not so happy, but he did what he could. He would not suffer death to be spoken of, avoided the sight of churchyards, funereal monuments, and whatsoever could bring it to mind. It is the resource of the ostrich who, hard-hunted, sticks his foolish head in the ground and would fain forget that his foolish unseeing body is not unseen too. 
or sometimes with a spasmodic antagonism significant of the same thing and of more, he would go, or stopping his court carriages, would send into churchyards and ask how many new graves there were today, though it gave his poor pompadour the disagreeablest qualms. We can figure the thought of Louis that day, when, all royally caparisoned for hunting, he met, at some sudden turning in the wood of Senar, a ragged peasant with a coffin. For whom? It was for a poor brother's slave, whom Majesty had sometimes noticed slaving in those quarters. What did he die of? Of hunger. The king gave his steed the spur. But figure his thought when death is now clutching at his own heartstrings, unlooked for, inexorable. Yes, poor Louis, death has found thee. No palace walls or lifeguards, gorgeous tapestries or gilt buckram of stiffest ceremonial could keep him out. But he is here, here at thy very life breath, and will extinguish it. Thou, whose whole existence hitherto was a chimera and scenic show, at length becomest a reality, sumptuous Versailles burst asunder like a dream into void immensity. Time is done, and all the scaffolding of time falls wrecked with hideous clang around thy soul. The pale kingdoms yawn open, there must thou enter naked, all unkinged, and await what is appointed thee. Unhappy man, there as thou turnest in dull agony on thy bed of weariness, what a thought is thine. Purgatory and hellfire, now all too possible in the prospect, in the retrospect, alas, what thing didst thou do that were not better undone? What mortal didst thou generously help? What sorrow hadst thou mercy on? Do the five hundred thousand ghosts who sank shamefully on so many battlefields from Rossbach to Quebec that thy harlot might take revenge for an epigram crowd round thee in this hour? Thy foul harem, the curses of mothers, the tears and infamy of daughters? Miserable man, thou hast done evil as thou couldst. Thy whole existence seems one hideous abortion and mistake of nature, the use and meaning of thee not yet known. Wert thou a fabulous griffin, devouring the works of men, daily dragging virgins to thy cave, clad also in scales that no spear would pierce, no spear but death's? A griffin not fabulous but real, frightful, O Louis, seem these moments for thee. We will pry no further into the horrors of a sinner's deathbed. And yet, let no meanest man lay flattering unction to thy soul. Louis was a ruler, but art not thou also one? His wide France, look at it from the fixed stars, themselves not yet infinitude, is no wider than thy narrow brickfield, where thou too didst faithfully or didst unfaithfully. Man, symbol of eternity imprisoned into time, it is not thy works which are all mortal, infinitely little, and the greatest no greatest than the least, but only the spirit thou workest in that can have worth or continuance. But reflect in any case, what a life problem this of poor Louis, when he rose as bien amé from that met sick bed, really was. What son of Adam could have swayed such incoherences into coherence? Could he? Blindest fortune alone has cast him on the top of it. He swims there, can as little sway it as the drift log sways the wind-tossed, moon-stirred Atlantic. What have I done to be so loved, he said then. He may say now, what have I done to be so hated? Thou hast done nothing, poor Louis. Thy fault is properly even this, that thou didst nothing. What could poor Louis do? abdicate and wash his hands of it in favour of the first that would accept. Other clear wisdom there was none for him. As it was, he stood gazing dubiously, the absurdest mortal extant, a very solecism incarnate, into the absurdest confused world, wherein at lost nothing seemed so certain that he, the incarnate solecism, had five senses that were flying tables, tables volantes which vanish through the floor to come back reloaded, and a pack or sef, whereby at least we have again this historical curiosity, a human being in an original position, swimming passively as on some boundless mother of dead dogs towards issues which he partly saw. For Louis had withal a kind of insight in him. 
So, when a new minister of marine, or what else it might be, came announcing his new era, the scarlet woman would hear from the lips of majesty at supper. Yes, he spread out his wear like another, promised the beautifulest things in the world, not a thing of which will come. He does not know this region, or he will see. Or again, tis the twentieth time I hear all that. France will never get a navy, I believe. How touching also was this. If I were lieutenant of police, I would prohibit those Paris cabriolets. Doomed mortal, for is it not a doom to be solecism incarnate? A new roi fainéant, king do-nothing, but with the strangest new mayor of the palace, no bow-legged pepper now for mayor, but that same cloud-capped, fire-breathing spectre of democracy, incalculable, which is enveloping the world. Was Louis no wickeder than this, or the other private do-nothing and eat all, such as we often enough see under the name of man, and even man of pleasure, cumbering God's diligent creation for a time? Say, wretcheder, his life solecism was seen and felt of a whole scandalised world. Him endless oblivion cannot engulf, and swallow to endless depths, not yet for a generation or two. However, be this as it will, we remark, not without interest, that on the evening of the fourth, Dame Du Barry issues from the sick room with perceptible trouble in her visage. It is the fourth evening of May, year of grace, 1774. Such a whispering in the oeil de boeuf. Is he dying then? What can be said is that Du Barry seems making up her packages. She sails weeping through her gilt boudoirs as if taking leave. Daiguillon and company are near their last card. Nevertheless, they will not yet throw up the game. But as for the sacramental controversy, it is as good as settled without being mentioned. Louis can send for his Abbe Moudon in the course of next night, be confessed by him, some say, for a space of seventeen minutes, and demand the sacraments of his own accord. Nay, already in the afternoon... Behold is not your sorceress du Barry with a handkerchief at her eyes, mounting Daiguillon's chariot, rolling off in his duchess's consolatory arms? She is gone, and her place knows her no more. Vanish, false sorceress, into space. Needless to hover at neighbouring Ruel, for thy day is done. Shut are the royal palace gates for evermore. Hardly in coming years shalt thou, under cloud of night, descend one in black domino like a black night bird, and disturb the fair Antoinette's music party in the park, all birds of paradise flying from thee, and musical windpipes growing mute. Thou unclean, yet unmalignant, not unpitiable thing! What a course was thine, from that first truckle-bed in Joan of Arc's country, where thy mother bore thee with tears to an unnamed father, forward through lowest subterranean depths and over highest sunlit heights of harlotdom and rascaldom, to the guillotine axe which shears away thy vainly whimpering head. Rest there uncursed, only buried and abolished, what else befitted thee? Louis, meanwhile, is in considerable impatience for his sacraments, sends more than once to the window to see whether they are not coming. Be of comfort, Louis, what comfort thou canst. They are under way, those sacraments. Toward six in the morning they arrive. Cardinal Grand Armano Rochemont is here, in pontificals with his pixes and his tools. He approaches the royal pillow, elevates his wafer, mutter or seems to mutter somewhat, and so, as the Abbe Georgel, in words that stick to one, expresses it, has Louis made the amend honourable to God. So does your Jesuit construe it. Wah, wah, as the wild Clotaire groaned out when life was departing, what great God is this that pulls down the strength of the strongest kings? The amende honorable, what legal apology you will to God, but not, if Daiguillon can help it, to man. Du Barry still hovers in his mansion at Ruel, and while there is life there is hope. Grand Armand Rochemont, accordingly, for he seems to be in the secret, has no sooner seen his pixes and gear repacked than he is stepping majestically forth again as if the work were done. But King's confessor Abbe Moudon starts forward with anxious, acidulant face, twitches him by the sleeve, whispers in his ear. 
whereupon the poor cardinal must turn round and declare audibly that his majesty repents of any subject of scandal he may have given a pu donner, and purposes by the strength of heaven assisting him to avoid the like for the future. Words listened to by Richelieu with mastiff face growing blacker answered to aloud with an epithet which Bossinval will not repeat. Old Richelieu, conqueror of Menorca, companion of flying table orgies, perforator of bedroom walls, is thy day also done? Alas, the chapel organs may keep going, the shrine of Saint Genevieve be let down and pulled up again without effect. In the evening the whole court, with Dauphin and Dauphiness, assist at the chapel. Priests are hoarse with chanting their prayers of forty hours, and the heaving bellows blow. Almost frightful, for the very heaven blackens, battering rain torrents dash with thunder, almost drowning the organ's voice, and electric fire flashes make the very flambeau on the altar pale. So that the most, as we are told, retired when it was over with hurried steps in a state of meditation, ressuyement, and said little or nothing. So it has lasted for the better half of a fortnight, the Dubarry gone almost a week. Bessonval says all the world was getting impatient que cela fini, that poor Louis would have done with it. It is now the 10th of May, 1774. He will soon have done now. This 10th May day falls into the loathsome sickbed, but dull, unnoticed there. For they that look out of the window are quite darkened, the cistern wheel moves discordant on its axis. Life, like a spent steed, is panting towards the goal. In their remote apartments, Dauphin and Dauphiness stand road-ready, all grooms and equerries booted and spurred, waiting for some signal to escape the house of pestilence. And hark, across the Oeil de Boeuf, what sound is that? Sound terrible and absolutely like thunder. It is the rush of the whole court, rushing as in wager to salute the new sovereigns. Hail to your majesties! The Dauphin and Dauphiness are king and queen. Overpowered with many emotions, they too fall on their knees together and with streaming tears exclaim, O oh God, guide us, protect us, we are too young to reign. Too young indeed. Thus, in any case, with a sound absolutely like thunder, as the horologe of time struck and an old era passed away. The Louis that was lies forsaken, a mass of abhorred clay, abandoned to some poor persons and priests of the Chapelle Ardente, who make haste to put him in two lead coffins pouring in abundant spirits of wine. The new Louis, with his court, is rolling towards Choisy through the summer afternoon, the royal tears still flow, but a word mispronounced by Monsieur d'Artois sets them all laughing, and they weep no more. Light mortals, how ye walk your light life minuet over bottomless abysses divided from you by a film. For the rest, the proper authorities felt that no funeral could be too unceremonious. Bessonval himself thinks it was unceremonious enough. Two carriages containing two noblemen of the usher species and a Versailles clerical person, some score of mounted pages, some fifty palfreniers, these with torches, but not so much as in black, start from Versailles on the second evening with their leaden beer. At a high trot they start, and keep up that pace. For the jibes, brocard, of those Parisians who stand planted in two rows all the way to St. Denis and give vent to their pleasantry, the characteristic of the nation, do not tempt one to slacken. Towards midnight the vaults of St. Denis receive their own, unwept by any eye of all these, if not by poor Locke, his neglected daughters, whose nunnery is hard by. Him they crush down and huddle underground in this impatient way, him and his era of sin and tyranny and shame. For behold, a new era is come, the future all the brighter that the past was base. End of Book One, Chapter Four The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One Book Two, The Paper Age, Chapter One 
Astraea Redux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 1. Astraea Redux. A paradoxical philosopher carrying to the utmost length that aphorism of Montesquieu's Happy the people whose annals are tiresome has said Happy the people whose annals are vacant. In which saying, mad as it looks, may there not still be found some grain of reason? For truly, as it has been written, silence is divine, and of heaven. So in all earthly things too there is a silence which is better than any speech. Consider it well, the event, the thing which can be spoken of and recorded, is it not in all cases some disruption, some solution of continuity? Were it even a glad event, it involves change, involves loss of active force. And so far, either in the past or in the present, is an irregularity, a disease. Stillest perseverance were our blessedness, not dislocation and alteration, could they be avoided. The oak grows silently in the forest a thousand years. Only in the thousandth year when the woodman arrives with his axe is there heard an echoing through the solitudes, and the oak announces itself when, with a far-sounding crash, it falls. How silent, too, was the planting of the acorn, scattered from the lap of some wandering wind? Nay, when our oak flowered or put on its leaves, its glad events, what shout of proclamation could there be? hardly from the most observant a word of recognition. These things befell not, they were slowly done, not in an hour, but through the flight of days. What was to be said of it? This hour seemed altogether as the last was, as the next would be. It is thus everywhere that foolish rumour babbles not of what was done, but of what was misdone or undone. And foolish history, ever more or less the written epitomised synopsis of rumour, knows so little that were not as well unknown. Attila invasions, Walter the Penniless Crusades, Sicilian Vespers, Thirty Years' Wars, mere sin and misery, not work but hindrance of work. For the earth all this while was yearly green and yellow with her kind harvests, The hand of the craftsman, the mind of the thinker, rested not. And so, after all, and in spite of all, we have this so glorious, high-domed, blossoming world, concerning which poor history may well ask with wonder whence it came. She knows so little of it, knows so much of what obstructed it, what would have rendered it impossible. Such, nevertheless, by necessity or foolish choice, is her rule and practice, whereby that paradox, happy the people whose annals are vacant, is not without its true side. And yet, what seems more pertinent to note here, there is a stillness, not of unobstructed growth, but of passive inertness, and symptom of imminent downfall. As victory is silent, so is defeat. Of the opposing forces, the weaker has resigned itself. The stronger marches on, noiseless now, but rapid, inevitable. The fall and overturn will not be noiseless. How all grows and has its period, even as the herbs of the fields, be it annual, centennial, millennial. All grows and dies, each by its own wondrous laws, in wondrous fashion of its own, spiritual things most wondrously of all. Inscrutable to the wisest are these latter, not to be prophesied of or understood. If when the oak stands proudliest, flourishing to the eye, you know that its heart is sound, it is not so with the man, how much less with the society, with the nation of men. Of such it may be affirmed even that the superficial aspect, that the inward feeling of full health, is generally ominous. For indeed it is of apoplexy, so to speak, and a plethoric lazy habit of body that churches, kingships, social institutions oftenest die. Sad when such institution plethorically says to itself, Take thy ease, thou hast goods laid up. Like the fool of the gospel to whom it was answered, Fool, this night thy life shall be required of thee. 
Is it the healthy peace or the ominous unhealthy that rests on France for these next ten years, over which the historian can pass lightly without call to linger, for as yet events are not, much less performances? Time of sunniest stillness, shall we call it what all men thought the new age of gold? Call it at least of paper, which in many ways is the succedaneum of gold, Bank paper, wherewith you can still buy where there is no gold left. Book paper, splendent with theories, philosophies, sensibilities. Beautiful art, not only of revealing thought, but also of so beautifully hiding from us the want of thought. Paper is made from the rags of things that did once exist. There are endless excellencies in paper. What wisest philosopher in this halcyon, uneventful period could prophesy that there was approaching, big with darkness and confusion, the event of events? Hope ushers in a revolution as earthquakes are preceded by bright weather. On the 5th of May, 15 years hence, old Louis will not be sending for the sacraments, but a new Louis, his grandson, with the whole pomp of astonished, intoxicated France, will be opening the States General. Du Barrydom and its Daiguillons are gone forever. There is a young, still docile, well-intentioned king, a young, beautiful and bountiful, well-intentioned queen, and with them all France, as it were, become young. Mopio and his parlement have to vanish into thick night. Respectable magistrates, not indifferent to the nation, were it only for having been opponents of the court, can descend unchained from their steep rocks at Crow in Combray and elsewhere, and return singing praises. The old parlement of Paris resumes its functions. Instead of a profligate, bankrupt Abbe Terre, we have now, for Controller General, a virtuous philosophic Turgo, with a whole reformed France in his head, by whom whatsoever is wrong, in finance or otherwise, will be righted as far as possible. Is it not as if wisdom herself were henceforth to have seat and voice in the Council of Kings? Turgo has taken office with the noblest plainness of speech to that effect, been listened to with the noblest royal trustfulness. It is true, as King Louis objects, they say he never goes to Mass. But liberal France likes him little worse for that. Liberal France answers, the Abbe Terre always went. Philosophism sees, for the first time, a philosoph, or even a philosopher, in office. She, in all things, will plausibly second him. Neither will light old Maurepa obstruct if he can easily help it. Then how sweet are the manners, vice losing all its deformity, becoming decent, as established things making regulations for themselves do, becoming almost a kind of sweet virtue. Intelligence so abounds, irradiated by wit and the art of conversation. Philosophism sits joyful in her glittering saloons, the dinner guest of opulence grown ingenuous, the very nobles proud to sit by her. And preachers, lifted up over all Bastille, a coming millennium. From far ferny, Patriarch Voltaire gives sign. Veterans Diderot, d'Alembert have lived to see this day. These with the younger, Marmontel, Morellet, Chamfort, Reynal, make glad the spicy board of rich, ministering dowager, a philosophic farmer-general. O oh, nights and suppers of the gods, of a truth the long demonstrated will now be done. The age of revolutions approaches, as Jean-Jacques wrote, but then of happy blessed ones. Man awakens from his long somnambulism, chases the phantasms that beleaguered and bewitched him. Behold the new morning glittering down the eastern steeps. Fly, false phantasms, from its shafts of light. Let the absurd fly, utterly forsaking this lower earth forever. It is truth and astraea redux that, in the shape of philosophism, henceforth reign. For what imaginable purpose was man made, if not to be happy? By victorious analysis and progress of the species, happiness enough now awaits him. 
kings can become philosophers, or else philosophers kings. Let but society be once rightly constituted by victorious analysis. The stomach that is empty shall be filled, the throat that is dry shall be wetted with wine, labour itself shall be all one as rest, not grievous but joyous. Wheat fields, one would think, cannot come to grow untilled, no man made clay or made weary thereby, unless indeed machinery will do it. Gratuitous tailors and restaurateurs may start up at fit intervals, one as yet sees not how. But if each will, according to rule of benevolence, have a care for all, then surely no one will be uncared for. Nay, who knows but by sufficiently victorious analysis, human life may be indefinitely lengthened and men get rid of death as they have already done of the devil. We shall then be happy in spite of death and the devil. So preaches magniloquent philosophism, heredeunt Saturnia Regna. The prophetic song of Paris and its philosophe is audible enough in the Versailles Oi de Boeuf, and the Oi de Boeuf, intent chiefly on nearer blessedness, can answer at worst with a polite, why not? Good old cheery Morapar is too joyful a Prime Minister to dash the world's joy. Sufficient for the day be its own evil. Cheery old man, he cuts his jokes and hovers careless along, his cloak well adjusted to the wind, if so be he may please all persons. The simple young king, whom Amorapa cannot think of troubling with business, has retired into the interior apartments. Taciturn, irresolute, though with a sharpness of temper at times, he at length determines on a little smith work. And so, in apprenticeship with a Sieur Gamin, whom one day he shall have little cause to bless, is learning to make locks. It appears further he understood geography and could read English. Unhappy young king, his childlike trust in that foolish old Morapa deserved another return, but friend and foe, destiny and himself, have combined to do him hurt. Meanwhile, the fair young queen in her halls of state walks like a goddess of beauty, the cynosure of all eyes, as yet mingles not with affairs, heeds not the future, least of all dreads it. Weber and Campan have pictured her there within the royal tapestries, in bright boudoirs, baths, peignoirs, and the grand and little toilette, with a whole brilliant world waiting obsequious on her glance. Fair young daughter of time, what things has time in store for thee? Like earth's brightest appearance, she moves gracefully, environed with the grandeur of earth, a reality and yet a magic vision. For behold, shall not utter darkness swallow it? A soft young heart adopts orphans, portions meritorious maids, delights to succour the poor, such poor as come picturesquely in her way, and sets the fashion of doing it, for, as was said, benevolence has now begun reigning. In her Duchess de Polignac, in Princess de Lamballe, she enjoys something almost like friendship. Now, too, after seven long years, she has a child, and soon even a Dauphin of her own can reckon herself, as queens go, happy in a husband. Events. The grand events are but charitable feasts of morals, fête de mer, with their prizes and speeches. Poissard processions to the Dauphin's cradle, above all flirtations, their rise, progress, decline and fall. There are snow statues raised by the poor in hard winter to a queen who has given them fuel. There are masquerades, theatricals, beautifyings of little Trianon, purchase and repair of Saint Cloud. Journeyings from the summer court Elysium to the winter one. There are poutings and grudgings from the Sardinian sisters-in-law, for the princes too are wedded, little jealousies which court etiquette can moderate. Wholly the lightest-hearted, frivolous foam of existence, yet an artfully refined foam, pleasant were it not so costly, like that which mantles on the wine of champagne. Monsieur, the king's elder brother, has set up for a kind of wit, and leans towards the philosophe side. 
Monsieur d'Artois pulls the mask from a fair impertinent, fights a duel in consequence, almost drawing blood. He has breeches of a kind new in this world, a fabulous kind. Four tall lackeys, says Mercier, as if he had seen it, hold him up in the air that he may fall into the garment without vestige of wrinkle, from which rigorous encasement the same four in the same way and with more effort must deliver him at night. This last is he who now, as a grey, time-worn man, sits desolate at Graz, having winded up his destiny with the three days. In such sort are poor mortals swept and shovelled to and fro. End of Book 2, Chapter 1《The French Revolution, a History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1 Book 2, The Paper Age Chapter 2, Petition in Hieroglyphs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 2 Petition in Hieroglyphs With the working people, again, it is not so well. Unlucky. For there are twenty to twenty-five millions of them, whom, however, we lump together into a kind of dim, compendious unity, monstrous but dim, far off as the canai, or, more humanely, as the masses. Masses, indeed. And yet, singular to say, if, with an effort of imagination, thou follow them over broad France, into their clay hovels, into their garrets and hutches, the masses consist all of units, every unit of whom has his own heart and sorrows, stands covered there with his own skin, and if you prick him, he will bleed. O oh, purple sovereignty, holiness, reverence! Thou, for example, Cardinal Grand Armoner, with thy plush covering of honour, who hast thy hands strengthened with dignities and monies, and art set on thy world watchtower solemnly in sight of God for such ends. What a thought that every unit of these masses is a miraculous man, even as thyself art, struggling with vision or with blindness for his infinite kingdom this life which he has got once only in the middle of eternities, with a spark of the divinity, what thou callest an immortal soul, in him. Dreary, languid do these struggle in their obscure remoteness, their hearth cheerless, their diet thin. For them in this world rises no era of hope, hardly now in the other, if it be not hope in the gloomy rest of death, for their faith, too, is failing. Untaught, uncomforted, unfed. A dumb generation, their voice only an inarticulate cry. Spokesmen in the King's Council, in the World's Forum, they have none that finds credence. At rare intervals, as now in 1775, they will fling down their hoes and hammers, and to the astonishment of thinking mankind, flock hither and thither, dangerous, aimless, get the length even of Versailles. Turgot is altering the corn trade, abrogating the absurdest corn laws. There is Darth, real or, were it even factitious, an indubitable scarcity of bread. And so... On the second day of May, 1775, these waste multitudes do here at Versailles Chateau, in widespread wretchedness, in sallow faces, squalor, winged raggedness, present as in legible hieroglyphic writing their petition of grievances. The chateau gates have to be shut, but the king will appear on the balcony and speak to them. They have seen the king's face. Their petition of grievances has been, if not read, looked at. For answer, two of them are hanged on a new gallows forty feet high, and the rest driven back to their dens for a time. Clearly a difficult point for government, that of dealing with these masses, if indeed it be not rather the sole point and problem of government, and all other points mere accidental crotchets, superficialities and beatings of the wind. For let charter chests, use and want, law common and special, say what they will, the masses count to so many millions of units, made to all appearance by God, whose earth this is declared to be. 
Besides, the people are not without ferocity. They have sinews and indignation. Do but look what holiday old Marquis Mirabeau, the crabbed old friend of men, looked on in these same years from his lodging at the baths of Mont d'Or. The savages descending in torrents from the mountains, our people ordered not to go out. The curate in surplice and stole, justice in its peruke. Marichose, sabre in hand, guarding the place till the bagpipes can begin. The dance interrupted in a quarter of an hour by battle. The cries, the squealings of children, of infirm persons and other assistants tarring them on as the rabble does when dogs fight. Frightful men, or rather frightful wild animals, clad in dupes of coarse woolen with large girdles of leather studded with copper nails, of gigantic stature, heightened by high wooden clogs, sabo rising on tiptoe to see the fight, tramping time to it, rubbing their sides with their elbows, their faces haggard, figure half, and covered with their long, greasy hair, the upper part of the visage waxing pale, the lower distorting itself into the attempt at a cruel laugh and a sort of ferocious impatience. And these people pay the tie, and you want further to take their salt from them? And you know not what it is you are stripping bare, or as you call it, governing. What by the spurt of your pen in its cold, dastard indifference you will fancy you can starve always with impunity, always till the catastrophe come? Ah, madame, such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, will end in the general overturn. Coubute général. Undoubtedly, a dark feature, this, in an age of gold age at least of paper and hope. Meanwhile, trouble us not with thy prophecies, O croaking friend of men, tis long that we have heard such, and still the old world keeps wagging its old way. End of Book 2, Chapter 2《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2 — The Paper Age Chapter 3 — Questionable This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 3 — Questionable Or is this same age of hope itself but a simulacrum, as hope too often is? Cloud vapour, with rainbows painted on it, beautiful to see, to sail towards, which hovers over Niagara Falls. In that case, Victoria's analysis will have enough to do. Alas, yes, a whole world to remake, if she could see it, work for another than she. For all is wrong and gone out of joint. The inward spiritual and the outward economical, head or heart, there is no soundness in it. As indeed evils of all sorts are more or less of kin and do usually go together, especially it is an old truth that wherever huge physical evil is, there as the parent and origin of it has moral evil to a proportionate extent been. Before those five and twenty labouring millions, for instance, could get that haggardness of face which old Mirabeau now looks on in a nation calling itself Christian and calling man the brother of man, what unspeakable, nigh infinite dishonesty of seeming and not being in all manner of rulers and appointed watchers, spiritual and temporal, must there not through long ages have gone on accumulating? It will accumulate. Moreover, it will reach a head, for the first of all Gospels is this, that a lie cannot endure for ever. In fact, if we pierce through that rose-pink vapour of sentimentalism, philanthropy and feasts of morals, there lies behind it one of the sorriest spectacles. You might ask, what bonds that ever held a human society happily together, or held it together at all, are in force here? It is an unbelieving people, which has suppositions, hypotheses and froth systems of Victoria's analysis, and for belief this mainly, that pleasure is pleasant. Hunger they have for all sweet things, and the law of hunger, but what other law? Within them or over them? Properly, none. 
Their king has become a King Popinjay, with his Morapa government gyrating as the weathercock does, blown about by every wind. Above them they see no god, or they even do not look above except with astronomical glasses. The church indeed still is, but in the most submissive state, quite tamed by philosophism, in a singularly short time, for the hour was come. Some twenty years ago, your Archbishop Beaumont would not even let the poor Jansenists get buried. Your Lomini Brienne, a rising man whom we shall meet with yet, could, in the name of the clergy, insist on having the anti-Protestant laws which condemned to death for preaching put in execution. And alas, now not so much as Baron Holbach's atheism can be burnt, except as pipe matches by the private speculative individual. Our church stands halted, dumb, like a dumb ox, lowing only for provender of tithes, content if it can have that, or dumbly, dully, expecting its further doom. And the twenty millions of haggard faces, and as finger-post and guidance to them in their dark struggle, a gallows forty feet high? Certainly a singular golden age, with its fist of morals, its sweet manners, its sweet institutions, institution douce, betokening nothing but peace among men. Peace? Oh, philosophy sentimentalism, what hast thou to do with peace when thy mother's name is Jezebel? Foul product of still fouler corruption, thou with the corruption art doomed. Meanwhile, it is singular how long the rotten will hold together, provided you do not handle it roughly. For whole generations it continues standing, with a ghastly affectation of life, after all, life and truth have fled out of it, so loath are men to quit their old ways and conquering indolence and inertia venture on new. Great, truly, is the actual, is the thing that has rescued itself from bottomless deeps of theory and possibility and stands there as a definite, indisputable fact whereby men do work and live, or once did so. Widely shall men cleave to that, while it will endure, and quit it with regret when it gives way under them. Rash enthusiast of change, beware! Hast thou well considered all that habit does in this life of ours? How all knowledge and all practice hang wondrous over infinite abysses of the unknown, impracticable, and our whole being is an infinite abyss, overarched by habit, as by a thin earth rind, laboriously built together. But if every man, as it has been written, holds confined within him a madman, what must every society do, society which in its commonest state is called the standing miracle of this world? Without such earth rind of habit, continues our author, call it system of habits, in a word fixed ways of acting and of believing, society would not exist at all. With such, it exists, better or worse. Herein, too, in this its system of habits, acquired, retained, how you will, lies the true law code and constitution of a society, the only code, though an unwritten one, which it can in no wise disobey. The thing we call written code, constitution, form of government and the like, what is it but some miniature image and solemnly expressed summary of this unwritten code? Is, or rather, alas, is not, but only should be, and always tends to be, in which latter discrepancy lies struggle without end. And now we add in the same dialect, but let by your chance in such ever-enduring struggle your thin earth rind be once broken, the fountains of the great deep boil forth, fire fountains enveloping, engulfing. Your earth rind is shattered, swallowed up. Instead of a green flowery world, there is a waste, wild, weltering chaos, which has again with tumult and struggle to make itself into a world. On the other hand, be this conceded, where thou findest a lie that is oppressing thee, extinguish it. Lies exist there only to be extinguished. They wait and cry earnestly for extinction. 
Think well, meanwhile, in what spirit thou wilt do it, not with hatred, with headlong self-violence, but in clearness of heart, with holy zeal, gently, almost with pity. Thou wouldst not replace such extinct lie by a new lie, which a new injustice of thy own were, the parent of still other lies, whereby the latter end of that business were worse than the beginning. So, however, in this world of ours, which has both an indestructible hope in the future and an indestructible tendency to persevere as in the past, must innovation and conservation wage their perpetual conflict as they may and can. Wherein the daimonic element that lurks in all human things may doubtless some once in a thousand years get vent. But indeed, may we not regret that such conflict, which after all is but like that classical one of hate-filled Amazons with heroic youths, and will end in embraces, should usually be so spasmodic? For conservation, strengthened by that mightiest quality in us, our indolence, sits for long ages, not victorious only, which she should be, but tyrannical, incommunicative. She holds her adversary as if annihilated, such adversary lying all the while like some buried Enceladus, who, to gain the smallest freedom, must stir a whole trinacria with its tightness. Wherefore, on the whole, we will honour a paper age too, an era of hope. For in this same frightful process of Enceladus revolt, when the task on which no mortal would willingly enter has become imperative, inevitable, is it not even a kindness of nature that she lures us forward by cheerful promises, fallacious or not, and a whole generation plunges into the Erebus blackness lighted on by an era of hope? It has been well said, man is based on hope, he has properly no other possession but hope. This habitation of his is named the place of hope. End of book two. Chapter 3《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 2 The Paper Age, Chapter 4 Maurepas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 4 Maurepas. But now, among French hopes, is not that of old Monsieur de Maurepas one of the best grounded, who hopes that he, by dexterity, shall contrive to continue minister? Nimble old man, who for all emergencies has his light jest, and ever in the worst confusion will emerge cork-like, unsunk. Small care to him is perfectibility, progress of the species, and astraea redux, Good only that a man of light wit, verging towards fourscore, can, in the seat of authority, feel himself important among men. Shall we call him, as Horti Chateroux was wont of old, Monsieur Facquenet, diminutive of scoundrel? In court dialect he is now named the Nestor of France, such a governing Nestor as France has. At bottom, nevertheless, it might puzzle one to say where the government of France in these days specially is. In that chateau of Versailles we have Nesta, king, queen, ministers and clerks with paper bundles tied in tape, but the government? For government is a thing that governs, that guides, and if need be, compels. Visible in France there is not such a thing. Invisible, inorganic, on the other hand, there is, in philosophe salon, in oeil de boeuf galleries, in the tongue of the babbler, in the pen of the pamphleteer. Her Majesty, appearing at the opera, is applauded. She returns, all radiant with joy. Anon, the applauses wax fainter, or threaten to cease. She is heavy of heart. The light of her face has fled. Is sovereignty some poor Montgolfier, which, blown into by the popular wind, grows great and mounts, or sinks flaccid if the wind be withdrawn? France was long a despotism tempered by epigrams, and now, it would seem, the epigrams have got the upper hand. Happy were a young Louis the Desired to make France happy, if it did not prove too troublesome, and he only knew the way. 
but there is endless discrepancy around him, so many claims and clamours, a mere confusion of tongues. Not reconcilable by man, not manageable, suppressible, save by some strongest and wisest men, which only a lightly jesting, lightly gyrating Monsieur de Maurepas can so much as subsist amidst. Philosophism claims her new era, meaning thereby innumerable things and claims it in no faint voice, for France at large, hitherto mute, is now beginning to speak also, and speaks in that same sense. A huge, many-toned sound, distant yet not unimpressive. On the other hand, the Oeil de Boeuf, which as nearest one can hear best, claims with shrill vehemence that the monarchy be, as heretofore, a horn of plenty, wherefrom loyal courtiers may draw, to the just support of the throne. Let liberalism and a new era, if such is the wish, be introduced, only no curtailment of the royal monies, which latter condition, alas, is precisely the impossible one. Philosophism, as we saw, has got her turgo made controller-general, and there shall be endless reformation. Unhappily, this turgo could continue only twenty months. With a miraculous Fortunatus purse in his treasury, it might have lasted longer. With such purse, indeed, every French controller-general that would prosper in these days ought first to provide himself. But here again, may we not remark the bounty of nature in regard to hope? Man after man advances confident to the Augean stable, as if he could clean it, expend his little fraction of an ability on it with such cheerfulness does, in so far as he was honest, accomplish something. Turgo has faculties, honesty, insight, heroic volition, but the fortunatus purse he has not. Sanguine controller-general. A whole pacific French revolution may stand schemed in the head of the thinker, but who shall pay the unspeakable indemnities that will be needed? Alas, far from that, on the very threshold of the business, he proposes that the clergy, the noblesse, the very parliament be subjected to taxes. One shriek of indignation and astonishment reverberates through all the chateau galleries. Monsieur de Maurepas has to gyrate. The poor king, who had written a few weeks ago, Il n'y a que vous et moi qui aimions le peuple. There is none but you and I that has the people's interest at heart must write now a dismissal, and let the French Revolution accomplish itself, pacifically or not, as it can. Hope, then, is deferred? Deferred, not destroyed or abated? Is not this, for example, our patriarch Voltaire, after long years of absence, revisiting Paris? With face shriveled to nothing, with huge peruke a la Louis XIV, which leaves only two eyes visible, glittering like carbuncles. The old man is here. What an outburst! Sneering Paris has suddenly grown reverent, devotional with hero worship. Nobles have disguised themselves as tavern waiters to obtain sight of him. The loveliest of France would lay their hair beneath his feet. His chariot is the nucleus of a comet whose train fills whole streets. They crown him in the theatre with immortal vivats, finally stifle him under roses. For old Richelieu recommended opium in such a state of the nerves, and the excessive patriarch took too much. Her Majesty herself had some thought of sending for him, but was dissuaded. Let Majesty consider it, nevertheless. The purport of this man's existence has been to wither up and annihilate all whereon Majesty and worship for the present rest, and is it so that the world recognises him? with apotheosis as its prophet and speaker, who has spoken wisely the thing it longed to say? Add only that the body of this same rose-stifled, beatified patriarch cannot get buried except by stealth. It is wholly a notable business, and France without doubt is big, what the Germans called of good hope. We shall wish her a happy birth hour and blessed fruit. Beaumarchais too has now winded up his law pleadings memoirs, not without result, to himself and to the world. 
Caron Beaumarchais, or de Beaumarchais, for he got ennobled, had been born poor, but aspiring Assyriant, with talents, audacity, adroitness, above all with the talent for intrigue, a lean but also a tough, indomitable man. Fortune and dexterity brought him to the harpsichord of Mesdames, our good Princess Locke, Grey, and Sisterhood. Still better, Paris Duvernier, the court banker, honoured him with some confidence to the length even of transactions in cash, which confidence, however, Duvernier's heir, a person of quality, would not continue. Quite otherwise, there springs a lawsuit from it, wherein tough Beaumarchais, losing both money and repute, is, in the opinion of Judge Reporter Goetzman of the Parliament Bopeo, of a whole indifferent acquiescing world, miserably beaten, in all men's opinions, only not in his own. Inspired by the indignation which makes, if not verses, satirical law papers, the withered music master, with a desperate heroism, takes up his lost cause in spite of the world, fights for it against reporters, parliament and principalities, with light banter, with clear logic, adroitly with an inexhaustible toughness and resource, like the skilfulest fencer, on whom so skilful is he the whole world now looks. Three long years it lasts with wavering fortune. In fine, after labours comparable to the twelve of Hercules, our uncomparable Caron triumphs, regains his lawsuit and lawsuits, strips reporter Gertzman of the judicial ermine, covering him with a perpetual garment of obloquy instead, and in regard to the Parliament Mopio, which he has helped to extinguish, to Parliament of all kind and to French justice generally, gives rise to endless reflections in the minds of men. Thus has Beaumarchais, like a lean French Hercules, ventured down, driven by destiny, into the nether kingdoms, and victoriously tamed hell-dogs there. He also is henceforth among the notabilities of his generation. End of Book Two, Chapter Four The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1. Book 2. The Paper Age. Chapter 5. Astraea Redux Without Cash. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2. Chapter 5. Astraea Redux Without Cash. Observe, however, beyond the Atlantic, has not the new day verily dawned? Democracy, as we said, is born, storm girt, is struggling for life and victory. A sympathetic France rejoices over the rights of man. In all saloons it is said, What a spectacle! Now too behold our Dean, our Franklin, American plenipotentiaries here in position soliciting. The sons of the Saxon Puritans with their old Saxon temper, old Hebrew culture, sleek Silas, sleek Benjamin, here on such errand among the light children of heathenism, monarchy, sentimentalism and the scarlet woman. A spectacle, indeed, over which saloons may cackle joyous, though Kaiser Joseph, questioned on it, gave this answer most unexpected from a philosophe. Madame, the trade I live by is that of royalist. Mon métier à moi, c'est d'être royaliste. So thinks light more apart, too. But the wind of philosophism and force of public opinion will blow him round. Best wishes, meanwhile, are sent, clandestine privateers armed. Paul Jones shall equip his bonhomme Richard. Weapons, military stores can be smuggled over if the English do not seize them, wherein, once more, Beaumarchais dimly as the giant smuggler becomes visible, filling his own lank pocket with all. But surely, in any case, France should have a navy. For which great object were not now the time, now when that proud termagant of the seas has her hands full? It is true, an impoverished treasury cannot build ships, but the hint once given, which Beaumarchais says he gave, this and the other loyal seaport chamber of commerce will build and offer them, goodly vessels bound into the waters, a ville de Paris, leviathan of ships. And now, when gratuitous three-deckers dance there at anchor with streamers flying, and eleutheromaniac philosophedom grows ever more clamorous, what can a Morapa do but gyrate? 
Squadrons crossed the ocean, gauges, lees, rough Yankee generals with woollen nightcaps under their hats present arms to the far-glancing chivalry of France and newborn democracy sees, not without amazement, despotism tempered by epigrams fight at her side. So, however it is, King's forces and heroic volunteers, Rochambeau, Bouillet, Lameth, Lafayette, have drawn their swords in this sacred quarrel of mankind, shall draw them again elsewhere in the strangest way. Off Ushant some naval thunder is heard, in the course of which did our young prince, Duke de Chartres, hide in the hold, or did he materially by active heroism contribute to the victory? Alas, by a second edition we learned that there was no victory, or that English Keppel had it. Our poor young prince gets his opera plaudits changed into mocking tees and cannot become Grand Admiral, the source to him of woes which one may call endless. Woe also for V de Paris, the leviathan of ships. English Rodney has clutched it and led it home with the rest. So successful was his new manoeuvre of breaking the enemy's line. It seems as if, according to Louis XV, France were never to have a navy. Brave Safran must return from Hyder Alley in the Indian waters with small result, yet with great glory for six non-defeats, which indeed, with such seconding as he had, one may reckon heroic. Let the old sea hero rest now, honoured of France, in his native Savannes mountains. Send smoke, not of gunpowder, but mere culinary smoke, through the old chimneys of the castle of Jales, which one day in other hand shall have other fame. Brave La Peru shall by and by lift anchor on philanthropic voyage of discovery, for the king knows geography. But alas, also, this will not prosper. The brave navigator goes and returns not. The seekers search far seas for him in vain. He has vanished, trackless, into blue immensity, and only some mournful, mysterious shadow of him hovers long in all heads and hearts. Neither while the war yet lasts will Gibraltar surrender. Not though Creon, Association, with the ablest projectors extant, are there, and Prince Condé and Prince d'Artois have hastened to help. Wondrous leather-roofed floating batteries set afloat by French-Spanish Pac de Famaille gave gallant summons, to which nevertheless Gibraltar answers plutonically with mere torrents of red-hot iron, as if stone calpe had become a throat of the pit, and utters such a doom's blast of a no as all men must credit. And so, with this loud explosion, the noise of war has ceased, an age of benevolence may hope for ever. Our noble volunteers of freedom have returned to be her missionaries. Lafayette, as the matchless of his time, glitters in the Versailles Oeil de Boeuf, has his bust set up in the Paris Hotel de Ville. Democracy stands inexpugnable, immeasurable, in her new world, has even a foot lifted towards the old, and our French finances, little strengthened by such work, are in no healthy way. What to do with the finances? This indeed is the great question. A small but most black weather symptom which no radiance of universal hope can cover. We saw Turgo cast forth from the controller ship with shrieks for want of a Fortunatus's purse. As little could Monsieur de Cluny manage the duty, or indeed do anything but consume his wages, attain a place in history where, as an ineffectual shadow, thou beholdest him still lingering, and let the duty manage itself. Did Genevieve's Necker possess such a purse, then? He possessed banker's skill, banker's honesty, credit of all kinds, for he had written academic prize essays, struggled for India companies, given dinner to philosophy, and realised a fortune in twenty years. He possessed further a taciturnity and solemnity of depth, or else of dullness, how singular for Saladon Gibbon, false swain as he had proved, whose father, keeping most probably his own gig, would not hear of such a union, to find now his forsaken demoiselle Suchot sitting in the high places of the world as minister's madame, and Necker not jealous. A new young demoiselle, one day to be famed as a madame and de stay, was romping about the knees of the decline and fall. 
The Lady Necker founds hospitals, gives solemn philosoph dinner parties to cheer her exhausted controller general. Strange things have happened. By clamour of philosophism, management of Marquis de Pesé and poverty constraining even kings. And so Necker, Atlas-like, sustains the burden of the finances for five years long? without wages, for he refused such, cheered only by public opinion and the ministering of his noble wife. With many thoughts in him, it is hoped, which, however, he is shy of uttering. His Comte Rendu, published by the royal permission, fresh sign of a new era, shows wonders, which what but the genius of some Atlas Necker can prevent from becoming portents. In Necker's head, too, there is a whole Pacific French Revolution of its kind, and in that taciturn dull depth or deep dullness, ambition enough. Meanwhile, alas, his Fortunatus's purse turns out to be little other than the old Vectigal of parsimony. Nay, he too has to produce his schemes of taxing clergy, noblesse to be taxed, provincial assemblies and the rest, like a mere turgo. The expiring Monsieur de Maurepas must gyrate one other time. Let Necker also depart, not unlamented. Great in a private station, Necker looks on from the distance, abiding his time. Eighty thousand copies of his new book, which he calls Administration des Finances, will be sold in a few days. He is gone, but shall return, and that more than once, borne by a whole shouting nation. Singular Controller-General of the Finances, once clerk in Telusson's bank. End of Book 2, Chapter 5《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2, The Paper Age, Chapter 6, Windbags This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 2, Chapter 6, Windbags So marches the world in this its paper age or era of hope. Not without obstructions, war explosions, which, however, heard from such distance, are little other than a cheerful marching music. If, indeed, that dark living chaos of ignorance and hunger, five and twenty million strong under your feet, were to begin playing. For the present, however, consider Longchamp. Now, when Lent is ending and the glory of Paris and France has gone forth as in annual want, not to assist at Tenebris masses, but to sun itself and show itself and salute the young spring. Manifold, bright-tinted, glittering with gold, all through the Bois de Boulogne in long-drawn variegated rows like long-drawn living flower borders, tulips, dahlias, lilies of the valley, all in their moving flower-pots of new gilt carriages pleasure of the eye and pride of life. So rolls and dances the procession, steady, a firm assurance, as if it rolled on adamant and the foundations of the world, not on mere heraldic parchment, under which smoulders a lake of fire. Dance on, ye foolish ones. Ye sought not wisdom, neither have ye found it. Ye and your fathers have sown the wind, ye shall reap the whirlwind. Was it not from of old written, The wages of sin is death? But at Longchamp, as elsewhere, we remark for one thing, the dame and cavalier are waited on each by a kind of human familiar named jockey. Little elf or imp, though young, already withered, with its withered air of premature vice, of knowingness, of completed elfhood, useful in various emergencies. The name jockey jockey comes from the English, as the thing also fancies that it does. Our Anglomania, in fact, has grown considerable, prophetic of much. If France is to be free, why shall she not, now when mad war is hushed, love neighbouring freedom? Cultivated men, your Dukes de Lioncourt, de la Rochefoucauld, admire the English constitution, the English national character, would import what of it they can. Of what is lighter, especially if it be light as wind, how much easier the freightage. Non-admiral, Duc de Chartres, not yet d'Orléans or Egalité, flies to and fro across the strait, importing English fashions. 
this he, as hand and glove with an English Prince of Wales, is surely qualified to do. Carriages and saddles, top boots and redding coats, as we call riding coats. Nay, the very mode of riding, for now no man on a level with his age, but will trot a l'anglaise, rising in the stirrups, scornful of the old sit-fast method in which, according to Shakespeare, butter and eggs go to market. Also he can urge the fervid wheels, this brave chartre of ours. No whip in Paris is rasher and surer than the unprofessional one of Monseigneur. Elf jockeys we have seen, but now real Yorkshire jockeys, and what they ride on and train, English racers for French races. These likewise we owe first, under the providence of the devil, to Monseigneur. Prince d'Artois also has his stud of racers. Prince d'Artois has with all the strangest horse leech, a moonstruck, much enduring individual of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, named Jean-Paul Marat. A problematic Chevalier d'Eon, now in petticoats, now in breeches, is no less problematic in London than in Paris, and causes bets and lawsuits. Beautiful days of international communion. Swindlery and blackguardism have stretched hands across the channel and saluted mutually. On the racecourse of Vincennes or Sablon, behold, in English curricle and four, wafted glorious among the principalities and rascalities, an English Dr. Dodd, for whom also the two early gallows gapes. Duke de Chartres was a young prince of great promise, as young princes often are, which promise, unfortunately, has belied itself. With the huge Orléans property, with the Duke de Pontrièvre for father-in-law, and now the young brother-in-law Lamballe killed by excesses, he will one day be the richest man in France. Meanwhile, his hair is all falling out, his blood is quite spoiled by early transcendentalism of debauchery. Carbuncles stud his face, dark studs on a ground of burnished copper. A most signal failure, this young prince. The stuff prematurely burnt out of him, little left but foul smoke and ashes of expiring sensualities. What might have been thought, insight and even conduct, gone now or fast going, to confuse a darkness, broken by bewildering dazzlements, to obstreperous crotchets, to activities which you may call semi-delirious or even semi-galvanic. Paris affects to laugh at his charioteering, but he heeds not such laughter. On the other hand, what a day not of laughter was that when he threatened for Lucas' sake to lay sacrilegious hands on the Palais Royal Garden. The flower parterre shall be riven up, the chestnut avenue shall fall, time-honoured boscages under which the opera hammer dryads were wont to wander, not inexorable to men. Paris moans aloud. Philidor from his Café de la Régence shall no longer look on greenness. The loungers and losels of the world where now shall they haunt. In vain is mosing, the axe glitters, the sacred groves fall crashing, for indeed Monseigneur was short of money. The opera hammy dryads fly with shrieks. Shriek not, ye opera hammer dryads, or not as those that have no comfort. He will surround your garden with new edifices and piazzas, though narrowed it shall be replanted, dizened with hydraulic jets, cannon which the sun fires at noon, things bodily, things spiritual, such as man has not imagined. And in the Palais Royal shall again, and more than ever, be the sorcerer's Sabbath and Satan at home of our planet. What will not mortals attempt? From remote Annonay in the Viveray, the brothers Montgolfier send up their paper dome filled with the smoke of burnt wool. The Viveray Provincial Assembly is to be prorogued this same day. Viveray Assembly members applaud and the shouts of congregated men. Will victorious analysis scale the very heavens then? Paris hears with eager wonder. Paris shall ere long see. From Réveillon's paper warehouse there in the Rue Saint-Antoine, a noted warehouse, the new Montgolfier airship launches itself. Ducks and poultry are born skyward, but now shall men be born. Nay, chemist Charles thinks of hydrogen and glazed silk. Chemist Charles will himself ascend from the Tuileries garden, Montgolfier solemnly cutting the cord. 
By heaven, he also mounts, he and another? Ten times ten thousand hearts go palpitating, all tongues are mute with wonder and fear, till a shout like the voice of seas rolls after him on his wild way. He soars, he dwindles upwards, has become a mere gleaming circlet, like some turgotine snuff-box, what we call turgotine platitude, like some new daylight moon. Finally he descends, welcomed by the universe. Duchess Polignac with a party is in the Bois de Boulogne, waiting, though it's drizzly winter, the 1st of December 1783. The whole chivalry of France, Duke de Chartres foremost, gallops to receive him. Beautiful invention, mounting heavenward so beautifully, so unguidably. Emblem of March and our age of hope itself, which shall mount specifically light, majestically in this same manner, and hover, tumbling with a faint will. Well, if it do not, Pilatre-like explode, and demount all the more tragically. So, riding on windbags, will men scale the Empyrean. Or observe Herr Dr. Mesmer in his spacious magnetic halls, Long stoled he walks, reverend, glancing upwards as in rapt commerce, an antique Egyptian hierophant in this new age. Soft music flits, breaking fitfully the sacred stillness. Round their magnetic mystery, which to the eye is mere tubs with water, sit breathless, rod in hand, the circles of beauty and fashion, each circle a living, circular passion flower, expecting the magnetic afflatus and new manufactured heaven on earth. O oh, women, O oh men, great is your infidel faith, a parliamentary Duport, a Burgas d'Espremenil, we notice there, chemist Berthelet too, on the part of Monsignor de Chartres. Had not the Academy of Sciences, with its Bayes, Franklins, Lavoisiers, interfered? But it did interfere. Mesmer may pocket his hard money and withdraw. Let him walk silent by the shore of the Bodensi, by the ancient town of Constance, meditating on much. For so, under the strangest new vesture, the old great truth, since no vesture can hide it, begins again to be revealed, that man is what we call a miraculous creature with miraculous power over men, and on the whole, with such a life in him, and such a world round him, as victorious analysis with her physiologies, nervous systems, physic and metaphysic, will never completely name, to say nothing of explaining. Wherein also the quack shall, in all ages, come in for his share. End of Book 2, Chapter 6《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Two, The Paper Age, Chapter Seven, Contrat Social. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Two, Chapter Seven, Contrat Social. In such accession of singular prismatic tints, flush after flush suffusing our horizon, does the era of hope dawn on towards fulfilment. Questionable. As indeed, with an era of hope that rests on mere universal benevolence, victorious analysis, vice cured of its deformity, and in the long run on twenty-five dark savage millions looking up in hunger and weariness to that ecce signum of theirs forty feet high, how could it be but questionable? Through all time, if we read aright, Sin was, is, will be, the parent of misery. This land calls itself most Christian, and has crosses and cathedrals. But its high priest is some Roche Amon, some necklace cardinal Louis de Rohan. The voice of the poor through long years ascends inarticulate in jacquerie, meal mobs, low whimpering of infinite moan, unheeded of the earth, not unheeded of heaven. Always, moreover, where the millions are wretched, there are the thousands straitened, unhappy. Only the units can flourish, or, say, rather, be ruined the last. 
Industry all noosed and halted, as if it too were some beast of chase for the mighty hunters of this world to bait and cut slices from, cries passionately to these its well-paid guides and watchers, not guide me, but laissez-faire, leave me alone of your guidance. What market has industry in this France? For two things there may be market and demand, for the coarser kind of field fruit, since the millions will live, for the fine kind of luxury and spicery, of multiform taste, from opera melodies down to races and courtesans, since the units will be amused. It is at bottom but a mad state of things. To mend and remake all which we have indeed victorious analysis. Honour to victorious analysis. Nevertheless, out of workshop and laboratory, what thing was victorious analysis yet known to make? Detection of incoherences mainly. Destruction of the incoherent. From of old, doubt was but half a magician. She evokes the spectres which she cannot quell. We shall have endless vortices of froth logic, whereon first words and then things are whirled and swallowed. Remark, accordingly, as acknowledged grounds of hope, at bottom mere precursors of despair, this perpetual theorising about man, the mind of man, philosophy of government, progress of the species and such like, the main thinking furniture of every head. Time and so many Montesquieu's, Mabley's, spokesmen of time have discovered innumerable things and now has not Jean-Jacques promulgated his new evangel of a contrat social explaining the whole mystery of government and how it is contracted and bargained for to universal satisfaction? Theories of government, such have been and will be in ages of decadence. Acknowledge them in their degree as processes of nature who does nothing in vain as steps in her great process. Meanwhile, what theory is so certain as this, that all theories, were they never so earnest, painfully elaborated, are, and by the very conditions of them, must be incomplete, questionable, and even false? Thou shalt know that this universe is what it professes to be, an infinite one. Attempt not to swallow it for thy logical digestion. Be thankful if skilfully planting down this and the other fixed pillar in the chaos, thou prevent it swallowing thee. That a new young generation has exchanged the sceptic creed, what shall I believe, for passionate faith in this gospel according to Jean Jacques, is a further step in the business, and but tokens much. Blessed also is hope, and always from the beginning there was some millennium prophesied, millennium of holiness, but what is notable, never till this new era, any millennium of mere ease and plentiful supply. In such prophesied lubber land of happiness, benevolence, and vice cured of its deformity, trust not, my friends. Man is not what one calls a happy animal. His appetite for sweet victual is so enormous. How, in this wild universe which storms in on him, infinite, vague menacing, shall poor man find, say not happiness, but existence and footing to stand on, if it be not by girding himself together for continual endeavour and endurance? Woe if in his heart there dwelt no devout faith, if the word duty had lost its meaning for him. For as to this of sentimentalism, so useful for weeping with over romances and on pathetic occasions, it otherwise verily will avail nothing, nay less. The healthy heart that said to itself, how healthy am I, was already fallen into the fatalist sort of disease. Is not sentimentalism twin sister to Kant, if not one and the same with it? Is not Kant the materia prima of the devil, from which all falsehoods, imbecilities, abominations body themselves, from which no true thing can come? For Kant is itself properly a double distilled lie, the second power of a lie. And now, if a whole nation fall into that, in such case, I answer, infallibly they will return out of it, for life is no cunningly devised deception or self-deception. It is a great truth that thou art alive, that thou hast desires, necessities. Neither can these subsist and satisfy themselves on delusions, 
but on fact. To fact, depend on it, we shall come back to such fact, blessed or cursed, as we have wisdom for. The lowest, least blessed fact one knows of, on which necessitous mortals have ever based themselves, seems to be the primitive one of cannibalism, that I can devour thee. What if such primitive fact were precisely the one we had with our improved methods to revert to and begin anew from? End of Book 2, Chapter 7《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2 — The Paper Age Chapter 8 — Printed Paper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 8 — Printed Paper in such a practical France, let the theory of perfectibility say what it will, discontents cannot be wanting. Your promised reformation is so indispensable, yet it comes not. Who will begin it with himself? Discontent with what is around us, still more with what is above us, goes on increasing, seeking ever new events. Of street ballads, of epigrams that, from of old tempered despotism, we need not speak. Nor of manuscript newspapers, nouvelles à la main, do we speak. Bachaumont and his journeymen and followers may close those thirty volumes of scurrilous eavesdropping and quit that trade, for at length, if not liberty of the press, there is licence. Pamphlets can be surreptitiously vended and read in Paris. Did they even bear to be printed at Peking? We have a courier de l'Europe in those years, regularly published at London, by a de Morande whom the guillotine has not yet devoured. There, too, an unruly langue still unguillotined, when his own country has become too hot for him and his brother advocates have cast him out, can emit his hoarse wailings, and Bastille dévoilé, Bastille unveiled. Loquacious Abbe Ranal at length has his wish, sees the histoire philosophique with its lubricity, unveracity, loose, loud, eleutheromaniac rant, contributed, they say, by philosopherdom at large, though in the Abbe's name and to his glory, burnt by the common hangman, and sets out on his travels as a martyr. It was the edition of 1781, perhaps the last notable book that had such fire beatitude, the hangman discovering now that it did not serve. Again, in courts of law, with their money quarrels, divorce cases, wheresoever a glimpse into the household existence can be had, what indications? The Parlement of Bessinson and I ring, audible to all France, with the amours and destinies of a young Mirabeau. He, under the nurture of a friend of men, has in state prisons, in marching regiments, Dutch authors, garrets, and quite other scenes, been for twenty years learning to resist despotism, despotism of men and also of gods. How, beneath this rose-coloured veil of universal benevolence and astraea redux, is the sanctuary of home so often a dreary void or a dark contentious hell on earth? The old friend of men has his own divorce case too, and at times his whole family but one under lock and key. He writes much about reforming and enfranchising the world, and for his own private behoof he has needed sixty lettres de cachet. A man of insight too, with resolution, even with manful principle, but in such an element, inward and outward, which he could not rule, but only madden. Edacity, rapacity, quite contrary to the finer sensibility of the heart. Fools that expect your verdant millennium and nothing but love and abundance, brooks running wine, winds whispering music, with the whole ground and basis of your existence champed into a mud of sensuality, which daily growing deeper will soon have no bottom but the abyss. Or consider that unutterable business of the diamond necklace. Red-hatted Cardinal Louis de Rohan, Sicilian jailbird Balsamo Cagliostro, 
milliner Dame de la Motte with a face of some piquancy, the highest church dignitaries waltzing in Walpurgis dance with quack prophets, pick purses and public women, a whole Satan's invisible world displayed, working there continually under the daylight visible one, the smoke of its torment going up forever. The throne has been brought into scandalous collision with the treadmill. Astonished Europe rings with the mystery for ten months, sees only lie unfold itself from lie, corruption among the lofty and the low, gulosity, credulity, imbecility, strength nowhere but in the hunger. Weep, fair queen, thy first tears of unmixed wretchedness. Thy fair name has been tarnished by foul breath, irremediably while life lasts. No more shalt thou be loved and pitied by living hearts, till a new generation has been born, and thy own heart lies cold, cured of all its sorrows. The epigrams henceforth become not sharp and bitter, but cruel, atrocious, unmentionable. On that 31st of May, 1786, a miserable Cardin Grand Almoner Rohan, on issuing from his Bastille, is escorted by hurrahing crowds, unloved he and worthy of no love, but important since the court and queen are his enemies. How is our bright era of hope dimmed, and the whole sky growing bleak with signs of hurricane and earthquake? It is a doomed world, gone all obedience that made men free, fast going the obedience that made men slaves, at least to one another. Slaves only of their own lusts they now are and will be, slaves of sin, inevitably also of sorrow. Behold the mouldering mass of sensuality and falsehood, round which plays foolishly itself a corrupt phosphorescence, some glimmer of sentimentalism, and over all, rising as ark of their covenant, the grim patibulary fork, forty feet high, which also is now nigh rotted. Add only that the French nation distinguishes itself among nations by the characteristic of excitability with the good but also with the perilous evil which belongs to that. Rebellion, explosion of unknown extent is to be calculated on. There are, as Chesterfield wrote, all the symptoms I have ever met with in history. Shall we say then, woe to philosophism, that it destroyed religion, what it called extinguishing the abomination, écrasé l'infâme. Woe rather to those that made the holy an abomination and extinguishable. Woe at all men that live in such a time of world abomination and world destruction. Nay, answer the couriers, it was Turgo, it was Necker, with their mad innovating. It was the Queen's want of etiquette. It was he, it was she, it was that. Friends, it was every scoundrel that had lived and quack-like pretended to be doing and been only eating and misdoing in all provinces of life as shoeblack or as sovereign lord, each in his degree from the time of Charlemagne and earlier. All this, for be sure no falsehood perishes but is as seed sown out to grow, has been storing itself for thousands of years and now the account day has come. And rude will the settlement be of wrath laid up against the day of wrath. O oh, my brother, be not thou a quack. Die rather, if thou wilt take counsel. Tis but dying once, and thou art quit of it for ever. Cursed is that trade, and bears curses. Thou knowest not how, long ages after thou art departed, and the wages thou hadst are all consumed. Nay, as the ancient wise have written, through eternity itself, and is verily marked in the doom-book of a god. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And yet, as we said, hope is but deferred, not abolished, not abolishable. It is very notable and touching how this same hope does still light onwards the French nation through all its wild destinies. For we shall still find hope shining, be it for fond invitation, be it for anger and menace, as a mild heavenly light it shone, as a red conflagration it shines, burning sulphurous blue through darkest regions of terror it still shines, and goes sent out at all since desperation itself is a kind of hope. 
Thus is our era still to be named of hope, though in the saddest sense, when there is nothing left but hope. But if anyone would know summarily what a Pandora's box lies there for the opening, he may see it in what by its nature is the symptom of all symptoms, the surviving literature of the period. Abbe Reynal, with his lubricity and loud, loose rant, has spoken his word, and already the fast-hastening generation responds to another. Glance at Beaumarchais's marriage to Figaro, which now, in 1784, after difficulty enough, has issued on the stage and runs its hundred nights to the admiration of all men. By what virtue or internal vigour it so ran, the reader of our day will rather wonder, and indeed will know so much the better, that it flattered some pruriency of the time, that it spoke what all were feeling and longing to speak. Small substance in that Figaro, thin wire-drawn intrigues, thin wire-drawn sentiments and sarcasms, a thing lean, barren, yet which winds and whisks itself as through a wholly mad universe, adroitly with a high-sniffing air, wherein each, as was hinted, which is the grand secret, may see some image of himself and of his own state and ways. So it runs its hundred nights, and all France runs with it, laughing applause. If the soliloquising barber asks, What has your lordship done to earn all this? and can only answer, You took the trouble to be born. Vous vous êtes donné la peine de naître. All men must laugh, and a gay horse-racing Anglomaniac noblesse loudest of all. For how can small books have a great danger in them, asks the Sieur Caron, and fancies his thin epigram may be a kind of reason. Conqueror of a golden fleece by giant smuggling, tamer of hell-dogs in the Parlement Maupéau, and finally crowned Orpheus in the Théâtre Francais, Beaumarchais bon has now culminated and unites the attributes of several demigods. We shall meet him once again in the course of his decline. Still more significant are two books produced on the eve of the ever-memorable explosion itself and read eagerly by all the world. Saint Pierre Paul et Virginie and Louvet's Chevalier de Faublé. Noteworthy books which may be considered as the last speech of old feudal France. In the first there rises melodiously, as it were, the wail of a moribund world, everywhere wholesome nature in unequal conflict with disease perfidious art cannot escape from it in the lowest hut in the remotest island of the sea. Ruin and death must strike down the loved one, and what is most significant of all, death even here, not by necessity, but by etiquette. What a world of prurient corruption lies visible in that super-sublime of modesty. Yet, on the whole, our good Saint-Pierre is musical, poetical, though most morbid. We will call his book The Swan Song of Old Dying France. Louvet's again let no man account musical. Truly, if this wretched faubla is a death speech, it is one under the gallows and by a felon that does not repent. Wretched cloaca of a book, without depth even as a cloaca. What picture of French society is here? Picture, properly, of nothing, if not of the mind that gave it out as some sort of picture, yet symptom of much, above all, of the world that could nourish itself thereon. End of book two. Chapter 8。The French Revolution: A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 3, The Parliament of Paris, Chapter 1, Dishonoured Bills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 1, Dishonoured Bills. While the unspeakable confusion is everywhere weltering within and through so many cracks in the surface, sulphur smoke is issuing. The question arises: Through what crevice will the main explosion carry itself? Through which of the old craters or chimneys, or must it at once form a new crater for itself? In every society are such chimneys, are institutions serving as such. Even Constantinople is not without its safety valves. There too, discontent can vent itself in material fire, 
by the number of nocturnal conflagrations or of hanged bakers, the reigning powers can read the signs of the times and change course according to these. We may say that this French explosion will doubtless first try all the old institutions of escape, for by each of these there is, or at least there used to be, some communication with the interior deep. They are national institutions in virtue of that. Had they even become personal institutions, and what we can call choked up from their original uses, there, nevertheless, must the impediment be weaker than elsewhere. Through which of them, then? An observer might have guessed through the law parlement, above all through the parlement of Paris. Men, though never so thickly clad in dignity, sit not inaccessible to the influences of their time, especially men whose life is business, who at all turns, were it even from behind judgment seats, have come in contact with the actual workings of the world. The councillor of Parliament, the President himself, who has bought his place with hard money that he might be looked up to by his fellow creatures, how shall he, in all philosoph soirees and saloons of elegant culture, become notable as a friend of darkness? Among the Paris long robes there may be more than one patriotic mal whose rule is conscience and the public good. There are clearly more than one hot-headed despremenil to whose confused thought any loud reputation of the brutus sort may seem glorious. The Le Pelletier, Le Moignons, have titles and wealth, yet at court are only styled noblesse of the robe. There are Duport of deep scheme, Freto, Sebatier of incontinent tongue, all nursed more or less on the milk of the contrat social. Nay, for the whole body, is not this patriotic opposition also a fighting for oneself? Awake, Parliament of Paris, renew thy long warfare. Was not the Parliament Maupeo abolished with ignominy? Not now hast thou to dread a Louis fourteen with a crack of his whip and his Olympian looks, not now a Richelieu and Bastillon. No, the whole nation is behind thee. Thou too, O oh heavens, mayst become a political power, and with the shakings of thy horsehair wig shake principalities and dynasties like a very jove with his ambrosial curls. Light old Monsieur de Maurepas, since the end of 1781, has been fixed in the frost of death. Nevermore, said the good Louis, shall I hear his step overhead. His light jestings and gyratings are at an end. No more can the importunate reality be hidden by pleasant wit, and today's evil be deftly rolled over upon tomorrow. The morrow itself has arrived, and now nothing but a solid, phlegmatic Monsieur de Vergen sits there in dull matter-of-fact, like some dull, punctual clerk, which he originally was, admits what cannot be denied, let the remedy come whence it will. In him is no remedy, only clerk-like dispatch of business according to routine. The poor king, grown older, yet hardly more experienced, must himself, with such no faculty as he has, begin governing, wherein also his queen will give help. Bright queen, with her quick, clear glances and impulses, clear and even noble, but all too superficial, vehement, shallow for that work. To govern France was such a problem, and now it has grown well nigh too hard to govern even the Oye de Boeuf. For if a distressed people has its cry, so likewise, and more audibly, has a bereaved court. To the Oye de Boeuf it remains inconceivable how, in a France of such resources, the horn of plenty should run dry. Did it not used to flow? Nevertheless, Necker, with his revenue of parsimony, has suppressed above six hundred places. Before the courtiers could oust him, parsimonious finance pedant as he was. Again, a military pedant, Saint-Germain, with his Prussian manoeuvres, with his Prussian notions, as if merit and not coat of arms should be the rule of promotion, has disaffected military men. The mousquetaires with much else are suppressed, for he too was one of your suppressors, and unsettling and oversetting did mere mischief to the oil de boeuf. Complaints abound, scarcity, anxiety, it is a changed oil de boeuf. Bessonval says, already in these years, 1781, there was such a melancholy, 
such a tristesse about court compared with former days, as made it quite dispiriting to look upon. No wonder that the oid birth feels melancholy when you are suppressing its places. Not a place can be suppressed, but some purse is the lighter for it, and more than one heart the heavier, for did it not employ the working classes too? Manufacturers, male and female, of laces, essences, of pleasure generally. Whosoever could manufacture pleasure? Miserable economies never felt over twenty-five millions. So... However, it goes on and is not yet ended. Few years more and the wolfhounds shall fall suppressed and bearhounds, the falconry, places shall fall thick as autumnal leaves. Duke de Polignac demonstrates to the complete silencing of ministerial logic that his place cannot be abolished. Then, gallantly turning to the Queen, surrenders it since Her Majesty so wishes. Less chivalrous was Duke de Coigny and not yet luckier, we got into a real quarrel, Kuan Yi and I, said King Louis, but if he had even struck me, I could not have blamed him. In regard to such matters, there can be but one opinion. Baron Bessonval, with that frankness of speech which stamps the independent man, plainly assures Her Majesty that it is frightful, affreux. You go to bed and are not sure, but you shall rise impoverished on the morrow. One might as well be in Turkey. It is, indeed, a dog's life. How singular this perpetual distress of the royal treasury. And yet it is a thing not more incredible than undeniable. A thing mournfully true, the stumbling block on which all ministers successively stumble and fall. Be it want of fiscal genius or some far other want, there is a palpablest discrepancy between revenue and expenditure. A deficit of the revenue. You must choke, comblier, the deficit, or else it will swallow you. This is the stern problem, hopeless seemingly, a squaring of the circle. Controller Jolie de Fleury, who succeeded Necker, could do nothing with it, nothing but propose loans, which were tardily filled up, impose new taxes, unproductive of money, productive of clamour and discontent. As little could Controller Dormesson do, or even less, for if Jolly maintained himself beyond year and day, Dormesson reckons only by months, till the king purchased Rambouillet without consulting him, which he took as a hint to withdraw. And so, towards the end of 1783, matters threatened to come to still stand. Vain seems human ingenuity. In vain has our newly devised Council of Finances struggled. A intendant of finance, controller general of finances. There are unhappily no finances to control. Fatal paralysis invades the social movement. Clouds of blindness or of blackness envelop us. Are we breaking down then into the black horrors of national bankruptcy? Great is bankruptcy the great bottomless pit into which all falsehoods, public and private, do sink, disappearing, whither from the first origin of them they were all doomed. For nature is true, and not a lie. No lie you can speak or act, but it will come after longer or shorter circulation, like a bill drawn on nature's reality, and be presented there for payment, with the answer, no effects. Pity only that it often had so long a circulation that the original forger was so seldom he who bore the final smart of it. Lies and the burden of evil they bring are passed on, shifted from back to back and from rank to rank, and so land ultimately on the dumbest lowest rank, who with spade and mattock, with sore heart and empty wallet, daily come in contact with reality, and can pass the cheat no further. Observe, nevertheless, how, by a just compensating law, if the lie with its burden, in this confused whirlpool of society, sinks and is shifted ever downwards, then in return the distress of it rises ever upwards and upwards, whereby, after the long pining and demi-starvation of those twenty millions, a Duc de Coigny and his majesty come also to have their real quarrel. Such is the law of just nature, bringing, though at long intervals, and were it only by bankruptcy, 
matters round again to the mark. But with a Fortunatus's purse in his pocket, through what length of time might not almost any falsehood last? Your society, your household, practical or spiritual arrangement is untrue, unjust, offensive to the eye of God and man. Nevertheless, its hearth is warm, its larder well replenished. The innumerable Swiss of heaven, with a kind of natural loyalty, gather round it, will prove by pamphleteering, musketeering, that it is a truth, or if not an unmixed, unearthly impossible truth, then better a wholesomely attempered one as wind is to the shorn lamb, and works well. Changed outlook, however, when purse and larder grow empty. Was your arrangement so true, so accordant to nature's ways? Then how in the name of wonder has nature, with her infinite bounty, come to leave it famishing there? To all men, to all women and all children, it is now indutiable that your arrangement was false. Honour to bankruptcy, ever righteous on the great scale, though in detail it is so cruel. Under all falsehoods it works, unweariedly mining. No falsehood did it rise heaven high and cover the world, but bankruptcy one day will sweep it down and make us free of it. End of Book 3, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Three: The Parliament of Paris, Chapter Two, Controller Calonne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Three, Chapter Two, Controller Calonne. Under such circumstances of tristesse, obstruction, and sick languor. When to an exasperated court it seems as if fiscal genius had departed from among men, what apparition could be welcomer than that of Monsieur de Calonne? Calonne, a man of indisputable genius, even fiscal genius more or less, of experience both in managing finance and parliaments, for he has been intendant at Metz, at Lille, king's procureur at Douar. A man of weight, connected with the moneyed classes, of unstained name, if it were not some peccadillo of showing a client's letter in that old Dagon La Chalotte business, as good as forgotten now. He has kinsmen of heavy purse, felt on the stock exchange. Our Foulon, Bertier, intrigue for him. Old Foulon, who has now nothing to do but intrigue, who is known and even seen to be what they call a scoundrel, but of unmeasured wealth who, from commissariat clerk, which he once was, may hope some think, if the game go right, to be minister himself one day. Such propping and backing has Monsieur de Calonne, and then, intrinsically, such qualities. Hope radiates from his face, persuasion hangs on his tongue. For all straits he has present remedy, and will make the world roll on wheels before him. On the 3rd of November, 1783, the Oie de Boeuf rejoices in its new controller-general. Cologne also shall have trial. Cologne also, in his way, as Turgot and Necker had done in theirs, shall forward the consummation, suffuse with one other flush of brilliancy our now too leaden-coloured era of hope, and wind it up into fulfilment. Great, in any case, is the felicity of the Oie de Boeuf. Stinginess has fled from these royal abodes. Suppression ceases. Your Bessonville may go peaceably to sleep, sure that he shall awake unplundered. Smiling plenty, as if conjured by some enchanter, has returned, scatters contentment from her new flowing horn. And mark what suavity of manners. A bland smile distinguishes our controller. To all men he listens with an air of interest, nay, of anticipation, makes their own wish clear to themselves and grants it, or at least grants conditional promise of it. I fear this is a matter of difficulty, said Her Majesty. Madame, answered the controller, if it is but difficult, it is done. If it is impossible, it shall be done. Sephora. A man of such facility withal, to observe him in the pleasure vortex of society which none partakes of with more gusto, you might ask, when does he work? 
And yet his work, as we see, is never behindhand. Above all, the fruit of his work, ready money. Truly a man of incredible facility, facile action, facile elocution, facile thought. How in mild suasion philosophic depth sparkles up from him as mere wit and lambent sprightliness, and in her majesty's soirees with the weight of a world lying on him he is the delight of men and women. By what magic does he accomplish miracles? By the only true magic, that of genius. Men name him the minister, as indeed, when was there another such? Crooked things are become straight by him, rough places plain, and over the oid birth there rests an unspeakable sunshine. Nay, in seriousness, let no man say that Calan had not genius, genius for persuading, before all things, for borrowing. With the skilfulest judicious appliances of underhand money, he keeps the stock exchanges flourishing, so that loan after loan is filled up as soon as opened. Calculators likely to know have calculated that he is spent in extraordinaries at the rate of one million daily, which indeed is some fifty thousand pounds sterling. But did he not procure something with it, namely peace and prosperity for the time being? Philosopher dumb grumbles and croaks, buys, as we said, eighty thousand copies of Necker's new book, but non pareil Calan, in Her Majesty's apartment, with the glittering retinue of dukes, duchesses, and mere happy admiring faces, can let Necker and philosophedom croak. The misery is such a time cannot last. Squandering and payment by loan is no way to choke a deficit. Neither is oil the substance for quenching conflagrations, but only for assuaging them, not permanently. To the non himself, who wants not insight, it is clear at intervals and dimly certain at all times that his trade is by nature temporary, growing daily more difficult, that changes incalculable lie at no great distance. Apart from financial deficit, the world is wholly in such a newfangled humour, all things working loose from their old fastenings towards new issues and combinations. There is not a dwarf jockey, a cropped brutus head, or anglomaniac horseman rising on his stirrups that does not betoken change. But what then? The day, in any case, passes pleasantly. For the morrow, if the morrow come, there shall be counsel too. Once mounted by munificence, suasion, magic of genius, high enough in favour with the oyer de boeuf, with the king, queen, stock exchange, and so far as possible with all men, a non pareil controller may hope to go careering through the inevitable in some unimagined way as handsomely as another. At all events, for these three miraculous years, it has been expedient heaped on expedient till now, with such cumulation and height, the pile topples perilous. And here has this world's wonder of a diamond necklace brought it at last to the clear verge of tumbling. Genius in that direction can no more. Mounted high enough or not mounted, we must fare forth. Hardly is poor Rohan, the necklace cardinal, safely bestowed in the Auvergne mountains, Dame de la Motte unsafely in the Sorpetuire, and that mournful business hushed up, when our sanguine controller once more astonishes the world. An expedient unheard of for these hundred and sixty years has been propounded, and by dint of suasion, for his light audacity, his hope and eloquence are matchless, has been got adopted. Convocation of the Notables Let notable persons, the actual or virtual rulers of their districts, be summoned from all sides of France. Let a true tale of His Majesty's patriotic purposes and wretched pecuniary impossibilities be suasively told them, and then the question put, what are we to do? Surely to adopt healing measures, such as the magic of genius will unfold, such as one sanctioned by notables, all parliament, and all men must, with more or less reluctance, submit to. End of Book 3, Chapter 2
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3, The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 3, The Notables. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 3, The Notables. Here, then, is verily a sign and wonder, visible to the whole world, bodeful of much. The Oye de Boeuf dolorously grumbles. Were we not well as we stood, quenching conflagrations by oil? Constitutional philosophedom starts with joyful surprise, stares eagerly what the result will be. The public creditor, the public debtor, the whole thinking and thoughtless public have their several surprises, joyful and sorrowful. Count Mirabeau, who has got his matrimonial and other lawsuits huddled up, better or worse, and works now in the dimmest element at Berlin, compiling Prussian monarchies, pamphlets on Cagliostro, writing with pay, but not with honourable recognition, innumerable dispatches for his government, scents, or decries, richer quarry from afar. He, like an eagle or vulture, or mixture of both, preens his wings for flight homewards. Monsieur de Cologne has stretched out an Aaron's rod over France, miraculous, and is summoning quite unexpected things. Audacity and hope alternate in him with misgivings, though the sanguine valiant side carries it. Anon, he writes to an intimate friend, Je me fais pitié et moi-même. I am an object of pity to myself. Anon invites some dedicating poet or poetaster to sing this assembly of the notables and the revolution that is preparing. Preparing indeed, and a matter to be sung, only not till we have seen it and what the issue of it is. In deep, obscure unrest, all things have so long gone rocking and swaying. Will Monsieur de Cologne, with this his alchemy of the notables, fasten all together again and get new revenues? or wrench all asunder so that it go no longer rocking and swaying, but clashing and colliding. Be this as it may, in the bleak short days we behold men of weight and influence threading the great vortex of French locomotion, each on his several line from all sides of France towards the chateau of Versailles, summoned thither de par le roi. There, on the 22nd day of February, 1787, they have met and got installed, notables to the number of 137, as we count them name by name. Add seven princes of the blood, it makes the round gross of notables. Men of the sword, men of the robe, peers, dignified clergy, parliamentary presidents, divided into seven boards, bureau, under our seven princes of the blood, Monsieur, Datois, Pontièvre, and the rest, amongst whom let not our new Duc d'Orléans, for since 1785 he is Chartres no longer, be forgotten. Never yet made admiral, and now turning the corner of his fortieth year with spoiled blood and prospects, half weary of a world which is more than half weary of him, Monseigneur's future is most questionable not in illumination and insight, not even in conflagration, but, as was said, in dull smoke and ashes of outburnt sensualities, does he live and digest. Sumptuosity and sordidness, revenge, life-weariness, ambition, darkness, putrescence, and say in sterling money three hundred thousand a year, were this poor prince once to burst loose from his court moorings, to what regions, with what phenomena, might he not sail and drift? Happily as yet, he affects to hunt daily, sits there since he must sit, presiding that bureau of his with dull moon visage, dull glassy eyes, as if it were a mere tedium to him. We observe, finally, that Count Mirabeau has actually arrived. He descends from Berlin on the scene of action, glares into it with a flashing sun glance, discerns that it will do nothing for him. He had hoped these notables might need a secretary. They do need one, but have fixed on Dupont de Namur, a man of smaller fame, but then of better, 
who indeed, as his friends often hear, labours under this complaint, surely not a universal one, of having five kings to correspond with. The pen of a Mirabeau cannot become an official one. Nevertheless, it remains a pen. In defect of secretaryship, he sets to denouncing stock brokerage, denunciation de l'agiotage, testifying as his wont is by loud bruit that he is present and busy, till, warned by friend Talleyrand, and even by Cologne himself underhand, that a seventeenth lettre de cachet may be launched against him, he timefully flits over the marches. And now, in stately royal apartments, as pictures of that time still represent them, our hundred and forty-four notables sit organised, ready to hear and consider. Controller Cologne is dreadfully behindhand with his speeches, his preparatives. However, the man's facility of work is known to us. For freshness of style, lucidity, ingenuity, largeness of view, that opening harangue of his was unsurpassable had not the subject matter been so appalling. A deficit concerning which accounts vary, and the controller's own account is not unquestioned, but which all accounts agree in representing as enormous. This is the epitome of our controller's difficulties. And then his means? Mere turgotism. For thither, it seems, we must come at last. Provincial assemblies, new taxation, nay, strangest of all, new land tax, what he calls subvention territoriale, from which neither privileged nor unprivileged nobleman, clergy nor parliamentier shall be exempt. Foolish enough! These privileged classes have been used to tax, levying toll, tribute and custom at all hands while a penny was left, but to be themselves taxed? Of such privileged persons, meanwhile, do these notables all but the merest fraction consist. Headlong Cologne had given no heed to the composition or judicious packing of them, but chosen such notables as were really notable, trusting for the issue to an off-hand ingenuity, good fortune and eloquence that never yet failed. Headlong Controller General. Eloquence can do much, but not all. Orpheus, with eloquence grown rhythmic, musical, what we call poetry, drew iron tears from the cheek of Pluto. But by what witchery of rhyme or prose wilt thou from the pocket of Plutus draw gold? Accordingly, the storm that now rose and began to whistle round Cologne, first in these seven bureaus and then on the outside of them, awakened by them, spreading wider and wider over all France, threatens to become unappeasable. A deficit so enormous? Mismanagement, profusion is too clear. Peculation itself is hinted at. Nay, Lafayette and others go so far as to speak it out with attempts at proof. The blame of his deficit, our brave Colon, as was natural, had endeavoured to shift from himself on his predecessors, not excepting even Necker. But now Necker vehemently denies, whereupon an angry correspondence which also finds its way into print. In the Oie de Boeuf and Her Majesty's private apartments, an eloquent controller with his Madame, if it is but difficult, had been persuasive. But alas, the cause is now carried elsewhither. Behold him one of these sad days in Monsieur's bureau, to which all the other bureaus have sent deputies. He is standing at bay, alone, exposed to an incessant fire of questions, interpolations, objurgations from those 137 pieces of logic ordnance, what we may well call bouche à feu, firemouth, literally. Never, according to Bessonval, or hardly ever, had such display of intellect, dexterity, coolness, suasive eloquence been made by man, to the raging play of so many firemouths, he opposes nothing angrier than light beams, self possession, and fatherly smiles. With the imperturbablest bland clearness, he for five hours long keeps answering the incessant volley of fiery, captious questions, reproachful interpolations, in words prompt as lightning, quiet as light. 
nay, the crossfire too, such side questions and incidental interpolations as, in the heat of the main battle, he, having only one tongue, could not get answered, these also he takes up at the first slake, answers even these. Could blandest suasive eloquence have saved France, she was saved. Heavy-laden controller, in the seven bureaus seems nothing but hindrance. In Monsieur's bureau, a Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, with an eye himself to the controllership, stirs up the clergy. There are meetings, underground intrigues. Neither from without anywhere come sign of help or hope. For the nation, where Mirabeau is now with stentor lungs denouncing adieu, the controller has hitherto done nothing or less. For philosophedom, he has done as good as nothing, sent out some scientific La Perouse or the like, and is he not in angry correspondence with its necker? The very oeil de boeuf looks questionable. A falling controller has no friends. Solid Monsieur de Vergen, who with his phlegmatic judicious punctuality might have kept down many things, died the very week before these sorrowful notables met. And now a seal-keeper, garde de Sceaux Miromenil, is thought to be playing the traitor, spinning plots for Lomini Brienne. Queen's reader, Abbe de Vermont, unloved individual, was Brienne's creature, the work of his hands from the first. It may be feared the backstairs passage is open, ground getting mined under our feet. Treacherous garde de Sceaux Miromenil at least should be dismissed, La Mognon, the eloquent notable, a stanch man with connections and even ideas, Parliament President, yet intent on reforming Parliament, were not he the right keeper? So, for one, thinks busy Bessonval, and at dinner table rounds the same into the controller's ear, who always, in the intervals of landlord duties, listens to him as with charmed look, but answers nothing positive. Alas, what to answer? The force of private intrigue, and then also the force of public opinion, grows so dangerous, confused. Philosophedom sneers aloud, as if its necker already triumphed. The gaping populace gapes over woodcuts or copper cuts, where, for example, a rustic is represented convoking the poultry in his barnyard with this opening address. Dear animals, I have assembled you to advise me what sauce I shall dress you with to which a cock, responding, We don't want to be eaten, is checked by, You wander from the point. Vous vous écartez de la question. Laughter and logic, ballad singer, pamphleteer, epigram and caricature, what wind of public opinion is this, as if the cave of the winds were bursting loose? At nightfall, President Lamogno steals over to the controller, finds him walking with large strides in his chamber like one out of himself. With rapid, confused speech, the controller begs Monsieur de Lamognon to give him an advice. Lamognon candidly answers that except in regard to his own anticipated keepership, unless that would prove remedial, he really cannot take upon him to advise. On the Monday after Easter, the 9th of April, 1787, a date one rejoices to verify, for nothing can excel the indolent falsehood of these histoires and memoirs, on the Monday after Easter, as I, Bessonval, was riding towards Romainville to the Maréchal de Ségur's, I met a friend on the boulevards who told me that Monsieur de Calonne was out. A little further on came Monsieur the Duc d'Orléans, dashing towards me, head to the wind, trotting à l'anglaise, and confirmed the news. It is true news. Treacherous garde de Sir Miromenil is gone, and Lamognon is appointed in his room, but appointed for his own profit only, not for the controller's. Next day the controller also has had to move. A little longer he may linger near, be seen among the money changers, and even working in the controller's office, where much lies unfinished, but neither will that hold. Two strong blows and beats this tempest of public opinion, of private intrigue, as from the cave of all winds, and blows him, higher authority giving sign, out of Paris and France, over the horizon, into invisibility or outer darkness. Such destiny the magic of genius could not forever avert. Ungrateful Oye de Boeuf, did he not miraculously rain gold manner on you? So that, as a courtier said, all the world held out its hand, and I held out my hat. 
for a time. Himself, his poor, penniless, had not a financier's widow in Lorraine offered him, though he was turned of fifty, her hand and the rich purse it held? Dim henceforth shall be his activity, though unwearied, Letters to the king, appeals, prognostications, pamphlets from London, written with the old suasive facility, which, however, do not persuade. Luckily, his widow's purse fails not. Once in a year or two, some shadow of him shall be seen hovering on the northern border, seeking election as national deputy, but be sternly beckoned away. Dimmer then, far borne over utmost European lands, in uncertain twilight of diplomacy, he shall hover, intriguing for exiled princes, and have adventures, be overset into the Rhine stream, and half drowned, nevertheless save his papers dry, unwearied, but in vain. In France he works miracles no more, shall hardly return thither to find a grave. Farewell, thou facile, sanguine controller-general, with thy light, rash hand, thy suasive mouth of gold. Worse men there have been, and better, but to thee also was allotted a task of raising the wind and the winds, and thou hast done it. But now, while ex-controller Cologne flies storm-driven over the horizon in this singular way, what has become of the controllership? It hangs vacant, one may say, extinct like the moon in her vacant interlunar cave. Two preliminary shadows, poor Monsieur Foucault, poor Monsieur Vuid, poor Monsieur Viadoy, do hold in quick succession some simulacrum of it, as the new moon will sometimes shine out with a dim preliminary old one in her arms. Be patient, ye notables, an actual new controller is certain and even ready were the indispensable manoeuvres but gone through. Long-headed Lamoignon with Home Secretary Breteuil and Foreign Secretary Montmorin have exchanged looks. Let these three once meet and speak. Who is it that is strong in the Queen's favour and the Amé de Vermont? That is the man of great capacity? Or at least that has struggled these fifty years to have it thought great, now in the clergy's name, demanding to have Protestant death penalties put in execution, no flaunting it in the oil de boeuf as the gayest man-pleaser and woman-pleaser, gleaning even a good word from philosophedom and your Voltaire and d'Alembert, with a party ready-made for him and the notables, Lomany de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, answer all the three with the clearest instantaneous concord and rush off to propose him to the king in such haste, says Bussonval, that Monsieur de Lamoignon had to borrow a cimar, seemingly some kind of cloth apparatus necessary for that. Lomine Brienne, who had all his life felt a kind of predestination for the highest officers, has now, therefore, obtained them. He presides over the finances. He shall have the title of Prime Minister itself, and the effort of his long life be realised. Unhappy only that it took such talent and industry to gain the place, that to qualify for it hardly any talent or industry was left disposable. Looking now into his inner man, what qualification may he have, Lomini beholds, not without astonishment, next to nothing but vacuity and possibility? principles or methods, acquirement outward or inward, for his very body is wasted by hard tear and wear, he finds none, not so much as a plan, even an unwise one. Lucky in these circumstances that Cologne has had a plan. Cologne's plan was gathered from Turgos and Neckers by compilation, shall become Lomini's by adoption. Not in vain has Lomini studied the working of the British constitution, for he professes to have some Anglomania of a sort. Why, in that free country, does one minister, driven out by Parliament, vanish from his king's presence, and another entered, borne in by Parliament? Surely not for mere change, which is ever wasteful, but that all men may have a share of what is going, and so the strife of freedom indefinitely prolong itself, and no harm be done. The notables, mollified by Easter festivities, by the sacrifice of Cologne, are not in the worst humour. Already His Majesty, while the interlunar shadows were in office, had held session of notables, and from his throne delivered promisory conciliatory eloquence, 
The Queen stood waiting at a window till his carriage came back, and Monsieur from afar clapped hands to her, in sign that all was well. It has had the best effect if such do but last. Leading notables, meanwhile, can be caressed. Brienne's new gloss, La Mognon's long head, will profit somewhat. Conciliatory eloquence shall not be wanting. On the whole, however, it is not undeniable that this of ousting Colon and adopting the plan of Colon is a measure which, to produce its best effect, should be looked at from a certain distance, cursorily, not dwelt on with minute near scrutiny. In a word, that no service the notables could now do was so obliging as, in some handsome manner, to take themselves away. Their six propositions about provisional assemblies, suppression of corvées and such like, can be accepted without criticism. The subvention on land tax and much else one must glide hastily over, safe nowhere but in flourishes of conciliatory eloquence. Till at length, on this 25th of May, year 1787, in solemn final session, there burst forth what we can call an explosion of eloquence, King, Lomany, Lamognon and Retinue taking up the successive strain in harangues to the number of ten besides his majesty's, which last the livelong day, whereby, as in a kind of choral anthem or bravura appeal of thanks, praises, promises, the notables are, so to speak, organed out and dismissed to their respective places of abode. They had sat and talked some nine weeks. They were the first notables since Richelieu's in the year 1626. By some historians sitting much at their ease in the safe distance, Lomany has been blamed for this dismissal of his notables. Nevertheless, it was clearly time. There are things, as we said, which should not be dwelt on with minute close scrutiny. Over hot coals you cannot glide too fast. In these seven bureaus, where no work could be done unless talk were work, the questionablest matters were coming up. Lafayette, for example, in Monseigneur d'Artois' bureau, took upon him to set forth more than one deprecatory oration about lettre de cachet, liberty of the subject, agio, and such like, which Monseigneur, endeavouring to repress, was answered that a notable being summoned to speak his opinion must speak it. Thus, too, his grace the Archbishop of Aix, perorating once with a plaintive pulpit tone in these words, Tithe that free will offering of the piety of Christians. Tithe, interrupted Duke de Rochefoucauld, with the cold business manner he has learned from the English, that free will offering of the piety of Christians, on which there are now 40,000 lawsuits in this realm. Nay, Lafayette, bound to speak his opinion, went the length one day of proposing to convoke a national assembly. You demand States General, asked Monseigneur with an air of military surprise. Yes, Monseigneur, and even better than that. Write it, said Monseigneur to the clerks. Written accordingly it is, and what is more will be acted by and by. End of Book 3, Chapter 3《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3, The Parlement of Paris. Chapter 4, Lomani's Edicts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 4, Lomani's Edicts. Thus then have the notables returned home, carrying to all quarters of France such notions of deficit, decrepitude, distraction, and that states-general will cure it, or will not cure it, but kill it. The unquietest humour possesses all men, ferments, seeks issue in pamphleteering, caricaturing, projecting, declaiming, vain jangling of thought, word and deed. It is spiritual bankruptcy, long tolerated, verging now towards economical bankruptcy, and become intolerable. For from the lowest dumb rank, the inevitable misery, as was predicted, has spread upwards. In every man is some obscure feeling that his position, oppressive or else oppressed, is a false one, 
All men in one or the other acrid dialect as assaulters or as defenders must give vent to the unrest that is in them. Of such stuff national well-being and the glory of rulers is not made. O oh, Lomini, what a wild-heaving, waste-looking, hungry and angry world hast thou, after lifelong effort, got promoted to take charge of? Lomini's first edicts are mere soothing ones. Creation of provincial assemblies for apportioning the imposts, when we get any. Suppression of corvée or statute labour. Alleviation of gabelle. Soothing measures recommended by the notables, long clamoured for by all liberal men. Oil cast on the waters has been known to produce a good effect. Before venturing with great essential measures, Lomini will see this singular swell of the public mind abate somewhat. Most proper, surely. But what if it were not a swell of the abating kind? There are swells that come of upper tempest and wind gust, but again there are swells that come of subterranean pent wind, some say, and even of inward decomposition, of decay that has become self-combustion. As when, according to Neptuno-Plutonic geology, the world is all decayed down into due atritis of this sort and shall now be exploded and new made. These latter abate not by oil. The fool says in his heart, How shall not tomorrow be as yesterday, as all days which were once tomorrows? The wise man looking on this France, moral, intellectual, economical, sees, in short, all the symptoms that he has ever met with in history, unabatable by soothing edicts. Meanwhile, abate or not, cash must be had and for that quite another sort of edict, namely bursal or fiscal ones. How easy were fiscal edicts? Did you know for certain that the Parliament of Paris would, what they call, register them? Such right of registering, properly of mere writing down, the Parliament has got by old want, and though but a law court can remonstrate and higgle considerably about the same. Hence many quarrels, desperate Mopeo devices and victory and defeat, a quarrel now nearly forty years long. Hence fiscal edicts, which otherwise were easy enough, become such problems. For example, is there not colonne subvention territoriale, universal unexempting land tax, the sheet anchor of finance? Or, to show, so far as possible, that one is not without original finance talent, Lomini himself can devise an addit to timbre, or stamp tax, borrowed also, it is true, but then from America. May it prove luckier in France than there. France has her resources. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied. The aspect of that Parlement is questionable. Already among the notables in that final symphony of dismissal, the Paris president had an ominous tone. Adrien Dupont, quitting magnetic sleep in this agitation of the world, threatens to rouse himself into preternatural wakefulness. Shallower, but also louder, there is magnetic despremenil with his tropical heat. He was born at Madras with his dusky confused violence, holding of illumination, animal magnetism, public opinion, Adam Weishaupt, Harmodius and Aristogoton, and all manner of confused violent things, of whom can come no good. The very peerage is infected with the leaven. Our peers have, in too many cases, laid aside their frogs, laces, bagwigs, and go about in English costume, or ride rising in their stirrups, in the most headlong manner, nothing but insubordination, eleutheromania, confused unlimited opposition in their heads. Questionable, not to be ventured upon if we had a fortunatus purse. But Lamini has waited all June, casting on the waters what oil he had, and now, betide as it may, the two finance edicts must out. On the 6th of July, he forwards his proposed stamp tax and land tax to the Parliament of Paris, and, as if putting his own leg foremost, not his borrowed Cologne's leg, places the stamp tax first in order. Alas, 
the Parliament will not register. The Parliament demands instead a state of the expenditure, a state of the contemplated reductions, states enough, which His Majesty must decline to furnish. Discussions arise, patriotic eloquence, the peers are summoned. Does the Nemean lion begin to bristle? Here surely is a duel which France and the universe may look upon with prayers, at lowest with curiosity and bets. Paris stirs with new animation. The outer courts of the Palais de Justice roll with unusual crowds coming and going. Their huge outer hum mingles with the clang of patriotic eloquence within and gives vigour to it. Poor Lomini gazes from the distance, little comforted, has his invisible emissaries flying to and fro, assiduous, without result. So pass the sultry dog days in the most electric manner, and the whole month of July. And still in the sanctuary of justice sounds nothing but harmodious aristigiton eloquence environed with the hum of crowding Paris, and no registering accomplished, and no states furnished. States, said a lively parliamentier, monsieur, the states that should be furnished us, in my opinion, are the states general. On which timely joke there follow cachinatory buzzes of approval. What a word to be spoken in the Palais de Justice. Old Domesson, the ex-controller's uncle, shakes his judicious head, far enough from laughing. But the outer courts, and Paris, and France, catch the glad sound and repeat it, shall repeat it, and re-echo and reverberate it, till it grows a deafening peal. Clearly enough, here is no registering to be thought of. The pious proverb says, There are remedies for all things but death. When a parliament refuses registering, the remedy, by long practice, has become familiar to the simplest, a bed of justice. One complete month this Parliament has spent in mere idle jargoning and sound and fury, the timbre edict not registered or like to be, the subvention not yet so much as spoken of. On the 6th of August, let the whole refractory body roll out in wheeled vehicles as far as the King's Chateau of Versailles. There shall the king, holding his bed of justice, order them by his own royal lips to register. They may remonstrate in an undertone, but they must obey, lest a worse unknown thing befall them. It is done. The Parlement has rolled out on royal summons, has heard the express royal order to register. Whereupon it has rolled back again amid the hushed expectancy of men. And now, behold, on the morrow, this Parliament, seated once more in its own palais, with crowds inundating the outer courts, not only does not register, but, oh, portent, declares all that was done on the prior day to be null, and the bed of justice as good as a futility. In the history of France, here verily, is a new feature. Nay, better still, our heroic Parliament, getting suddenly enlightened on several things, declares that, for its part, it is incompetent to register tax edicts at all, having done it by mistake during these late centuries, that for such act one authority only is competent, the assembled three estates of the realm. To such length can the universal spirit of a nation penetrate the most isolated body corporate, Say rather, with such weapons, homicidal and suicidal, in exasperated political duel, will bodies corporate fight. But in any case, is not this the real death grapple of war and internecine duel, Greek meeting Greek, whereon men, had they even no interest in it, might look with interest unspeakable? Crowds, as was said, inundate the outer courts. Inundation of young Eleutheromaniac noblemen in English costume uttering audacious speeches. Of procureur, basoche clerk, who are idle in these days of loungers, newsmongers and other nondescript classes. Rolls tumult there. 
from three to four thousand persons waiting eagerly to hear the arete resolutions you arrive at within, applauding with bravos, with the clapping of from six to eight thousand hands. Sweet also is the mead of patriotic eloquence when your despremenil, your freto, or sabatier issuing from his demosthenic Olympus, the thunder being hushed for the day, is welcomed in the outer courts with a shout from four thousand throats, is borne home shoulder high with benedictions and strikes the stars with his sublime head. End of book three, chapter four. The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3, The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 5, Lomini's Thunderbolts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 5, Lomini's Thunderbolts. Arise, Lomini Brienne, here is no case for letters of jussion, for faltering or compromise. Thou seest the whole loose fluent population of Paris, whatsoever is not solid and fixed to work, inundating these outer courts like a loud destructive deluge. The very basoche of lawyers clerks talk sedition. The lower classes in this duel of authority with authority, Greek throttling Greek, have ceased to respect the city watch. Police satellites are marked on the back with chalk. The M signifies mouchard, spy. They are hustled, hunted like ferrae naturae. Subordinate rural tribunals send messengers of congratulation, of adherence. Their fountain of justice is becoming a fountain of revolt. The provincial parliament look on with intent eye, with breathless wishes, while their elder sister of Paris does battle. The whole twelve are of one blood and temper. The victory of one is that of all. Ever worse it grows. On the 10th of August there is plaint omitted touching the prodigalities of Cologne and permission to proceed against him. No registering, but instead of it, denouncing of dilapidation, peculation, and ever the burden of the song, states general. Have the royal armories no thunderbolt that thou couldst, O Lomini, with red right hand, launch it among these demosthenic theatrical thunder barrels, mere resonant noise for the most part, and shatter and smite them silent? On the night of the 14th of August, Lomini launches his thunderbolt, or handful of them. Letters named of the seal, de cachet, as many as needful, some six score and odd, are delivered overnight. And so, next day betimes, the whole Parliament, once more set on wheels, is rolling incessantly towards Troy in Champagne, escorted, says history, with the blessings of all people, the very innkeepers and postilions looking gratuitously reverent. This is the 15th of August, 1787. What will not people bless in their extreme need? Seldom had the Parliament of Paris deserved much blessing, or received much. An isolated body corporate, which, out of old confusions, while the sceptre of the sword was confusedly struggling to become a sceptre of the pen, had got itself together, better and worse, as body corporates do, to satisfy some dim desire of the world and many clear desires of individuals, and so had grown in the course of centuries, on concession, on acquirement and usurpation, to be what we see it, a prosperous social anomaly deciding lawsuits, sanctioning or rejecting laws, and withal disposing of its places and offices by sale for ready money, which method, sleek President no after meditation, will demonstrate to be the indifferent best. In such a body, existing by purchase for ready money, there could not be excess of public spirit, there might well be excess of eagerness to divide the public spoil. Men in helmets have divided that with swords, men in wigs with quill and inkhorn do divide it, and even more hatefully these latter, if more peaceably, for the wig method is at once irresistibler and baser. By long experience, says Bessonval, it has been found useless to sue a parliamentaire at law. No officer of justice will serve a writ on one. 
his wig and gown are his Vulcan's panoply, his enchanted cloak of darkness. The Parliament of Paris may count itself an unloved body, mean, not magnanimous, on the political side. Were the king weak, always, as now, has his Parliament barked, cur-like, at his heels, with what popular cry there might be. Were he strong, it barked before his face, hunting for him as his alert beagle. An unjust body, where foul influences have more than once worked shameful perversion of judgment. Does not in these very days the blood of murdered Lally cry aloud for vengeance? Baited, circumvented, driven mad like the snared lion, Valour had to sink extinguished under vindictive chicane. Behold him, that hapless lily, his wild dark soul looking through his wild dark face, trailed on the ignominious death hurdle, the voice of his despair choked by a wooden gag. The wild fire soul that had known only peril and toil, and for three score years has buffeted against fate's obstruction and men's perfidy, like genius and courage amid poltroonery, dishonesty and commonplace, faithfully enduring and endeavouring. O Parliament of Paris, dost thou reward it with a gibbet and a gag? The dying Lally bequeathed his memory to his boy, a young lally has arisen, demanding redress in the name of God and man. The Parliament of Paris does its utmost to defend the indefensible, abominable, nay, what is singular, dusky-glowing Aristogiton Despremenil is the man chosen to be its spokesman in that. Such social anomaly is it that France now blesses. An unclean social anomaly, but in duel against another worse. The exiled Parliament is felt to have covered itself with glory. There are quarrels in which even Satan bringing help were not unwelcome. Even Satan, fighting stiffly, might cover himself with glory of a temporary sort. But what a stir in the outer courts of the Palais when Paris finds its Parliament trundled off to Troy in Champagne and nothing left but a few meat keepers of records, the demosthenic thunder become extinct, the martyrs of liberty clean gone. Confused wail and menace rises from the four thousand throats of procureurs, bachoche clerks, nondescripts and anglo-maniac noblesse, ever new idlers crowd to see and hear, rascality with increasing numbers and vigour hunts mouchard. Loud whirlpool rolls through these spaces, the rest of the city fixed to its work cannot yet go rolling. Audacious placards are legible in and about the Palais. The speeches are as good as seditious. Surely the temper of Paris is much changed. On the third day of this business, 18th of August, Monsieur and Monseigneur d'Artois, coming in state carriages according to use and wont, to have these late obnoxious arrêts and protests expunged from the records, are received in the most marked manner. Monsieur who is thought to be in opposition, is met with vivats and strewed flowers. Monseigneur, on the other hand, with silence, with murmurs which rise to hisses and groans. Nay, an irreverent rascality presses towards him in floods with such hissing vehemence that the captain of the guards has to give orders, Hort les arms! Handle arms! At which thunder word, indeed, and the flash of the clear iron, the rascal flood recoils through all avenues fast enough. New features, these. Indeed, as good Monsieur de Malacheur pertinently remarks, it is a quite new kind of contest, this, with the Parlement. No transitory sputter as from collision of hard bodies, but more like the first sparks of what, if not quenched, may become a great conflagration. This good Malesherbe sees himself now again in the king's council after an absence of ten years. Lomini would profit, if not by the faculties of the man, yet by the name he has. As for the man's opinion, it is not listened to. Wherefore, he will soon withdraw a second time, back to his books and his trees. In such king's council, what can a good man profit? Turgot tries it not a second time. Turgot has quitted France and this earth some years ago, and now cares for none of these things. Singular enough, Turgot, this same Lomini, and the Abbe Mourlet were once a trio of young friends, fellow scholars in the Sorbonne. 
Forty new years have carried them severally thus far. Meanwhile, the Parlement sits daily at Troy, calling cases and daily adjourns, no procureur making his appearance to plead. Troy is as hospitable as could be looked for. Nevertheless, one has comparatively a dull life. No crowds now to carry you shoulder high to the immortal gods. Scarcely a patriot or two will drive out so far and bid you be of firm courage. You are in furnished lodgings, far from home and domestic comfort. Little to do but wander over the unlovely Champagne fields, seeing the grapes ripen, taking counsel about the thousand times consulted, a prey to tedium, in danger even that Paris may forget you. Messengers come and go. Pacific Lomini is not slack in negotiating, promising. Dormesson and the prudent elder members see no good in strife. After a dull month, the Parliament, yielding and retaining, makes truce, as all Parliaments must. The stamp tax is withdrawn. The subvention land tax is also withdrawn, but in its stead there is granted what they call a prorogation of the second twentieth, itself a kind of land tax, but not so oppressive to the influential classes, which lies mainly on the dumb class. Moreover, secret promises exist on the part of the elders that finances may be raised by loan. Of the ugly words states general, there shall be no mention. And so, on the 20th of September, our exiled Parliament returns. Despramenel said, It went out covered in glory, but had come back covered with mud. Debout. Not so, Aristogiton, or if so, thou surely art the man to clean it. End of Book 3, Chapter 5《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3 The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 6 Lomini's Plots. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 6 Lomini's Plots. Was ever unfortunate chief minister so bested as Lomini Brienne? The reins of the state fairly in his hand these six months are not the smallest motive power of finance to stir from the spot with this way or that. He flourishes his whip but advances not. Instead of ready money there is nothing but rebellious debating and recalcitrating. Far is the public mind from having calmed. It goes chafing and fuming ever worse, and in the royal coffers, with such yearly deficit running on, there is hardly the colour of coin. Ominous prognostics. Malesherb, seeing an exhausted, exasperated France grow hotter and hotter, talks of conflagration. Mirabeau, without talk, has, as we perceive, descended on Paris again, close on the rear of the Parlement, not to quit his native soil any more. Over the frontiers, behold, Holland invaded by Prussia, the French party oppressed, England and the stadtholder triumphing to the sorrow of War Secretary Montmorin and all men. But without money, sinews of war as of work and of existence itself, what can a chief minister do? Taxes profit little. This of the second twentieth falls not due till next year and will then, with its strict valuation, produce more controversy than cash. Taxes on the privileged classes cannot be got registered, are intolerable to our supporters themselves. Taxes on the unprivileged yield nothing, as from a thing drained dry more cannot be drawn. Hope is nowhere, if not in the old refuge of loans. To Lomini, aided by the long head of Lamoignon, deeply pondering this sea of troubles, the thought suggested itself, why not have a successive loan, emprunt successif, of loan that went on lending, year after year, as much as needful, say, till 1792? The trouble of registering such loan were the same. We had then breathing time, money to work with, at least to subsist on. Edict of a successive loan must be proposed. 
to conciliate the philosophe, let a liberal edict walk in front of it for emancipation of Protestants. Let a liberal promise guard the rear of it that when our loan ends in that final 1792, the States General shall be convoked. Such liberal edict of Protestant emancipation, the time having come for it, shall cost Alamany as little as the death penalties to be put in execution did. As for the liberal promise of States General, it can be fulfilled or not. The fulfilment is five good years off. In five years, much intervenes. But the registering? Ah, truly, there is the difficulty. However, we have that promise of the elders given secretly at Troy, judicious gratuities, cajoleries, underground intrigues, with old Foulon named Am Damne, familiar demon of the Parliament, may perhaps do the rest. At worst and lowest, the royal authority has resources, which ought it not to put forth. If it cannot realise money, the royal authority is as good as dead, dead of that surest and miserablest death, inanition. Risk and win. Without risk, all is already lost. For the rest, as in enterprises of pith, a touch of stratagem often proves furthersome. His Majesty announces a royal hunt for the 19th of November next, and all whom it concerns are joyfully getting their gear ready. Royal hunt indeed, but of two-legged, unfeathered game. At eleven in the morning of that royal hunt day, 19th of November, 1787, unexpected blare of trumpeting, tumult of charioteering and cavalcading disturbs the seat of justice. His Majesty is come with garde sur Lamagnon and peers and retinue to hold royal session and have edicts registered. What a change since Louis XIV entered here in boots and whip in hand, ordered his registering to be done with an Olympian look which none durst gainsay, and did without stratagem in such unceremonious fashion hunt as well as register. For Louis XVI on this day the registering will be enough, if indeed he and the day suffice for it. Meanwhile, with fit ceremonial words, the purpose of the royal breast is signified. Two edicts for Protestant emancipation for successive loan, of both which edicts our trusty garde de Sir Lamagnon will explain the purport, on both which a trusty parliament is requested to deliver its opinion, each member having free privilege of speech. And so, Lamagnon too, having perorated, not amiss, and wound up with that promise of States General, the sphere music of parliamentary eloquence begins. Explosive, responsive, sphere answering sphere, it waxes louder and louder. The peers sit attentive, of diverse sentiment, unfriendly to States General, unfriendly to despotism, which cannot reward merit and is suppressing places. But what agitates his highness d'Orléans? The rubicond moonhead goes wagging, darker beams the copper visage like unscoured copper in the glazed eye's disquietude. He rolls uneasy in his seat as if he meant something. Amid unutterable satiety, has sudden new appetite for new forbidden fruit been vouchsafed him? Disgust and edacity, laziness that cannot rest, Futile ambition, revenge, non-admiralship. Oh, within that carbuncled skin, what a confusion of confusion sits bottled. Eight couriers in the course of the day gallop from Versailles, where Lomini waits palpitating, and gallop back again, not with the best news. In the outer courts of the palais, huge buzz of expectation reigns. It is whispered the chief minister has lost six votes overnight and from within resounds nothing but forensic eloquence, pathetic and even indignant, heart-rending appeals to the royal clemency that his majesty would please to summon states-general forthwith and be the saviour of France, where in dusky glowing Despremenel, but still more Sabatier de Cabra and Freto, since named Comer Freto, Goody Freto, are among the loudest. For six mortal hours at last, in this manner, the infinite hubbub unslackened. 
And so now, when brown dusk is falling through the windows and no end visible, His Majesty, on hint of garde des Sceaux la Mognon, opens his royal lips once more to say, in brief, that he must have his loan edict registered. Momentary deep pause. See, Monseigneur d'Orléans rises with moon visage turned towards the royal platform. He asks, with a delicate graciosity of manner covering unutterable things, whether it is a bed of justice, then, or a royal session. Fire flashes on him from the throne and neighbourhood. Surly answer that it is a session. In that case, Monseigneur will crave leave to remark that edicts cannot be registered by order in a session and indeed to enter against such registry his individual humble protest. Vous êtes bien le maître, you will do your pleasure, answers the king, and thereupon in high state marches out, escorted by his court retinue. Dorleon himself, as in duty bound, escorting him, but only to the gate. Which duty done, Dorleon returns in from the gate, redacts his protest in the face of an applauding Parliament, an applauding France, and so has cut his court mooring, shall we say, and will now sail and drift fast enough towards chaos? Thou foolish Dorleon, a quality that art to be, is royalty grown a mere wooden scarecrow whereon thou, pert, scold headed crow, mayst alight at pleasure and peck, not yet wholly. Next day, a letter to Cachet sends Dorleon to bethink himself in his chateau of Villiers Cotteret, where, alas, is no Paris with its joyous necessaries of life, no fascinating, indispensable Madame du Buffon, light wife of a great naturalist much too old for her. Monseigneur, it is said, does nothing but walk distractedly at Villiers Cotteret, cursing his stars. Versailles itself shall hear penitent wail from him, so hard is his doom. By a second simultaneous letter de cachet, good Ifrato is hurled into the stronghold of Ham amid the Norman marshes. By a third, Sabatier de Cabre into Mont Saint-Michel amid the Norman quicksands. As for the Parlement, it must on summons travel out to Versailles with its register book under its arm to have the protest buffet expunged, not without admonition and even rebuke. A stroke of authority which one might have hoped would quiet matters. Unhappily, no. It is a mere taste of the whip to rearing courses which makes them rear worse. When a team of twenty-five millions begins rearing, what is Lomini's whip? The Parliament will nowise acquiesce meekly and set to register the Protestant edict and do its other work in salutary fear of these three lettres de cachet. Far from that, it begins questioning lettres de cachet generally, their legality, endurability, emits dolorous objurgation, petition on petition to have its three martyrs delivered, cannot till that be complied with so much as think of examining the Protestant edict, but puts it off always till this day week, in which objurgatory strain Paris and France joins it, or rather has preceded it, making fearful chorus. And now also the other Parliament, at length opening their mouths, begin to join, some of them as at Grenoble and at Rennes, with portentous emphasis threatening by way of reprisal to interdict the very tax-gatherer. In all formal contests, as Malachir remarks, it was the Parliament that excited the public, but here it is the public that excites the Parliament. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3, The Parliament of Paris Chapter 7, Internecine this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 7, Internecine What a France through these winter months of the year 1787! The very oeil de boeuf is doleful, uncertain, with a general feeling among the suppressed that it were better to be in Turkey. 
The wolf hounds are suppressed, the bear hounds, the Duc de Coigny, Duc de Polignac, in the tree and on Little Heaven, Her Majesty one evening takes Bessonval's arm, asks his candid opinion. The intrepid Bessonval, having, as he hopes, nothing of the sycophant in him, plainly signifies that, with a parliament in rebellion and an oeil de boeuf in suppression, the king's crown is in danger. Whereupon, singular to say, Her Majesty, as if hurt, changed the subject. Et ne me parla plus de rien. To whom, indeed, can this poor queen speak? in need of wide counsel, if ever mortal was, yet beset here only by the hubbub of chaos. Her dwelling place is so bright to the eye, and confusion and black care darkens it all. Sorrows of the sovereign, sorrows of the woman, think coming sorrows environ her more and more. Lamotte, the necklace countess, has in these late months escaped, perhaps been suffered to escape, from the Salpietre. Vain was the hope that Paris might thereby forget her, and this ever-widening lie and heap of lies subside. The La Motte with a V for voleurs, thief, branded on both shoulders, has got to England, and will therefrom emit lie on lie, defiling the highest queenly name, mere distracted lies, which in its present humour France will greedily believe. For the rest, it is too clear our successive loan is not filling. As indeed, in such circumstances, a loan registered by expunging of protests was not the likeliest to fill. Denunciation of lettre de cachet, of despotism generally, abates not. The twelve parliaments are busy, the twelve hundred placarders, ballad singers, pamphleteers. Paris is what, in figurative speech, they call flooded with pamphlets, regorge de brochures, flooded and eddying again, hot deluge from so many patriot ready writers, all at the fervid or boiling point, each ready writer now in the hour of eruption going like an Iceland geyser, against which what can a judicious friend morale do, a riverol, an unruly langue, well paid for it, spouting, cold. Now also at length does come discussion of the Protestant edict, but only for new embroilment, in pamphlet and counter-pamphlet, increasing the madness of men. Not even orthodoxy, bedrid as she seemed, but will have a hand in this confusion. She, once again in the shape of Abbe L'Enfant, whom prelates drive to visit and congratulate, raises audible sound from her pulpit drum. Or Marca Despremenil, who has his own confused way in all things, produces at the right moment, in parliamentary harangue, a pocket crucifix with the apostrophe, Will ye crucify him afresh? Him, O oh Despremenil, without scruple, considering what poor stuff of ivory and filigree he is made of. To all which add only that poor Brienne has fallen sick, so hard was the tear and wear of his sinful youth, so violent, incessant is this agitation of his foolish old age. Baited, bayed at through so many throats, his grace growing consumptive, inflammatory, with humour de dart, lies reduced to milk diet, in exasperation, almost in desperation, with repose, precisely the impossible recipe, prescribed as the indispensable. On the whole, what can a poor government do but once more recoil, ineffectual? The king's treasury is running towards the lees, and Paris eddies with a flood of pamphlets. At all rates, let the latter subside a little. D'Orléans gets back to Rancy, which is nearer Paris, and the fair, frail Buffon. Finally, to Paris itself. Neither Afreto and Sabatier banished forever. The Protestant edict is registered to the joy of Boissy d'Anglas and good Malesherbe. Successive loan, all protests expunged or else withdrawn, remains open, the rather as few or none come to fill it. States general for which the Parliament has clamoured, and now the whole nation clamours, will follow in five years, if indeed not sooner. O oh, Parliament of Paris, what a clamour was that! Monsieur, said old Domesson, you will get States-General, and you will repent it. Like the horse in the fable, 
who, to be avenged of his enemy, applied to the man. The man, mounted, did swift execution on the enemy, but unhappily would not dismount. Instead of five years, let three years pass, and this clamorous parliament shall have both seen its enemy hurled prostrate and been itself ridden to foundering, say, rather jugulated for hide and shoes, and lie dead in the ditch. Under such omens, however, we have reached the spring of 1788. By no path can the king's government find passage for itself, but is everywhere shamefully flung back. Beleaguered by twelve rebellious parliaments, which are grown to be the organs of an angry nation, it can advance nowhither, can accomplish nothing, obtain nothing, not so much as money to subsist on, but must sit there seemingly to be eaten up of deficit. The measure of the iniquity, then, of the falsehood which has been gathering through long centuries is nearly full? At least that of the misery is. For the hovels of the twenty-five millions, the misery, permeating upwards and forwards, as its law is, has got so far to the very oeil de boeuf of Versailles. Man's hand in this blind pain is set against man, not only the low against the higher, but the higher against each other. Provincial noblesse is bitter against court noblesse, robe against sword, rocher against pen. But against the king's government, who is not bitter? Not even Bessonval in these days. To it, all men and bodies of men are become as enemies. It is the centre whereon infinite contentions unite and clash. What new universal vertiginous movement is this of institution, social arrangements, individual minds, which once worked cooperative, now rolling and grinding in distracted collision? Inevitable, it is the breaking up of a world solecism, worn out at last, down even to bankruptcy of money. And so this poor Versailles court, as the chief or central solecism, finds all other solecisms arrayed against it. Most natural. For your human solecism, be it person or combination of persons, is ever by law of nature uneasy. If verging towards bankruptcy, it is even miserable. And when would the meanest solecism consent to blame or amend itself, while there remained another to amend? These threatening signs do not terrify Lomeny, much less teach him. Lomeny, though of light nature, is not without courage of a sort. Nay, have we not read of lightest creatures, trained canary birds, that could fly cheerfully with lighted matches and fire cannon, fire whole powder magazines? To sit and die of deficit is no part of Lomeny's plan. The evil is considerable, but can he not remove it? Can he not attack it? At lowest, he can attack the symptom of it, these rebellious parliament he can attack and perhaps remove. Much is dim to Lomini, but two things are clear. That such parliamentary duel with royalty is growing perilous, nay, internecine, above all, that money must be had. Take thought, brave Lomini, thou garde de ce Lomagnon, who hast ideas. So often defeated, balked cruelly when the golden fruit seemed within clutch, rally for one other struggle. To tame the parliament, to fill the king's coffers, these are now life and death questions. Parliaments have been tamed more than once, set to perch on the peaks of rocks inaccessible except by litters, a parliament grows reasonable. O oh, Mopio, thou bold man, had we left thy work where it was. But apart from exile or other violent methods, is there not one method whereby all things are tamed, even lions, the method of hunger? What if the Parliament supplies were cut off, namely its lawsuits? Minor courts, for the trying of innumerable minor causes, might be instituted, these we could call grand balayage, whereon the Parliament, shortened of its prey, would look with yellow despair but the public fond of cheap justice with favour and hope. Then, for finance, for registering of edicts, why not, from our own oeil de boeuf dignitaries, our princes, dukes, marshals, make a thing we could call plenary court, and there, so to speak, do our registering ourselves? 
St. Louis had his plenary court of great barons, most useful to him. Our great barons are still here, at least the name of them is still here. Our necessity is greater than his. Such is the Lomini Lamognon device, welcome to the king's council as a light beam in great darkness. The device seems feasible. It is eminently needful. Be it once well executed, great deliverance is wrought. Silent then and steady, now or never, the world shall see one other historical scene, and so singular a man as Lomini de Brienne still the stage manager there. Behold, accordingly, a home secretary, Bretaille, beautifying Paris in the peaceablest manner in this hopeful spring weather of 1788. The old hovels and hutches disappearing from our bridges, as if for the state too there were halcyon weather and nothing to do but beautify. Parliament seems to sit acknowledged victor. Brienne says nothing of finance, or even says and prints that it is all well. How is this, such halcyon quiet, though the successive loan did not fill? In a victorious parliament, Councillor Gosselin de Montsabert even denounces that levying of the second twentieth on strict valuation, and gets decree that the valuation shall not be strict, not on the privileged classes. Nevertheless, Brienne endures it, launches no lettre de cachet against it. How is this? Smiling is such vernal weather, but treacherous, sudden. For one thing, we hear it whispered, the intendant of provinces have all got order to be at their posts on a certain day. Still more singular, what incessant printing is this that goes on at the king's chateau under lock and key? Sentries occupy all gates and windows, the printers come not out, they sleep in their workrooms, their very food is handed into them. A victorious parliament smells new danger. Despremenil has ordered horses to Versailles, prowls round that guarded printing office, prying, snuffing, if so be the sagacity and ingenuity of man may penetrate it. To the shower of gold most things are penetrable. Despremenil descends on the lap of a printer's Danai in the shape of 500 louis d'or. The Danai's husband smuggles a ball of clay to her, which she delivers to the golden councillor of parliament, kneaded within it their stick-printed proof-sheets. By heaven, the royal edict of that same self-registering plenary court of those grand balayages that shall cut short our lawsuits. It is to be promulgated all over France on one and the same day. This, then, is what the intendant will bid wait for at their posts. This is what the court sat hatching as its accursed cockatrice egg, and would not stir, though provoked, till the brood were out. High with it, Despremenil, home to Paris, convoke instantaneous sessions, let the Parliament and the earth and heavens know it. End of Book 3, Chapter 7« The French Revolution – A History » by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3 – The Parliament of Paris Chapter 8 – Lomeny's Death Throes This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3 – Chapter 8 – Lomeny's Death Throes On the morrow, which is the 3rd of May, 1788, an astonished Parliament sits convoked, listens speechless to the speech of Despremenil, unfolding the infinite misdeed, deed of treachery, of unhallowed darkness, such as despotism loves. Denounce it, O Parliament of Paris, awaken France and the universe, roll what thunder-barrels of forensic eloquence thou hast, with thee too it is verily now or never. The Parliament is not wanting at such juncture. In the hour of his extreme jeopardy, the lion first incites himself by roaring, by lashing his sides. So, here, the Parliament of Paris. On the motion of Despremenil, a most patriotic oath of the one and all sort is sworn with united throat, an excellent new idea which in these coming years shall not remain unimitated. Next comes indomitable declaration almost of the rights of man, at least of the rights of Parliament. 
invocation to the friends of French freedom in this and in subsequent time, all which, or the essence of all which, is brought to paper in a tone wherein something of plaintiveness blends with and tempers heroic valour. And thus, having sounded the storm-bell, which Paris hears, which all France will hear, and hurled such defiance in the teeth of lomony and despotism, the Parliament retires as from a tolerable first day's work. But how Lomini felt to see his coquetry's egg, so essential to the salvation of France, broken in this premature manner, let readers fancy. Indignant, he clutches at his thunderbolts, de cachet of the seal, and launches two of them, a bolt for Despremenil, a bolt for that busy Gauchelard whose service in the second twentieth and strict valuation is not forgotten. Such bolts clutched promptly overnight, and launched with the early new morning, shall strike agitated Paris, if not into requiescence, yet into wholesome astonishment. Ministerial thunderbolts may be launched, but if they do not hit? Despremenel and Gosselard, warned both of them, as is thought by singing of some friendly bird, elude the Lomini tipstaves, escape disguised through sky windows, over roofs, to their own palais de justice. The thunderbolts have missed. Paris, for the buzz flies abroad, is struck into astonishment, not wholesome. The two martyrs of liberty doff their disguises, don their long gowns. Behold, in the space of an hour, by aid of ushers and swift runners, the Parliament, with its councillors, presidents, even peers, sits anew assembled. The assembled Parliament declares that these its two martyrs cannot be given up to any sublunary authority. Moreover, that the session is permanent, admitting of no adjournment, till pursuit of them has been relinquished. And so, with forensic eloquence, denunciation and protest, with couriers going and returning, the Parliament, in this state of continual explosion that shall cease neither night nor day, waits the issue. Awakened Paris once more inundates those outer courts, boils in floods wilder than ever through all avenues. Dissonant hubbub there is jargon as of Babel in the hour when they were first smitten, as here with mutual unintelligibility, and the people had not yet dispersed. Paris City goes through its diurnal epochs of working and slumbering, and now, for the second time, most European and African mortals are asleep. But here, in this whirlpool of words, sleep falls not. The night spreads her coverlid of darkness over it in vain. Within is the sound of mere martyr invincibility, tempered with the due tone of plaintiveness. Without is the infinite expectant hum, growing drowsier a little. So has it lasted for six and thirty hours. But hark, through the dead of midnight, what tramp is this? Tramp as of armed men, foot and horse, guard Francaise, guard Suisse, marching hither in silent regularity, in the flare of torchlight. There are sappers too, with axes and crowbars. Apparently if the doors open not, they will be forced. It is Captain Dagou, missioned from Versailles. Dagou, a man of known firmness, who once forced Prince Condé himself by mere incessant looking at him to give satisfaction and fight. He now, with axes and torches, is advancing on the very sanctuary of justice. Sacrilegious! Yet what help? The man is a soldier, looks merely at his orders, impassive, moves forward like an inanimate engine. The doors open on summons. They need no axes. Door after door. And now the innermost door opens, discloses the long-gowned senators of France, a hundred and sixty-seven by tail, seventeen of them peers, sitting there, majestic, in permanent session. Were not the men military and of cast iron, this sight, this silence, re-echoing the clank of his own boots, might stagger him. For the hundred and sixty-seven receive him in perfect silence which some liken to that of the Roman Senate overfallen by Brennus, some to that of a nest of coiners surprised by officers of the police. Monsieur, said Degout, de par le roi, 
Express order has charged Dagu with the sad duty of arresting two individuals, Monsieur Duval d'Espremenil and Monsieur Gaulard de Montsabert. Which respectable individuals, as he has not the honour of knowing them, are hereby invited in the King's name to surrender themselves? Profound silence. Buzz, which grows a murmur. We are all Despremenil's ventures a voice, which other voices repeat. The President inquires whether he will employ violence. Captain Daegu, honoured with His Majesty's commission, has to execute His Majesty's order. Would so gladly do it without violence, will in any case do it, grants an august silent space to deliberate which method they prefer. And thereupon Daegu, with grave military courtesy, has withdrawn for the moment. What boots it, august senators? All avenues are closed with fixed bayonets. Your courier gallops to Versailles through the dewy night, but also gallops back again with tidings that the order is authentic, that it is irrevocable. The outer court simmer with idle population, but Dagu's grenadier ranks stand there as immovable floodgates. There will be no revolting to deliver you. Monsieur, thus spoke Despremenil, when the victorious Gauls entered Rome, which they had carried by assault, the Roman senators, clothed in their purple, sat there in the curule chairs with a proud and tranquil countenance, awaiting slavery or death. Such, too, is the lofty spectacle which you, in this hour, offer to the universe, à l'univers, after having generously, with much more of the like, as can be read. In vain, O oh, Despremenil, here is this cast-iron Captain Daegu with his cast-iron military air, come back. Despotism, constraint, destruction sit waving in his plumes. Despremenil must fall silent, heroically give himself up, lest worst befall. Him Goslard heroically imitates, with spoken and speechless emotion they fling themselves into the arms of their parliamentary brethren for a last embrace. And so, amid plaudits and plaints, from a hundred and sixty-five throats, amid waving sobbings, a whole forest's eye of parliamentary pathos, they are led through the winding passages to the rear gate, where, in the grey of the morning, two coaches with exempts stand waiting. There must the victims mount, bayonets menacing behind. Despremenal's stern question to the populace, whether they have courage, is answered by silence. They mount and roll, and neither the rising of the May sun, it is the sixth morning, nor its setting shall lighten their heart, but they fare forward continually. This Bremenil, towards the utmost isles of Saint Marguerite, or here, supposed by some, if that is any comfort, to be Calypso Island, Goslard, towards the land fortress of pierre en extant then near the city of Lyon. Captain Daigu may now, therefore, look forward to majorship, to commandship of the Tuileries, and withal vanish from history, where, nevertheless, he has been fated to do a notable thing. For not only are Despremenil and Goslard safe whirling southward, but the Parliament itself has straightway to march out, to that also his inexorable order reaches. Gathering up their long skirts, they file out, the whole hundred and sixty-five of them, through two rows of unsympathetic grenadiers, a spectacle to gods and men. The people revolt not, they only wonder and grumble. Also, we remark, these unsympathetic grenadiers are garde Francais, who one day will sympathise. In a word, the Palais de Justice is swept clear, the doors of it are locked, and Daegu returns to Versailles with a key in his pocket, having, as was said, merited preferment. As for this Parliament of Paris now turned out to the street, we will, without reluctance, leave it there. The beds of justice it had to undergo in the coming fortnight at Versailles, in registering, or rather refusing to register, those new hatched edicts, and how it assembled in taverns and tap-rooms there for the purpose of protesting, or hovered disconsolate with outspread skirts, not knowing where to assemble, and was reduced to lodge protest with a notary, and in the end to sit still in a state of forced vacation and do nothing. All this, natural now as the burying of the dead after battle, shall not concern us. The Parliament of Paris has as good as performed its part, doing and misdoing, so far, but hardly further, could it stir the world. 
Lomani has removed the evil then? Not at all. Not so much as the symptom of the evil, scarcely the twelfth part of the symptom, and exasperated the other eleven. The intendant of provinces, the military commandants, are at their posts on the appointed 8th of May, but in no parliament, if not in the single one of Douai, can these new edicts get registered. Not peaceable signing with ink, but browbeating, bloodshedding, appeal to primary club law against these bailliages, against this plenary court, exasperated theme as everywhere shows face of battle. The provincial noblesse are of her party, and whoever hates Lomini in the evil time, with her attorneys and tipstaves, she enlists and operates down even to the populace. At Rennes in Brittany, where the historical Bertrand de Morville is intendant, it has passed from fatal continual duelling between the military and gentry to street fighting, to stone volleys and musket shot, and still the edicts remain unregistered. The afflicted Bretons send remonstrance to Lomini by a deputation of twelve, whom, however, Lomini, having heard them, shuts up in the Bastille. A second larger deputation he meets by his scouts on the road and persuades or frightens back. But now a third largest deputation is indignantly sent by many roads, refused audience on arriving. It meets to take counsel, invites Lafayette, an old patriot Breton, in Paris to assist, agitates itself, becomes the Breton Club, first germ of the Jacobins' society. So many as eight parliaments get exiled. Others might need that remedy, but it is one not always easy of appliance. At Grenoble, for instance, where a Mounier, a Banave, have not been idle, the Parliament had due order, by lettre de cachet, to depart and exile itself. But on the morrow, instead of coaches getting yoked, the alarm bell burst forth, ominous, and peals and booms all day. Crowds of mountaineers rush down with axes, even with firelocks, whom, most ominous of all, the soldiery shows no eagerness to deal with. Axe overhead, the poor general has to sign capitulation to engage that the lettre de cachet shall remain unexecuted and a beloved parliament stay where it is. Besançon, Dijon, Rouen, Bordeaux are not what they should be. At Pau in Bern, where the old commandant had failed, the new one, a Grammont native to them, is met by a procession of townsmen with the cradle of Henri IV, the palladium of their town is conjured as he venerates this old tortoise shell in which the great Henri was rocked not to trample on Bernese liberty, is informed withal that his majesty's cannon are all safe in the keeping of his majesty's faithful burghers of power, and do now lie pointed on the walls there, ready for action. At this rate, your grand bayages are likely to have a stormy infancy. As for the plenary court, it has literally expired in the birth. The very courtiers looked shy at it. Old Marshal Brogli declined the honour of sitting therein. Assaulted by a universal storm of mingled ridicule and execration, this poor plenary court met once and never any second time. Distracted country, contention hisses up with forked hydra tongues, wheresoever poor Lomini sets his foot, let a commandant, a commissioner of the king, says Weber, enter one of these parliaments to have an edict registered, the whole tribunal will disappear and leave the commandant alone with the clerk and first president. The edict registered and the commandant gone, the whole tribunal hastens back to declare such registration null. The highways are covered with grand deputations of parliaments proceeding to Versailles to have their registers expunged by the king's hand or returning home to cover a new page with a new resolution still more audacious. Such is the France of this year, 1788. Not now a golden or paper age of hope with its horse racings, balloon flyings and finer sensibilities of the heart. Ah, Gone is that, its golden effulgence paled, be darkened in this singular manner, brewing towards preternatural weather. For, as in that wreck storm of Paul Le Virginie at Saint Pierre, one huge motionless cloud, say of sorrow and indignation, girdles our whole horizon, streams up hairy, copper edged over a sky of the colour of lead. 
motionless itself, but small clouds as exiled parliaments and such like, parting from it, fly over the zenith with the velocity of birds, till at last, with one loud howl, the whole four winds be dashed together, and all the world exclaim, There is the tornado! Tout le monde s'écria, voilà l'ouragan. For the rest, in such circumstances, the successive loan very naturally remains unfilled, neither indeed can that impost of the second twentieth, at least not on strict valuation, be levied to good purpose. Lenders, says Weber, in his hysterical, vehement manner, are afraid of ruin, tax-gatherers of hanging. The very clergy turn away their face. Convoked in extraordinary assembly, they afford no gratuitous gift, don gratui, if it be not that of advice. Here too, instead of cash, is clamour for states-general. O oh, Lomini Brienne, with thy poor flimsy mind all bewildered, and now three actual cauteries on thy worn-out body, who art like to die of inflammation, provocation, milk diet, d'atre vivre, and malady, best untranslated, and presidest over a France with innumerable actual cauteries, which also is dying of inflammation and the rest. Was it wise to quit the bosky verges of Brienne and thy new Ashlar chateau there and what it held for this? Soft were those shades and lawns, sweet the hymns of poetasters, the blandishments of high-rouged graces, and always this and other fillers, soft morale, nothing deeming himself or thee a questionable sham priest, could be so happy in making happy, and also, hadst thou known it, in the military school hard by there sat, studying mathematics, a dusky complexion taciturned boy under the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. With fifty years of effort and one final deadlift struggle, thou hast made an exchange. Thou hast got thy robe of office, as Hercules had his Nessus shirt. On the 13th of July of this 1788, there fell on the very edge of harvest the most frightful hailstorm, scattering into wild waste the fruits of the year, which had otherwise suffered grievously by drought. For sixty leagues round Paris, especially the ruin, was almost total. To so many other evils, then, there is to be added that of dearth, perhaps of famine. Some days before this hailstorm, on the 5th of July, and still more decisively some days after it, on the 8th of August, Lomini announces that the States-General are actually to meet in the following month of May, till after which period this of the plenary court and the rest shall remain postponed. Further, as in Lomini there is no plan of forming or holding these most desirable states-generals, thinkers are invited to furnish him with one through the medium of discussion by the public press. What could a poor minister do? There are still ten months of respite reserved. A sinking pilot will fling out all things, his very biscuit bags, lead, log, compass and quadrant, before flinging out himself. It is on this principle of sinking and the incipient delirium of despair that we explain likewise the almost miraculous invitation to thinkers. Invitation to chaos to be so kind as build out of its tumultuous driftwood an ark of escape for him. In these cases not invitation but command has usually proved serviceable. The Queen stood that evening pensive in a window with her face turned towards the garden. The chef de Gobelet had followed her with an obsequious cup of coffee and then retired till it was sipped. Her Majesty beckoned Dame Campan to approach. Grand Dieu, murmured she with the cup in her hand, what a piece of news will be made public today. The King grants States General. Then raising her eyes to heaven, if Campan were not mistaken, she added, "'Tis a first beat of the drum of ill omen for France.' This noblesse will ruin us. During all that hatching of the plenary court, while Lamagnon looked so mysterious, Bessonval had kept asking him one question, whether they had cash. To which, as Lamagnon always answered on the faith of Lomini, that the cash was safe, judicious Bessonval rejoined that then all was safe. Nevertheless, the melancholy fact is that the royal coffers are almost getting literally void of coin. 
Indeed, apart from all other things, this invitation to thinkers and the great change now at hand are enough to arrest the circulation of capital and forward only that of pamphlets. A few thousand gold louis are now all of money or money's worth that remains in the king's treasury. With another movement as of desperation, Lomini invites Necker to come and be controller of finances. Necker has other work in view than controlling finances for Lomini. With a dry refusal, he stands taciturn, awaiting his time. What shall a desperate prime minister do? He has grasped at the strong box of the king's theatre. Some lottery has been set on foot for those sufferers by the hailstorm. In his extreme necessity, Lomini lays hands even on this. To make provision for the passing day on any terms will soon be impossible. On the 16th of August, poor Weber heard at Paris and Versailles hawkers with a hoarse stifled tone of voice, va étoffe sourde, drawling and snuffling through the streets, an edict concerning payments, such was the soft title Riverol had controlled for it. All payments at the royal treasury shall be made henceforth three-fifths in cash and the remaining two-fifths in paper bearing interest. Or Weber almost swooned at the sound of these cracked voices with their bodeful raven note, and will never forget the effect it had on him. But the effect on Paris, on the world generally? From the dens of stock brokerage, from the heights of political economy, of neckerism and philosophism, from all articulate and inarticulate throats rise hootings and howlings such as ear had not yet heard, Sedition itself may be imminent. Monseigneur d'Artois, moved by Duchess Polignac, feels called to wait upon Her Majesty and explain frankly what crisis matters stand in. The Queen wept, Brienne himself wept, for it is now visible and palpable that he must go. Remains only that the court, to whom his manners and garrulities were always agreeable, shall make his fall soft. The grasping old man has already got his Archbishop of Toulouse exchanged for the richer one of sense, and now, in this hour of pity, he shall have the coadjutorship for his nephew, hardly yet of due age, a dameship of the palace for his niece, a regiment for her husband, for himself a red cardinal's hat, a coupe de bois cutting from the royal forests, and on the whole from five to six hundred thousand livres of revenue, Finally, his brother, the Comte de Brienne, shall still continue war minister. Buckled round with such bolsters and huge feather beds of promotion, let him now fall as soft as he can. And so Lamini departs, rich if court titles and money bonds can enrich him, but if these cannot, perhaps the poorest of all extant men. Hissed at by the people of Versailles, he drives forth to Jardis, southward to Brienne, for recovery of health, then to Nice, to Italy, but shall return, shall glide to and fro, tremulous, faint twinkling, fallen on awful times, till the guillotine snuff out his weak existence. Alas, worse, for it is blown out or choked out foully, pitiably, on the way to the guillotine. In his palace of Sens, rude Jacobin bailiffs made him drink with them from his own wine cellars, feast with them from his own larder, and on the morrow morning the miserable old man lies dead. This is the end of Prime Minister Cardinal Archbishop Lomini de Brienne. Flimsy a mortal was seldom fated to do as weighty a mischief, to have a life as despicable envied, an exit as frightful. Fired, as the phrase is, with ambition, blown like a kindled rag, the sport of winds, not this way, not that way, but of always straight towards such a powder mine, which he kindled. Let us pity the hapless Lomini and forgive him, and as soon as possible, forget him. End of Book 3, Chapter 8« The French Revolution – A History » by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3 – The Parliament of Paris Chapter 9 – Burial with Bonfire This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 3 – Chapter 9 – Burial with Bonfire 
Besenval, during these extraordinary operations of payments to fifth in paper and change of Prime Minister, had been out on a tour through his district of command, and indeed for the last months peacefully drinking the waters of Contrex Ville. Returning now in the end of August towards Moulin, and knowing nothing, he arrives one evening at Langres, finds the whole town in a state of uproar, grande rumeur, doubtless some sedition, a thing too common in these days. He alights, nevertheless, inquires of a man tolerably dressed what the matter is. How, answers the man, have you not heard the news? The archbishop is thrown out and Monsieur Necker is recalled and all is going to go well. Such rumour and vociferous acclaim has risen round Monsieur Necker ever from that day when he issued from the Queen's apartments a nominated minister. It was on the 24th of August. The galleries of the chateau, the courts, the streets of Versailles, in few hours the capital, and as the news flew, all France resounded with the cry of Vive le Ra, Vive Monsieur Necker. In Paris, indeed, it unfortunately got the length of turbulence. Petards, rockets go off in the Place Dauphine, more than enough. A wicker figure, mannequin dossier, in Archbishop's stole, made emblematically three-fifths of its satin, two-fifths of its paper, is promenaded, not in silence, to the popular judgment bar, is doomed, shriven by a mock abbe de Vaumont, then solemnly consumed by fire at the foot of Henri's statue on the Pont Neuf, with such petarding and huzzaing that Chevalier Dubois and his city watch see good finally to make a charge, more or less ineffectual. And there wanted not burning of sentry boxes, forcing of guard houses, and also dead bodies thrown into the Seine overnight to avoid new effervescence. Parliaments therefore shall return from exile. Plenary court, payment two-fifths in paper, have vanished, gone off in smoke at the foot of Henri's statue. States-general, with a political millennium, are now certain. Nay, it shall be announced in our fond haste for January next, and all, as the long man said, is going to go. To the prophetic glance of Bessonval, one other thing is too apparent. That friend Lamagnon cannot keep his keepership. Neither he nor War Minister Comte de Brienne. Already old Foulon, with an eye to be War Minister himself, is making underground movements. This is that same Foulon named Arme d'Amne du Parlement, a man grown grey in treachery, in griping, projecting, intriguing and iniquity, who once, when it was objected to some finance scheme of his, what will the people do, made answer in the fire of discussion, the people may eat grass. Hasty words which fly abroad irrevocable and will send back tidings. Foulon, to the relief of the world, fails on this occasion and will always fail. Nevertheless, it steads not Monsieur de la Moignon. It steads not the doomed man that he have interviews with the king and be seen to return a radieu, emitting rays. La Moignon is the hated of parliaments. Comte de Brienne is brother of the cardinal archbishop. The 24th of August has been, and the 14th of September is not yet, when they too, as their great principle had done, descend, made to fall soft, like him. And now, as if the last burden had been rolled from its heart and assurance were at length perfect, Paris bursts forth anew into extreme jubilee. The Basoche rejoices aloud that the foe of parliaments is fallen. Nobility, gentry, commonality have rejoiced and rejoice. Nay, now, with new emphasis, rascality itself, starting suddenly from its dim depths, will arise and do it, for down even thither the new political evangel, in some rude version or other, has penetrated. It is Monday, the 14th of September, 1788. Rascality assembles anew in great force in the Place Dauphine, lets off petards, fires blunderbusses to an incredible extent without interval for eighteen hours. There is again a wicker figure, mannequin of Osier, the centre of endless howlings. Also Necker's portrait, snatched or purchased from some print shop, is borne processionally aloft on a perch with hazards, an example to be remembered but chiefly on the Pont Neuf, where the great Henri in bronze rides sublime, there do crowds gather. 
All passengers must stop till they have bowed to the people's king and said audibly, Vive Henri IV, au diable la Magnon. No carriage but must stop, not even that of His Highness d'Orléans. Your coach doors are opened. Monsieur will please to put forth his head and bow, or even, if refractory, to alight altogether and kneel. From Madame a wave of her plumes, a smile of her fair face, there where she sits shall suffice. And surely a coin or two to buy fusées were not unreasonable from the upper classes, friends of liberty. In this manner it proceeds for days, in such rude horse play, not without kicks. The city watch can do nothing, hardly save its own skin, for the last twelve months, as we have sometimes seen, it has been a kind of pastime to hunt the watch. Bessonval indeed is at hand with soldiers, but they have orders to avoid firing and are not prompt to stir. On Monday morning, the explosion of petards began, and now it is near midnight of Wednesday, and the wick mannequin is to be buried, apparently in the antique fashion. Long rows of torches following it move towards the Hôtel La Magnon, but a servant of mine, Bessonval's, has run to give warning, and there are soldiers come. Gloomy La Magnon is not to die by conflagration, or this night, nor yet for a year, and then by gunshot. Suicidal or accidental is unknown. Foiled rascality burnt its mannequin of Ozier under his windows, tears up the sentry box and rolls off to try Brienne, to try Dubois, captain of the watch. Now, however, all is bestirring itself. Garde Francaise, Invalide, Horse Patrol, the torch procession is met with sharp shot, with the thrusting of bayonets, the slashing of sabres. Even Dubois makes a charge with that cavalry of his, and the cruelest charge of all, there are a great many killed and wounded. Not without clangour, complaint, subsequent criminal trials, and official persons dying of heartbreak. So, however, with steel besom, rascality is brushed back into its dim depths, and the streets are swept clear. Not for a century and a half had rascality ventured to step forth in this fashion. Not for so long showed its huge, rude lineaments in the light of day. A wonder and a new thing, as yet gambling merely in awkward, brobdignag sport, not without quaintness, hardly in anger. Yet in its huge, half-vacant laugh lurks a shade of grimness, which could unfold itself. However, the thinkers, invited by Lomini, are now far on with their pamphlets. States general, on one plan or another, will infallibly meet, if not in January, as was once hoped, yet at latest in May. Old Duke de Richelieu, moribund in these autumn days, opens his eyes once more, murmuring, What would Louis XIV, whom he remembers, have said? Then closes them again, forever, before the evil time. End of Book 3, Chapter 9《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 4, States General Chapter 1, The Notables Again This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 4, Chapter 1, The Notables Again the universal prayer, therefore, is to be fulfilled. Always in days of national perplexity, when wrong abounded and help was not, this remedy of states-general was called for. By a Malesherbes, nay, by a Fenelon, even parliaments calling for it were escorted with blessings. And now, behold, it is vouchsafed us. States-general shall verily be. To say, let states-general be, was easy. To say in what manner they shall be is not so easy. Since the year of 1614, there have no states general met in France. All trace of them has vanished from the living habits of men. Their structure, powers, methods of procedure, which were never in any measure fixed, have now become wholly a vague possibility. Clay which the potter may shape, this way or that, say rather the twenty-five millions of potters, for so many have now more or less a vote in it. How to shape the states general? There is a problem. Each body corporate, each privileged, each organised class has secret hopes of its own in that matter, and also secret misgivings of its own. 
For, behold, this monstrous twenty-five million class, hitherto the dumb sheep which these others had to agree about the manner of shearing, is now also arising with hopes. It has ceased, or is ceasing, to be dumb. It speaks through pamphlets, or at least brays and growls behind them, in unison, increasingly wonderfully their volume of sound. As for the Parliament of Paris, it has at once declared for the old form of 1614, which form had this advantage that the tiers estate, third estate or commons, figured there as a show mainly, whereas the noblesse and clergy had but to avoid quarrel between themselves and decide unobstructed what they thought best. Such was the clearly declared opinion of the Paris Parliament but being met by a storm of mere hooting and howling from other men, such opinion was blown straightway to the winds, and the popularity of the Parliament along with it, never to return. The Parliament's part, we said above, was as good as played. Concerning which, however, there is this further to be noted, the proximity of dates. It was on the 22nd of September that the Parliament returned from vacation or exile in its estates to be reinstalled amid boundless jubilee from all Paris. Precisely next day it was that this same Parliament came to its clearly declared opinion. And then on the morrow after that you behold it covered with outrages, its outer court one vast sibilation and the glory departed from it for evermore. A popularity of 24 hours was in those times no uncommon allowance. On the other hand, how superfluous was that invitation of Lomenes, the invitation to thinkers. Thinkers and unthinkers, by the million, are spontaneously at their post, doing what is in them. Clubs, Labour, Society, Publicol, Breton Club, Enraged Club, Club des Enragés, Likewise, dinner parties in the Palais Royal, your Mirabeau's Talleyrand dining there in company with Chamfort, Morellet, with Dupont and hot parliamenteers, not without object, for a certain Neckerian lions provider, whom one could name, assembles them there, or even their own private determination to have dinner does it. And then, as to pamphlets, in figurative language, it is a sheer snowing of pamphlets like to snow up the government thoroughfares. Now is the time for friends of freedom, sane and even insane. Count, or self-styled Count d'Intrigue, the young Laguedocian gentleman, with perhaps Chamfort the cynic to help him, rises into furor, almost pithic, highest where many are high foolish young Languedocian gentleman, who himself so soon, emigrating among the foremost, must fly indignant over the marches with the contrast social in his pocket towards outer darkness, thankless intriguing, ignis fatuous hoverings, and death by the stiletto. Abbe Sier has left Chartres Cathedral and canonry and bookshelves there, has let his tonsure grow and come to Paris with a secular head of the most irrefragible sort to ask three questions and answer them. What is the third estate? All. What has it hitherto been in our form of government? Nothing. What does it want? To become something. Dorleon, for to be sure he, on his way to chaos, is in the thick of this, promulgates his deliberations, fathered by him, written by Laclosse of the Liaison Dangereuse, the result of which comes out simply, the third estate is the nation. On the other hand, Monseigneur d'Artois, with other princes of the blood, publishes in solemn memorial to the king that if such things be listened to, privilege, nobility, monarchy, church, state and strongbox are in danger. In danger, truly. And yet, if you do not listen, are they out of danger? It is the voice of all France, this sound that rises. Immeasurable, manifold, as the sound of outbreaking waters. Wise were he who knew what to do in it, if not to fly to the mountains and hide himself. How an ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, sitting there on such principles, in such an environment, would have determined to demean itself at this new juncture, may even yet be a question. 
Such a government would have felt too well that its long task was now drawing to a close, that, under the guise of these states-general, at length inevitable, a new, omnipotent, unknown of democracy was coming into being, in presence of which no Versailles government either could or should, except in a provisory character, continue extant. To an act which provisory character, so unspeakably important, might its whole faculties but have sufficed, and so a peaceable, gradual, well-conducted abdication and domine dimittas have been the issue. This for our ideal, all-seeing Versailles government but for the actual, irrational Versailles government? Alas, that is a government existing there only for its own behoof, without right except possession, and now also without might. It foresees nothing, sees nothing, has not so much as a purpose, but has only purposes, and the instinct whereby all that exists will struggle to keep existing wholly a vortex in which vain counsels, hallucinations, falsehoods, intrigues and imbecilities whirl like withered rubbish in the meeting of winds. The oi de boeuf has its irrational hopes, if also its fears. Since hitherto all states general have done as good as nothing, why should these do more? The commons indeed look dangerous, but on the whole, is not revolt, unknown now for five generations, an impossibility? The three estates can, by management, be set against each other. The third will, as heretofore, join with the king, will, out of mere spite and self-interest, be eager to tax and vex the other two. The other two are thus delivered, bound into our hands, that we may fleece them likewise. Whereupon, money being got and the three estates all in quarrel, dismiss them and let the future go on as it can. As good Archbishop Lomini was wont to say, there are so many accidents and it needs but one to save us. How many to destroy us? Poor Necco, in the midst of such an anarchy, does what is possible for him. He looks into it with obstinately hopeful face, lords the known rectitude of the kingly mind, listens indulgent-like to the known perverseness of the queenly and courtly, emits, if any proclamation or regulation, one favouring the tiers état, but settles nothing, hovering afar off rather, and advising all things to settle themselves. The grand questions for the present have got reduced to two. The double representation and the vote by head. Shall the commons have a double representation, that is to say, have as many members as the noblesse and clergy united? Shall the states general, when once assembled, vote and deliberate in one body, or in three separate bodies, vote by head or vote by class, ordre as they call it? These are the moot points, now filling all France with jargon, logic and eleutheromania. To terminate which Necker bethinks him, might not a second convocation of the notables be fittest? Such second convocation is resolved on. On the 6th of November of this year, 1788, these notables accordingly have reassembled after an interval of some 18 months. They are Cologne's old notables, the same 144, to show one's impartiality, likewise to save time. They sit there once again in their seven bureaus in the hard winter weather. It is the hardest winter since 1709, thermometer below zero of Fahrenheit, Seine River frozen over. Cold, scarcity and eleutheromaniac clamour, a changed world since these notables were organed out in May gone a year. They shall see now whether, under their seven princes of the blood in their seven bureaus, they can settle the moot points. To the surprise of patriotism, these notables, once so patriotic, seem to incline the wrong way, towards the anti-patriotic side. They stagger at the double representation, at the vote by head. There is not affirmative decision. There is mere debating, and that is not with the best aspects. For indeed, were not these notables themselves mostly of the privileged classes? They clamoured once, now they have their misgivings, make their dolorous representations. 
Let them vanish, ineffectual, and return no more. They vanish after a month's session on this 12th of December, year 1788, the last terrestrial notables not to reappear any other time in the history of the world. And so, the clamour still continuing, and the pamphlets and nothing but patriotic addresses louder and louder, pouting in from all corners of France, Necker himself some fortnight after, before the year is yet done, has to present his report, recommending at his own risk that some double representation, nay, almost enjoining it so loud as the jargon and eleutheromania, what dubitating, what circumambulating, these whole six noisy months, for it began with Brienne in July, has not report followed report and one proclamation flown in the teeth of the other? However, that first moot point, as we see, is now settled. As for the second, that of voting by head or by order, it, unfortunately, is still left hanging. It hangs there, we may say, between the privileged orders and the unprivileged as a ready-made battle prize and necessity of war from the very first, which battle prize, whosoever seizes it, may thenceforth bear as battle flag with the best omens. But so, at least, by royal edict of the 24th of January, does it finally, to impatient, expectant France, become not only indubitable that national deputies are to meet, but possible, so far and hardly farther has the royal regulation gone, to begin electing them. End of Book 4, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 4, States General, Chapter 2, The Election. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 2, The Election. Up then and be doing! The royal signal word flies through France as through vast forests the rushing of a mighty wind. At parish churches, in town halls, and every house of convocation, by bailliages, by senechalcies, in whatever form men convene, there, with confusion enough, are primary assemblies forming, to elect your electors, such is the form prescribed, then to draw up your writ of plaints and grievances, cahiers de plaintes et doléances, of which latter there is no lack. With such virtue works this royal January edict as it rolls rapidly in its leathern mails along these frost-bound highways towards all the four winds. Like some fiat or magic spellword which such things do resemble. For always as it sounds out at the market cross accompanied with trumpet blast presided by Bailly Seneschal or other minor functionary with beef-eaters or in country churches is droned forth after sermon or prone de mes parasal and is registered, posted and let fly all over the world you behold how this multitudinous French people so long simmering and buzzing in eager expectancy begins heaping and shaping itself into organic groups which organic groups, again, hold smaller organic grouplets. The inarticulate buzzing becomes articulate speaking and acting. By primary assembly and then by secondary, by successive elections and infinite elaboration and scrutiny according to prescribed process, shall the genuine plaint and grievances be at length got to paper, shall the fit national representative be at length laid hold of. How the whole people shakes itself as if it had one life, and in thousand-voiced rumour announces that it is awake, suddenly out of long death sleep, and will thenceforth sleep no more. The long looked for has come at last. Wondrous news of victory, deliverance, enfranchisement, sounds magical through every heart. To the proud strong man it has come, whose strong hand shall no more be gived, to whom boundless unconquered continents lie disclosed. The weary day drudge has heard of it, the beggar with his crusts moistened in tears. What? To us also has hope reached, down even to us? Hunger and hardship are not to be eternal. 
the bread we extorted from the rugged glebe and with the toil of our sinews reaped and ground and kneaded into loaves was not holy for another then, but we also shall eat of it and be filled? Glorious news, answer the prudent elders, but all too unlikely. Thus, at any rate, may the lower people who pay no money taxes and have no right to vote assiduously crowd round those that do and most halls of assembly, with indoors and without, seem animated enough. Paris alone of towns is to have representatives, the number of them twenty. Paris is divided into sixty districts, each of which, assembled in some church or the like, is choosing two electors. Official deputations pass from district to district, for all is inexperience as yet, and there is endless consulting. The streets swarm strangely with busy crowds, pacific yet restless and loquacious. At intervals is seen the gleam of military muskets, especially about the Palais, where Parliament once more on duty sits querulous, almost tremulous. Busy is the French world. In those great days, what poorest speculative craftsman but will leave his workshop, if not to vote, yet to assist in voting? On all highways is a rustling and bustling, over the wide surface of France, ever and anon through the spring months as the sower casts his corn abroad among the furrows, sounds of congregating and dispersing, of crowds in deliberation, acclamation, voting by ballot and by voice, rise discrepant towards the ear of heaven. To which political phenomena add this economical one, that trade is stagnant and also bread getting dear. For before the rigorous winter there was, as we said, a rigorous summer with drought and on the 13th of July with destructive hail. What a fearful day! All cried while that tempest fell. Alas, the next anniversary of it will be worse. Under such aspect is France electing national representatives. The incidents and specialties of these elections belong not to universal but to local or parish history, for which reason let not the new troubles of Grenoble or Bessanson, the bloodshed on the streets of Rennes and consequent march thither of the Breton young men with manifesto by their mothers, sisters and sweethearts, nor such like, detain us here. It is the same sad history everywhere, with superficial variations. A reinstated Parliament, as at Besançon, which stands astonished at this behemoth of a States-General it had itself evoked, starts forward with more or less audacity to fix a thorn in its nose, and alas is instantaneously struck down and hurled quite out, for the new popular force can use not only arguments but brickbats. Or else, and perhaps combined with this, it is an order of noblesse, as in Brittany, which will beforehand tie up the third estate, that it harm not the old privileges. In which act of tying up, never so skilfully set about, there is likewise no possibility of prospering. But the behemoth Briareus snaps your cords like green rushes. Tie up? Alas, monsieur! And then, as for your chivalry, rapiers, valour and wager of battle, think one moment, how can that answer? The plebeian heart too has read life in it, which changes not to paleness at glance even of you. And the six hundred Breton gentlemen assembled in arms for seventy-two hours in the Cordelia's cloister at Rennes have to come out again, wiser than they entered. For the Nant youth, the Angers youth, all Brittany was astir. Mothers, sisters and sweethearts shrieking after the march. The Breton noblesse must even let the mad world have its way. In other provinces, the noblesse, with equal goodwill, finds it better to stick to protests, to well-redacted cahier of grievances and satirical writings and speeches. Such is partially their course in Provence, whither indeed Gabriel Honoré Riquetti, Comte de Mirabeau, has rushed down from Paris to speak a word in season. In Provence, the privileged, backed by their A Parliament, discover that such novelties, enjoined though they be by royal edict, tend to national detriment, and what is still more indisputable, to impair the dignity of the noblesse. Whereupon Mirabeau, protesting aloud, this same noblesse, amid huge tumult, within doors and without, flatly determines to expel him from their assembly. 
No other method, not even that of successive duels, would answer with him, the obstreperous, fierce, glaring man, expelled he accordingly is. In all countries, at all times, exclaims he, departing, the aristocrats have implacably pursued every friend of the people, and with tenfold implacability, if such a one were himself born of the aristocracy. It was thus that the last of the Gracchi perished by the hands of the patricians, but he, being struck with the mortal stab, flung dust towards heaven, and called on the avenging deities, and from this dust there was born Marius, Marius not so illustrious for exterminating the Cimbri as for over overturning in Rome the tyranny of the nobles. Casting up which new curious handful of dust through the printing press to breed what it can and may, Mirabeau stalks forth into the third estate. That he now, to ingratiate himself with this third estate, opened a cloth shop in Marseille, and for moments became a furnishing tailor, or even the fable that he did so, is to us always among the pleasant memorabilities of this era. Stranger Clothier never wielded the L wand and rent webs for men or fractional parts of men. The fils adoptif is indignant at such disparaging fable, which nevertheless was widely believed in those days. But indeed, of Achilles in the heroic aged killed mutton, why should not Mirabeau in the unheroic ones measure broadcloth? More authentic are his triumph progresses through that disturbed district, with mob jubilee, flaming torches, windows hired for two louis, and voluntary guard of a hundred men. He is deputy-elect both of A and of Marseille, but will prefer A. He has opened his far-sounding voice, the depths of his far-sounding soul. He can quell, such virtue is in a spoken word, the pride tumults of the rich, the hunger tumults of the poor, and wild multitudes move under him as under the moon do billows of the sea. He has become a world compeller and ruler over men. One other incident and specialty we note, with how different an interest... It is of the Parliament of Paris, which starts forward, like the others, only with less audacity, seeing better how it lay, to nose-ring that behemoth of a states-general. Worthy Dr. Guillotin, respectable practitioner in Paris, has drawn up his little plan of a carrière of doliences, as had he not, having the wish and gift, the clearest liberty to do. He is getting the people to sign it, whereupon the surly Parliament summons him to give an account of himself. He goes, but with all Paris at his heels, which floods the outer courts and copiously signs the cahier even there, while the doctor is giving account of himself within. The Parliament cannot too soon dismiss Guillotin with compliments to be borne home shoulder high. This respectable Guillotin we hope to behold once more, and perhaps only once. The Parliament not even once, but let it be engulfed unseen by us. Meanwhile, such things, cheering as they are, tend little to cheer the national creditor, or indeed the creditor of any kind. In the midst of universal, portentous doubt, what certainty can seem so certain as money in the purse and the wisdom of keeping it there? Trading, speculation, commerce of all kinds has as far as possible come to a dead pause, and the hand of the industrious lies idle in his bosom. Frightful enough when now the rigour of seasons has also done its part, and to scarcity of work is added scarcity of food. In the opening spring there come rumours of forestalment, there come king's edicts, petitions of bakers against millers, and at length in the month of April, troops of ragged lackals and fierce cries of starvation. These are the thrice-famed brigands, an actual existing quotity of persons who long reflected and reverberated through so many millions of heads as in concave multiplying mirrors become a whole brigand world and like a kind of supernatural machinery wondrously move the epos of the revolution. The brigands are here, the brigands are there, the brigands are coming. Not otherwise sounded the clang of Phoebus, Apollo's silver bow, scattering pestilence and pale terror, for this clang too was of the imagination, preternatural, 
and it too walked in formless immiserability, having made itself alike to the night, nick dicos. But remark at least, for the first time, the singular empire of suspicion in those lands, in those days. If poor famishing men shall, prior to death, gather in groups and crowds, as the poor field fairs and plovers do in bitter weather, were it but that they may chirp mournfully together, and misery look in the eyes of misery. If famishing men, what famishing field fairs cannot do, should discover, once congregated, that they need not die while food is in the land, since they are many, and with empty wallets have right hands, in all this what need were there of preternatural machinery? To most people, none. But not to French people in a time of revolution. These brigands, as Turgos also were, fourteen years ago, have all been set on, enlisted, though without tuck of drum, by aristocrats, by democrats, by d'Orléans, d'Artois, and enemies of the public wheel. Nay, historians to this day will prove it by one argument. These brigands, pretending to have no victual, nevertheless contrive to drink, nay, have been seen drunk, an unexampled fact. But on the whole, may we not predict that a people with such a width of credulity and of incredulity, the proper union of which makes suspicion and indeed unreason generally, will see shapes enough of immortals fighting in its battle ranks and never want for epical machinery? Be this as it may, the brigands are clearly got to Paris in considerable multitudes, with sallow faces, lank hair, the true enthusiast complexion, with sooty rags and also with large clubs, which they smite angrily against the pavement. These mingle in the election tumult, would fain sign guillotines cahier, or any cahier or petition whatsoever could they but write. Their enthusiast complexion, the smiting of their sticks, bodes little good to any one, least of all to rich master manufacturers of the suburb Saint-Antoine, with whose workmen they can sort. End of Book 4, Chapter 2《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 4, States General, Chapter 3, Grown Electric. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 3, Grown Electric. But now also national deputies from all ends of France are in Paris with their commissions, what they call pouvoirs or powers, in their pockets, inquiring, consulting, looking out for lodgings at Versailles. The States General shall open there, if not on the 1st, then surely on the 4th of May, in grand procession and gala. The Salle de Manu is all new carpentered, bedizened for them. Their very costume has been fixed, a grand controversy which there was as to slouch hats or slouched hats for the common deputies has got as good as adjusted. Ever new strangers arrive, loungers, miscellaneous persons, officers on furlough, as the worthy Captain Damp Martin, whom we hope to be acquainted with. These also from all regions have repaired hither to see what is toward. Our Paris committees of the sixty districts are busier than ever. It is now too clear the Paris elections will be late. On Monday, the 27th of April, astronomer Bailly notices that the Sieur Revillon is not at his post. The Sieur Revillon, extensive paper manufacturer of the Rue Saint-Antoine, he, commonly so punctual, is absent from the electoral committee and even will never reappear there. In those immense magazines of velvet paper has aught befallen? Alas, yes. Alas, it is no more golfier rising there today, but drudgery, rascality, and the suburb that is rising. Was the Sir Réveillon himself once a journeyman, heard to say that a journeyman might live handsomely on fifteen sous a day? Some sevenpence halfpenny, tis a slender sum. Or was he only thought and believed to be heard saying it? By this long chafing and friction, it would appear the national temper has grown electric. Down in those dark dens, in those dark heads and hungry hearts, who knows in what strange figure the new political evangel may have shaped itself? 
what miraculous communion of drudges may be getting formed. Enough grim individuals soon waxing to grim multitudes and other multitudes crowding to see beset that paper warehouse, demonstrate in loud, ungrammatical language addressed to the passions too the insufficiency of sevenpence halfpenny a day. The city watch cannot dissipate them. Broils arise and bellowings. Réveillon at his wit's end entreats the populace, entreats the authorities. Bessonval, now in active command, commandant of Paris, does towards evening to Réveillon's earnest prayer send some thirty garde Françaises. These clear the street, happily without firing, and take post there for the night in hope that it may be all over. Not so. On the morrow it is far worse. Saint-Antoine has arisen anew grimmer than ever, reinforced by the unknown tattered Amalian figures with their enthusiast complexion and large sticks. The city through all streets is flowing thitherward to see two cartloads of paving stones that happen to pass that way have been seized as a visible godsend. Another detachment of Garde Francaise must be sent, Bessonval and the colonel taking earnest counsel. Then still another. They, hardly with bayonets and menace of bullets, penetrate to the spot. What a sight! A street choked up with lumber, tumult and the endless press of men. A paper warehouse eviscerated by axe and fire. Mad din of revolt. Musket volleys responded to by yells, by miscellaneous missiles, by tiles raining from roof and windows, tiles, execrations and slain men. The Garde Francaise like it not, but have to persevere. All day it continues, slackening and rallying. The sun is sinking, and Saint Antoine has not yielded. The city flies hither and thither. Alas, the sound of that musket volleying booms into the far dining rooms of the Chaussee d'Antin, alters the tone of the dinner gossip there. Captain Damp Martin leaves his wine, goes out with a friend or two to see the fighting. Unwashed men growl on him with murders of Abale's aristocrats, down with the aristocrats, and insult the cross of St. Louis. They elbow him and hustle him, but do not pick his pocket, as indeed at Réveillon's too there was not the slightest stealing. At fall of night, as the thing will not end, Bessonval takes his resolution, orders out the guard Suisse with two pieces of artillery. The Swiss guard shall proceed thither, summon that rabble to depart in the king's name. If disobeyed, they shall load their artillery with grape-shot, visibly to the general eye, shall again summon. If again disobeyed, fire, and keep firing, till the last man be in this manner blasted off and the street clear. With which spirited resolution, as might have been hoped, the business is got ended. At sight of the lit matches of the foreign red-coated Switzers, Saint Antoine dissipates hastily in the shades of dusk. There is an encumbered street. There are from four to five hundred dead men. Unfortunate Réveillon has found shelter in the Bastille. Does therefrom, safe behind stone bulwarks, issue plaint, protestation, explanation for the next month? Bold Bessonval has thanks from all the respectable Parisian classes, but finds no special notice taken of him at Versailles, a thing the man of true worth is used to. But how it originated, this fierce electric sputter and explosion? From Dorléans, cry the court party, he with his gold enlisted these brigands, surely in some surprising manner without sound of drum, he raked them in hither from all corners to ferment and take fire, evil is his good. From the court, cries enlightened patriotism, it is the cursed golden wiles of aristocrats that enlisted them, set them upon ruining an innocent sieur Réveillon to frighten the faint and disgust men with the career of freedom. Bessonval, with reluctance, concludes that it came from the English, our natural enemies. Or, alas, might not one rather attribute it to Diana in the shape of hunger, to some twin Dioscuri, oppression and revenge so often seen in the battles of men. 
poor lackles, all betoiled, besoiled, encrusted into dim defacement, into whom, nevertheless, the breath of the Almighty has breathed a living soul. To them it is clear only that eleutheromaniac philosophism has yet baked no bread, that patriotic committee men will level down to their own level and no lower. Brigands, or whatever they might be, it was bitter earnest with them. They bury their dead with the title of Défenseur de la Patrie, Martyrs of the Good Cause. Or, shall we say, insurrection has now served its apprenticeship, and this was its proof stroke, and no inconclusive one. Its next will be a master stroke, announcing indisputable mastership to a whole astonished world. Let that rock fortress, tyranny's stronghold, which they name Bastille, or building, as if there were no other building, look to its guns. But in such wise, with primary and secondary assemblies and carrier of grievances, with motions, congregations of all kind, with much thunder of froth eloquence, and at last with thunder of platoon musketry, does agitated France accomplish its elections. With confused winnowing and sifting in this rather tumultuous manner, it has now, all except some remnants of Paris, sifted out the true wheat grains of national deputies, 1,214 in number, and will forthwith open its States General. End of Book 4, Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Four, States General, Chapter Four: The Procession. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Four, Chapter Four, The Procession. On the first Saturday of May, it is gala at Versailles, and Monday, fourth of the month, is to be a still greater day. The deputies have mostly got thither and sought out lodgings, and are now successively, in long, well-ushered files, kissing the hand of majesty in the chateau. Supreme Usher de Brise does not give the highest satisfaction. We cannot but observe that in ushering noblesse or clergy into the anointed presence, he liberally opens both his folding doors, and on the other hand, for members of the third estate, opens only one. However, there is room to enter. Majesty has smiles for all. The good Louis welcomes his honourable members with smiles of hope. He has prepared for them the whole of menus, the largest near him, and often surveyed the workmen as they went on. A spacious hall, with raised platform for throne, court and blood royal, space for six hundred commons deputies in front, for half as many clergy on this hand and half as many noblesse on that. It has lofty galleries, wherefrom dames of honour, splendid in gaze door, foreign diplomacies and other gilt-edged, white-frilled individuals to the number of two thousand may sit and look. Broad passages flow through it, and outside the inner wall, all round it. There are committee rooms, guard rooms, robing rooms, really a noble hall, where upholstery aided by the subject fine arts has done its best, and crimson tasselled cloths and emblematic fleur-de-lis are not wanting. The hall is ready, the very costume, as we said, has been settled, and the commons are not to wear the hated slouch hat, chapeau clabeau, but one not quite so slouched, chapeau rabatou. As for their manner of working, when all dressed, for their voting by head or by order and the rest, this, which it were perhaps still time to settle, and in few hours will be no longer time, remains unsettled, hangs dubious in the breast of twelve hundred men. But now, finally, the sun, on Monday the 4th of May, has risen, unconcerned as if it were no special day. And yet, as his first rays could strike music from the Memnon statue on the Nile, what tones were there, so thrilling, tremulous of preparation and foreboding, which he awoke in every bosom at Versailles? Huge Paris, in all conceivable and inconceivable vehicles, is pouring itself forth. From each town and village come subsidiary rills. Versailles is a very sea of men. But above all, from the Church of St. Louis to the Church of Notre Dame, one vast suspended billow of life, 
with spray scattered even to the chimney pots. For on chimney tops too, as over the roofs, and up thitherwards on every lamp iron signpost, breakneck coin of vantage, sits patriotic courage, and every window bursts with patriotic beauty, for the deputies are gathering at St. Louis Church to march in procession to Notre Dame and hear sermon. Yes, friends, ye may sit and look, boldly or in thought, all France and all Europe may sit and look, for it is a day like few others. Oh, one might weep like Xerxes, so many serried rows sit perched there like winged creatures, alighted out of heaven. All these and so many more that follow them shall have wholly fled aloft again, vanishing into the blue deep, and the memory of this day still be fresh. It is the baptism day of democracy. Sick time has given it birth, the numbered months being run. The extreme unction day of feudalism. A superannuated system of society, decrepit with toils, for has it not done much, produced you and what ye have and know, and with thefts and brawls named glorious victories, and with profligacy, sensualities, and on the whole with dotage and senility, is now to die. And so, with death throes and birth throes, a new one is to be born. What a work, O oh earth and heavens, what a work! Battles and bloodshed, September massacres, bridges of Lodi, retreats of Moscow, Waterloo's, Peterloo's, ten-pound franchises, tar-barrels and guillotines. And from this present date, if one might prophesy, two centuries of it still to fight. Two centuries, hardly less, before democracy go through its due most baleful stages of quackocracy and pestilential world be burnt up and have begun to grow green and young again. Rejoice, nevertheless, ye Versailles multitudes, to you from whom all this is hid, and glorious end of it is visible. This day sentence of death is pronounced on shams. Judgment of resuscitation, were it but far off, is pronounced on realities. This day it is declared aloud, as with a doom trumpet, that a lie is unbelievable. Believe that, stand by that, if more there be not, and let what thing or things soever will follow it follow. Ye can no other, God be your help. So spake a greater than any of you, opening his chapter of world history. Behold, however, the doors of St. Louis Church flung wide, and the procession of processions advancing towards Notre Dame. Shouts rend the air, one shout at which Grecian birds might drop dead. It is indeed a stately, solemn sight. The elected of France, and then the court of France. They are marshalled and marched there, all in prescribed place and costume. Our commons in plain black mantle and white cravat. Noblesse in gold-worked, bright-dyed cloaks of velvet, resplendent, rustling with laces, waving with plumes. The clergy and roche alb and other best pontificalibus. Lastly comes the king himself and king's household, also in their brightest blaze of pomp, their brightest and final. One. Some fourteen hundred men, blown together from all winds, on the deepest errand. Yes, in that silent marching mass there lies futurity enough. No symbolic ark like the old Hebrews do these men bear, yet with them too is a covenant. They too preside at a new era in the history of men. The whole future is there, and destiny dim brooding over it. In the hearts and unshaped thoughts of these men, it lies illegible, inevitable. Singular to think, they have it in them. Yet not they, not mortal, only the eye above can read it, as it shall unfold itself in fire and thunder of siege and field artillery, in the rustling of battle banners, the tramp of hosts, in the glow of burning cities, the shriek of strangled nations. Such things lie hidden, safe wrapped in this fourth day of May. Say rather, had lain in some other unknown day, of which this latter is the public fruit and outcome. And indeed, what wonders lie in every day, had we the sight, as happily we have not, to decipher it? For is not every meanest day the conflux of two eternities? 
Meanwhile, suppose we too, good reader, should, as now, without miracle, muse Clio enables us, take our station also on some coin of vantage, and glance momentarily over this procession and this life sea with far other eyes than the rest do, namely with prophetic. We can mount and stand there without fear of falling. As for the life sea, or onlooking unnumbered multitude, it is unfortunately all too dim. Yet, as we gaze fixedly, do not nameless figures, not a few, which shall not always be nameless, disclose themselves, visible or presumable there? Young Baroness de Stael, she evidently looks from a window among older honourable women. Her father is minister and one of the gala personages, to his own eyes the chief one. Young spiritual Amazon, thy rest is not there, nor thy loved father's. As Malebranche saw all things in God, so Monsieur Necker sees all things in Necker, a theorem that will not hold. But where is the brown-locked, light-behaved, fire-hearted Demoiselle Terragne? Brown, eloquent beauty, who, with thy winged words and glances, shalt thrill rough bosoms, hold steel battalions, and persuade an Austrian kaiser, pike and helm lie provided for thee in due season, and, alas, also straight waistcoat and long lodging in the Salpetriere. Best hadst thou stayed in native Luxembourg and been the mother of some brave man's children, but it was not thy task, it was not thy lot. Of the rougher sex, how, without tongue or hundred tongues of iron, enumerate the notabilities? Has not Marquis Valladi hastily quitted his Quaker broad rim, his Pythagorean Greek in Wapping in the city of Glasgow? De Morand from his Courier de l'Europe, Lingue from his Annals, they looked eager through the London fog and became ex-editors, that they might feed the guillotine and have their due. Does Louvet of Faublas stand a tiptoe? And Brissot, Height de Wauville, friend of the blacks? He, with the Marquis Condorcet and Clavier the Genovese, have created the Moniteur newspaper, or are about creating it. Able editors must give account of such a day. Or seest thou with any distinctness, low down probably, not in place of honour, a Stanislas Maillard, riding tipstaff, Huissard oui, Cheval, of the Châtelet, one of the shiftiest of men? A Captain Ulin of Geneva, Captain Ailey of the Queen's Regiment, both with an air of half-pay. Jourdain with tile-coloured whiskers, not yet with tile beard, an unjust dealer in mules. He shall be, in a few months, Jourdain the headsman, and have other work. Surely also in some place not of honour stands or sprawls up querulous that he too, though short may see, one squalidest bleared mortal, redolent of soot and horse drugs, Jean-Paul Marat of Neuchâtel. O oh, Marat, renovator of human science, lecturer on optics, O oh, thou remarkablest horse-leech, once in d'Artois stable, as thy bleared soul looks forth through thy bleared, dull, acrid, woe-stricken face, what sees it in all this? Any faintest light of hope, like day-spring after no resembler night? Or is it but blue sulphur-light and spectres, woe, suspicion, revenge without end? Of Draper Lacointre, how he shut his cloth shop hard by and stepped forth, one need hardly speak. Nor of saint the sonorous brewer from the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. Two other figures, and only two, we signalise there. The huge brawny figure, through whose black brows and rude flattened face, figure écrasé, there looks a waste energy as of Hercules not yet furibond. He is an Assyrian unprovided advocate, Danton by name, him, Mark. Then that other, his slight-built comrade and craft brother, he with the long curling locks, with the face of dingy blackguardism, wondrously irradiated with genius, as if a naphtha lamp burnt within it, that figure is Camille des Moulins, a figure of infinite shrewdness, wit, nay, humour, one of the sprightliest, clearest souls in all these millions. Thou poor Camille, say of thee what they may, it were but falsehood to pretend one did not almost love thee, thou headlong, lightly sparkling man. 
But the brawny, not yet furibund figure, we say, is Jacques Danton, a name that shall be tolerably known in the revolution. He is president of the Electoral Cordeliers district at Paris, or about to be it, and shall open his lungs of brass. We dwell no longer on the mixed shouting multitude, for now, behold, the commons deputies are at hand. Which of these six hundred individuals in plain white cravat that have come up to regenerate France might one guess would become their king? For a king or leader they, as all bodies of men, must have, be their work what it may, there is one man there who, by character, faculty, position, is fittest of all to do it. That man, as future, not yet elected king, walks there among the rest. He with the thick black locks, will it be? With the hure, as himself calls it, or black boar's head, fit to be shaken as a senatorial portent, through whose shaggy beetle brows and rough-hewn seamed carbuncle face there look natural ugliness, smallpox, incontinence, bankruptcy, and burning fire of genius, like comet fire glaring fuliginous through murkiest confusions. It is Gabriel Honore Ricchetti de Mirabeau, the world compeller, man-ruling deputy of I. According to the Baroness de Stael, he steps proudly along, though looked at askance here, and shakes his black chevalier or lion's mane, as if prophetic of great deeds. Yes, reader, that is the type, Frenchman of this epoch, as Voltaire was of the last. He is French in his aspirations, acquisitions, in his virtues, in his vices perhaps more French than any other man, and intrinsically such a mass of manhood too. Mark him well. The National Assembly were all different without that one. Nay, he might say with the old despot, the National Assembly, I am that. Of a southern climate of wild southern blood, for the Rechettis or Arreghettis had to fly from Florence and the Guelphs long centuries ago and settled in Provence, where from generation to generation they have ever approved themselves a peculiar kindred, irascible, indomitable, sharp-cutting, true like the steel they wore, of an intensity and activity that sometimes verged towards madness, yet did not reach it. One ancient Ricchetti, in mad fulfilment of a mad vow, chains two mountains together, and the chain, with its iron star of five rays, is still to be seen. May not a modern Ricchetti unchain so much and set it drifting, which also shall be seen? Destiny has work for that swart, burly-headed Mirabeau. Destiny has watched over him, prepared him from afar. Did not his grandfather, stout Col d'Argent, silver stock, so they named him, shattered and slashed by seven and twenty wounds in one fell day, lie sunk together on the bridge at Cassano, while Prince Eugene's cavalry galloped and regalloped over him? Only the flying sergeant had thrown a camp kettle over that loved head, and Vendôme, dropping his spyglass, moaned out, Mirabeau is dead then. Nevertheless, he was not dead. He awoke to breathe, and miraculous surgery, for Gabriel was yet to be. With his silver stock he kept his scarred head erect through long years, and wedded and produced tuft Marquis Victor, the friend of men, whereby at last in the appointed year 1749 this long-expected rough-hewn Gabriel Honore did likewise see the light, roughest lion's whelp ever littered of that rough breed. How the old lion, for our old Marquis too, was lion-like, most unconquerable, kingly genial, most perverse, gazed wonderingly on his offspring and determined to train him as no lion had yet been. It is in vain, O Marquis, this cub, though thou slay him and flay him, will not learn to draw in dog-cart of political economy and be a friend of man. He will not be thou, must and will be himself another than thou. Divorce lawsuits, whole family save one in prison, and three score lettres de cachet for thy own sole use do but astonish the world. Our luckless Gabriel, sinned against and sinning, has been in the Isle of Ré and heard the Atlantic from his tower, in the Castle Livif and heard the Mediterranean at Marseille. 
He has been in the fortress of Jou and forty-two months with hardly clothing on his back in the dungeon of Vincennes, all by letter de cachet from his lion father. He has been in Pontalia jails, self-constituted prisoner, was noticed fording estuaries of the sea at low water in flight from the face of men. He has pleaded before a parliaments to get back his wife, the public gathering on roofs to see, since they could not hear, the clatter teeth, clack dent, snarled singular old Mirabeau, discerning in such admired forensic eloquence nothing but two clattering jawbones and a head vacant sonorous of the drum species. But as for Gabriel Honore, in these strange wayfarings, what has he not seen and tried? From drill sergeants to prime ministers to foreign and domestic booksellers, all manner of men he has seen, all manner of men he has gained, for at bottom it is a social, loving heart, that wild, unconquerable one, more especially all manner of women. From the archer's daughter at Saint to that fair young Sophie, Madame Monnier, whom he could not but steal and be beheaded for in effigy. For indeed, hardly since the Arabian prophet lay dead to Ali's admiration was there seen such a love hero with the strength of thirty men. In war, again, he has helped to conquer Corsica, fought duels, irregular brawls, horse-whipped calumnious barons. In literature, he has written on despotism, on lettres de cachet, erotic, sapphic, westerian, obscenities, profanities, books on the Prussian monarchy, on Cagliostro, on Cologne, on the water companies of Paris, each book comparable, we will say, to a bituminous alarum fire, huge, smoky, sudden. The firepan, the kindling, the bitumen were his own, but the lumber of rags, old wood and nameless combustible rubbish, for all is fuel to him, was gathered from huckster and ass panniers of every description under heaven. Whereby, indeed, hucksters enough have been heard to exclaim, Out upon it, the fire is mine! Nay, consider it more generally, seldom had man such a talent for borrowing. The idea, the faculty of another man, he can make his. The man himself, he can make his. All reflex and echo, tout de reflet et cerevèbre, snarls old Mirabeau, who can see but will not. Crabbed old friend of men, it is his sociality, his aggregative nature, and will now be the quality of all for him. In that forty years' struggle against despotism, he has gained the glorious faculty of self-help, and yet not lost the glorious natural gift of fellowship, of being helped. Rare union. This man can live self-sufficing, yet lives also in the life of other men, can make men love him, work with him. A born king of men. But consider further how, as the old Marquis still snarls, he has made away with, you may, swallowed all formulas, a fact which, if we meditate it, will in these days mean much. This is no man of system, then. He is only a man of instincts and insights. A man, nevertheless, who will glare fiercely on any object and see through it and conquer it, for he has intellect, he has will, force beyond other men. A man not with logic spectacles, but with an eye. Unhappily, without decalogue, moral code, or theorem of any fixed sort, yet not without a strong living soul in him, and sincerity there, a reality, not an artificiality, not a sham. And so he, having struggled forty years against despotism and made away with all formulas, shall now become the spokesman of a nation bent to do the same. For is it not precisely the struggle of France also to cast off despotism, to make away with her old formulas, having found them naught worn out far from the reality? She will make away with such formulae, and even go bare if need be, till she have found new ones. Toward such work, in such manner, marches he, this singular Ricchetti Mirabeau, in fiery rough figure with black Samson locks under the slouch hat, he steps along there. A fiery, fuliginous mass which could not be choked and smothered, but would fill all France with smoke. And now it has got air, it will burn its whole substance, its whole smoke atmosphere too, and fill all France with flame. Strange lot, 
Fought tears of that smouldering with foul fire damp and vapour enough, then victory over that, and like a burning mountain he blazes heaven high, and for twenty three resplendent months pours out in flame and molten fire torrents all that is in him, the pharos and wonder sign of an amazed Europe, and then lies hollow, cold for ever. Pass on, thou questionable Gabriel Honore, the greatest of them all, in the whole national deputies, in the whole nation, there is none like and none second to thee. But now, if Mirabeau is the greatest, who of these six hundred may be the meanest? Shall we say that anxious, slight, ineffectual-looking man, under thirty, in spectacles, his eyes were the glasses off, troubled, careful, with upturned face, snuffling dimly the uncertain future time, complexion of a multiplex atrabilia colour, the final shade of which may be the pale sea-green? That greenish-coloured, verdatra individual is an advocate of ours. His name is Maximilien Robespierre. The son of an advocate, his father founded mason lodges under Charles Edward, the English prince or pretender. Maximilian, the firstborn, was thriftily educated. He had brisk Camille de Moulin for schoolmate in the College of Louis le Grand at Paris. But he begged our famed necklace cardinal Rohan, the patron, to let him depart thence and resign in favour of a younger brother. The strict-minded Max departed, home to paternal Arras, and even had a law case there and pleaded, not unsuccessfully, in favour of the first Franklin Thunderrod. With a strict, painful mind, an understanding small but clear and ready, he grew in favour with official persons who could foresee in him an excellent man of business, happily quite free from genius. The bishop, therefore, taking counsel, appoints him judge of his diocese, and he faithfully does justice to the people, till, behold, one day a culprit comes whose crime merits hanging, and the strict-mindest Max must abdicate, for his conscience will not permit the dooming of any son of Adam to die. A strict-minded, straight-laced man, a man unfit for revolutions, whose small soul, transparent, wholesome, looking as small ale, could by no chance ferment into virulent alligar, the mother of ever new alligar, till all France were grown acetous virulent, we shall see. Between which two extremes of grandest and meanest, so many grand and mean roll on towards their several destinies in that procession. There is Cazales, the learned young soldier, who shall become the eloquent orator of royalism and earn the shadow of a name. Experienced Mounier, experienced Malouet, whose presidential parliamentary experience the stream of things shall soon leave stranded. A Petion has left his gown and briefs at Chartres for a stormier sort of pleading, has not forgotten his violin, being fond of music. His hair is grizzled, though he is still young, Convictions, beliefs, placid, unalterable, are in that man, not hindmost of them, belief in himself. A Protestant clerical, Rabo Saint Etienne, a slender, young, eloquent, and vehement Barnave, will help to regenerate France. There are so many of them young. Till thirty the Spartans did not suffer a man to marry, but how many men here, under thirty? Coming to produce not one sufficient citizen, but a nation and a world of such the old to heal up rents, the young to remove rubbish, which latter, is it not indeed, the task here? Dim, formless from this distance, yet authentically there, thou noticedest the deputies from Nantes? To us mere clothes screens with slouch hat and cloak, but bearing in their pocket a cahier of doliances with this singular clause and much such in it, that the master wigmakers of Nantes be not troubled with new guild brethren, the actually existing number of ninety-two being more than sufficient. The Wren people have elected Farmer Gerard, a man of natural sense and rectitude without any learning. He walks there with solid step, unique in his rustic farmer clothes, which he will wear always, careless of short cloaks and costumes. The name Gerard, or Père Gerard, Father Gerard, as they please to call him, will fly far, borne about in endless banter, 
in royalist satires, in republican didactic almanacs. As for the man, Gerard, being asked once what he did after trial of it, candidly think of this parliamentary work, I think, answered he, that there are a good many scoundrels among us. So walks Father Gerard, solid in his thick shoes, whithersoever bound. And worthy Dr. Guillotine, whom we hope to behold one other time? If not here, the doctor should be here, and we see him with the eye of prophecy, for indeed the Parisian deputies are all a little late. Singular Guillotine, respectable practitioner, doomed by a satiric destiny to the strangest immortal glory that ever kept obscure mortal from his resting place, the bosom of oblivion. Guillotine can improve the ventilation of the hall, in all cases of medical police and hygiene be a present aid, but greater far he can produce his report on the penal code and reveal therein a cunningly devised beheading machine which shall become famous and world famous. This is the product of Guillotine's endeavours gained not without meditation and reading, which product popular gravity or levity christens by a feminine derivative name, as if it were his daughter, La Guillotine. With my machine, messieurs, I whisk off your head, vous fais sauter la tête, in a twinkling, and you have no pain, whereat they all laugh. Unfortunate doctor, for two and twenty years he, unguillotine, shall hear nothing but guillotine, see nothing but guillotine, then dying shall through long centuries wander, as it were, a disconsolate ghost on the wrong side of Styx and Leith, his name like to outlive Caesar's. See Bailly, likewise of Paris, time-honoured historian of astronomy ancient and modern, Poor Bailly, how thy serenely beautiful philosophizing with its soft moonshiny clearness and thinness ends in foul thick confusion of presidency, mayorship, diplomatic officiality, rabid triviality and the throat of everlasting darkness. Far was it to descend from the heavenly galaxy to the drapeau rouge, beside that fatal dung heap on that last hell day thou must tremble, though only with cold. De foire. Speculation is not practice. To be weak is not so miserable, but to be weaker than our task. Woe the day when they mounted thee, a peaceable pedestrian, on that wild hippogriff of a democracy, which, spurning the firm earth, nay, lashing at the very stars, no yet known Astolfo could have ridden. In the common deputies there are merchants, artists, men of letters, 374 lawyers, and at least one clergyman, the Abbe Sier. Him also Paris sends among its twenty. Behold him, the light, thin man, cold but elastic, wiry, instinct with the pride of logic, passionless, or with but one passion, that of self-conceit. If indeed that can be called a passion, which in its independent, concentrated greatness seems to have soared into transcendentalism, and to sit there with a kind of godlike indifference and look down on passion. He is the man, and wisdom shall die with him. This is the Sierra who shall be system builder, constitution builder general, and build constitutions as many as wanted, sky high, which shall all unfortunately fall before he get the scaffolding away. La politique, he said to Dumont, polity is a science I think I have completed, achevé. What things, O C.A., with thy clear, assiduous eyes, art thou to see? But were it not curious to know how C.A., now in these days, for he is said to be still alive, looks out on all that constitution masonry through the roomy soberness of extreme age, might we hope, still with the old irrefragible transcendentalism? The victorious cause pleased the gods, the vanquished one pleased Sies, Victor Catoni. Thus, however, amid sky-rending vivats and blessings from every heart, has the procession of the commons deputies rolled by. Next follow the noblesse, and next the clergy, concerning both of whom it might be asked what they specially have come for. 
especially, little as they dream of it, to answer this question, put in a voice of thunder, What are you doing in God's fair earth and task garden, where whosoever is not working is begging or stealing? Woe, woe to themselves and to all, if they can only answer, Collecting tithes, preserving game. Remark, meanwhile, how Dorleon affects to step before his own order and mingle with the commons. For him are vivats, few for the rest, though all wave in plumed hats of a feudal cut and have sword on thigh, though among them is Dantraig, the young Languedocian gentleman, and indeed many appear more or less noteworthy. There are Lianco and La Rochefoucauld, the liberal Anglomaniac dukes. There is a filially pious Lally, a couple of liberal Lameths. Above all, there is Lafayette, whose name shall be Cromwell Grandison, and fill the world. Many a formula has this Lafayette too made away with, yet not all formulas. He sticks by the Washington formula, and by that will he stick, and hang for it, as by sure bower anchor hangs and swings the tight warship, which, after all changes of wildest weather and water, is still found hanging. Happy for him, be it glorious or not. Alone of all Frenchmen, he has a theory of the world and right mind to conform thereto. He can become a hero and perfect character were it but the hero of one idea. Note further our old parliamentary friend Christum Catiline d'Espremenil. He is returned from the Mediterranean islands, a red-hot royalist, repentant to the finger-ends, unsettled-looking, whose light, dusky glowing, at best, now flickers foul in the socket, whom the National Assembly will by and by, to save time, regard as in a state of distraction. Note lastly that globular younger Mirabeau, indignant that his elder brother is among the commons. It is Vicomte Mirabeau, named often a Mirabeau Tonno, barrel Mirabeau, on account of his rotundity and the quantities of strong liquor he contains. There then walks our French noblesse, all in the old pomp of chivalry, and yet, alas, how changed from the old position, drifted far down from their native latitude, like arctic icebergs got into the equatorial sea and fast thawing there. Once these chivalry dukes, dukes, as they are still named, did actually lead the world, were it only towards battle spoil, where lay the world's best wages then, Moreover, being the ablest leaders going, they had their lion's share, those deuce, which none could grudge them. But now, when so many looms, improved ploughshares, steam engines and bills of exchange have been invented, and for battle brawling itself men hired drill sergeants at eighteen pence a day, what mean these gold mantle chivalry figures walking there in black velvet cloaks, in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, reeds shaken in the wind? The clergy have got up with Kair for abolishing pluralities, enforcing residence of bishops, better payment of tithes. The dignitaries, we can observe, walk stately, apart from the numerous undignified, who indeed are properly little other than commons disguised in curate frocks. Here, however, though by strange ways, shall the precept be fulfilled, and they that are greatest, much to their astonishment, become least. For one example, out of many, mark that plausible Gregoire. One day Curé Gregoire shall be a bishop, when the now stately are wandering distracted as bishops in partibus. With other thought, mark also the Abbé Mori, his broad, bold face, mouth accurately primmed, full eyes that ray out intelligence, falsehood, the sort of sophistry which is astonished you should find it sophistical skilfullest vamper up of old rotten leather to make it look like new always a rising man he used to tell mercier you will see i shall be in the academy before you likely indeed thou skilfullest maury nay thou shalt have a cardinal's hat and plush and glory but alas also in the long run mere oblivion like the rest of us and six feet of earth what boots it vamping rotten leather on these terms Glorious in comparison is the livelihood thy good old father earns by making shoes. One may hope in a sufficient manner. Maurice does not want for audacity. He shall wear pistols by and by, and at death cries of La Lanterne, the lamp iron, answer coolly, 
Friends, will you see better there? But yonder, halting lamely along, thou noticed next Bishop Toleron Perigord, his reverence of Autun. A sardonic grimness lies in that irreverent reverence of Autun. He will do and suffer strange things, and will become surely one of the strangest things ever seen or likely to be seen. A man living in falsehood and on falsehood, yet not what you can call a false man. There is the specialty. It will be an enigma for future ages, one may hope. Hitherto such a product of nature and art was possible only for this age of ours, age of paper and of burning of paper. Consider Bishop Talleyrand and Marquis Lafayette as the topmost of their two kinds, and say once more, looking at what they did and what they were, O tempus ferax rerum. On the whole, however, has not this unfortunate clergy also drifted in the time stream far from its native latitude? An anomalous mass of men, of whom the whole world has already a dim understanding that it can understand nothing. They were once a priesthood, interpreters of wisdom, revealers of the holy that is in man, a true clerus, or inheritance of God on earth. But now? They pass silently with such cahiers as they have been able to redact, and none cries, God bless them. King Louis, with his court, brings up the rear. He, cheerful in this day of hope, is saluted with plaudits, still more Necker, his minister. Not so the Queen, on whom hope shines not steadily any more. Ill-fated Queen. Her hair is already grey, with many cares and crosses. Her first-born son is dying in these weeks. Black falsehood has ineffaceably soiled her name, ineffaceably while this generation lasts. Instead of vive la reine, voices insult her with vive d'Orléans. Of her queenly beauty little remains except its stateliness, not now gracious but haughty, rigid, silently enduring. With the most mixed feeling, wherein joy has no part, she resigns herself to a day she hoped never to have seen. Poor Marie Antoinette, with thy quick, noble instincts, vehement glancings, vision all too fitful, narrow for the work thou hast to do. Oh, there are tears in store for thee, bitterest wailings, soft womanly meltings, though thou hast the heart of an imperial Teresa's daughter. Thou doomed one, shut thy eyes on the future. And so, in stately procession, have passed the elected of France, some towards honour and quick fire consummation, most towards dishonour, not a few towards massacre, confusion, emigration, desperation all towards eternity. So many heterogeneities cast together into the fermenting vat, there with incalculable action, counteraction, elective affinities, explosive developments, to work out healing for a sick, moribund system of society. Probably the strangest body of men, if we consider well, that ever met together on our planet on such an errand, so thousandfold complex a society, ready to burst up from its infinite depths, and these men, its rulers and healers, without life rule for themselves, other life rule than a gospel according to Jean Jacques. To the wisest of them, what we must call the wisest man is properly an accident under the sky. Man is without duty round him, except it be to make the constitution. He is without heaven above him or hell beneath him. He has no God in the world. What further or better belief can be said to exist in these twelve hundred? Belief in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, in heraldic scutcheons, in the divine right of kings, in the divine right of game destroyers. Belief, or what is still worse, canting half-belief, or worst of all, mere Machiavellic pretense of belief, in consecrated dough-wafers and the godhead of a poor old Italian man. Nevertheless, in that immiserable confusion and corruption which struggles there so blindly to become less confused and corrupt, there is, as we said, this one salient point of a new life discernible, the deep, fixed determination to have done with shams. 
a determination which consciously or unconsciously is fixed, which waxes ever more fixed into very madness and fixed idea, which in such embodiment as lies provided there shall now unfold itself rapidly, monstrous, stupendous, unspeakable, new for long thousands of years. How has the heaven's light, oftentimes in this earth, to clothe itself in thunder and electric murkiness and descend as molten lightning, blasting if purifying? Nay, is it not rather the very murkiness and atmospheric suffocation that brings the lightning and the light? The new evangel, as the old has been, was it to be born in the destruction of a world? But how the deputies assisted at high mass and heard sermon and applauded the preacher, church as it was, when he preached politics. How next day, with sustained pomp, they are for the first time installed in their salle de menu, hall no longer of amusements, and become a state's general. Readers can fancy for themselves. The king from his estrade, gorgeous as Solomon in all his glory, runs his eye over that majestic hall, many plumed, many glancing, bright tinted as rainbow in the galleries and near side spaces where beauty sits reigning bright influence. Satisfaction as of one that after long voyaging had got to port plays over his broad, simple face, the innocent king. He rises and speaks with sonorous tone, a conceivable speech, with which, still more, with the succeeding one-hour and two-hour speeches of Garde des Sceaux and Monsieur Necker, full of nothing but patriotism, hope, faith, and the deficiency of the revenue, no reader of these pages shall be tried. We remark only that as His Majesty, on finishing the speech, put on his plumed hat, and the noblesse, according to custom, imitated him, Atier's etat deputies did mostly, not without a shade of fierceness, in like manner clap on or even crush on their slouched hats and stand there awaiting the issue. Thick buzz among them between majority and minority of couvrez-vous, découvrez-vous, hats off, hats on, to which His Majesty puts end by taking off his own royal hat again. The session terminates without further accident or omen than this with which, significantly enough, France has opened her States General. End of Book 4, Chapter 3《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 11, From Versailles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 7, Chapter 11, From Versailles However, the Paris National Guard, wholly under arms, has cleared the palace and even occupies the nearer external spaces, extruding miscellaneous patriotism for the most part into the Grand Court or even into the Forecourt. The bodyguards, you can observe, have now, of a verity, hoisted the national cockade, for they step forward to the windows or balconies, hat aloft in hand, on each hat a huge trickler, and fling over their bandoliers in sign of surrender, and shout, Viva la nation! To which, how can the generous heart respond but with, Viva le roi! Vivant les gars du corps! His Majesty himself has appeared with Lafayette on the balcony and again appears. Vive le roi! greets him from all throats, but also from some one throat is heard. Le roi à Paris! The king to Paris. Her Majesty too, on demand, shows herself, though there is peril in it. She steps out on the balcony with her little boy and girl. No children! Point d'enfants! cry the voices. She gently pushes back her children and stands alone, her hands serenely crossed on her breast. Should I die, she had said, I will do it. Such serenity of heroism has its effect. Lafayette, with ready wit in his high-flown chivalrous way, takes that fair queenly hand and, reverently kneeling, kisses it. Thereupon the people do shout, Viva la reine! Nevertheless, poor Weber saw, or even thought he saw, for hardly the third part of poor Weber's experiences in such hysterical days will stand scrutiny. One of these brigands levelled his musket at Her Majesty, with or without intention to shoot, for another of the brigands angrily struck it down. 
so that all and the Queen herself, nay, the very Captain of the Bodyguards, have grown national. The very Captain of the Bodyguards steps out now with Lafayette. On the hat of the repentant man is an enormous tricolour, large as a soup platter or sunflower, visible to the utmost forecourt. He takes the national oath with a loud voice, elevating his hat, at which sight all the army raise their bonnets on their bayonets with shouts. Sweet is reconcilement to the heart of man. Lafayette has sworn Flandre. He swears the remaining bodyguards down in the marble court. The people clasp them in their arms. O oh, my brothers, why would ye force us to slay you? Behold, there is joy over you as over returning prodigal sons. The poor bodyguards now, national and tricolour, exchange bonnets, exchange arms. There shall be peace and fraternity. And still, vive le roi, and also le roi à Paris, not now from one throat, but from all throats as one, for it is the heart's wish of all mortals. Yes, the king to Paris, what else? Ministers may consult and national deputies wag their heads, but there is now no other possibility. You have forced him to go willingly. At one o'clock, Lafayette gives audible assurance to that purpose, and universal insurrection, with immeasurable shout and a discharge of all the firearms, clear and rusty, great and small, that it has returns him acceptance. What a sound, heard for leagues, a doom appeal. That sound, too, rolls away into the silence of ages. And the chateau of Versailles stands ever since vacant, hushed still, its spacious courts grass-grown, responsive to the hoe of the weeder. Times and generations roll on in their confused gulf current, and buildings, like builders, have their destiny. Till one o'clock, then, there will be three parties, National Assembly, National Rascality, National Royalty, all busy enough. Rascality rejoices, women trim themselves with tricolour, Nay, motherly Paris has sent her avengers sufficient cartloads of loaves which are shouted over, which are gratefully consumed. The avengers, in return, are searching for grain stores, loading them in fifty wagons, that so a national king, probable harbinger of all blessings, may be the evident bringer of plenty for one. And thus has sans calottism made prisoner its king, revoking his parole. The monarchy has fallen, and not so much as honourably, no, ignominiously, with struggle, indeed oft repeated, but then with unwise struggle, wasting its strength in fits and paroxysms, at every new paroxysm foiled more pitifully than before. Thus, Brolier's whiff of grape-shot, which might have been something, has dwindled to the pot-valour of an opera of past, and, O oh, Richard, O oh, mon roi, which again we shall see dwindle to a favorous conspiracy, a thing to be settled by the hanging of one chevalier. Poor monarchy! But what, save foulest defeat, can await that man who wills and yet wills not? Apparently the king either has a right, assertable as such to the death before God and man, or else he has no right. Apparently the one or the other could he but know which. May heaven pity him! Were Louis wise, he would this day abdicate. Is it not strange so few kings abdicate, and none yet heard of has been known to commit suicide? Fritz I of Prussia alone tried it, and they cut the rope. As for the National Assembly, which decrees this morning that it is inseparable from His Majesty, and will follow him to Paris, there may one thing be noted, its extreme want of bodily health. After the 14th of July, there was a certain sickliness observable among honourable members, so many demanding passports on account of infirm health. But now, for these following days, there is a perfect Murian. President Mounier, Lally Tolendal, Clermont Tonnerre, and all constitutional two-chamber royalists needing change of air, as most no-chamber royalists had formerly done. For in truth it is the second emigration, this, that has now come, most extensive among commons, deputies, noblesse, clergy, so that to Switzerland alone there go sixty thousand. They will return in the day of accounts, yes, and have hot welcome. 
But immigration on immigration is the peculiarity of France. One immigration follows another, grounded on reasonable fear and reasonable hope, largely also on childish pet. The high flyers have gone first, now the lower flyers, and even the lower will go down to the crawlers. Whereby, however, cannot our National Assembly so much the more commodiously make the Constitution, your two-chamber Anglo-maniacs being all safe, distant on foreign shores? Abbe Mori is seized and sent back again. He, tough as tanned leather with eloquent Captain Cazales and some others, will stand it out for another year. But here, meanwhile, the question arises, was Philip d'Orléans seen this day in the Bois de Boulogne in grey surtout? waiting under the wet, sear foliage what the day might bring forth? Alas, yes, the eidolon of him was, in Weber's and other such brains. The Châtelet shall make large inquisition into the matter, examining a hundred and seventy witnesses, and Deputy Chabreau publish his report, but disclose nothing farther. What then has caused these two unparalleled October days? For surely such dramatic exhibition never yet enacted itself without dramatist and machinist. Wooden punch emerges not with his domestic sorrows into the light of day unless the wire be pulled. How can human mobs? Was it not d'Orléans then, and Laclos, Marquis Sillery, Mirabeau, and the sons of confusion, hoping to drive the king to Metz and gather the spoil? Nay, was it not quite contrariwise the Oye de Boeuf, bodyguard Colonel de Guiche, Minister Saint Priest, and high flying loyalist, hoping also to drive him to Metz and try it by the sword of civil war? Good Marquis Toulongion, the historian and deputy, feels constrained to admit that it was both. Alas, my friends, credulous incredulity is a strange matter. But when a whole nation is smitten with suspicion and sees a dramatic miracle in the very operation of the gastric juices, what help is there? Such nation is already a mere hypochondriac bundle of diseases as good as changed into glass, atrabilia decadent, and will suffer crises. Is not suspicion itself the one thing to be suspected, as Montaigne feared, only one fear? Now, however, the short hour has struck. His Majesty is in his carriage, with his Queen, Sister Elizabeth, and two royal children. Not for another hour can the infinite procession get marshalled and under way. The weather is dim, drizzling, the mind confused, and noise great. Processional marches not a few our world has seen. Roman triumphs and ovations, Kabyric cymbal beatings, royal progresses, Irish funerals. But this of the French monarchy marching to its bed remained to be seen. Miles long and of breadth losing itself in vagueness for all the neighbouring country crowds to see. Slow, stagnating along like shoreless lake, yet with a noise like Niagara, like Babel and Bedlam, a splashing and a tramping, a hurrahing, uproaring, musket volleying, the truest segment of chaos seen in these latter ages till slowly it disembogue itself in the thickening dusk into expectant Paris through a double row of faces all the way from Passy to the Hôtel de Ville. Consider this. Vanguard of national troops with trains of artillery, of pikemen and pike women mounted on cannons, on carts, hackney coaches or on foot, tripudiating in trickler ribbons from heel to heel, loaves struck on the points of bayonets, green boughs stuck in gun barrels, Next, as main march, fifty cartloads of corn, which have been lent, for peace, from the stores of Versailles, behind which follow stragglers of the Garde du Corps, all humiliated in grenadier bonnets. Close on these comes the royal carriage, come royal carriages, for there are an hundred national deputies too, among whom sits Mirabeau, his remarks not given. Then, finally, pell-mell as rearguard, Flandre, Swiss, hundred Swiss, other bodyguards, brigands, whosoever cannot get before. Between and among all which masses flows without limit Saint Antoine and the monadic cohort, monadic especially about the royal carriage, tripudiating there, covered with tricolour, singing allusive songs, pointing with one hand to the royal carriage, which the illusions hit, and pointing to the provision wagons with the other hand, and these words, 
Courage, friends, we shall not want bread now. We are bringing you the baker, the bakeress, and baker's boy. Le boulanger, le boulanger, et le petit mitron. The wet day draggles the trickler, but the joy is unextinguishable. Is not all well now? Ah, madame, notre bonne reine, said some of these strong women some days hence. Ah, madame, our good queen, don't be a traitor any more. Ne soyez plus traître, and we will all love you. Poor Weber went splashing along close by the royal carriage with a tear in his eye. Their majesties did me the honour, or I thought they did, to testify from time to time by shrugging of the shoulders, by looks directed to heaven, the emotions they felt. Thus, like frail cockle, floats the royal lifeboat, helmless on black deluges of rascality. Mercier, in his loose way, estimates the procession and assistance at two hundred thousand. He says it was one boundless, inarticulate ha-ha, transcendent world laughter, comparable to the Saturnalia of the ancients. Why not? Here, too, as we said, is human nature, once more human. Shudder at it, whoso is of shuddering humour. Yet, behold, it is human. It has swallowed all formulas. It repudiates even so. For which reason they that collect vases and antiques with figures of dancing bacantes in wild and all but impossible positions may look with some interest on it. Thus, however, has the slow-moving chaos or modern Saturnalia of the ancients reached the barrier and must halt to be harangued by Mayor Bailly. Thereafter it has to lumber along between the double row of faces in the transcendent heaven-lashing ha-ha, two hours longer towards the Hôtel de Ville. Then again to be harangued there by several persons, by Moreau de Saint-Marie among others, Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, now National Deputy for San Domingo. To all which poor Louis, who seemed to experience a slight emotion on entering this town hall, can answer only that he comes with pleasure, with confidence among his people. Thereby ye, in reporting it, forgets confidence. And the poor queen says eagerly, Add with confidence. Monsieur rejoins by ye, you are happier than if I had not forgot. Finally, the king is shown on an upper balcony by torchlight with a huge trickler in his hat. And all the people, says Weber, grasped one another's hands, thinking now surely the new era was born. Hardly till eleven at night can royalty get to its vacant, long-deserted palace of the Tuileries to lodge there somewhat in strolling player fashion. It is Tuesday, the 6th of October, 1789. Poor Louis has two other Paris processions to make. One, ludicrous, ignominious, like this. The other, not so ludicrous, nor ignominious, but serious. Nay, sublime. End of Book 7, Chapter 11 End of the French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, The Third Estate, Chapter One, Inertia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Five, Chapter One, Inertia. That exasperated France in this same National Assembly of hers has got something, nay, something great, momentous, indispensable, cannot be doubted. Yet still the question were, specially, what? A question hard to solve even for calm onlookers at this distance, wholly insoluble to actors in the middle of it. The States-General, created and conflated by the passionate effort of the whole nation, is there as a thing high and lifted up. Hope, jubilating, cries aloud that it will prove a miraculous brazen serpent in the wilderness, whereon whosoever looks with faith and obedience shall be healed of all woes and serpent bites. We may answer, it will at least prove a symbolic banner, round which the exasperating complaining twenty-five millions, otherwise isolated and without power, may rally and work, what it is them to work. 
If battle must be the work, as one cannot help expecting, then shall it be a battle banner, say an Italian gonfalon with its old Republican caroccio, and shall tower up, carborne, shining in the wind, and with iron tongue peel forth many a signal. A thing of prime necessity, which whether in the van or in the centre, whether leading or led and driven, must do the fighting multitude incalculable services, for a season, while it floats in the very front, nay, as it were, stands solitary there, waiting whether force will gather round it, this same national caroccio and the signal peals it rings are a main object with us. The omen of the slouch hats clapped on shows the commons deputies to have made up their minds on one thing, that neither noblesse nor clergy shall have precedence of them, hardly even majesty itself. To such length has the contra social and force of public opinion carried us. For what is majesty but the delegate of the nation, delegated and bargained with, even rather tightly, in some very singular posture of affairs which Jean-Jacques has not fixed the date of? Coming, therefore, into their hall on the morrow, an inorganic mass of six hundred individuals, these commons deputies perceive, without terror, that they have it all to themselves. Their hall is also the grand or general hall for all the three orders, but the noblesse and clergy, it would seem, have retired to their two separate apartments or halls, and are there verifying their powers, not in a conjoint, but in a separate capacity. They are to continue two separate, perhaps separately voting orders then? It is as if both noblesse and clergy had silently taken for granted that they already were such, Two orders against one. And so the third order to be left in a perpetual minority? Much may remain unfixed, but the negative of that is a thing fixed in the slouch-hatted heads in the French nation's head. Double representation and all else hitherto gained were otherwise futile, null. Doubtless the powers must be verified, doubtless the commission, the electoral documents of your deputy, must be inspected by his brother deputies and found valid. It is the preliminary of all. Neither is this question of doing it separately or doing it conjointly a vital one. But if it lead to such, it must be resisted. Wise was that maxim. Resist the beginnings. Nay, were resistance unadvisable, even dangerous, yet surely pause is very natural. Pause, with twenty-five millions behind you, may become resistance enough. The inorganic mass of commons deputies will restrict itself to a system of inertia, and for the present remain inorganic. Such method, recommendable alike to sagacity and to timidity, do the commons deputies adopt, and, not without adroitness and with ever more tenacity, they persist in it day after day, week after week. For six weeks their history is of the kind named barren, which indeed, as philosophy knows, is often the fruitfulest of all. These were their still creation days, wherein they sat incubating. In fact, what they did was to do nothing in a judicious manner. Daily, the inorganic body reassembles, regrets that they cannot get organisation, verification of powers in common, and begin regenerating France. Headlong motions may be made, but let such be repressed. Inertia alone is at once unpunishable and unconquerable. Cunning must be met by cunning, proud pretension by inertia, by a low tone of patriotic sorrow low but incurable, unalterable. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. What a spectacle for France! Six hundred inorganic individuals, essential to its regeneration and salvation, sit there on their elliptic benches, longing passionately towards life, in painful durance, like souls waiting to be born. Speeches are spoken, eloquent, audible, within doors and without. Mind agitates itself against mind. The nation looks on with ever deeper interest. Thus do the commons deputies sit incubating. There are private conclaves, supper parties, consultations, Breton Club, Club of Viroflay, germs of many clubs. 
wholly an element of confused noise, dimness, angry, heat, wherein, however, the eros egg, kept at the fit temperature, may hover safe, unbroken, till it be hatched. In your mooniers, malouets, le chapeliers, in science sufficient for that, fervour in your banaves, rabot. At times shall come an inspiration from royal Mirabeau. He is nowise yet recognised as royal, nay, he was groaned at when his name was first mentioned, but he is struggling towards recognition. In the course of the week, the commons, having called their eldest to the chair and furnished him with the young, stronger-lunged assistants, can speak articulately, and in audible, lamentable words declare, as we said, that they are an inorganic body longing to become organic. Letters arrive, but an inorganic body cannot open letters. They lie on the table unopened. The eldest may at most procure for himself some kind of list or muster roll to take the votes by and wait what will betide. Noblesse and clergy are all elsewhere. However, an eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies, which is some comfort. With effort, it is determined, not that a deputation shall be sent, for how can an inorganic body send deputations, but that certain individual commons members shall, in an accidental way, stroll into the clergy chamber and then into the noblesse one, and mention there, as a thing they have happened to observe, that the commons seem to be sitting waiting for them in order to verify their powers. That is the wiser method. The clergy, among whom are such a multitude of undignified, of mere commons in curates' frocks, depute instant respectful answer that they are, and will now more than ever be, in deepest study as to that very matter. Contrary rise, the noblesse, in cavalier attitude, reply after four days that they, for their part, are all verified and constituted, which they had trusted the commons also were such separate verification being clearly the proper constitutional wisdom of ancestors' method, as they, the noblesse, will have much pleasure in demonstrating by a commission of their number if the commons will meet them commission against commission, directly in the rear of which comes a deputation of clergy, reiterating in their insidious conciliatory way the same proposal. Here, then, is a complexity. What will wise commons say to this? Warily, inertly, the wise commons, considering that they are, if not a French third estate, at least an aggregate of individuals pretending to some title of that kind, determine, after talking on it five days, to name such a commission, though, as it were, with proviso not to be convinced, a sixth day is taken up in naming it, a seventh and an eighth day in getting the forms of meeting, plays, hour and the like settled, so that it is not till the evening of the 23rd of May that Noblesse Commission first meets Commons Commission, clergy acting as conciliators, and begins the impossible task of convincing it. One other meeting on the 25th will suffice. The Commons are inconvincible, the Noblesse and clergy irrefragibly convincing. The Commissions retire, each order persisting in its first pretensions. Thus have three weeks passed. For three weeks, the third estate Caroccio, with far-seeing Gonfalon, has stood stock still, flouting the wind, waiting what force would gather round it. Fancy can conceive the feeling of the court, and how counsel met counsel, the loud-sounding inanity whirled in that distracted vortex where wisdom could not dwell. Your cunningly devised taxing machine has been got together, set up with incredible labour, and stands there, its three pieces in contact, its two flywheels of noblesse and clergy, its huge working wheel of tiers etat. The two flywheels whirl in the softest manner, but prodigious to look upon, the huge working wheel hangs motionless, refuses to stir. The cunningest engineers are at fault. How will it work when it does begin? Fearfully, my friends, and to many purposes, but to gather taxes or grind court meal, one may apprehend never. Could we but have continued gathering taxes by hand? Messieurs Datois, Conti, Condé, named court triumvirate, they of the anti-democratic memoir au roi, has not their foreboding proved true? They may wave reproachfully their high heads, they may beat their poor brains, but the cunningest engineers can do nothing. 
Necker himself, were he even listened to, begins to look blue. The only thing one sees advisable is to bring up soldiers. New regiments, too, and a battalion of a third have already reached Paris. Others shall get in March. Good were it, in all circumstances, to have troops within reach. Good that the command were in sure hands. Let Brullier be appointed, old Marshal Duke de Brullier, veteran disciplinarian of a firm drill sergeant morality, such as may be depended on. For alas, neither are the clergy or the very noblesse what they should be and might be when so menaced from without, entire undivided within. The noblesse, indeed, have their Catiline or Crispin d'Espremenil, dusky glowing all in renegade heat, their boisterous barrel Mirabeau, but also they have their Lafayette, Lianco, Lemeths, above all their Dorléans, now cut forever from his court moorings and musing drowsily of high and highest sea prizes, for is not he too a son of Henri IV and partial potential heir apparent on his voyage towards chaos? From the clergy again, so numerous are the curés, actual deserters have run over, two small parties, in the second party, curé Grégoire. Nay, there is talk of a whole hundred and forty-nine of them about to desert in mass, and only restrained by an archbishop of Paris. It seems a losing game. But judge if France, if Paris, sat idle all this while. Addresses from far and near flow in, for our commons have now grown organic enough to open letters. Or indeed to cavil at them, thus poor Marquis de Brézé, supreme usher, master of ceremonies, or whatever his title was, writing about this time on some ceremonial matter, sees no harm in winding up with a Monsieur, yours with sincere attachment. To whom does it address itself, this sincere attachment, inquires Mirabeau? To the Dean of the Tiers Etat. There is no man in France entitled to write that, rejoins he, whereat the galleries in the world will not be kept from applauding. Poor de Brézé, these commons have a still older grudge at him, nor has he yet done with them. In another way, Mirabeau has had to protest against the quick suppression of his newspaper, Journal of the States General, and to continue it under a new name in which act of valour the Paris electors, still busy redacting their carrier, could not but support him by address to His Majesty. They claim utmost provisory freedom of the press. They have spoken even about demolishing the Bastille and erecting a bronze patriot king on the site. These are the rich burghers, but now consider how it went, for example, with such loose miscellany, now all grown eleutheromaniac, of loungers, prowlers, social nondescripts, and the distilled rascality of our planet, as whirls forever in the Palais Royal. Or what low, infinite groan, first changing into a growl, comes from San Antoine, and the twenty-five millions in danger of starvation. There is the indisputablest scarcity of corn, be it aristocrat plot, d'Orléans plot of this year, or drought and hail of last year, in city and province the poor man looks desolately towards a nameless lot. And this state's general, that could make us an age of gold, is forced to stand motionless, cannot get its powers verified. All industry necessarily languishes, if it be not that of making motions. In the Palais Royal there has been erected, apparently by subscription, a kind of wooden tent en plage de bois, most convenient, where select patriotism can now redact resolutions, deliver harangues with comfort, let the weather be as it will. Lively is that Satan at home. On his table, on his chair, in every café, stands a patriotic orator, a crowd round him within, a crowd listening from without, open mouth through open door and window, with thunders of applause for every sentiment of more than common hardiness. In Monsieur de Seine's pamphlet shop close by, you cannot, without strong elbowing, get to the counter. Every hour produces its pamphlet or litter of pamphlets. There were thirteen today, sixteen yesterday, ninety-two last week. Think of tyranny and scarcity, fervid eloquence, rumour, pamphleteering, Société Publicale, Breton Club, Enraged Club, and whether every taproom, coffee room, social reunion, accidental street group over wide France was not an enraged club. 
to all which the common deputies can only listen with a sublime inertia of sorrow, reduced to busy themselves with their internal police. Sure a position no deputies ever occupied, if they keep it with skill. Let not the temperature rise too high, break not the eros egg till it be hatched, till it break itself. An eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies, cannot be restrained from applauding. The two privileged orders, the noblesse all verified and constituted, may look on with what face they will, not without a secret tremor of heart. The clergy, always acting the part of conciliators, make a clutch at the galleries and the popularity there, and miss it. Deputation of them arrives with dolorous message about the dearth of grains and the necessity there is of casting aside vain formalities and deliberating on this. An insidious proposal, which, however, the commons, moved thereto by sea-green robes Pierre, dexterously accept as a sort of hint or even pledge that the clergy will forthwith come over to them, constitute the states general, and so cheapen grains. Finally, on the 27th day of May, Mirabeau, judging the time now nearly come, proposes that the inertia cease that leaving the noblesse to their own stiff ways, the clergy be summoned in the name of the God of peace to join the commons and begin. To which summons, if they turn a deaf ear, we shall see. Are not 149 of them ready to desert? O oh, triumvirate of princes, new guard des so barantin, thou home secretary, Bertoy, Duchess Polignac, and Queen, eager to listen, what is now to be done? This third estate will get in motion with the force of all France in it, clergy machinery with noblesse machinery, which were to serve as beautiful counterbalances and drags, will be shamefully dragged after it and take fire along with it. What is to be done? The oil de boeuf waxes more confused than ever. Whisper and counter-whisper, a very tempest of whispers. Leading men from all the three orders are nightly spirited thither, conjurers many of them, but can they conjure this? Necker himself were now welcome, could he interfere to purpose. Let Necker interfere then, and in the king's name. Happily that incendiary god of peace message is not yet answered. The three orders shall again have conferences. Under this patriot minister of theirs somewhat may be healed, clouted up, we, meanwhile, getting forward Swiss regiments and a hundred pieces of field artillery. This is what the Oie de Boeuf, for its part, resolves on. But as for Necker, alas, poor Necker, thy obstinate third estate has one first last word, verification in common, as the pledge of voting and deliberating in common. Halfway proposals from such a tried friend, they answer with a stare. The tardy conferences speedily break up. The third estate, now ready and resolute, the whole world backing it, returns to its hall of the three orders, and Necker to the Oie de Boeuf, with the character of a disconjured conjurer there, fit only for dismissal. And so the Commons deputies are at last on their own strength getting under way. Instead of chairman or dean, they have now got a president, astronomer Bailly, under way with a vengeance with endless vociferous and temperate eloquence, borne on newspaper wings to all lands, they have now, on the 17th day of June, determined that their name is not Third Estate, but National Assembly. They, then, are the nation, triumvirate of princes, queen, refractory noblesse and clergy. What, then, are you? A most deep question, scarcely answerable in living political dialects all regardless of which our new National Assembly proceeds to appoint a committee of subsistence, dear to France, though it can find little or no grain. Next, as if our National Assembly stood quite firm on its legs, to appoint four other standing committees, then to settle the security of the national debt, then that of the annual taxation, all within eight and forty hours. At such a rate of velocity it is going, the conjurers of the Oie de Boeuf may well ask themselves, Whither? End of Book 5, Chapter 1
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 5, The Third Estate, Chapter 2, Mercury de Brézé. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 2, Mercury de Brézé. The only question is, which god? Shall it be Mars de Broly with his hundred piece of cannon? Not yet, answers Prudence, so soft, irresolute is King Louis. Let it be messenger Mercury, our supreme usher de Brézé. On the morrow, which is the 20th of June, these 149 false curates, no longer restrainable by his grace of Paris, will desert in a body. Let de Brézé intervene and produce closed doors. Not only shall there be royal session in that salle des menu, but no meeting nor working except by carpenters till then. Your third estate, self-styled National Assembly, shall suddenly see itself extruded from its hall by carpenters in this dexterous way, and reduced to do nothing, not even to meet or articulately lament, till Majesty with séance royale and new miracles be ready. In this manner shall de Brézé, as Mercury ex machina, intervene, and if the oi de Boeuf mistake not, work deliverance from the nodus. Of poor de Brézé we can remark that he has yet prospered in none of his dealings with these commons. Five weeks ago, when they kissed the hand of Majesty, the mode he took got nothing but censure, and then his sincere attachment, how was it scornfully whiffed aside? Before supper this night he writes to President Bailly a new letter to be delivered shortly after dawn tomorrow in the King's name, which letter, however, Bailly, in the pride of office, will merely crush together into his pocket like a bill he does not mean to pay. Accordingly, on Saturday morning, the 20th of June, shrill-sounding heralds proclaim through the streets of Versailles that there is to be a séance royale next Monday, and no meeting of the States-General till then. And yet, we observe, President Bailly, in sound of this, and with de Brézé's letter in his pocket, is proceeding with National Assembly at his heels to the accustomed salle de menu, as if de Brézé and heralds were mere wind. It is shut, this salle, occupied by garde Française. Where is your captain? The captain shows his royal order. Workmen, he is grieved to say, are all busy setting up the platform for His Majesty's séance. Most unfortunately, no admission. Admission at furthest for President and Secretaries to bring away papers which the joiners might destroy. President Bailly enters with Secretaries and returns bearing papers. Alas, within doors, instead of patriotic eloquence, there is now no noise but hammering, sawing, and operative screeching and rumbling. A profanation without parallel. The deputies stand grouped on the Paris road on this umbrageous avenue de Versailles, complaining aloud of the indignity done them. Courtiers, it is supposed, look from their windows and giggle. The morning is none of the comfortablest. Raw, it is even drizzling a little. But all travellers pause. Patriot, gallery men, miscellaneous spectators increase the groups. Wild councils alternate. Some desperate deputies propose to go and hold session under the great outer staircase at Marley, under the king's windows, for his majesty, it seems, has driven over thither. Others talk of making the chateau forecourt, what they call place d'armes, a runny mead, a new chom de may of free Frenchmen, nay, of awakening to sounds of indignant patriotism the echoes of the Oie de Boeuf itself. Notice is given that President Bailly, aided by judicious guillotine and others, has found place in the tennis court in the Rue Saint-Francois. Thither, in long-drawn files, horse jingling like cranes on wing, the commons deputies angrily wend. Strange sight was this in the Rue Saint-Francois, Vieux Versailles. A naked tennis court, as the pictures of that time still give it, four walls naked, except a loft, some poor wooden penthouse or roofed spectators' gallery hanging round them. On the floor, not now an idle tee-heeing, a snapping of bowls and rackets, but the bellowing din of an indignant national representation, scandalously exiled hither. 
however a cloud of witnesses looked down on them from wooden penthouse from wall top from adjoining roof and chimney rolls towards them from all quarters with passionate spoken blessings some table can be procured to write on some chair if not to sit on then to stand on the secretaries undo their tapes by has constituted the assembly experienced Mounier, not wholly new to such things in parliamentary revolts which he has seen or heard of thinks that it were well in these lamentable threatening circumstances to unite themselves by an oath universal acclamation as from smouldering bosoms getting vent the oath is redacted, pronounced aloud by President Bailly, and indeed in such a sonorous tone that the cloud of witnesses even outdoors hear it and bellow response to it. Six hundred right hands rise with President Bailly's to take God above to witness that they will not separate for man below, but will meet in all places, under all circumstances, wheresoever two or three can get together, till they have made the Constitution." made the constitution friends that is a long task six hundred hands meanwhile will sign as they have sworn six hundred save one one loyalist abdiel still visible by this sole light point and nameable poor monsieur martin d'orc from castelnaudari in languedoc him they permit to sign or signify refusal they even save him from the cloud of witnesses by declaring his head deranged at four o'clock the signatures are all appended. New meeting is fixed for Monday morning, earlier than the hour of the royal session, that our 149 clerical deserters be not balked. We shall meet at the Recolles Church or elsewhere, in hope that our 149 will join us. And now it is time to go to dinner. This, then, is the session of the tennis court, famed Séance du Jeu du Pomme, the fame of which has gone forth to all lands. This is the Mercurius de Brézé's appearance as deus ex machina. This is the fruit it brings. The giggle of courtiers in the Versailles Avenue has already died into gaunt silence. Did the distracted court with the Garde des so Barrington, Triumvirate and Company imagine that they could scatter 600 national deputies big with a national constitution like as much barn door poultry big with next to nothing by the white or black rod of a supreme usher? Barn door poultry fly cackling but national deputies turn round lion-faced and with uplifted right hand swear an oath that makes the four corners of France tremble. President Bailly has covered himself with honour, which shall become rewards. The National Assembly is now doubly and trebly the nation's assembly, not militant, martyred only, but triumphant, insulted, and which could not be insulted. Paris disembogues itself once more to witness with grim looks the séance royale, which, by a new felicity, is postponed till Tuesday. The 149, and even with bishops among them, all in processional mass, have had free leisure to march off and solemnly join the commons sitting waiting in their church. The commons welcome them with shouts, with embracings, nay, with tears, for it is growing a life and death matter now. As for the séance itself, the carpenters seem to have accomplished their platform, but all else remains unaccomplished. Futile, we may say fatal, was the whole matter. King Louis enters through seas of people, all grim, silent, angry with many things, for it is a bitter rain, too. Enters to a third estate, likewise grim, silent, which has been wetted, waiting under mean porches at back doors, while court and privileged were entering by the front. King and God de Sir, there is no necker visible, make known, not without long-windedness, the determinations of the royal breast. The three orders shall vote separately. On the other hand, France may look for considerable constitutional blessings as specified in these five and thirty articles, which Garde des so is waxing hoarse with reading. Which five and thirty articles, adds His Majesty, again rising, if the three orders most unfortunately cannot agree together to effect them, I myself will effect. So je ferai le bien de mes peuples which, being interpreted, may signify you, contentious deputies of the States-General, have probably not long to be here. But in fine, 
or shall now withdraw for this day and meet again, each order in its separate place tomorrow morning for dispatch of business. This is the determination of the royal breast, pithy and clear. And herewith king, retinue, noblesse, majority of clergy file out as if the whole matter were satisfactorily completed. These file out through grim silent seas of people. Only the commons deputies file not out, but stand there in gloomy silence, uncertain what they shall do. One man of them is certain. One man of them discerns and dares. It is now that King Mirabeau starts to the tribune and lifts up his lion voice. Verily a word in season, for in such scenes the moment is the mother of ages. Had not Gabriel Anore been there, one can well fancy how the commons deputies, affrighted at the perils which now yawn dim all round them, and waxing ever paler in each other's paleness, might very naturally one after one have glided off, and the whole course of European history have been different. But he is there. List to the brule of that royal forest voice, sorrowful, low, fast swelling to a roar. Eyes kindle at the glance of his eye. National deputies were missioned by a nation. They have sworn an oath. They, but lo, while the lion's voice roars loudest, what apparition is this? Apparition of Mercurius de Brézé, muttering somewhat. Speak out, cry several. Monsieur, shrills de Brézé, repeating himself. You have heard the king's orders. Mirabeau glares on him with fire-flashing face, shakes the black lion's mane. Yes, monsieur, we have heard what the king was advised to say, and you who cannot be the interpreter have his orders to the states general, you who have neither place nor right of speech here, you are not the man to remind us of it. Go, monsieur, tell these who sent you that we are here by the will of the people, and that nothing shall send us hence but the force of bayonets. And poor de Brézé shivers forth from the National Assembly, and also, if it be not in one faintest glimmer months later, finally from the page of history. Hapless de Brézé, doomed to survive long ages in men's memories in this faint way with tremulent white rod. He was true to etiquette, which was his faith here below, a martyr to respect of persons. Short woollen cloaks could not kiss Majesty's hand as long velvet ones did, nay, lately, when the poor little Dauphin lay dead and some ceremonial visitation came, was he not punctual to announce it even to the Dauphin's dead body? Monsieur, a deputy of the States General. Sunt lacrimae rerum. But what does the Oi de Boeuf now, when de Brézé shivers back thither? Dispatch that same force of bayonets? Not so. The seas of people still hang multitudinous, intent on what is passing. Nay, rush and roll, loud billowing into the courts of the chateau itself, for a report has risen that Necker is to be dismissed. Worst of all, the Garde Francais seem indisposed to act. Two companies of them do not fire when ordered. Necker, for not being at the séance, shall be shouted for, carried home in triumph, and must not be dismissed. His grace of Paris, on the other hand, has to fly with broken coach panels and owe his life to furious driving. The garde du corps, bodyguards, which you were drawing out, had better be drawn in again. There is no sending of bayonets to be thought of. Instead of soldiers, the Oie de Boeuf sends carpenters to take down the platform. Ineffectual shift. In few instants, the very carpenters cease wrenching and knocking at their platform, stand on it, hammer in hand, and listen, open-mouthed. The third estate is decreeing that it is, was, and will be nothing but a national assembly, and now, moreover, an inviolable one, all members of it inviolable. Infamous, traitorous towards the nation and guilty of capital crime is any person, body, corporate, tribunal, court or commission that now or henceforth during the present session or after it shall dare to pursue, interrogate, arrest or cause to be arrested, detain or cause to be detained any etc. etc. on whose part soever the same be commanded. Which done... One can wind up with this comfortable reflection from Abbe Sies. Monsieur, you are today what you were yesterday. 
Courtiers may shriek, but it is and remains even so. Their well-charged explosion has exploded through the touch hole, covering themselves with scorches, confusion and unseemly soot. Poor triumvirate, poor queen, and above all poor queen's husband, who means well had he any fixed meaning. Folly is that wisdom which is wise only behindhand. A few months ago these thirty-five concessions had filled France with a rejoicing which might have lasted for several years. Now it is unavailing, the very mention of it slighted, Majesty's express orders set at naught. Oh, France is in a roar, a sea of persons estimated at ten thousand, whirls all this day in the Palais Royal. The remaining clergy, and likewise some forty-eight noblesse, d'Orléans among them, have now forthwith gone over to the victorious commons, by whom, as is natural, they are received with acclamation. The third estate triumphs. Versailles town, shouting round it, ten thousand whirling all day in the Palais Royal, and all France standing a tiptoe, not unlike whirling. Let the Oye de Boeuf look at it. As for King Louis, he will swallow his injuries, will temporise, keep silence, will at all costs have present peace. It was Tuesday the 23rd of June when he spoke that peremptory royal mandate, and the week is not done till he has written to the remaining obstinate noblesse that they also must oblige him and give in. This Brevenel rages his last, Baron Mirabeau breaks his sword, making a vow which he might as well have kept. The triple family is now therefore complete, the third erring brother, the noblesse, having joined it, erring but pardonable, soothed so far as possible by sweet eloquence from President Bailly. So triumphs the third estate, and states-general are become national assembly, and all France may sing te diem. By wise inertia and wise cessation of inertia, great victory has been gained. It is the last night of June. All night you meet nothing on the streets of Versailles but men running with torches, with shouts of jubilation. From the 2nd of May, when they kiss the hand of Majesty, to this 30th of June, when men run with torches, we count seven weeks complete. For seven weeks the national Caraccio has stood far seen, ringing many a signal, and so much having now gathered round it may hope to stand. End of Book 5, Chapter 2《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 5, The Third Estate. Chapter 3, Bollier the War God. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 3, Bollier the War God. The court feels indignant that it is conquered, but what then? Another time it will do better. Mercury descended in vain. Now has the time come for Mars. The gods of the Oie de Boeuf have withdrawn into the darkness of their cloudy Ida and sit there shaping and forging what may be needful, be it billets of a new national bank, munitions of war, or things forever inscrutable to men. Accordingly, what means this apparatus of troops? The National Assembly can get no furtherance for its committee of subsistences, can hear only that at Paris the baker's shops are besieged, that in the provinces people are living on meal husks and boiled grass. But on all highways there hover dust clouds with the march of regiments, with the trailing of cannon, Foreign pandours of fierce aspect, Salis Samad, Esterhazy, Royal Allemand, so many of them foreign to the number of thirty thousand, which fear can magnify to fifty, all wending towards Paris and Versailles. Already on the heights of Montmartre is a digging and delving too like a scarping and trenching. The effluence of Paris is arrested Versaillewards by a barrier of cannon at Sevres Bridge. From the Queen's Muse, cannon stand pointed on the National Assembly Hall itself. The National Assembly has its very slumbers broken by the tramp of soldiery, swarming and defiling, endless or seemingly endless, all round those spaces at dead of night, without drum music, without audible word of command. 
what means it? Shall eight or even shall twelve deputies, our Mirabeaus, Barnaves, at the head of them, be whirled suddenly to the castle of Ham, the rest ignominiously dispersed to the winds? No national assembly can make the constitution with cannon levelled on it from the Queen's muse? What means this reticence of the oi de boeuf, broken only by nods and shrugs? In the mystery of that cloudy Ida, what is it that they forge and shape? Such questions must distracted patriotism keep asking and receive no answer but an echo. Enough of themselves. But now, above all, while the hungry food year, which runs from August to August, is getting older, becoming more and more a famine year, with meal husks and boiled grass, brigands may actually collect, and in crowds at farm and mansion howl angrily, Food! Food! It is in vain to send soldiers against them. At sight of soldiers they disperse, they vanish as underground, then directly reassemble elsewhere for new tumult and plunder. Frightful enough to look upon, but what to hear of, reverberated through twenty-five millions of suspicious minds. Brigands and broliers, open conflagration, preternatural rumour, are driving mad most hearts in France. What will the issue of these things be? At Marseille, many weeks ago, the townsmen have taken arms for suppressing of brigands and other purposes. The military commandant may make of it what he will. Elsewhere, everywhere, could not the like be done? Dubious on the distracted patriot imagination wavers as a last deliverance some foreshadow of a national guard. But conceive, above all, the wooden tent in the Palais Royal. A universal hubbub there as of dissolving worlds, their loudest bellows, the mad, mad-making voice of rumour, their sharpest gazes, suspicion into the pale, dim world whirlpool, discerning shapes and phantasms, imminent, bloodthirsty regiments camped on the Champ de Mars, dispersed National Assembly, red-hot cannonballs to burn Paris, the mad war-god and Bologna's sounding thongs, to the calmest man it is becoming too plain that battle is inevitable. Inevitable, silently nod, messieurs and broliers, inevitable and brief. Your National Assembly, stopped short in its constitutional labours, may fatigue the royal ear with addresses and remonstrances. Those cannon of ours stand duly levelled. Those troops are here. The King's declaration, with its thirty-five two generous articles, was spoken, was not listened to, but remains yet unrevoked. He himself shall effect it. Sir Lil Ferrat. As for Brolier, he has his headquarters at Versailles, all as in a seat of war. Clerks writing, significant staff officers, inclined to taciturnity, plumed aide-de-camp, scouts, orderlies flying or hovering. He himself looks forth, important, impenetrable, listens to Bessonval, commandant of Paris, and his warning and earnest counsels, for he has come out repeatedly on purpose, with a silent smile. The Parisians resist, scornfully cry messieurs, as a meal mob may. They have sat quiet these five generations, submitting to all. Their mercia declared in these very years that a Parisian revolt was henceforth impossible. Stand by the royal declaration of the 23rd of June. The nobles of France, valorous, chivalrous as of old, will rally round us with one heart. And as for this which you call third estate, and which we call canaille of unwashed sans culottes, of patelin scribblers, facetious spouters, brave Brolier, with a whiff of grape-shot, salve de canon, if need be, will give quick account of it. Thus reason they on their cloudy ida, hidden from men, men also hidden from them. Good is grape-shot, messieurs, on one condition, that the shooter also were made of metal. But unfortunately he is made of flesh. Under his buffs and bandoliers your hired shooter has instincts, feelings, even a kind of thought. It is his kindred, bone of his bone, this same canaille that shall be whiffed. He has brothers in it, a father and mother, living on meal husks and boiled grass. His very doxy, not yet dead in the spittle, drives him into military heterodoxy, declares that if he shed patriot blood he shall be accursed among men. 
The soldier, who has seen his pay stolen by rapacious foulons, his blood wasted by Soubises, pompadours, and the gates of promotion shut inexorably on him if he were not born noble, is himself not without griefs against you. Your cause is not the soldier's cause, but, as would seem, your own only, and no other gods nor man's. For example, the world may have heard how at Bethune lately, when there rose some riot about grains, of which sort there are so many, and the soldiers stood drawn out, and the word fire was given, not a trigger stirred, only the butts of all muskets rattled angrily against the ground, and the soldiers stood glooming with a mixed expression of countenance, till clutched, each under the arm of a patriot householder, they were all hurried off in this manner to be treated and caressed and have their pay increased by subscription. Neither have the Garde Francais, the best regiment of the line, shown any promptitude for street firing lately. They returned grumbling from Ravaillons and have not burnt a single cartridge since. Nay, as we saw, not even when bid. A dangerous humour dwells in these guards. Notable men, too, in their way. Vladi the Pythagorean was at one time an officer of theirs. Nay, in the ranks, under the three-cornered felt and cockade, what hard heads may there not be and reflections going on, unknown to the public? One head of the hardest we do now discern there, on the shoulders of a certain Sergeant Hoche. Lazare Hoche, that is the name of him. He used to be about the Versailles royal stables, nephew of a poor herb woman, a handy lad, exceedingly addicted to reading. He is now Sergeant Hoche and can rise no farther. He lays out his pay in rushlights and cheap editions of books. On the whole, the best seems to be, consign these guard Francais to their barracks. So Bessonval thinks, and orders. Consigned to their barracks, the guard Francais do but form a secret association, an engagement not to act against the National Assembly. Debauched by Vladi the Pythagorean, debauched by money and women, cry Bessonval and innumerable others. Debauched by what you will or in need of no debauching, behold them, long files of them, their consignment broken, arrive, headed by their sergeants, on the 26th day of June at the Palais Royal. Welcomed with vivats, with presents and a pledge of patriot liquor, embracing and embraced, declaring in words that the cause of France is their cause. Next day and the following day the like. What is singular too, except this patriot humour and breaking of their consignment, they behave otherwise with the most rigorous accuracy. They are growing questionable, these guards. Eleven ringleaders of them are put in the Abbey prison. It boots not in the least. The imprisoned eleven have only, by the hand of an individual, to drop towards nightfall a line in the Café du Foix, where patriotism harangues loudest on its table. Two hundred young persons, soon waxing to four thousand, with fit crowbars, roll towards the abbey, smite asunder the needful doors, and bear out their eleven with other military victims, to supper in the Palais Royal Garden, to board and lodging in camp beds in the Théâtre des Variétés, other national Praetanium as yet not being in readiness. Most deliberate, nay, so punctual were these young persons that finding one military victim to have been imprisoned for real civil crime, they returned him to his cell with protest. Why new military force was not called out? New military force was called out. New military force did arrive, full gallop, with drawn sabre. But the people gently laid hold of their bridles. The dragoons sheathed their swords, lifted their caps by way of salute, and sat like mere statues of dragoons, except indeed that a drop of liquor being brought them, they drank to the king and nation with the greatest cordiality. And now... Ask in return why Messieurs and Broglie, the great god of war, on seeing these things, did not pause and take some other course, any other course. Unhappily, as we said, they could see nothing. Pride which goes before a fall, wrath if not reasonable, yet pardonable, most natural, had hardened their hearts and heated their heads. So, with imbecility and violence, ill-matched pair, they rushed to seek their hour. 
All regiments are not Garde Francais or debauched by Valadi, the Pythagorean. Let fresh, undebauched regiments come up. Let Royal Allemand, Salé Samard, Swiss Chateau Vieux come up, which can fight but can hardly speak except in German gutturals. Let soldiers march and highways thunder with artillery wagons. Majesty has a new royal session to hold and miracles to work there. The whiff of grapeshot can, if needful, become a blast and tempest. In which circumstances, before the red-hot balls begin raining, may not the hundred and twenty Paris electors, though their carrière is long since finished, see good to meet again daily as an electoral club? They meet first in a tavern, where the largest wedding party cheerfully gives place to them. But latterly they meet in the Hôtel de Ville, in the town hall itself. Flissel, provost of merchants with his four eschevins, scabins, assessors, could not prevent it, such was the force of public opinion. He, with his eschevins and the six-and-twenty town councillors, all appointed from above, may well sit silent there in their long gowns, and consider with awed eye what prelude this is of convulsion coming from below, and how themselves shall fare in that. End of Book 5 Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 5, The Third Estate, Chapter 4, To Arms. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 4, To Arms. So hangs it dubious, fateful, in the sultry days of July. It is the passionate printed advice of Monsieur Marat to abstain, of all things, from violence. Nevertheless, the hungry poor are already burning town barriers where tribute on eatables is levied, getting clamorous for food. The 12th July morning is Sunday. The streets are all placarded with an enormous-sized de par le roi inviting peaceable citizens to remain within doors, to feel no alarm, to gather in no crowd. Why so? What mean these placards of enormous size? Above all, what means this clatter of military, dragoons, hussars, rattling in from all points of the compass towards the Place Louis Cannes, with a staid gravity of face, though saluted with mere nicknames, hootings and even missiles? Bessonval is with them. Swiss guards of his are already in the Champs-Élysées with four pieces of artillery. Have the destroyers descended on us then? From the bridge of Sèvres to utmost Vincennes, from Saint-Denis to the Champ de Mars, we are begirt. Alarm of the vague unknown is in every heart. The Palais Royal has become a place of awestruck interjections, silent shakings of the head. One can fancy with what dolorous sound the noontide cannon which the sun fires at the crossing of his meridian, went off there, bodeful like an inarticulate voice of doom. Are these troops verily come out against brigands? Where are the brigands? What mystery is in the wind? Hark! A human voice reporting articulately the Job's news. Necker, people's minister, saviour of France, is dismissed. Impossible. Incredible treasonous to the public peace. Such a voice ought to be choked in the waterworks had not the newsbringer quickly fled. Nevertheless, friends, make of it what you will. The news is true. Necker is gone. Necker hies northward incessantly in obedient secrecy since yesternight. We have a new ministry. Brolier, the war god, aristocrat Breteuil, Foulon, who said the people might eat grass. Rumour, therefore, shall arise in the Palais Royal and in broad France. Paleness sits on every face, confused tremor and fremescence, waxing into thunder peals of fury stirred on by fear. But see Camille Desmoulins from the Café de Foire, rushing out Sibylline in face, his hair streaming, in each hand a pistol. He springs to the table, the police satellites are eyeing him. Alive they shall not take him, nor they alive him alive. This time he speaks without stammering. Friends, shall we die like hunted hares, like sheep hounded into their pinfold, bleating for mercy, where is no mercy but only a wetted knife? 
The hour is come, the supreme hour of Frenchman and man, when oppressors are to try conclusions with oppressed, and the word is swift death or deliverance forever. Let such hour be well come. Us, meseems, one cry only befits, to arms! Let universal Paris, universal France, as with the throat of the whirlwind, sound only to arms! To arms, yell responsive, the innumerable voices, like one great voice, as of a demon yelling from the air. For all faces wax fire-eyed, all hearts burn up into madness. In such or fitter words does Camilla evoke the elemental powers in this great moment. Friends, continues Camilla, some rallying sign, cockades, green ones, the colour of hope. As with the flight of locusts, these green tree leaves, green ribbons from the neighbouring shops, all green things are snatched and made cockades of. Camilla descends from his table, stifled with embraces, wetted with tears, has a bit of green ribbon handed him, sticks it in his hat. And now to Curtius's image shop there, to the boulevards, to the four winds, and rest not till France be on fire. France, so long shaken and wind-parched, is probably at the right inflammable point. As for poor Curtius, who one grieves to think might be but imperfectly paid, he cannot make two words about his images. The wax bust of Necker, the wax bust of Dorleon, helpers of France, these covered with crepe, as in funeral procession, or after the manner of suppliants appealing to heaven, to earth, and to Taurus itself, a mixed multitude bears off, for a sign as indeed man with his singular imaginative faculties can do little or nothing without signs. Thus Turks look to their prophet's banner, also osier mannequins have been burnt, and Necker's portrait has erewhile figured aloft on its perch. In this manner march they, a mixed, continually increasing multitude, armed with axes, staves and miscellanea, grim many sounding through the streets. Be all theatres shut. Let all dancing on planked floor or on the natural greensward cease. Instead of a Christian Sabbath and feast of ganguet tabernacles, it shall be a sorcerer's Sabbath and Paris gone rabid dance with the fiend for piper. However, Bessonval with horse and foot is in the Place Louis Cairns. Mortals promenading homewards in the fall of the day saunter by from Chaillot or Passy with flirtation and a little thin wine, with sadder step than usual. Will the bust procession pass that way? Behold it. Behold also Prince Lambesque dash forth on it with his royal allemands. Shots fall and sabre strokes. Busts are hewn asunder and also, also heads of men. A sabred procession has nothing for it but to explode along what streets, alleys, tuileries, avenues it finds and disappear. One unarmed man lies hewed down, a garde francaise by his uniform. Bear him or bear even the report of him dead and gory to his barracks, where he has comrades still alive. But why not now, victorious Lambesque, charge through that Tuileries garden itself where the fugitives are vanishing? Not show the Sunday promenaders too how steel glitters be sprent with blood that it be told of and men's ears tingle? Tingle, alas, they did, but the wrong way. Victorious Lambesque, in this his second or Tuileries charge, succeeds but in overturning, call it not slashing, for he struck with the flat of his sword, one man, a poor old schoolmaster, most pacifically tottering there, and is driven out by barricade of chairs, by flights of bottles and glasses, by execrations in bass voice and treble, most delicate is the mob queller's vocation, wherein too much may be as bad as not enough. For each of these bass voices, and more each treble voice, born to all points of the city, rings now nothing but distracted indignation, will ring all another. The cry, to arms, roars tenfold, steeples with their metal storm voice boom out as the sun sinks, armourers' shops are broken open, plundered, and the streets are a living foam sea, chafed by all the winds. Such issue came of Lambeck's charge on the Tuileries garden, no striking of salutary terror into Chio promenaders, a striking into broad wakefulness of frenzy and the three furies which otherwise were not asleep. 
For they lie always, those subterranean humanities, fabulous and yet so true, in the dullest existence of man, and can dance brandishing their dusky torches, shaking their serpent's hair. Lambusk with royal Allemande may ride to his barracks with curses for his marching music, then ride back again like one troubled in mind. Vengeful guard Francais, suckering with knit brows, start out on him with their barracks in the Chaussee d'Antin, pouring a volley into him, killing and wounding, which he must not answer but ride on. Council dwells not under the plumed hat. If the Eumenides awaken and Brolier has given no orders, what can a Bessonval do? When the Garde Francaise, with Palais Royal volunteers, roll down, greedy of more vengeance, to the Place Louis Cannes itself, they find neither Bessonval, Lambesque, Royal Allemande, nor any soldier now there. Gone is military order. On the far eastern boulevard of Saint Antoine, the Chasseurs Normandie arrive, dusty, thirsty after a hard day's ride, but can find no billet master, see no course in this city of confusions, cannot get to Bessonval, cannot so much as discover where he is. Normandy must even bivouac there in its dust and thirst, unless some patriot will treat it to a cup of liquor with advices. Raging multitudes surround the Hôtel de Ville, are crying, Arms! Orders! The six-and-twenty town councillors, with their long gowns, have ducked under into the raging chaos, shall never emerge more. Bessonval is painfully wriggling himself out to the Champ de Mars. He must sit there in the cruelest uncertainty. Courier after courier may dash off for Versailles, but will bring back no answer, can hardly bring himself back for the roads are all blocked with batteries and pickets, with floods of carriages arrested for examination. Such was Brolier's one sole order. The Oye de Boeuf, hearing in the distance such mad din which sounded almost like invasion, will before all things keep its own head whole. A new ministry, with, as it were, but one foot in the stirrup, cannot take leaps. Mad Paris is abandoned altogether to itself. What a Paris when the darkness fell! A European metropolitan city hurled suddenly forth from its old combinations and arrangements to crash simultaneously together, seeking new. Use and want will now no longer direct any man. Each man, with what of originality he has, must begin thinking or following those that think. Seven hundred thousand individuals on the sudden find all their old paths, old ways of acting and deciding, vanish from under their feet. And so there go they, with clangour and terror, they know not as yet whether running, swimming or flying, headlong into the new era. With clangour and terror from above Brolier, the war god impends, preternatural with his red-hot cannonballs, and from below a preternatural brigand world menaces with dirk and firebrand. Madness rules the hour. Happily, in place of the submerged 26, the Electoral Club is gathering, has declared itself a provisional municipality. On the morrow it will get Provost Flessel with an échevin or two to give help in many things. For the present it decrees one most essential thing, that forthwith a Parisian militia shall be enrolled. Depart, ye heads of districts, to labour in this great work, while we here in permanent committee sit alert. Let fensible men, each party in its own range of streets, keep watch and ward all night. Let Paris court a little fever sleep, confused by such fever dreams of violent motions at the Palais Royal, or from time to time start awake and look out, palpitating in its nightcap at the clash of discordant, mutually unintelligible patrols, on the gleam of distant barriers, going up all too ruddy towards the vault of night. End of Book 5 Chapter 4《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 5 — The Third Estate Chapter 5 — Give Us Arms This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 5 — Chapter 5 — Give Us Arms On Monday the huge city has awoke, not to its weekday industry, to what a different one. The working man has become a fighting man, has one want only, that of arms. 
The industry of all crafts has paused, except it be the smiths fiercely hammering pikes, and in a faint degree the kitcheners cooking offhand victuals for bouche va toujours. Women, too, are sewing cockades, not now of green, which being d'artois colour, the Hôtel de Ville has had to interfere in it, but of red and blue, our old Paris colours. These, once based on a ground of constitutional white, are the famed tricolour, which, if prophecy err not, will go round the world. All shops, unless it be the bakers and vintners, are shut. Paris is in the streets, rushing, foaming like some Venice wine glass into which you had dropped poison. The toxin by order is peeling madly from all steeples. Arms, ye elector municipals, thou flesselles with thy echevins, give us arms. Flesselles gives what he can, fallacious, perhaps insidious promises of arms from Charleville, order to seek arms here, order to seek them there. The new municipals give what they can, some 360 in different firelocks, the equipment of the city watch. A man in wooden shoes and without coat directly clutches one of them and mounts guard. Also, as hinted, an order to all smiths to make pikes with their whole soul. Heads of districts are in fervent consultation. Subordinate patriotism roams distracted, ravenous for arms. Hitherto at the Hotel de Ville was only such modicum of indifferent firelocks as we have seen. At the so-called arsenal there lies nothing but rust, rubbish and saltpetre, overlooked too by the guns of the Bastille. His Majesty's repository, what they call guard meubler, is forced and ransacked, tapestries enough and gauderies, but of serviceable fighting gear small stock. Two silver-mounted cannons there are, an ancient gift from His Majesty of Siam to Louis XIV, gilt sword of the good Henri, antique chivalry arms and armour. These and such as these, the necessitous patriotism snatches greedily for want of better. The Siamese cannons go trundling on an errand they were not meant for. Among the indifferent firelocks are seen tourney lances, the princely helm and hauberk glittering amid ill-hatted heads, as in a time when all times and their possessions are suddenly sent jumbling. At the Maison de Saint-Lazare, Lazare house once, now a correction house with priests, there was no trace of arms, but, on the other hand, corn, plainly, to a culpable extent. Out with it, to market, in this scarcity of grains! Heavens, will fifty-two carts in long row hardly carry it to the whole or bled? Well, truly, ye reverend fathers, was your pantry filled, fatter your larders, over-generous your wine-bins, ye plotting exasperators of the poor, traitorous forestallers of bread. Vain is protesting, entreaty on bare knees, the house of St. Lazarus has that in it which comes not out by protesting. Behold how from every window it vomits, mere torrents of furniture of bellowing and hurly-burly, the cellars also leaking wine, till as was natural smoke rose, kindled, some say, by the desperate St. Lazarists themselves, desperate of other riddance, and the establishment vanished from this world in flame. Remark, nevertheless, that a thief, set on or not by aristocrats, being detected there, is instantly hanged. Look also at the Châtelet prison. The debtors' prison of La Force is broken from without, and they that sat in bondage to aristocrats go free, hearing of which the felons at the Châtelet do likewise dig up their pavements and stand on the offensive with the best prospects, had not patriotism, passing that way, fired a volley into the felon world and crushed it down again under hatches. Patriotism consorts not with thieving and felony. Surely also punishment this day hitches, if she still hitch, after crime with frightful shoes of swiftness. Some score or two of wretched persons found prostrate with drink in the cellars of that St. Lazare are indignantly hailed to prison. The jailer has no room, whereupon other place of security not suggesting itself, it is written en les pendis, they hang them. Brief is the word, not without significance, be it true or untrue. In such circumstances, the aristocrat, the unpatriotic rich man, is packing up for departure. 
but he shall not get departed. A wooden shod force has seized all barriers, burnt or not. All that enters, all that seeks to issue, is stopped there and dragged to the Hotel de Ville. Coaches, tumbrils, plate, furniture, many meal sacks. In time, even flocks and herds encumber the Place de Grève. And so it roars and rages and brays, drums beating, steeples peeling, criers rushing with handbells, Oye, oye, all men to their districts to be enrolled. The districts have met in gardens, open squares, are getting marshalled into volunteer troops. No red-hot ball has yet fallen from Bissonval's camp. On the contrary, deserters with their arms are continually dropping in. Nay, now a joy of joys at two in the afternoon. The Garde Francais, being ordered to St. Denis and flatly declining, have come over in a body. It is a fact worth many. 3,600 of the best fighting men with complete accoutrement, with cannoneers even, and cannon. Their officers are left standing alone, could not so much as succeed in spiking the guns. The very Swiss, it may now be hoped, Chateau Vieux and the others will have doubts about fighting. Our Parisian militia, which some think it were better to name National Guard, is prospering as heart could wish. It promised to be 48,000, but will in few hours double and quadruple that number, invincible if we had only arms. But see the promised Charleville boxes marked artillery. Here, there, are arms enough? Conceive the blank face of patriotism when it found them filled with rags, foul linen, candle ends and bits of wood. Provost of the merchants, how is this? Neither at the Chartreux convent, whither we were sent with signed order, is there or ever was there any weapon of war. Nay, here, in this sane boat, safe under tarpaulings, had not the nose of patriotism been of the finest, a five thousand weight of gunpowder, not coming in, but surreptitiously going out. What meanest thou, Flacelles? Tis a ticklish game, that of amusing us. Cat plays with captive mouse, but mouse with enraged cat, with enraged national tiger. Meanwhile, the faster, O ye black apron smiths, smite with strong arm and willing heart. This man and that, all stroke from head to heel, shall thunder alternating and ply the great forge hammer, till stithy reel and ring again, while ever and anon overhead booms the alarm cannon, for the city has now got gunpowder. Pikes are fabricated, fifty thousand of them in six and thirty hours. Judge whether the black apron have been idle. Dig trenches, unpave the streets, ye others, assiduous, man and maid. Cram the earth with barrel barricades, at each of them a volunteer sentry. Pile the windstones in window sills and upper rooms. Have scalding pitch, at least boiling water, ready, ye weak old women, to pour it and dash it on royal allemande with your old skinny arms. Your shrill curses along with it will not be wanting. Patrols of the newborn National Guard bearing torches scour the streets all that night, which otherwise are vacant, yet illuminated in every window by order. Strange looking, like some naphtha lighted city of the dead, with here and there a flight of perturbed ghosts. O oh, poor mortals, how ye make this earth bitter for each other, this fearful and wonderful life, fearful and horrible, and Satan has his place in all hearts. Such agonies and ragings and wailings he have and have had in all times, to be buried all in so deep silence and the salt sea is not swollen with your tears. Great, meanwhile, is the moment when tidings of freedom reach us, when the long enthralled soul from amidst its chains and squalid stagnancy arises, where it's still only in blindness and bewilderment, and swears by him that made it that it will be free. Free? Understand that well, it is the deep commandment, dimmer or clearer, of our whole being to be free. Freedom is the one purport, wisely aimed at or unwisely, of all man's struggles, toilings and sufferings in this earth. Yes, supreme is such a moment, if thou have known it. First vision as of a flame-girt Sinai in this our waste pilgrimage, which thenceforth wants not its pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Something it is even, nay, something considerable, when the chains have grown corrosive, poisonous, to be free from oppression by our fellow man. 
Forward, ye maddened sons of France, be it towards this destiny or towards that. Around you is but starvation, falsehood, corruption, and the clam of death. Where ye are is no abiding. Imagination may imperfectly figure how Commandant Bessonval in the Champ de Mars has worn out these sorrowful hours. Insurrection all round, his men melting away. From Versailles to the most pressing messages comes no answer, or once only some vague word of answer which is worse than none. A council of officers can decide merely that there is no decision. Colonels inform him, weeping, that they do not think their men will fight. Cruel uncertainty is here. War god Brolier sits yonder, inaccessible in his Olympus, does not descend terror-clad, does not produce his whiff of grape-shot, sends no orders. Truly in the chateau of Versailles all seems mystery. In the town of Versailles were we there, all is rumour, alarm and indignation. An august national assembly sits to appearance menaced with death, endeavouring to defy death. It has resolved that Necker carries with him the regrets of the nation. It has sent solemn deputation over to the chateau with entreaty to have these troops withdrawn. In vain, His Majesty, with a singular composure, invites us to be busy, rather, with our own duty, making the Constitution. Foreign pandas and such like go pricking and prancing with a swashbuckler air, with an eye, too, probably, to the Salle de Menu, were it not for the grim-looking countenances that crowd all avenues there. Be firm, ye national senators, the cynosure of a firm, grim-looking people. The august national senators determine that there shall at least be permanent session till this thing end. Wherein, however, consider that worthy Lafranc de Pompignon, our new president, whom we have named Bailly's successor, is an old man, wearied with many things. He is the brother of that Pompignon who meditated lamentably on the book of lamentations. Savez-vous pourquoi, Jérémy, se lamentez tout la vie C'est qui au prévoyage que Pompignon le traduirait Poor Bishop Pompignon withdraws, having got Lafayette for helper or substitute, this latter as nocturnal vice-president, with a thin house and disconsolate humour, sits sleepless with lights unsnuffed, waiting what the hours will bring. So at Versailles. But at Paris, agitated Bessonval, before retiring for the night, has stepped over to old Monsieur de Sombroy of the Hotel des Invalides hard by. Monsieur de Sombroy has, what is a great secret, some eight and twenty thousand stand of muskets deposited in his cellars there, but no trust in the temper of his invalide. This day, for example, he sent twenty of the fellows down to unscrew those muskets, lest sedition might snatch at them, but scarcely in six hours had the twenty unscrewed twenty gun-locks, or dog's heads, shen, of locks, each invalide his dog's head. If ordered to fire, they would, he imagines, turn their cannon against himself. Unfortunate old military gentleman, it is your hour, not of glory. Old Marquis de Launay, too, of the Bastille, has pulled up his drawbridges long since, and retired into his interior, with sentries walking on his battlements under the midnight sky, aloft over the glare of illuminated Paris, whom a national patrol, passing that way, takes the liberty of firing at seven shots towards twelve at night, which do not take effect. This was the 13th day of July, 1789, a worse day, many said, than the last thirteenth was, when only hail fell out of heaven, not madness rose out of Tophet, ruining worse than crops. In these same days, as chronology will teach us, hot old Marquis Mirabeau lies stricken down at Agenteuil, not within sound of these alarm guns, for he properly is not there, and only the body of him now lies, deaf and cold for ever. It was on Saturday night that he, drawing his last life breaths, gave up the ghost there, leaving a world which would never go to his mind, now broken out seemingly into deliration and the culbut général. What is it to him, departing elsewhither on his long journey? The old chateau Mirabeau stands silent, far off on its scarped rock in that gorge of two windy valleys, the pale fading spectre now of a chateau, this huge world riot and France and the world itself fades also like a shadow on the great still mirror sea 
and all shall be as God wills. Young Mirabeau, sad of heart, for he loved this crabbed, brave old father, sad of heart and occupied with sad cares, is withdrawn from public history. The great crisis transacts itself without him. End of Book 5, Chapter 5《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 5, The Third Estate, Chapter 6, Storm and Victory. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 6, Storm and Victory. But to the living and the struggling a new fourteenth morning dawns. Under all roofs of this distracted city is the notice of a drama, not untragical, crowding towards solution. The bustlings and preparings, the tremors and menaces, the tears that fell from old eyes. This day, my sons, ye shall quit you like men. By the memory of your father's wrongs, by the hope of your children's rights. Tyranny impends in red wrath. Help for you is none, if not in your own right hands. This day ye must do or die. From earliest light a sleepless permanent committee has heard the old cry, now waxing almost frantic mutinous. Arms! Arms! Provost Flessel, or what traitors there are among you, may think of those shallable boxes, a hundred and fifty thousand of us, and but the third man furnished with so much as a pike. Arms are the one thing needful. With arms we are an unconquerable, man-defying national guard. Without arms, a rabble to be whiffed with grapeshot. Happily, the word has arisen, for no secret can be kept, that there lie muskets at the Hotel des Invalides. Thither too will we, King's Procureur, Monsieur Ethy de Corny, and whatsoever of authority a permanent committee can lend, shall go with us. Bessonval's camp is there. Perhaps he will not fire on us. If he kill us, we shall but die. Alas, poor Bessonval, with his troops melting away in that manner, has not the smallest humour to fire. At five o'clock this morning, as he lay dreaming, oblivious in the École Militaire, a figure stood suddenly at his bedside, with face rather handsome, eyes inflamed, speech rapid and curt, air audacious. Such a figure drew Priam's curtains. The message and monition of the figure was that resistance would be hopeless, that if blood flowed, woe to him who shed it. Thus spoke the figure and vanished. Withal, there was a kind of eloquence that struck one. Bessonval admits that he should have arrested him, but did not. Who this figure with inflamed eyes, with speech rapid and curt, might be? Bessonval knows, but mentions not. Camille de Moulin? Pythagorean Maki Valadi, inflamed with violent motions all night at the Palais Royal? Fame names him young Monsieur Maillard, then shuts her lips about him for ever. In any case, behold, about nine in the morning, our national volunteers rolling in long, wide flood, southwestward to the Hotel des Invalides, in search of the one thing needful. King's procureur, Monsieur Ethy de Corny, and officials are there. The curé of Saint-Étienne-du-Mont marches unpacific at the head of his militant parish. The clerks of the Bazoche in red coats we see marching. Now volunteers of the Bazoche, the volunteers of the Palais Royal, national volunteers, numerable by tens of thousands of one heart and mind. The king's muskets are the nation's. Think, old Monsieur de Sombroy, how in this extremity thou wilt refuse them. Old Monsieur de Sombroy would fain hold parley, send couriers, but it skills not. The walls are scaled, no invalid firing a shot, the gates must be flung open. Patriotism rushes in, tumultuous, from ground cell up to ridge tile, through all rooms and passages, rummaging distractedly for arms. What cellar or what cranny can escape it? The arms are found, all safe there, lying packed in straw, apparently with a view to being burnt. More ravenous than famishing lions over dead prey, the multitude, with clangour and vociferation, pounces on them, struggling, dashing, clutching, to the jamming up to the pressure, fracture and probable extinction of the weaker patriot. And so, with such protracted crash of deafening, most discordant orchestra music, the scene is changed, 
and eight and twenty thousand sufficient firelocks are on the shoulders of so many national guards, lifted thereby out of darkness into fiery light. Let Bessonval look at the glitter of these muskets as they flash by. Guard Francais, it is said, have cannon levelled on him, ready to open, if need be, from the other side of the river. Motionless sits he, astonished, one may flatter oneself, at the proud bearing, fier contenance, of the Parisians. And now to the Bastille, ye intrepid Parisians. There grapeshot still threatens, thither all men's thoughts and steps are now tending. Old de Launay, as we hinted, withdrew into his interior soon after midnight of Sunday. He remains there ever since, hampered, as all military gentlemen now are, in the saddest conflict of uncertainties. The Hotel de Villa invites him to admit national soldiers, which is a soft name for surrendering. On the other hand, His Majesty's orders were precise. His garrison is but eighty-two old invalides, reinforced by thirty-two young Swiss. His walls, indeed, are nine feet thick. He has cannon and powder, but alas, only one day's provision of victuals. The city, too, is French, the poor garrison mostly French. Rigorous old de Lournay, think what thou wilt do. All morning since nine there has been a cry everywhere, To the Bastille! Repeated deputations of citizens have been here, passionate for arms, whom de Lournay has got dismissed by soft speeches through portholes. Towards noon, Elector Turio de la Rosière gains admittance, finds de Lournay indisposed for surrender, nay, disposed for blowing up the place, rather. Turio mounts with him to the battlements. Heaps of paving stones, old iron and missiles lie piled, cannon all duly levelled, in every embrasure a cannon, only drawn back a little. But outwards, behold, O Turio, how the multitude flows on, welling through every street, toxin furiously peeling, all drums beating the general, the suburb Saint Antoine rolling hitherward wholly as one man. Such vision spectral, yet Real, thou, O Turio, as from thy mount of vision, beholdest in this moment, prophetic of what other phantasmagories and loud gibbering spectral realities, which thou yet beholdest not, but shalt. Que voulez-vous, said de Lone, turning pale at the sight, with an air of reproach, almost of menace. Monsieur, said Turio, rising into the moral sublime, what mean you? Consider if I could not precipitate both of us from this height, say only a hundred feet, exclusive of the walled ditch. Whereupon de Lornay fell silent. Thurio shows himself from some pinnacle to comfort the multitude, becoming suspicious, from essent, then descends, departs with protest, with warning addressed also to the invalid, on whom, however, it produces but a mixed, indistinct impression. The old heads are none of the clearest. Besides, it is said, de Lornay has been profuse of beverages, prodigua de buisson. They think they will not fire. If not fired on, if they can help it, but must on the whole be ruled considerably by circumstances. Woe to thee, de Lornay, in such an hour, if thou canst not, taking some one firm decision, rule circumstances. Soft speeches will not serve. Hard grape-shot is questionable but hovering between the two is unquestionable. Ever wilder swells the tide of men, their infinite hum waxing ever louder into imprecations, perhaps into crackle of stray musketry, which latter on walls nine feet thick cannot do execution. The outer drawbridge has been lowered for Turio. New deputation of citizens, it is the third and noisiest of all, penetrates that way into the outer court. Soft speeches producing no clearance of these, de Lornay gives fire, pulls up his drawbridge. A slight sputter, which has kindled the too combustible chaos, made it a roaring fire chaos. Burst forth insurrection at sight of its own blood, for there were deaths by that sputter of fire, into endless rolling explosion of musketry, distraction, execration, and overhead from the fortress let one great gun with its grape shot go booming to show what we could do. The Bastille is besieged. On then all Frenchmen that have hearts in their bodies, roar with all your throats of cartilage and metal, ye sons of liberty, stir spasmodically whatsoever of utmost faculty is in you, soul, body or spirit, for it is the hour. 
smite their Louis Tournay cartwright of the Marais, old soldier of the regiment Dauphine, smite at that outer drawbridge chain, though the fiery hail whistles round thee. Never over knave or fellow did thy axe strike such a stroke. Down with it, man, down with it to Orcus, let the whole accursed edifice sink thither, and tyranny be swallowed up for ever. Mounted, some say on the roof of the guardroom, some on bayonets stuck into joints of the wall, Louis Tournay smites brave Aubin Bonmer, also an old soldier, seconding him. The chain yields, breaks, the huge drawbridge slams down, thundering, avec fracas. Glorious, and yet, alas, it is still but the outworks. The eight grim towers with their invalid musketry, their paving stones and cannon mouths still soar aloft intact. Ditch yawning, impassable, stone faced, the inner drawbridge with its back towards us, the Bastille is still to take. To describe this siege of the Bastille, thought to be one of the most important in history, perhaps transcends the talent of mortals. Could one but, after infinite reading, get to understand so much as the plan of the building? But there is open esplanade at the end of the Rue Saint-Antoine. There are such forecourts, Cœur Avancé, Cœur de l'Orme, arched gateways where Louis Tournay now fights, then new drawbridges, dormant bridges, rampart bastions, and the grim eight towers, a labyrinthic mass, high frowning there of all ages from twenty years to four hundred and twenty, beleaguered in its last hour, as we said, by mere chaos come again. Ordnance of all calibres, throats of all capacities, men of all plans, every man his own engineer, seldom since the war of pygmies and cranes were there seen so anomalous a thing. Half pay Ali is home for a suit of regimentals, no one would heed him in coloured clothes. Half pay Ulin is haranguing Garde Francais in the Place de Grève. Frantic patriots pick up the grape shots, bear them, still hot or seemingly so, to the Hotel de Ville. Paris, you perceive, is to be burnt. Flacelle is pale to the very lips, for the roar of the multitude grows deep. Paris wholly has got to the acme of its frenzy, whirled all ways by panic madness. At every street barricade there whirls simmering a minor whirlpool, strengthening the barricade since God knows what is coming, and all minor whirlpools play distractedly into that grand fire maelstrom which is lashing round the Bastille. And so it lashes and it roars, Cola, the wine merchant, has become an impromptu cannoneer. Si Jorge of the marine service, fresh from Brest, ply the king of Siam's cannon. Singular, if we were not used to the like. Jorge lay last night, taking his ease at his inn. The king of Siam's cannon also lay, knowing nothing of him, for a hundred years. Yet now, at the right instant, they have got together and discourse eloquent music. For hearing what was toward, Georges sprang from the Brest diligence and ran. Garde Francaise will also be here with real artillery, were not the walls so thick. Upwards from the esplanade, horizontally from all neighbouring roofs and windows, flashes one irregular deluge of musketry without effect. The invalid lie flat, firing comparatively at their ease from behind stone, hardly through portholes, show the tip of a nose. We fall shot and make no impression. Let conflagration rage of whatsoever is combustible. Guard rooms are burnt, invalid mess rooms. A distracted peruke maker with two fiery torches is for burning the salpetra of the arsenal. Had not a woman run screaming, had not a patriot with some tincture of natural philosophy instantly struck the wind out of him, butt of musket on pit of stomach, overturned barrels and stayed the devouring element. A young, beautiful lady, seized escaping in these outer courts and thought falsely to be Delaunay's daughter, shall be burnt in Delaunay's sight. She lies swooned on a paillasse, but again a patriot, it is brave Aubin Bonnemer, the old soldier, dashes in and rescues her. Straw is burnt, three cartloads of it, hauled thither, go up in white smoke, almost to the choking of patriotism itself, so that Elie had, with singed brows, to drag back one cart and Raoul, the gigantic haberdasher, another. Smoke as of Tophet, confusion as of Babel, noise as of the crack of doom. Blood flows, the element of new madness. The wounded are carried into houses of the Rue Cerisay. The dying leave their last mandate, not to yield till the accursed stronghold fall. And yet, alas, how fall? The walls are so thick. 
Deputations three in number arrived from the Hotel de Ville. Abbe Fouché, who was of one, can say, with what almost superhuman courage of benevolence, these wave their town flag in the arched gateway and stand rolling their drum, but to no purpose. In such crack of doom, Delaunay cannot hear them, dare not believe them. They return with justified rage, the whew of lead still singing in their ears. What to do? The firemen are here, squirting with their fire pumps on the invalid cannon to wet the touch holes. They, unfortunately, cannot squirt so high, but produce only clouds of spray. Individuals of classical knowledge propose catapults. Santerre, the sonorous brewer of the suburb Saint Antoine, advises rather that the place be fired by a mixture of phosphorus and oil of turpentine spouted up through forcing pumps. Oh, Spinola, Santerre, hast thou the mixture ready? Every man his own engineer. And still the fire deluge abates not, even women are firing, and Turks, at least one woman with her sweetheart and one Turk. Guard Francais have come, real cannon, real cannoneers. Asha Maillard is busy, half pay a lee, half pay Julian rage in the midst of thousands. How the great Bastille clock ticks inaudible in its inner court there, at its ease, hour after hour, as if nothing special for it or the world were passing. It told one when the firing began and is now pointing towards five, and still the firing slakes not. Far down in their vaults the seven prisoners hear muffled din as of earthquakes, their turnkeys answer vaguely. Woe to thee, Delaunay, with thy poor hundred invalid. Brolier is distant with his ears heavy. Bessonval hears, but can send no help. One poor troop of hussars has crept, reconnoitring, cautiously along the quay as far as the Pont Neuf. We are come to join you, said the captain, for the crowd seems shoreless. A large-headed, dwarfish individual of smoke-bleared aspect shambles forward, opening his blue lips, for there is sense in him, and croaks, Alight, then, and give us your arms. The hussar captain is too happy to be escorted to the barriers and dismissed on parole. Who the Scot individual was? Men answer, it is Monsieur Marat, author of the excellent Pacific Avis du Peuple. Great truly, O thou remarkable dog-leech, is this thy day of emergence and new birth, and yet this same day come four years. But let the curtains of the future hang. What shall Delaunay do? One thing only Delaunay could have done, what he said he would do. Fancy him sitting from the first with lighted taper within arm's length of the powder magazine, motionless like old Roman senator or bronze lamp holder, coldly apprising Turio and all men by a slight motion of his eyes what his resolution was. Harmless he sat there, while unharmed, but the king's fortress meanwhile could, might, would or should in no wise be surrendered save to the king's messenger, one old man's life worthless so it be lost with honour. But think ye, brawling canaille, how will it be when a whole Bastille springs skyward? In such statuesque, taper-holding attitude, one fancies Delaunay might have left Turio, the red clerks of the Bazoche, curé of St. Stephen, and all the tag-rag and bobtail of the world, to work their will. And yet withal he could not do it. Hast thou considered how each man's heart is so tremulously responsive to the hearts of all men? Hast thou noted how omnipotent is the very sound of many men? How their shriek of indignation pulses the strong soul, their howl of contumely withers with unfelt pangs. The Ritter Gluck confessed that the ground tone of the noblest passage in one of his noblest operas was the voice of the populace he had heard at Vienna crying to their Kaiser, Bread! Bread! Great is the combined voice of men, the utterance of their instincts which are truer than their thoughts. It is the greatest a man encounters among the sounds and shadows which make up this world of time. He who can resist that has his footing somewhere beyond time. Delaunay could not do it. Distracted, he hovers between the two, hopes in the middle of despair, surrenders not his fortress, declares that he will blow it up, seizes torches to blow it up, and does not blow it. Unhappy old Delaunay, it is the death agony of thy Bastille and thee. Jail, jailering and jailer, all three, such as they may have been, must finish. 
For four hours now has the world bedlam roared, call it the world chimera blowing fire. The poor invalid have sunk under their battlements or rise only with reversed muskets. They have made a white flag of napkins, go beating the chamard or seeming to beat, for one can hear nothing. The very Swiss at the portcullis look weary of firing, disheartened in the fire deluge. A porthole at the drawbridge is opened as by one that would speak. See, Hussier Maillard, the shifty man, on his plank, swinging over the abyss of that stone ditch, plank resting on parapet, balanced by weight of patriots. He hovers, perilous, such a dove towards such an ark. Deftly, thou shifty usher, one man already fell and lies smashed far down there against the masonry. Usher Maillard falls not. Deftly, unerring, he walks with outspread palm. The Swiss holds a paper through his porthole. The shifty usher snatches it and returns. Terms of surrender, pardon, immunity to all. Are they accepted? Foi d'officier, on the word of an officer answers half pay Hulin or half pay Ailey, for men do not agree on it. They are, sinks the drawbridge. Usher Maillard, bolting it when down, rushes in the living deluge. The Bastille is fallen. Victoire! La Bastille est prise! End of Book 5, Chapter 6《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 5 — The Third Estate Chapter 7 — Not a Revolt This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5 — Chapter 7 — Not a Revolt Why dwell on what follows? Hulin's foi d'officier should have been kept but could not. The Swiss stand drawn up, disguised in white canvas smocks, the invalids without disguise, their arms all piled against the wall. The first rush of victors, in ecstasy that the death peril is past, leaps joyfully on their necks, but new victors rush, and ever new, also in ecstasy, not wholly of joy. As we said, it was a living deluge, plunging headlong, had not the Garde Francaise in their cool military way wheeled round with arms levelled, it would have plunged suicidally by the hundred or the thousand into the Bastille ditch. And so it goes plunging through court and corridor, billowing uncontrollable, firing from windows, on itself, in hot frenzy of triumph, of grief and vengeance for its slain. The poor invalides will fare ill. One Swiss, running off in his white smock, is driven back with a death thrust. Let all prisoners be marched to the town hall to be judged. Alas, already one poor invalid has his right hand slashed off him, his maimed body dragged to the Place de Grève and hanged there. This same right hand, it is said, turned back de Launay from the powder magazine and saved Paris. De Launay, discovered in grey frock with poppy-coloured ribbon, is for killing himself with the sword of his cane. He shall to the Hotel de Ville, Ulan Maillard and others escorting him, Eli marching foremost with a capitulation paper on his sword's point. Through roarings and cursings, through hustlings, clutchings, and at last through strokes, your escort is hustled aside, fell down, Ulan seeks exhausted on a heap of stones. Miserable de Launay. He shall never enter the Hotel de Ville, only his bloody hair cue held up in a bloody hand. That shall enter for a sign. The bleeding trunk lies on the steps there. The head is off through the streets, ghastly, aloft on a pike. Rigorous de Launay has died, crying out, O oh, friends, kill me fast. Merciful de Lorme must die, though gratitude embraces him in this fearful hour and will die for him, it avails not. Brothers, your wrath is cruel. Your place de grève is become a throat of the tiger, full of mere fierce bellowings and thirst of blood. One other officer is massacred, one other invalid is hanged on the lamp iron. With difficulty, with generous perseverance, the Garde Francais will save the rest. Provost Flessel, stricken long since with the paleness of death, must descend from his seat to be judged at the Palais Royal, alas, to be shot dead by an unknown hand at the turning of the first street. O oh, evening sun of July, 
how at this hour thy beams fall slant on reapers amid peaceful woody fields, on old women spinning in cottages, on ships far out in the silent main, on balls at the Orangerie of Versailles, where high rouge dames of the palace are even now dancing with double-jacketed hussar officers, and also on this roaring hell-porch of a Hotel de Ville, Babel Tower, with the confusion of tongues, were not bedlam added with the conflagration of thoughts, was no type of it. One forest of distracted steel bristles endless in front of an electoral committee points itself in horrid radii against this and the other accused breast. It was the Titans warring with Olympus, and they scarcely crediting it have conquered. Prodigy of prodigies, delirious, as it could not but be. Denunciation, vengeance, blaze of triumph on a dark ground of terror, all outward, all inward things fallen into one general wreck of madness. Electoral committee had it a thousand throats of brass, it would not suffice. Abbe Lefebvre in the vaults down below is black as Vulcan, distributing that five thousand weight of powder with what perils these eight and forty hours. Last night a patriot in liquor insisted on sitting to smoke on the edge of one of the powder barrels. There smoked he, independent of the world, till the abbe purchased his pipe for three francs and pitched it far. Ailey in the grand hall, electoral committee looking on, sits with drawn sword bent in three places, with battered helm, for he was of the Queen's regiment, cavalry, with torn regimentals, face singed and soiled, comparable, some think, to an antique warrior, judging the people, forming a list of Bastilla heroes. Oh, friends, stain not with blood the greenest laurels ever gained in this world, such is the burden of Ailey's song, could it be but listened to. Courage, Ailey, courage, ye municipal electors. A declining sun, the need of victuals and of telling news, will bring assuagement, dispersion, all earthly things must end. Along the streets of Paris circulate seven Bastille prisoners, borne shoulder high, seven heads on pikes, the keys of the Bastille and much else. See also the Garde Francais in their steadfast military way, marching home to their barracks with the Invalides and Swiss kindly enclosed in hollow square. It is one year and two months since these same men stood unparticipating with Brenos d'Auguste at the Palais de Justice when fate overtook Despremenil, and now they have participated and will participate. Not Garde Francaise henceforth, but centre grenadiers of the National Guard, men of iron discipline and humour, not without a kind of thought in them. Likewise, ashlar stones of the Bastille continue thundering through the dusk. Its paper archive shall fly white. Old secrets come to view and long-buried despair finds voice. Read this portion of an old letter. If not for my consolation, Monseigneur would grant me for the sake of God and the most blessed Trinity that I could have news of my dear wife. Were it only her name on card to show that she is alive, it were the greatest consolation I could receive. I should for ever bless the greatness of Monseigneur. Poor prisoner, who namest thyself Kere Demery, and hast no other history. She is dead, that dead wife of thine, and thou art dead. Tis fifty years since thy breaking heart put this question, to be heard now, first, and long heard, in the hearts of men. But so does the July twilight thicken, so must Paris, as sick children and all distracted creatures do, brawl itself finally into a kind of sleep. Municipal electors, astonished to find their heads still uppermost, are home. Only Moreau de Saint-Méry, of tropical birth and heart, of coolest judgment, he with two others shall sit permanent at the town hall. Paris sleeps, gleams up with the illuminated city. Patrols go clashing without common watchword. There go rumours, alarms of war to the extent of 15,000 men marching through the suburb Saint-Antoine, who never got it marched through. Of the day's distraction judged by this of the night, Moreau de Saint-Marie, before rising from his seat, gave upwards of 3,000 orders. What a head, comparable to Friar Bacon's brass head. Within it lies all Paris, 
prompt must the answer be, right or wrong? In Paris is no other authority extant. Seriously, a most cool, clear head, for which also thou, O brave Saint-Marie, in many capacities, from august senator to merchant's clerk, book dealer, vice-king, in many places, from Virginia to Sardinia, shalt ever as a brave man find employment. Bessonville has decamped under cloud of dusk, amid a great affluence of people who did not harm him. He marches with faint growing tread down the left bank of the Seine all night towards infinite space. Resummoned shall Bessonval himself be for trial, for difficult acquittal. His king's troops, his royal Allemand, are gone hence for ever. The Versailles ball and lemonade is done. The orangery is silent except for night birds. Over in the Salle de Menu, Vice President Lafayette, with unsnuffed lights, with some hundred of members stretched on tables round him, sits erect, out watching the bear. This day a second solemn deputation went to His Majesty, a second and then a third, with no effect. What will the end of these things be? In the court all is mystery. Not without whisperings of terror, though ye dream of lemonade and epaulettes, ye foolish women. His Majesty, kept in happy ignorance, perhaps dreams of double barrels and the woods of Meudon. Late at night, the Duke de Liancourt, having official right of entrance, gains access to the royal apartments, unfolds with earnest clearness in his constitutional way the Job's news. Mais, said poor Louis, c'est un revolt! Why, that is a revolt. Sire, answered Liancourt, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. End of Book 5, Chapter 7《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 5, The Third Estate, Chapter 8 Conquering Your King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 8 Conquering Your King. On the morrow, a fourth deputation to the chateau is on foot, of a more solemn, not to say awful, character for, besides orgies on the orangery, it seems the grain convoys are all stopped, nor has Mirabeau's thunder been silent. Such deputation is on the point of setting out, when, lo, his majesty himself, attended only by his two brothers, step in, quite in the paternal manner, announces that the troops and all causes of offence are gone, and henceforth there shall be nothing but trust, reconcilement, goodwill, whereof he permits and even requests a national assembly to assure Paris in his name. Acclamation, as of men suddenly delivered from death, gives answer. The whole assembly spontaneously rises to escort his majesty back, interlacing their arms to keep off the excessive pressure from him, for all Versailles is crowding and shouting. The chateau musicians, with a felicitous promptitude, strike up the Seine de sa famille, bosom of one's family. The Queen appears at the balcony with her little boy and girl, kissing them several times. Infinite vivats spread far and wide, and suddenly there has come, as it were, a new heaven on earth. Eighty-eight august senators, Bailly, Lafayette, and our repentant archbishop among them, take coach for Paris, with a great intelligence, benedictions without end on their heads. From the Place Louis Cairns, where they alight all the way to the Hôtel de Ville, it is one sea of trickler cockades, of clear national muskets, one tempest of huzzahings, hand clappings, aided by occasional rollings of drum music. Harangues of due fervour are delivered, especially by Lally Tollendal, pious son of the ill fated murdered Lally, on whose head, in consequence, a civic crown of oak or parsley is forced which he forcibly transfers to Baiz. But surely, for one thing, the National Guard must have a general. Moreau de Saint-Marie, he of the three thousand orders, casts one of his significant glances on the bust of Lafayette, which has stood there ever since the American War of Liberty, whereupon, by acclamation, Lafayette is nominated. Again, in room of the slain traitor or quasi-traitor Flazel, President Bailly shall be... Provost of the merchants? 
No, Mayor of Paris, so be it, Mayor de Paris, Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, Viva Bailly, Viva Lafayette, the universal out-of-doors multitude rends the welcome in confirmation. And now, finally, let us to Notre Dame for a tedium. Towards Notre Dame Cathedral, in glad procession, these regenerators of the country walk through a jubilant people in fraternal manner, Abbe Lefebvre, still black with his gunpowder services, walking arm in arm with the white-stoled archbishop. Poor Bailly comes upon the foundling children, sent to kneel to him, and weeps. T. Diem, our archbishop officiating, is not only sung, but shot with blank cartridges. Our joy is boundless, as our woe threatened to be. Paris, by her own pike and musket and the valour of her own heart, has conquered the very war gods to the satisfaction now of majesty itself. A courier is, this night, getting under way for Necker, the people's minister, invited back by the king, by national assembly and nation, shall traverse France amid shoutings and the sound of trumpet and timbrel. Seeing which course of things, messieurs of the court triumvirate, messieurs of the dead-born Brolier ministry, and others such, consider that their part also is clear, to mount and ride. Off, ye two loyal Brolier's, Polignacs and princes of the blood, off while it is yet time. Did not the Palais Royal, in its late nocturnal violent motions, set a specific price, place of payment not mentioned, on each of your heads? With precautions, with the aid of pieces of cannon and regiments that can be depended on, Miss Seigneurs, between the sixteenth night and the seventeenth morning, get to their several roads, not without risk. Prince Condé has, or seems to have, men galloping at full speed, with a view, it is thought, to fling him into the river wires at Pont saint mayence The Polignacs travel disguised, friends, not servants, on their coach-box. Brolier has his own difficulties at Versailles, runs his own risks at Metz and Verdun, does nevertheless get safe to Luxembourg, and there rests. This is what they call the first emigration, determined on, as appears, in full court conclave, His Majesty assisting. Prompt he, for his share of it, to follow any counsel whatsoever. Three sons of France and four princes of the blood of St. Louis, says Weber, could not more effectually humble the burghers of Paris than by appearing to withdraw in fear of their life. Alas, the burghers of Paris bear it with unexpected stoicism. The man d'Artois indeed is gone, but has he carried, for example, the land d'Artois with him? Not even Bagatelle, the country house, which shall be useful as a tavern. Hardly the four valet breeches, leaving the breeches maker. As for old Foulon, one learns that he is dead. At least a sumptuous funeral is going on, the undertakers honouring him, if no other will. Antendon Bertier, his son-in-law, is still living, lurking. He joined Bessonval on that Eumenides Sunday, appearing to treat it with levity, and has now fled no man knows whither. The emigration is not gone many miles, Prince Condé hardly across the Oise, when His Majesty, according to arrangement, for the emigration also thought it might do good, undertakes a rather daring enterprise, that of visiting Paris in person. With a hundred members of assembly, with small or no military escort, which indeed he dismissed at the bridge of Sèvres, poor Louis sets out, leaving a desolate palace, a queen weeping, the present, the past and the future all so unfriendly for her. At the barrier of Passy, Mayor Bailly and Grand Gala presents him with the keys, harangues him in academic style, mentions that it is a great day that in Henri Quatre's case the king had to make conquest of his people, but in this happier case the people makes conquest of its king. A conquis son roi. The king, so happily conquered, drives forward slowly through a steel people, all silent or shouting only, Viva la nation, is harangued at the town hall by Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, by King's procureur, Monsieur Ethi de Corny, by Lally Tonandal and others, knows not what to think of it or say of it, learns that he is restorer of French liberty, as a statue of him to be raised on the site of the Bastille shall testify to all men. 
Finally, he is shown at the balcony with a trickler cockade in his hat, is greeted now with vehement acclamation from square and street, from all windows and roofs, and so drives home again amid glad, mingled and, as it were, intermarried shouts of Vive le Roi and Vive la Nation, wearied but safe. It was Sunday when the red-hot balls hung over us in mid-air. It is now but Friday, and the revolution is sanctioned. An august national assembly shall make the constitution, and neither foreign pandour, domestic triumvirate with levelled cannon, Guy Fawkes powder plots, for that too was spoken of, nor any tyrannic power on the earth or under the earth shall say to it, What dost thou? So jubilates the people, sure now of a constitution. Cracked Marquis saint Rouge is heard under the windows of the chateau, murmuring sheer speculative treason. End of Book 5, Chapter 8「The French Revolution: A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, The Third Estate, Chapter Nine, The Lantern. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Five, Chapter Nine, The Lantern. The fall of the Bastille may be said to have shaken all France to the deepest foundations of its existence. The rumour of these wonders flies everywhere with a natural speed of rumour, with an effect thought to be preternatural, produced by plots. Did Dorleon or Laclos, nay, did Mirabeau, not overburdened with money at this time, send riding couriers out from Paris to gallop on all radii or highways towards all points of France? It is a miracle which no penetrating man will call in question. Already in most towns electoral committees were met to regret Necker in harangue and resolution. In many a town as Rennes, Caen, Lyon, an ebullient people was already regretting him in brickbats and musketry. But now at every town's end in France there do arrive in these days of terror men as men will arrive, nay men on horseback since rumour oftenest travels riding. These men declare, with alarmed countenance, the brigands to be coming, to be just at hand, and do then ride on about their further business, be what it might. Whereupon the whole population of such town defensively flies to arms. Petition is soon thereafter forwarded to National Assembly. In such peril and terror of peril, leave to organise yourself cannot be withheld. The armed population becomes everywhere an enrolled National Guard. Thus rides rumour, careering along all radii from Paris outwards to such purpose. In few days, some say in not many hours, all France to the utmost borders bristles with bayonets. Singular, but undeniable, miraculous or not. But thus may any chemical liquid, though cooled to the freezing point or far lower, still continue liquid, and then, on the slightest stroke or shake, it at once rushes wholly into ice. Thus has France for long months and even years been chemically dealt with, brought below zero, and now, shaken by the fall of a Bastille, it instantaneously congeals into one crystallised mass of sharp-cutting steel. Goya la tocca! Where? Who touches it? In Paris, an electoral committee with a new mayor and general is urgent with belligerent workmen to resume their handicrafts. Strong dames of the market, Dame de la Haule, demit congratulatory harangues, present bouquets to the shrine of Saint Genevieve. Unenrolled men deposit their arms, not so readily as could be wished, and receive nine francs. With tediums, royal visits and sanctioned revolution, there is halcyon weather, weather even of preternatural brightness, the hurricane being overblown. Nevertheless, as is natural, the waves still run high, hollow rocks retaining their murmur. We are but at the 22nd of the month, hardly above a week since the Bastille fell, when it suddenly appears that old Foulon is alive. Nay, that he is here in early morning in the streets of Paris, the extortioner, the plotter who would make the people eat grass and was a liar from the beginning. It is even so. 
the deceptive sumptuous funeral of some domestic that died, the hiding place at Vitry towards Fontainebleau, have not availed that wretched old man. Some living domestic or dependent, for none loves Foulon, has betrayed him to the village. Merciless boars of Vitry unearth him, pounce on him like hellhounds. Westward, old infamy, to Paris to be judged at the Hôtel de Ville. His old head, which seventy-four years have bleached, is bare. They have tied an emblematic bundle of grass on his back. A garland of nettles and thistles is round his neck. In this manner, led with ropes, goaded on with curses and menaces, must he, with his old limbs, sprawl forward, the pitiablest, most unpitied of all old men. Sooty Saint Antoine and every street mustering its crowds as he passes. The Place de Grave, the hall of the Hôtel de Ville, will scarcely hold his escort and him. Foulon must not only be judged righteously, but judged there where he stands, without any delay. Appoint seven judges, ye municipals, or seventy and seven. Name them yourselves, or we will name them, but judge him. Electoral rhetoric, eloquence of Mayor Bailly, is wasted explaining the beauty of the law's delay. Delay, and still delay. Behold, O Mayor of the people, the morning has worn itself into noon, and he is still unjudged. Lafayette, pressingly sent for, arrives, gives voice. This Foulon, a known man, is guilty almost beyond doubt, but may he not have accomplices? Ought not the truth to be cunningly pumped out of him in the Abbey prison? It is a new light. Saint Colotism claps hands, at which hand-clapping Foulon, in his feignness as his destiny would have it, also claps. See, they understand one another, cries dark Saint Colotism, blazing into fury of suspicion. Friends, said a person in good clothes, stepping forward, what is the use of judging this man? Has he not been judged these thirty years? With wild yells, Sans Colotism clutches him in its hundred hands. He is whirled across the Place de Grève to the lantern, lamp iron, which there is at the corner of the Rue de la Vannerie, pleading bitterly for life to the deaf winds. Only with the third rope, for two ropes broke and a quavering voice still pleaded, can he be so much as got hanged. His body is dragged through the streets. His head goes aloft on a pike, the mouth filled with grass, amid sounds as of Tophet from a grass-eating people. Surely if revenge is a kind of justice, it is a wild kind. O oh, mad Sanskolotism, hast thou risen in thy mad darkness, in thy soot and rags, unexpectedly like an Enceladus living buried from under his Trinacria? They that would make grass be eaten do now eat grass in this manner? After long dumb groaning generations, has the turn suddenly become thine to such abysmal overturns and frightful instantaneous inversions of the centre of gravity are human solecisms all liable, if they but knew it, the more liable, the falser and top-heavier they are. To add to the horror of Merbailly and his municipals, word comes that Berthier has also been arrested, that he is on his way hither from Compiègne. Berthier, intendant, say, tax levier of Paris, sycophant and tyrant, forestaller of corn, contriver of camps against the people, accused of many things. Is he not Foulon's son-in-law, and in that one point guilty of all? In these hours, too, when sans colotism has its blood up, the shuddering municipal send one of their number to escort him with mounted national guards. At the fall of day, the wretched Bertier, still wearing a face of courage, arrives at the barrier in an open carriage with the municipal beside him, five hundred horsemen with drawn sabres, unarmed footmen enough, not without noise. Placards go brandished round him, bearing legibly his indictment as sans colotism with unlegal brevity in huge letters draws it up. Paris has come forth to meet him with hand-clappings, with windows flung up, with dances, triumph songs, as of the Furies. Lastly, the head of Foulon, this also meets him on a pike. Well might his look become glazed and sense fail him at such sight. Nevertheless, be the man's conscience what it may, his nerves are of iron. At the Hôtel de Ville he will answer nothing. 
he says, he obeyed superior ordered. They have his papers, they may judge and determine as for himself, not having closed an eye these two nights, he demands before all things to have sleep. Leaden sleep, thou miserable Batier. Guards rise with him in motion towards the abbey. At the very door of the Hôtel de Ville they are clutched, flung asunder as by a vortex of mad arms. Bertier whirls towards the lantern. He snatches a musket, fells and strikes, defending himself like a mad lion, is borne down, trampled, hanged, mangled. His head too, and even his heart, flies over the city on a pike. Horrible in lands that had known equal justice. Not so unnatural in lands that had never known it. Le sang qui cure l'est-il donc si pur? asked Barnave, intimating that the gallows, though by irregular methods, has its own. Thou thyself, O reader, when thou turnest that corner of the Rue de la Vanerie and discernest still that same grim bracket of old iron, will not want for reflections. Over a grocer's shop, or otherwise, with a bust of Louis Fourteenth in the niche under it, or now no longer in the niche, it still sticks out there, still holding out an ineffectual light of fish oil, and has seen worlds wrecked, and says nothing. But to the eye of unenlightened patriotism, what a thundercloud was this, suddenly shaping itself in the radiance of the halcyon weather. Cloud of Erebus blackness, betokening latent electricity without limit. Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, throw up their commissions in an indignant manner, need to be flattered back again. The cloud disappears, as thunder clouds do. The halcyon weather returns, though of a greyer complexion, of a character more and more evidently not supernatural. Thus, in any case, with what rub soever, shall the Bastille be abolished from our earth, and with it feudalism, despotism, and, one hopes, scoundrelism generally, and all hard usage of man by his brother man. Alas, the scoundrelism and hard usage are not so easy of abolition. But as for the Bastille, it sinks day after day and month after month, its ashlars and boulders tumbling down continually by express order of our municipals. Crowds of the curious roam through its caverns, gaze on the skeletons found walled up, on the oubliettes, iron cages, monstrous stone blocks with padlocked chains. One day we discern Mirabeau there, along with Genevese Dumont. Workers and onlookers make reverent way for him, fling verses, flowers on his path, Bastille papers and curiosities into his carriage with vivats. Able editors compile books from the Bastille archives, from what of them remain unburnt. The key of that robber den shall cross the Atlantic, shall lie on Washington's hall table. The great clock ticks now in a private patriotic clockmaker's apartment, no longer measuring hours of mere heaviness. Vanished is the Bastille, what we call vanished, the body or sandstone of it hanging in benign metamorphosis for centuries to come over the Seine waters, as Pont Louis says, the soul of it living, perhaps still longer, in the memories of men. So far, ye august senators, with your tennis court oaths, your inertia and impetus, your sagacity and pertinacity, have ye brought us. And yet think, messieurs, as the petitioner justly urged, you who were our saviours did yourselves need saviours. The brave Bastilliers, namely workmen of Paris, many of them in straitened pecuniary circumstances. Subscriptions are opened, lists are formed, more accurate than Ailey's, harangues are delivered. A body of Bastille heroes, tolerably complete, did get together, comparable to the Argonauts, hoping to endure like them. But in little more than a year the whirlpool of things threw them asunder again, and they sank. So many highest superlatives achieved by man are followed by new higher, and dwindle into comparatives and positives. The siege of the Bastille, weighed with which in the historical balance most other sieges, including that of Troy Town, a gossamer, cost, as we find, in killed and mortally wounded on the part of the besiegers, some eighty-three persons. On the part of the besieged, after all that straw-burning, fire-pumping and deluge of musketry, 
One poor solitary invalid, shot stone dead, ride mort on the battlements. The Bastille fortress, like the city of Jericho, was overturned by miraculous sound. End of Book 5, Chapter 9《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 6 — Consolidation Chapter 1 — Make the Constitution This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6 — Chapter 1 — Make the Constitution Here perhaps is the place to fix a little more precisely what these two words, French Revolution, shall mean. For, strictly considered, they may have as many meanings as there are speakers of them. All things are in revolution, in change from moment to moment, which becomes sensible from epoch to epoch. In this time world of ours there is probably nothing else but revolution and mutation, and even nothing else conceivable. Revolution, you answer, means speedier change. Whereupon one has still to ask, how speedy? At what degree of speed, in what particular points of this variable course, which varies in velocity but can never stop till time itself stops, does revolution begin and end, cease to be ordinary mutation, and again become such? It is a thing that will depend on definition, more or less arbitrary. For ourselves, we answer that French Revolution means here the open, violent rebellion and victory of disimprisoned anarchy against corrupt, worn-out authority. How anarchy breaks prison, bursts up from the infinite deep, and rages uncontrollable, immeasurable, enveloping a world, in faces after faces of fever frenzy, till the frenzy burning itself out, and what elements of new order it held, since all force holds such, developing themselves, the uncontrollable begot, if not re-imprisoned, yet harnessed, and its mad forces made to work towards their object as sane, regulated ones. For as hierarchies and dynasties of all kinds, theocracies, aristocracies, autocracies, strumpetocracies, have ruled over the world, so it was appointed in the decrees of providence that this same victorious anarchy, Jacobinism, Sanscalotism, French Revolution, horrors of French Revolution, or what else mortals name it, should have its turn. The destructive wrath of Sanscalotism, this is what we speak, having unhappily no voice for singing. Surely a great phenomenon, nay, it is a transcendental one, overstepping all rules and experience, the crowning phenomenon of our modern time. For here again, most unexpectedly, comes antique fanaticism in new and newest vesture, miraculous as all fanaticism is. Call it the fanaticism of making away with formulas, de humeur les fumules. The world of formulas, the formed regular world, which all habitable world is, must needs hate such fanaticism like death, and be at deadly variance with it. The world of formulas must conquer it, or failing that, must die execrating it, anathematizing it, can nevertheless in no wise prevent its being and its having been. The anathemas are there, and the miraculous thing is there. Whence it cometh? Whither it goeth? These are questions. When the age of miracles lay faded into the distance as an incredible tradition, and even the age of conventionalities was now old, and man's existence had for long generations rested on mere formulas which were grown hollow by course of time, and it seemed as if no reality any longer existed but only phantasms of realities, and God's universe were the work of the tailor and upholsterer mainly, and men were buckram masks that went about becking and grimacing there, on a sudden, the earth yawns asunder, and amid Tartarian smoke and glare of fierce brightness, rises Sanscalotism, many-headed fire-breathing, and asks, What think ye of me? Well, may the buckram masks start together, terror-struck, into expressive, well-concerted groups. It is indeed, friends, a most singular, most fatal thing. Let whosoever is but buckram and a phantasm look to it, ill verily may it fare with him. Here methinks he cannot much longer be. 
Woe also to many a one who is not wholly buckram, but partially real and human. The age of miracles has come back. Behold the world phoenix in fire consummation and fire creation. Wide are her fanning wings, loud is her death melody of battle thunders and falling towns. Skyward lashes the funeral flame enveloping all things. It is the death birth of a world. Whereby, however, as we often say, shall one unspeakable blessing seem attainable. This, namely, that man and his life rest no more on hollowness and a lie, but on solidity and some kind of truth. Welcome the beggarliest truth, so it may be one, in exchange for the royalist sham. Truth of any kind breeds ever new and better truth. Thus hard granite rock will crumble down into soil under the blessed skyey influences and cover itself with verdure, with fruitage and umbrage. But as for falsehood, which in like contrary manner grows ever falser, what can it or what should it do but decease, being ripe, decompose itself gently or even violently and return to the father of it, too probably in flames of fire? Sanskalotism will burn much, but what is incombustible it will not burn. Fear not, Sanskalotism. Recognize it for what it is, the portentous, inevitable end of much, the miraculous beginning of much. One other thing thou mayest understand of it, that it too came from God, for has it not been? From of old, as it is written, are his goings forth in the great deep of things. Fearful and wonderful now, as in the beginning, in the whirlwind also he speaks, and the wrath of men is made to praise him. But to gauge and measure this immeasurable thing, and what is called account for it, and reduce it to a dead logic formula, attempt not. Much less shalt thou shriek thyself hoarse, cursing it, for that, to all needful length, has been already done. As an actually existing son of time, look with unspeakable manifold interest, oftenest in silence, at what time did bring. Therewith edify, instruct, nourish thyself, or were it but to amuse and gratify thyself as it is given thee. Another question which at every new turn will rise on us, requiring ever new reply, is this. Where the French Revolution specially is... In the king's palace, in his majesty's or her majesty's managements and maltreatments, cabals, imbecilities and woes, answer some few, whom we do not answer. In the national assembly, answer a large mixed multitude, who accordingly seat themselves in the reporter's chair, and therefrom noting what proclamations, acts, reports, passages of logic fence, bursts of parliamentary eloquence seem notable within doors, and what tumults and rumours of tumult become audible from without, produce volume on volume, and naming it History of the French Revolution, contentedly publish the same. To do the like, to almost any extent, with so many filed newspapers, choix des rapports, histoire parlementaire as there are, amounting to many horse loads, were easy for us. Easy but unprofitable. The National Assembly, named now Constituent Assembly, goes its course, making the Constitution. But the French Revolution also goes its course. In general, may we not say that the French Revolution lies in the heart and head of every violent speaking, of every violent thinking French man. How the 25 millions of such in their perplexed combination, acting and counteracting, may give birth to events, which event successively is the cardinal one, and from what point of vision it may best be surveyed, this is a problem. Which problem, the best insight, seeking light from all possible sources, shifting its point of vision, whithersoever vision or glimpse of vision can be had, may employ itself in solving and be well content to solve in some tolerably approximate way. As to the National Assembly, in so far as it still towers eminent over France after the manner of a carbon carroccio, though now no longer in the van, and rings signals for retreat or to advance, it is and continues a reality, among other realities. 
But insofar as it sits making the constitution, on the other hand, it is a fatuity and chimera mainly. Alas, in the never-so-heroic building of Montesquieu Marbley card castles, though shouted over by the world, what interest is there? Occupied in that way, an august National Assembly becomes for us little other than a Sanhedrin of pedants, not of the gerund grinding, yet of no fruitfuller sort, and its loud debatings and recriminations about rights of man, rights of peace and war, veto suspensive, veto absolute, what are they but so many pedants' curses? May God confound you for your theory of irregular verbs. A constitution can be built, constitutions in our fallacier, but the frightful difficulty is that of getting men to come and live in them. Could C.A. have drawn thunder and lightning out of heaven to sanction his constitution, it had been well, but without any thunder? Nay, strictly considered, is it not still true that without some such celestial sanction, given visibly in thunder or invisibly otherwise, no constitution can in the long run be worth much more than the waste paper it is written on? The constitution, the set of laws or prescribed habits of acting that men will live under, is the one which images their convictions, their faith as to this wondrous universe and what rights, duties, capabilities they have there, which stands sanctioned, therefore, by necessity itself, if not by a seen deity, then by an unseen one. Other laws, whereof there are always enough ready-made, are usurpations which men do not obey, but rebel against and abolish by their earliest convenience. The question of questions accordingly were, who is it that especially for rebellers and abolishers can make a constitution? He that can image forth the general belief when there is one, that can impart one when, as here, there is none. A most rare man, ever as of older God-missioned man, here, however, in defect of such transcendent supreme man, time, with its infinite succession of merely superior men, each yielding his little contribution, does much. Force, likewise, for as antiquarian philosophers teach, the royal sceptre was from the first something of a hammer to crack such heads as could not be convinced, will all along find somewhat to do. And thus, in perpetual abolition and reparation, rending and mending, with struggle and strife, with present evil and the hope and effort towards future good, must the Constitution, as all human beings do, build itself forward or unbuild itself and sink as it can and may. O oh, C.A. and ye other committee men and twelve hundred miscellaneous individuals from all parts of France, what is the belief of France and yours if ye knew it? Properly, that there shall be no belief that all formulas be swallowed, the constitution which will suit that? Alas, too clearly, a no constitution, an anarchy, which also, in due season, shall be vouchsafed you. But, after all, what can an unfortunate National Assembly do? Consider only this, that there are 1,200 miscellaneous individuals, not a unit of whom but has his own thinking apparatus, his own speaking apparatus. In every unit of them is some belief and wish, different for each, both that France should be regenerated and also that he individually should do it. 1,200 separate forces, yoked miscellaneously to any object, miscellaneously to all sides of it, and bid pull for life. Or... Is it the nature of national assemblies generally to do, with endless labour and clangour, nothing? Are representative governments mostly at bottom tyrannies too? Shall we say the tyrants, the ambitious, contentious persons from all corners of the country do, in this manner, get gathered into one place, and there, with motion and counter-motion, with jargon and hubbub, cancel one another like the fabulous Kilkenny cats, and produce for net result zero? The country, meanwhile, governing or guiding itself by such wisdom, recognised or for the most part unrecognised, as may exist in individual heads here and there. Nay, even that were a great improvement, for of old, with their Guelph factions and Ghibelline factions, with their red roses and white roses, they were wont to cancel the whole country as well. 
Besides, they do it now in a much narrower cockpit within the four walls of their assembly house, and here and there an outpost of hustings and barrel heads. Do it with tongues, too, not with swords, all which improvements in the art of producing zero. Are they not great? Nay, best of all, some happy continents, as the western one with its savannas, where whosoever has four willing limbs finds food under his feet and an infinite sky over his head, can do without governing. What sphinx questions, which the distracted world in these very generations must answer or die? End of Book 6, Chapter 1《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Consolidation, Chapter Two, The Constituent Assembly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Six, Chapter Two, The Constituent Assembly. One thing an elected assembly of twelve hundred is fit for: destroying which indeed is but a more decided exercise of its natural talent for doing nothing. Do nothing, only keep agitating, debating, and things will destroy themselves. So, and not otherwise, proved it with an august National Assembly. It took the name Constituent, as if its mission and function had been to construct or build, which also, with its whole soul, it endeavoured to do. Yet, in the fates and the nature of things, there lay for it, precisely of all functions, the most opposite to that. Singular, what Gospels men will believe, even Gospels according to Jean-Jacques. It was the fixed faith of these national deputies, as of all thinking Frenchmen, that the Constitution could be made, that they there and then were called to make it. How, with the toughness of old Hebrews or Ishmaelite Moslem, did the otherwise light, unbelieving people persist in this their credo, quia impossibile, and front the armed world with it, and grow fanatic and even heroic, and do exploits by it? The Constituent Assembly's constitution, and several others will, being printed and not manuscript, survive to future generations as an instructive, well-nigh incredible document of the time the most significant picture of the then existing France, or, at lowest, picture of these men's picture of it. But in truth and seriousness, what could the National Assembly have done? The thing to be done was, actually, as they said, to regenerate France, to abolish the old France and make a new one, quietly or forcibly, by concession or by violence. This, by the law of nature, has become inevitable. With what degree of violence depends on the wisdom of those that preside over it. With perfect wisdom on the part of the National Assembly it had all been otherwise, but whether in any wise it could have been pacific, nay, other than bloody and convulsive, may still be a question. Grant, meanwhile, that this constituent assembly does, to the last, continue to be something. With a sigh, it sees itself incessantly forced away from its infinite divine task of perfecting the theory of irregular verbs to finite terrestrial tasks, which latter have still a significance for us. It is the cynosure of revolutionary France, this National Assembly. All work of government has fallen into its hands or under its control. All men look to it for guidance. In the middle of that huge revolt of twenty-five millions, it hovers always aloft as carroccio or battle standard, impelling and impelled in the most confused way. If it cannot give much guidance, it will still seem to give some. It emits pacifatory proclamations, not a few, with more or with less result. It authorises the enrolment of National Guards, lest brigands come to devour us and reap the unripe crops. It sends missions to quell effervescences, to deliver men from the lantern. It can listen to congratulatory addresses which arrive daily by the sackful, mostly in Kim Cambyses' vein, also to petitions and complaints from all mortals, so that every mortal's complaint, if it cannot get redressed, may at least hear itself complain. For the rest, an august National Assembly can produce parliamentary eloquence and appoint committees, committees of the Constitution, of reports, of researches, and of much else, 
which again yield mountains of printed paper. The theme of new parliamentary eloquence in bursts or in plenty of smooth flowing floods. And so, from the waste vortex whereon all things go whirling and grinding, organic laws or the similitude of such slowly emerge. With endless debating, we get the rights of man written down and promulgated, true paper basis of all paper constitutions. Neglecting, cry the opponents, to declare the duties of man. Forgetting, answer we, to ascertain the mights of man, one of the fatalist omissions. Nay, sometimes, as on the 4th of August, our National Assembly, fired suddenly by an almost preternatural enthusiasm, will get through whole masses of work in one night. A memorable night this 4th of August. Dignitaries temporal and spiritual, peers, archbishops, parliaments, presidents, each outdoing the other in patriotic devotedness, come successively to throw their untenable possessions on the altar of the fatherland. With louder and louder vivats, for indeed it is after dinner too, they abolish tithes, seigneurial dues, gabel, excessive preservation of game, nay, privilege, immunity, feudalism, root and branch, then appoint a te deum for it. And so finally disperse about three in the morning, striking the stars with their sublime heads. Such night, unforeseen but forever memorable, was this the 4th of August, 1789. Miraculous, or semi-miraculous, some seem to think it. A new night of Pentecost, shall we say, shaped according to the new time and new church of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It had its causes, also its effects. In such manner labour the national deputies, perfecting their theory of irregular verbs, governing France and being governed by it, with toil and noise, cutting asunder ancient intolerable bonds and, for new ones, assiduously spinning ropes of sand. Were their labours a nothing or a something, yet the eyes of all France being reverently fixed on them, history can never very long leave them altogether out of sight. For the present, if we glance into that assembly hall of theirs, it will be found, as is natural, most irregular. As many as a hundred members are on their feet at once, no rule in making motions, or only commencements of a rule. Spectators' gallery allowed to applaud, and even to hiss. President appointed once a fortnight, raising many times no serene head above the waves. Nevertheless, as in all human assemblages, like does begin arranging itself to like. The perennial rule, ubi homines sunt modis sunt, proves valid. Rudiments of methods disclose themselves, rudiments of parties. There is a right side, côté droit, a left side, côté gauche, sitting on Monsieur le Président's right hand or on his left. The côté droit, conservative, the côté gauche, destructive. Intermediate is Anglo-Maniac constitutionalism or two-chamber royalism with its mouniers, its lalies, fast verging towards non-entity. Preeminent on the right side, pleads and perorates Casales, the dragoon captain, eloquent, mildly fervent, earning for himself the shadow of a name. There also blusters Barrel Mirabeau, the younger Mirabeau, not without wit. Dusky Despremenil does nothing but sniff and ejaculate. Might, it is fondly thought, lay prostrate the elder Mirabeau himself, would he but try, which he does not. Last and greatest, see, for one moment, the Abbe Mori, with his Jesuitic eye, his impassive brass face, image of all the cardinal sins. Indomitable, unquenchable, he fights Jesuitico rhetorically, with toughest lungs and heart, for throne, especially for altar and tithes. So that a shrill voice exclaims once from the gallery, Monsieur of the clergy, you have to be shaved. If you wriggle too much, you will get cut. The left side is also called the Delion side, and sometimes, derisively, the Palais Royal. And yet, so confused, real imaginary, seems everything, it is doubtful, as Mirabeau said, whether Dorleon himself belonged to that same Dorleon party. What can be known and seen is that his moon visage doth beam forth from that point of space. There likewise sits sea-green Robespierre, 
throwing in his light weight with decision, not yet with effect. A thin, lean Puritan and precisian, he would make away with formulas, yet lives, moves, and has his being wholly in formulas of another sort. Purple, such according to Robespierre, ought to be the royal method of propagating laws. Purple, this is the law I have framed for thee, dost thou accept it? Answered the right side from centre and left by inextinguishable laughter. Yet men of insight discern that the sea green may by chance go far. This man, observes Mirabeau, will do somewhat. He believes every word he says. ABCA is busy with mere constitutional work, wherein unlucky fellow workmen are less pliable than, with one who has completed the science of polity, they ought to be. Garage CA, nevertheless, some twenty months of heroic travail, of contradiction from the stupid, and the constitution shall be built, the top stone of it brought out with shouting, say, rather, the top paper, for it is all paper, and thou hast done in it what the earth or the heaven could require, thy utmost. Note, likewise, this trio, memorable for several things. Memorable were it only that their history is written in an epigram, Whatsoever these three have in hand, it is said, Duport thinks it, Barnave speaks it, Lameth does it. But Royal Mirabeau, conspicuous among all parties, raised above and beyond them all, this man rises more and more. As we often say, he has an eye, he is a reality, while others are formulas and eye glasses. In the transient he will detect the perennial, find some firm footing, even among paper vortexes. His fame is gone forth to all lands. It gladdened the heart of the crabbed old friend of men himself before he died. The very postilions of inns have heard of Mirabeau. When an impatient traveller complains that the team is insufficient, his postilion answers, Yes, monsieur, the wheelers are weak, but my Mirabeau, main horse, you see, is a right one. Mais mon Mirabeau est excellent. And now, reader, thou shalt quit this noisy discrepancy of a national assembly, not if thou be of humane mind, without pity. Twelve hundred brother men are there in the centre of twenty-five millions, fighting so fiercely with fate and with one another, struggling their lives out as most sons of Adam do, for that which profiteth not. Nay, on the whole, it is admitted further to be very dull, Dull as this day's assembly, said someone. Why date? Pourquoi date? answered Mirabeau. Consider that they are twelve hundred, that they not only speak but read their speeches, and even borrow and steal speeches to read. With twelve hundred fluent speakers and their Noah's deluge of vociferous commonplace, unattainable silence may well seem the one blessing of life. But figure twelve hundred pamphleteers droning forth perpetual pamphlets and no man to gag them. Neither, as in the American Congress, do the arrangements seem perfect. A senator has not his own desk and newspaper here. Of tobacco, much less of pipes, there is not the slightest provision. Conversation itself must be transacted in a low tone with continual interruption. Only pencil notes circulate freely in incredible numbers to the foot of the very tribune. Such work is it, regenerating a nation, perfecting one's theory of irregular verbs. End of Book 6, Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 6, Consolidation, Chapter 3, The General Overturn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 3, The General Overturn. Of the King's Court, for the present, there is almost nothing whatever to be said. Silent, deserted are these halls. Royalty languishes, forsaken of its war god and all its hopes, till once the Oie de Boeuf rally again. The sceptre is departed from King Louis. He has gone over to the Salle des Menus, to the Paris Town Hall, or one knows not whither. In the July days, while all ears were yet deafened by the crash of the Bastille, and ministers and princes were scattered to the four winds, it seemed as if the very valets had grown heavy of hearing. 
Besson bar, also in flight towards infinite space, but hovering a little at Versailles, was addressing His Majesty personally for an order about post-horses, when, lo, the valet-in-waiting places himself familiarly between His Majesty and me, stretching out his rascal neck to learn what it was. His Majesty, in sudden collar, whirled round, made a clutch at the tongs. I gently prevented him. He grasped my hand in thankfulness, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Poor king! For French kings also are men. Louis XIV himself once clutched the tongs and even smote with them, but then it was at Louvois and Dame Maintenon ran up. The queen sits weeping in her inner apartments, surrounded by weak women. She is at the height of unpopularity, universally regarded as the evil genius of France. Her friends and familiar counsellors have all fled, and fled surely on the foolishest errand. The Chateau Polignac still frowns aloft on its bold and enormous cubical rock amid the blue girdling mountains of Auvergne. But no Duke and Duchess Polignac look forth from it. They have fled. They have met Necker at Baal. They shall not return. That France should see her nobles resist the irresistible, inevitable, with the face of angry men, was unhappy, not unexpected. But with the face and sense of pettish children? This was her peculiarity. They understood nothing, would understand nothing. Does not at this hour a new Polignac, first born of these two, sit reflective in the castle of Ham, in an astonishment he will never recover from, the most confused of existing mortals? King Louis has his new ministry. Mere popularities, old President Pompignon, Necker come back in triumph and other such. But what will it avail him? As was said, the sceptre, all but the wooden gilt sceptre, had departed elsewhither. Volition, determination, is not in this man, only innocence, indolence, dependence on all persons but himself, on all circumstances but the circumstances he were lord of. So troublous internally is our Versailles and its work. Beautiful if seen from afar, resplendent like a sun, seen near at hand, a mere sun's atmosphere, hiding darkness, confused ferment of ruin. But over France there goes on the indisputablest destruction of formulas, transaction of realities that follow therefrom. So many millions of persons, all jived and nigh strangled with formulas, whose life, nevertheless, at least the digestion and hunger of it, was real enough. Heaven has at length sent an abundant harvest, but what profits it the poor man when earth with her formulas interposes? Industry, in these times of insurrection, must needs lie dormant, capital, as usual, not circulating, but stagnating timorously in nooks. The poor man is short of work, is therefore short of money. Nay, even had he money, bread is not to be bought for it. Were it plotting of aristocrats, plotting of d'Orléans, were it brigands, preternatural terror, and the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, enough, the markets are scarce of grain, plentiful only in tumult. Farmers seem lazy to thresh, being either bribed, or needing no bribe, with prices ever rising, with perhaps rent itself no longer so pressing. Neither, what is singular, do municipal enactments, that along with so many measures of which you shall sell so many of rye, and other the like, much mend the matter. Dragoons with drawn swords stand ranked among the corn sacks, often more dragoons than sacks. Meal mobs abound, growing into mobs of still darker quality. Starvation has been known among the French commonality before this, known and familiar. Did we not see them in the year 1775, presenting in sallow faces, in wretchedness and raggedness, their petition of grievances, and for answer, getting a brand new gallows, forty feet high? Hunger and darkness through long years. For look back on that earlier Paris riot when a great personage worn out by debauchery was believed to be in want of blood baths, and mothers in worn raiment yet with living hearts under it filled the public places with their wild Rachel cries, stilled also by the gallows. 
Twenty years ago, the friend of men, preaching to the deaf, described the limousin peasants as wearing a pain-stricken, souffre douleur look, a look past complaint, as if the oppression of the great were like the hail and the thunder, a thing irremediable, the ordinance of nature. And now, if in some great hour the shock of a falling Bastille should awaken you, and it were found to be the ordinance of art merely, and remediable, reversible. Or has the reader forgotten that flood of savages which, in sight of the same friend of men, descended from the mountain at Mont d'Or? Lank-haired, haggard faces, shapes raw-boned in high sabots, in woollen jupes with leather girdles studded with copper nails. They rocked from foot to foot and beat time with their elbows too as the quarrel and battle which was not long in beginning went on. Shouting fiercely, the lank faces distorted into the similitude of a cruel laugh. For they were darkened and hardened long had they been the prey of excisemen and taxmen, of clerks with the cold spurt of their pen. It was the fixed prophecy of our old Marquis, which no man would listen to, that such government by blind man's buff stumbling along too far would end by the general overturn, the culbut general. No man would listen. Each went his thoughtless way, and time and destiny also travelled on. The government by blind man's buff stumbling along has reached the precipice inevitable for it dull drudgery driven on by clerks with the cold dusted spurt of their pen has been driven into a communion of drudges. For now, moreover, there have come the strangest confused tidings. By Paris journals with their paper wings, or still more portentous where no journals are by rumour and conjecture, oppression not inevitable, a Bastille prostrate, and the constitution fast getting ready. Which constitution, if it be something and not nothing, what can it be but bread to eat? The traveller, walking up hill, bridle in hand, overtakes a poor woman. The image, as such commonly are, of drudgery and scarcity, looking sixty years of age, though she is not yet twenty-eight. They have seven children, her poor drudge and she, a farm with one cow which helps to make the children soup, also one little horse or garron. They have rents and quit rents, hens to pay to this seigneur, oat sacks to that, king's taxes, statute labour, church taxes, taxes enough, and think the times inexpressible. She has heard that somewhere, in some manner, something is to be done for the poor. God send it soon, for the dues and taxes crush us down. Nous écrasons. Fair prophecies are spoken, but they are not fulfilled. There have been notables, assemblages, turnings out and comings in, intriguing and manoeuvring, parliamentary eloquence and arguing, Greek meeting Greek in high places has long gone on, yet still bread comes not. The harvest is reaped and garnered, yet still we have no bread. Urged by despair and by hope, what can drudgery do but rise as predicted and produce the general overturn? Fancy then some five full-grown millions of such gaunt figures with their haggard faces, figure halve, in woollen jupes with copper-studded leather girths and high sabots, starting up to ask as in forest roarings their washed upper classes after long unreviewed centuries virtually this question, How have ye treated us? How have ye taught us, fed us and led us while we toiled for you? The answer can be read in flames over the nightly summer sky. This is the feeding and leading we have had of you, emptiness of pocket, of stomach, of head, and of heart. Behold, there is nothing in us, nothing but what nature gives her wild children of the desert, ferocity and appetite, strength grounded on hunger. Did ye mark among your rights of men that man was not to die of starvation while there was bread reaped by him? It is among the mites of man. Seventy-two chateaux have flamed aloft in the Maconnais and Beaujolais alone. This seems the centre of the conflagration. But it has spread over Dauphine, Alsace, the Lyonnais. The whole southeast is in a blaze. All over the north, from Rouen to Metz, disorder is abroad. 
Smugglers of salt go openly in armed bands. The barriers of towns are burnt. Toll gatherers, tax gatherers, official persons put to flight. It was thought, says Young, the people from hunger would revolt. And we see they have done it. Desperate lackles, long prowling aimless, now finding hope in desperation itself, everywhere form a nucleus. They ring the church bell by way of toxin, and the parish turns out to the work. Ferocity, atrocity, hunger and revenge, such work as we can imagine. Ill stands it now with the seigneur who, for example, has walled up the only fountain of the township who has ridden high on his charter and parchments, who has preserved game, not wisely, but too well. Churches also and canonries are sacked without mercy, which have shorn the flock too close, forgetting to feed it. Woe to the land over which sans colotism in its day of vengeance tramps roughshod, shod in sabbats. High-bred seigneurs with their delicate women and little ones had to fly half-naked under cloud of night, glad to escape the flames and even worse. You meet them at the table d'hôte of inns, making wise reflections or foolish that rank is destroyed, uncertain whether they shall now wend. The maitea will find it convenient to be slack in paying rent. As for the tax-gatherer, he, long hunting as a biped of prey, may now get hunted as one. His Majesty's exchequer will not fill up the deficit this season. It is the notion of many that a patriot Majesty, being the restorer of French liberty, has abolished most taxes, though for their private ends some men make a secret of it. Where this will end? In the abyss one may prophesy whither all delusions are at all moments travelling, where this delusion has now arrived. For if there be a faith from of old, it is this, as we often repeat, that no lie can live for ever. The very truth has to change its vesture from time to time, and be born again. But all lies have sentence of death written down against them, and heaven's chancery itself, and slowly or fast advance incessantly towards their hour. The sign of a grand seigneur being landlord, says the vehement plain-spoken Arthur Young, are wastes, lands, deserts, ling. Go to his residence, you will find it in the middle of a forest, peopled with deer, wild boars and wolves. The fields are scenes of pitiable management, as the houses are of misery. To see so many millions of hands that would be industrious, all idle and starving. Oh, if I were legislator of France for one day, I would make these great lords skip again. Oh, Arthur, thou now actually beholdest them skip. Wilt thou grow to grumble at that too? For long years and generations it lasted, but the time came. Featherbrain, whom no reasoning and no pleading could touch, the glare of the firebrand had to illuminate. There remained but that method. Consider it, look at it. The widow is gathering nettles for her children's dinner. A perfumed seigneur, delicately lounging in the oeil de boeuf, has an alchemy whereby he will extract from her the third nettle and name it rent and law. Such an arrangement must end. Ought it? But, O oh, most fearful, is such an ending. Let those to whom God in his great mercy has granted time and space prepare another and milder one. To some it is a matter of wonder that the seigneurs did not do something to help themselves, say, combine and arm, for there were a hundred and fifty thousand of them, all violent enough. Unhappily, a hundred and fifty thousand, scattered over wide provinces, divided by mutual ill will, cannot combine. The highest seigneurs, as we have seen, had already emigrated, with a view of putting France to the blush. Neither are arms now the peculiar property of seigneurs, but of every mortal who has ten shillings wherewith to buy a second-hand firelock. Besides, those starving peasants, after all, have not four feet and claws that you could keep them down permanently in that manner. They are not even of black colour. They are mere unwashed seigneurs, and a seigneur too has human bowels. The seigneurs did what they could, enrolled in national guards, fled with shrieks complaining to heaven and earth. One seigneur, famed Meme of Quincy near Vesoul, invited all the rustics of his neighbourhood to a banquet, blew up his chateau and them with gunpowder, and instantaneously vanished, no man yet knows whither. Some half-dozen years after, he came back and demonstrated that it was by accident. 
nor are the authorities idle, though unluckily all authorities, municipalities and such like, are in the uncertain transitory state, getting regenerated from old monarchic to new democratic. No official yet knows clearly what he is. Nevertheless, mayors, old or new, do gather, marishauses, national guards, troops of the line, justice of the most summary sort is not wanting. The electoral committee of Masson, though but a committee, goes the length of hanging, for its own behoof, as many as twenty. The prévot of Dauphiné traverses the country with a movable column, with tipstaves, gallows ropes, for gallows any tree will serve, and suspend its culprit, or thirteen culprits. Unhappy country! How is the fair gold and green of the ripe, bright year defaced with horrid blackness? Black ashes of chateaus, black bodies of gibbeted men. Industry has ceased in it, not sounds of the hammer and saw, but of the tocsin and alarm drum. The sceptre has departed, whither one knows not, breaking itself in pieces, here impotent, there tyrannous. National guards are unskilful and of doubtful purpose. Soldiers are inclined to mutiny. There is danger that they too may quarrel, danger that they may agree. Strasbourg has seen riots, a town hall torn to shreds, its archives scattered white on the winds, drunk soldiers embracing drunk citizens for three days, and Mayor Dietrich and Marshal Rochambeau reduced night to desperation. Through the middle of all which phenomena is seen on his triumphant transit, escorted through Beaufort, for instance, by fifty national horsemen and all the military music of the place, Monsieur Necker, returning from Baal. Glorious as the meridian, though poor Necker himself partly guesses whither it is leading. One highest culminating day at the Paris Town Hall, with immortal vivats, with wife and daughter kneeling publicly to kiss his hand, with Bessonval's pardon granted, but indeed revoked before sunset. One highest day, but then lower days, and even lower, down even to lowest. Such magic is in a name, and in the want of a name. Like some enchanted Mambrino's helmet, essential to victory comes this saviour of France, be shouted, be symboled by the world, alas so soon to be disenchanted, to be pitched shamefully over the lists as a barber's basin. Gibbon could wish to show him, in this ejected barber's basin state, to any man of solidity who were minded to have the soul burnt out of him and become a caput mortuum by ambition, unsuccessful or successful. Another small face, as we add, and no more. How, in the autumn months, our sharp-tempered Arthur has been pestered for some days past by shot, lead drops and slugs, rattling five or six times into my chaise and about my ears, all the mob of the country gone out to kill game. It is even so. On the cliffs of Dover, over all the marches of France, there appear this autumn two signs of the earth, emigrant flights of French seigneurs, emigrant winged flights of French game. Finished, one may say, or as good as finished, is the preservation of game on this earth, completed for endless time. What part it had to play in the history of civilization is played. Plaudite exeat. In this manner does sans collotism blaze up, illustrating many things producing among the rest, as we saw on the 4th of August, that semi-miraculous night of Pentecost in the National Assembly, semi-miraculous, which had its causes and its effects. Feudalism is struck dead, not on parchment only and by ink, but in very fact by fire, say, by self-combustion. This conflagration of the southeast will abate, will be got scattered to the west or elsewhere Extinguish it will not till the fuel be all done. End of Book 6, Chapter 3《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 6, Consolidation, Chapter 4, In Q. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 4, in Q. If we look now at Paris, one thing is too evident, that the baker's shops have got their cues or tails, 
their long strings of purchases arranged in tail so that the first comes to be first served were the shop once open. This waiting in tail, not seen since the early days of July, again makes its appearance in August. In time we shall see it perfected by practice to the rank almost of an art, and the art, or quasi-art, of standing in tail become one of the characteristics of the Parisian people, distinguishing them from all other peoples whatsoever. But consider, while work itself is so scarce, how a man must not only realise money but stand waiting, if his wife is too weak to wait and struggle, for half days in the tail till he gets it changed for dear bad bread. Controversies to the length sometimes of blood and battery must arise in these exasperated queues. Or, if no controversy, then it is but one accordant pang lingua of complaint against the powers that be. France has begun her long curriculum of hungering, instructive and productive beyond academic curriculums, which extend over some seven most stressful years. As Jean-Paul says of his own life, to a great height shall the business of hungering go. Or consider, in strange contrast, the jubilee ceremonies. For in general, the aspect of Paris presents these two features, jubilee ceremonials and scarcity of victual. Processions enough walk in jubilee, of young women decked and dizened, their ribbons all tricolour, moving with song and table to the shrine of Saint Genevieve to thank her that the Bastille is down. The strong men of the market and the strong women fail not with their bouquets and speeches. Abbe Fourchet, famed in such work, for Abbe Lefebvre could only distribute powder, blesses tricolour cloth for the National Guard and makes it a national tricolour flag, victorious, or to be victorious, in the cause of civil and religious liberty all over the world. Fouché, we say, is the man for TDMs and public consecrations, to which, as in this instance of the flag, our National Guard will reply with volleys of musketry, church and cathedral though it be, filling Notre Dame with such noisiest, fuliginous amen, significant of several things. On the whole, we will say our new mayor, Bailly, our new commander, Lafayette, named also Scipio Americanus, have bought their preferment deer. Bailly rides in gilt state coach with beefeaters and sumptuosity, Camille de Moulin and others sniffing at him for it. Scipio bestrides the white charger and waves with civic plumes in sight of all France. Neither of them, however, does it for nothing, but in truth at an exorbitant rate. At this rate, namely, of feeding Paris and keeping it from fighting. Out of the city fund, some 17,000 of the utterly destitute are employed digging on Montmartre at tenpence a day, which buys them at market price almost two pounds of bad bread. They look very yellow when Lafayette goes to harangue them. The town hall is in travail night and day. It must bring forth bread, a municipal constitution, regulation of all kinds, curbs on the sanscolotic press, above all bread, bread. Purveyors prowl the country far and wide with the appetite of lions, detect hidden grain, purchase open grain, by gentle means or forcible must and will find grain. A most thankless task and so difficult, so dangerous, even if a man did gain some trifle by it. On the 19th of August there is food for one day. Complaints there are that the food is spoiled and produces an effect on the intestines, not corn, but plaster of Paris. Which effect on the intestines, as well as that smarting in the throat and palate, a town hall proclamation warns you to disregard, and even to consider as drastic beneficial. The mayor of St. Denis, so black was his bread, has by a dyspeptic populace been hanged on the lantern there. National Guards protect the Paris corn market. First ten suffice, then six hundred. Busy are you, Bailly, Brissot de Vauville, Condorcet, and ye others? For, as just hinted, there is a municipal constitution to be made too. The old Bastille electors, after some ten days of psalmodying over their glorious victory, begin to hear it asked in a splenetic tone, Who put you there? They accordingly had to give place, not without moanings and audible growlings on both sides, to a new, larger body, specially elected for that post. 
which new body augmented, altered, then finally fixed at the number of 300 with the title of town representatives, representant de la commune, now sits there, rightly portioned into committees, assiduous, making a constitution at all moments when not seeking flower. And such a constitution, little short of miraculous, one that shall consolidate the revolution. The revolution is finished then? Thereby ye and all respectable friends of freedom would fain think so. Your revolution, like jelly sufficiently boiled, needs only to be poured into shapes of constitution and consolidated therein. Could it indeed contrive to cool, which last, however, is precisely the doubtful thing, or even the not doubtful? Unhappy friends of freedom consolidating a revolution. They must sit at work there, their pavilions spread on very chaos between two hostile worlds, the upper court world, the nether sansculotic one, and beaten on by both, toil painfully, perilously, doing in sad literal earnest the impossible. End of Book 6, Chapter 4《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 6, Consolidation, Chapter 5, The Fourth Estate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 5, The Fourth Estate. Pamphleteering opens its abysmal throat wider and wider, never to close more. Our philosophes, indeed, rather withdraw after the manner of Marmontel, retiring in disgust the first day. Abbé Reynal, grown grey and quiet in his Marseille domicile, is little content with this work. The last literary act of the man will again be an act of rebellion, an indignant letter to the Constituent Assembly, answered by the order of the day. Thus also philosophe Morellet puckers discontented brows, being indeed threatened in his benefices by that 4th of August, it is clearly going too far. How astonishing that those haggard figures in woollen dupes would not rest as satisfied with speculation and victorious analysis as we. Ah, yes, speculation, philosophism, once the ornament and wealth of the saloon, will now coin itself into mere practical propositions and circulate on street and highway universally, with results. A fourth estate of able editors springs up, increases and multiplies, irrepressible, incalculable. New printers, new journals, and ever new, so prurient is the world, let our three hundred curb and consolidate as they can. Lustelot, under the wing of Prudhomme, dull blustering printer, edits weekly his Revolution de Paris in an acrid, emphatic manner. Acrid, corrosive, as the spirit of Slows and Coppera is Marat, friend of the people, struck already with the fact that the National Assembly, so full of aristocrats, can do nothing except dissolve itself and make way for a better, that the town hall representatives are little other than babblers and imbeciles, if not even knaves. Poor is this man, squalid, and dwells in garrets, a man unlovely to the sense, outward and inward a man forbid, and is becoming fanatical, possessed with fixed idea. Cruel lucis of nature, did nature, O oh poor Marat, as in cruel sport, knead thee out of her leavings and miscellaneous waste clay, and fling thee forth step-dame-like, a distraction into this distracted eighteenth century? Work is appointed thee there, which thou shalt do. The three hundred have summoned and will again summon Marat, but always he croaks forth answer sufficient, always he will defy them or elude them and endure no gag. Cara, ex-secretary of the decapitated Hospodar and then of a necklace cardinal, likewise pamphleteer, adventurer in many scenes and lands, draws nigh to Messier of the Tableau de Paris and with foam on his lips proposes an anal patriotique. The Moniteur goes its prosperous way. Barrea weeps on paper as yet loyal. Riverol, Royou are not idle. Deep calls to deep. Your domine salvum fac regum shall awaken pange lingua 
with an Ami du Peuple, there is a King's Friend newspaper, Ami du Roi. Camille Desmoulins has appointed himself Procureur General de la Lanterne, Attorney General of the Lampiron, and pleads, not with atrocity, under an atrocious title, editing weekly his brilliant Revolutions of Paris and Brabant. Brilliant, we say, for if in that thick murk of journalism with its dull blustering, with its fixed or loose fury, any ray of genius greet thee, be sure it is Camille's. The thing that Camille teaches us, he with his light finger adorns. Brightness plays, gentle, unexpected, amid horrible confusions. Often is the word of Camille worth reading when no other's is. Questionable Camille, how thou glitterest with a fallen, rebellious, yet still semi-celestial light, as is the starlight on the brow of Lucifer. Son of the morning, into what times and what lands art thou fallen? But in all things is good, though not good for consolidating revolutions. Thousand wagon-loads of this pamphleteering and newspaper matter lie rotting slowly in the public libraries of our Europe, Snatched from the great gulf like oysters by bibliomaniac pearl divers, there must they first rot, then what was pearl in Camille or others may be seen as such and continue as such. Nor has public speaking declined, though Lafayette and his patrols look sour on it. Loud always is the Palais Royal, loudest the Café de Foix, such a miscellany of citizens and citizenesses circulating there. Now and then, according to Camille, some citizens employ the liberty of the press for a private purpose, so that this or the other patriot finds himself short of his watch or pocket handkerchief. But for the rest, in Camille's opinion, nothing can be a livelier image of the Roman Forum. A patriot proposes his motion. If it finds any supporters, they make him mount on a chair and speak. If he is applauded, he prospers and redacts. If he is hissed, he goes his ways. Thus they circulating and perorating. Tall, shaggy Marquis saint de Rouge, a man that has had his losses and has deserved them, is seen eminent and also heard. Bellowing is the character of his voice, like that of a bull of Bashan, voice which drowns all voices, which causes frequently the hearts of men to leap. Cracked or half-cracked is this tall Marquis's head, uncracked are his lungs, the cracked and the uncracked shall alike avail him. Consider, Father, that each of the forty-eight districts has his own committee, speaking and motioning continually, aiding in the search for grain, in the search for a constitution, checking and spurring the poor three hundred of the town hall. That Danton, with a voice reverberating from the domes, is president of the Cordelia's district, which has already become a Goshen of patriotism. That apart from the seventeen thousand utterly necessitous digging on Montmartre, most of whom, indeed, have got passes and been dismissed into space with four shillings, there is a strike or union of domestics out of place who assemble for public speaking. Next, a strike of tailors, for even they will strike and speak. Further, a strike of journeymen cordwainers, a strike of apothecaries, so dear is bread. All these, having struck, must speak generally under the open canopy, and pass resolutions, Lafayette and his patrols watching them suspiciously from the distance. Unhappy mortals, such tugging and lugging and throttling of one another to divide in some not intolerable way the joint felicity of man in this earth when the whole lot to be divided is such a feast of shells. Diligent are the three hundred. None equals Scipio Americanus in dealing with mobs. But surely all these things bode ill for the consolidating of a revolution. End of Book 6, Chapter 5《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 1, Patrolitism This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 1. Patrolotism. No, friends, this revolution is not of the consolidating kind. 
Do not fires, fevers, sown seeds, chemical mixtures, men, events, all embodiments of force that work in this miraculous complex of forces named universe, go on growing through their natural phases and developments, each according to its kind, reach their height, reach their visible decline, finally sink under, vanishing, and what we call die? They all grow, there is nothing but what grows and shoots forth into its special expansion, once give it leave to spring. Observe, too, that each grows with a rapidity proportioned in general to the madness and unhealthiness there is in it. Slow, regular growth, though this also ends in death, is what we name health and sanity. A sanscolotism which has prostrated Bastilles, which has got pike and musket and now goes burning chateaus, passing resolutions and haranguing under roof and sky, may be said to have sprung and, by law of nature, must grow. To judge by the madness and diseasedness, both of itself and of the soil and element it is in, one might expect the rapidity and monstrosity would be extreme. Many things too, especially all diseased things, grow by shoots and fits. The first grand fit and shooting forth of Sanscolotism with that of Paris conquering its king. For Bailly's figure of rhetoric was all too sad a reality. The king is conquered, going at large on his parole, on condition, say, of absolutely good behaviour, which in these circumstances will unhappily mean no behaviour whatever. A quite untenable position, that of majesty put on its good behaviour. Alas, is it not natural that whatever lives try to keep itself living? Whereupon his majesty's behaviour will soon become exceptionable, and so the second grand fit of Sanscolotism, that of putting him in durance, cannot be destined. Necker, in the National Assembly, is making moan, as usual, about his deficit. Barriers and custom houses burnt, the tax gatherers hunted, not hunting, his majesty's exchequer all but empty. The remedy is a loan of thirty millions, then, on still more enticing terms, a loan of eighty millions, neither of which loans, unhappily, will the stock jobbers venture to lend. The stock jobber has no country except his own black pool of agio. And yet, in those days, for men that have a country, what a glow of patriotism burns in many a heart, penetrating inwards to the very purse. So early as the 7th of August, a dom patriotique, a patriotic gift of jewels to a considerable extent, has been solemnly made by certain Parisian women, and solemnly accepted with honourable mention, whom forthwith all the world takes to imitating and emulating, Patriotic gifts, always with some heroic eloquence which the President must answer and the Assembly listen to, flow in from far and near, in such numbers that the honourable mention can only be performed in lists published at stated epochs. Each gives what he can. The very cordwainers have behaved munificently. One landed proprietor gives a forest. Fashionable society gives its shoe buckles, takes cheerfully to shoe ties. Unfortunate females give what they have amassed in loving. The smell of all cash, as Vespasian thought, is good. Beautiful, and yet inadequate. The clergy must be invited to melt their superfluous church plate in the royal mint. Nay, finally, a patriotic contribution of the forcible sort must be determined on, though unwillingly. Let the fourth part of your declared yearly revenue, for this once only, be paid down. So shall a National Assembly make the Constitution, undistracted at least by insolvency. Their own wages, as settled on the 17th of August, are but 18 francs a day, each man. But the public service must have sinews, must have money. To appease the deficit, not to combler or choke the deficit, if you or mortal could. For with all, as Mirabeau was heard saying, it is the deficit that saves us. Towards the end of August, our National Assembly, in its constitutional labours, has got so far as the question of veto. Shall Majesty have a veto on the national enactments, or not have a veto? What speeches were spoken, within doors and without, clear and also passionate logic, imprecations, combinations, gone happily for the most part to limbo. Through the cracked brain and uncracked lungs of saint Eurouge, the Palais-Royal rebellows with veto. Journalism is busy, 
France rings with veto. I shall never forget, says Dumont, my going to Paris one of these days with Mirabeau and the crowd of people we found waiting for his carriage about Leger, the bookseller's shop. They flung themselves before him, conjuring him with tears in their eyes, not to suffer the veto absolu. They were in a frenzy. Monsieur le Comte, you are the people's father. You must save us. You must defend us against those villains who are bringing back despotism. If the king gets this veto, what is the use of National Assembly? We are slaves. All is done. Friends, if the sky fall, there will be catching of larks. Mirabeau, adds Dumont, was eminent on such occasions. He answered vaguely, with a patrician imperturbability, and bound himself to nothing. Deputations go to the Hôtel de Ville, anonymous letters to aristocrats in the National Assembly, threatening that 15,000, or sometimes that 60,000, will march to illuminate you. The Paris districts are astir. Petition signing. saint Hiroux sets forth from the Palais Royal with an escort of 1,500 individuals to petition in person. Resolute, or seemingly so, is the tall, shaggy Marquis in the Café de Foire, but resolute also is Commandant General Lafayette. The streets are all beset by patrols. saint Hiroux is stopped at the Barrière des Bonhommes. He may bellow like the bulls of Bashan, but absolutely must return. The brethren of the Palais Royal circulate all night and make motions under the open canopy, all coffee houses being shut. Nevertheless, Lafayette and the town hall do prevail. saint Rouge is thrown into prison. Veto absolu adjusts itself into suspensive veto, prohibition, not forever, but for a term of time. And this doom's clamour will grow silent as the others have done. So far has consolidation prospered, though with difficulty, repressing the nether sanscalotic world, and the constitution shall be made. With difficulty, amid jubilee and scarcity, patriotic gifts, bakers' cues, Abbe Fauché's harangues with their armin of platoon musketry. Scipio Americanus has deserved thanks from the National Assembly and France. They offer him stipends and emoluments to a handsome extent, or which stipends and emoluments he, covetous of far other blessedness than mere money, does in his chivalrous way, without scruple, refuse. To the Parisian common man, meanwhile, one thing remains inconceivable that now, when the Bastille is down and French liberty restored, grain should continue so dear. Our rights of man are voted, feudalism and all tyranny abolished. Yet behold, we stand in queue. Is it aristocrat forestallers? A court still bent on intrigues? Something is rotten somewhere. And yet, alas, what to do? Lafayette, with his patrols, prohibits everything, even complaint. saint Rouge and other heroes of the veto lie in durance. People's friend Marat was seized. Printers of patriotic journals are fettered and forbidden. The very hawkers cannot cry till they get license and leaden badges. Blue National Guards ruthlessly dissipate all groups, scour with levelled bayonets the Palais Royal itself, Pass on your affairs along the Rue Taran, the patrol presenting his bayonet cries. To the left, turn into the Rue Saint-Benoît, he cries. To the right. A judicious patriot like Camille Desmoulins in this instant is driven for quietness sake to take the gutter. Oh, much suffering people, our glorious revolution is evaporating in trickle of ceremonies and complimentary harangues of which latter, as Lustelot accurately calculates, upwards of 2,000 have been delivered within the last month at the town hall alone. And our mouths, unfilled with bread, are to be shut under penalties. The caricaturist promulgates his emblematic tablature. La patrouletism chassant le patriotisme. Patriotism driven out by patrolatism. Ruthless patrols, long, superfine harangues, and scanty, ill-baked loaves, more like baked bath bricks, which produce an effect on the intestines. Where will this end? In consolidation? End of Book 7, Chapter 1《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women, Chapter 2, 
O Richard, O my King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 2. O Richard, O my King. For alas, neither is the town hall itself without misgivings. The nether sans colotic world has been suppressed hitherto, but then the upper court world, symptoms there are that the oid de birth is rallying. More than once in the town hall Sanhedrin, often enough from those outspoken baker's cues, has the wish uttered itself, Oh, that our restorer of French liberty were here, that he could see with his own eyes, not with the false eyes of queens and cabals, and his really good heart be enlightened. For falsehood still environs him, intriguing dukes de guiche with bodyguards, scouts of bouillet, a new flight of intriguers, now that the old is flown. What else means this advent of the regiment de Flandre entering Versailles as we hear on the 23rd of September with two pieces of cannon? Did not the Versailles National Guard do duty at the chateau? Had they not Swiss? Hundred Swiss, Guard du corps, bodyguards so called. Nay, it would seem the number of bodyguards on duty has, by a manoeuvre, been doubled. The new relieving battalion of them arrived at its time, but the old relieved one does not depart. Actually, there runs a whisper through the best-informed upper circles, or a nod still more portentous than whispering, of His Majesty's flying to Metz, of a bond to stand by him therein, which has been signed by noblesse and clergy to the incredible amount of thirty or even of sixty thousand. Lafayette coldly whispers it and coldly asseverates it to Count d'Estaing at the dinner table, and d'Estaing, one of the bravest men, quakes to the core lest some lackey overhear it and tumbles thoughtful without sleep all night. Her regiment Flandre, as we said, is clearly arrived. His Majesty, they say, hesitates about sanctioning the 4th of August, makes observations of chilling tenor on the very rights of man. Likewise may not all persons, the bakers' queues themselves, discern on the streets of Paris the most astonishing number of officers on furlough, crosses of St. Louis and such like. Some reckon from a thousand to twelve hundred. Officers of all uniforms, nay, one uniform never before seen by eye, green faced with red. The tricolour cockade is not always visible, but what in the name of heaven may these black cockades which somewhere foreshadow? Hunger wets everything, especially suspicion and indignation. Realities themselves in this Paris have grown unreal, preternatural. Phantasms once more stalk through the brain of hungry France. O oh, ye laggards and dastards, cry shrill voices from the queues. If ye had the hearts of men, ye would take your pikes and second-hand firelocks and look into it, not leave your wives and daughters to be starved, murdered and worse. Peace, women. The heart of man is busy and heavy. Patriotism, driven out by patrolatism, knows not what to resolve on. The truth is, the Oi de Boeuf has rallied, to a certain unknown extent. A changed Oi de Boeuf, with Versailles National Guards in their tricolour cockades doing duty there, a court all flaring with tricolour. Yet, even to a tricolour court, men will rally... Ye loyal hearts, burnt-out seigneurs, rally round your queen with wishes which will produce hopes, which will produce attempts. For indeed, self-preservation being such a law of nature, what can a rallied court do but attempt an endeavour, or call it plot, with such wisdom and unwisdom as it has? They will fly escorted to Metz, where brave Bouillet commands. They will raise the royal standard. The bond signatures shall become armed men. Were not the king so languid, their bond, if at all signed, must be signed without his privity. Unhappy king, he has but one resolution, not to have a civil war. For the rest he still hunts. Having ceased lock-making, he still dozes and digests. Is clay in the hands of the potter. Ill will it fare with him in a world where all is helping itself, where, as has been written, whosoever is not hammer must be stithy, and the very hiss upon the wall grows there in that chink because the whole universe could not prevent its growing. But as for the coming up of this regiment to Flandre, may it not be urged that there were Saint-Durge petitions and continual meal mobs? 
undebauched soldiers be their plot, or any dim elements of a plot, are always good. Did not the Versailles municipality, an old monarchic one not yet refounded into a democratic, instantly second the proposal? Nay, the very Versailles National Guard, wearied with continual duty at the chateau, did not object. Only Draper Le Quintre, who was now Major Le Quintre, shook his head. Yes, friends, surely it was natural this regiment de Flandre should be sent for since it could be got. It was natural that, at sight of military bandoliers, the heart of the rallied Oeil de Boeuf should revive, and maids of honour and gentlemen of honour speak comfortable words to epauletted defenders and to one another. Natural also, and mere common civility, that the bodyguards, a regiment of gentlemen, should invite their Flandre brethren to a dinner of welcome. Such invitation, in the last days of September, is given and accepted. Dinners are defined as the ultimate act of communion. Men that can have communion in nothing else can sympathetically eat together, can still rise into some glow of brotherhood over food and wine. The dinner is fixed on for Thursday the 1st of October and ought to have a fine effect. Further, as such dinner may be rather extensive and even the non-commissioned and the common man be introduced to see and to hear, could not His Majesty's opera apartment, which has lain quite silent ever since Kaiser Joseph was here, be obtained for the purpose? The hall of the opera is granted. The Salon d'Hercule shall be drawing-room. Not only the officers of Flandre, but of the Swiss, of the hundred Swiss, nay, of the Versailles National Guard, such of them as have any loyalty, shall feast. It will be a repast like few. And now, suppose this repast, the solid part of it, transacted and the first bottle over. Suppose the customary loyal toasts drunk, the king's health, the queen's, with deafening vivats, that of the nation omitted or even rejected. Suppose champagne flowing, with pot valorous speeches, with instrumental music, empty feathered heads growing ever the noisier in their own emptiness in each other's noise. Her Majesty, who looks unusually sad tonight, His Majesty sitting dulled with the day's hunting, is told that the sight of it would cheer her. Behold, she enters there, issuing from her state rooms, like the moon from the clouds, this fairest unhappy queen of hearts royal husband by her side, young Dauphin in her arms. She descends from the boxes amid splendours and acclaim, walks queen-like round the tables, gracefully escorted, gracefully nodding, her looks full of sorrow yet of gratitude and daring with the hope of France on her mother bosom. And now the band striking up, O Richard, O mon roi, l'univers t'abandonne, O Richard, O my king, and world is all forsaking thee. Could man do other than rise to height of pity, of loyal valour? Could feather-headed young ensigns do other than, by white bourbon cockades handed them from fair fingers, by waving of swords drawn to pledge the Queen's health, by trampling of national cockades, by scaling the boxes whence intrusive murmurs may come, by vociferation, tripudiation, sound, fury and distraction, within doors and without, testify what tempest-tossed state of vacuity they are in? till champagne and tripudiation do their work, and all lie silent, horizontal, passively slumbering, with mead of battle dreams. A natural repast, in ordinary times a harmless one, now fatal, as that of Thyestes, as that of Job's sons, when a strong wind smote the four corners of their banquet house. Poor, ill-advised Marie Antoinette, with a woman's vehemence, not with the sovereign's foresight, it was so natural, yet so unwise. Next day, in public speech of ceremony, Her Majesty declares herself delighted with the Thursday. The heart of the Oye de Boeuf glows into hope, into daring, which is premature. Rallied maids of honour, waited on by abbés, so white cockades, distribute them with words, with glances to epauletted youths, who in return may kiss, not without fervour, the fair sewing fingers. Captains of horse and foot go swashing with enormous white cockades. Nay, one Versailles national captain had mounted the like, so witching with the words and glances, and laid aside his tricolor. Well may Mere Le Quintre shake his head with a look of severity and speak audible resentful words. 
but now a swashbuckler with enormous white cockade overhearing the major invites him insolently once and then again elsewhere to recant and failing that to duel which latter feat Major Laquantra declares that he will not perform, not at least by any known laws of fence, that he nevertheless will, according to mere law of nature, by dirk and blade, exterminate any vile gladiator who may insult him or the nation. Whereupon, for the Major is actually drawing his implement, they are parted, and no weasand slit. End of Book 7, Chapter 2 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 7, The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 3, Black Cockades. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 3, Black Cockades. But fancy what effect this Thyestes repast and trampling on the national cockade must have had in the Salle des Menus in the famishing baker's queues at Paris. Nay, such Thyestes repasts, it would seem, continue. Flandre has given its counter-dinner to the Swiss and hundred Swiss. Then on Saturday there has been another. Yes, here with us is famine, but yonder at Versailles is food, enough and to spare. Patriotism stands in queue, shivering hunger-struck, insulted by patrolatism, while bloody-minded aristocrats, heated with excess of living high, trample on the national cockade. Can the atrocity be true? Nay, look, green uniforms faced with red, black cockades, the colour of night. Are we to have military onfall and death also by starvation? For behold, the Corbeil corn-boat, which used to come twice a day with its plaster of Paris meal, now comes only once. And the town hall is deaf, and the men are laggard and dastard. At the Café de Foire this Saturday evening a new thing is seen, not the last of its kind, a woman engaged in public speaking. Her poor man, she says, was put to silence by his district. Their presidents and officials would not let him speak. Wherefore she here with her shrill tongue will speak, denouncing, while her breath endures, the corbeil boat, the plaster of Paris bread, sacrilegious opera dinners, green uniforms, pirate aristocrats, and those black cockades of theirs. Truly it is time for the black cockades at least to vanish. Them, patrolatism itself will not protect. Nay, sharp-tempered Monsieur Tassin, at the Tuileries parade on Sunday morning, forgets all national military rule, starts from the ranks, wrenches down one blockade, which is swashing ominous there, and tramples it fiercely into the soil of France. Patrolatism itself is not without suppressed fury. Also, the districts begin to stir. The voice of President Danton reverberates in the Cordeliers, People's friend Marat has flown to Versailles and back again, swart bird, not of the halcyon kind. And so Patriot meets promenading Patriot this Sunday and sees his own grim care reflected on the face of another. Groups, in spite of patrolatism, which is not so alert as usual, fluctuate deliberative. Groups on the bridges, on the quays, at the patriotic cafes. And ever as any black cockade may emerge, rises the many-voiced growl and bark, Abba! Down! All black cockades are ruthlessly plucked off. One individual picks his up again, kisses it, attempts to refix it. But a hundred canes start into the air, and he desists. Still worse went it with another individual, doomed by extempore plebiscitum to the lantern saved with difficulty by some active corps de garde. Lafayette sees signs of an effervescence, which he doubles his patrols, doubles his diligence to prevent. So passes Sunday, the 4th of October, 1789. Sullen is the male heart, repressed by patrolatism. Vehement is the female, irrepressible. The public-speaking woman at the Palais Royal was not the only speaking one. Men know not what the pantry is, when it grows empty, only house-mothers know. 
O oh, women, wives of men that will only calculate and not act. Patrolitism is strong, but death by starvation and military onfall is stronger. Patrolitism represses male patriotism, but female patriotism? Will guards named national thrust their bayonets into the bosoms of women? Such thought, or rather such dim, unshaped, raw material of a thought, ferments universally under the female nightcap, and by earliest daybreak, on slight hint, will explode. End of Book 7, Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven: The Insurrection of Women, Chapter Four: The Menads. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Seven, Chapter Four: The Menads. If Voltaire once, in splenetic humour, asked his countrymen, "But you, Guelch, what have you invented?" they can now answer, "The art of insurrection." It was an art indeed needed in these last singular times, an art for which the French nature, so full of vehemence, so free from depth, was perhaps of all others the fittest. Accordingly, to what a height, one may well say, of perfection has this branch of human industry been carried by France within the last half-century? Insurrection, which Lafayette thought might be the most sacred of duties, ranks now for the French people among the duties which they can perform. Other mobs are dull masses which roll onwards with a dull, fierce tenacity, a dull, fierce heat, but emit no light flashes of genius as they go. The French mob, again, is among the liveliest phenomena of our world. So rapid, audacious, so clear-sighted, inventive, prompt to seize the moment, instinct with life to its finger-ends, that talent, there were no other, of spontaneously standing in queue, distinguishes, as we said, the French people from all peoples, ancient and modern. Let the reader confess, too, that, taking one thing with another, perhaps few terrestrial appearances are better worth considering than mobs. Your mob is a genuine outburst of nature, issuing from, or communicating with, the deepest deep of nature. When so much goes grinning and grimacing as a lifeless formality, and under the stiff buckram no heart can be felt beating, here, once more, if nowhere else, is a sincerity and reality. Shudder at it, or even shrink over it if thou must, nevertheless consider it. Such a complex of human forces and individualities hurled forth in their transcendental mood to act and react on circumstances and on one another, to work out what it is in them to work. The thing they will do is known to no man, least of all to themselves. It is the inflammablest, immeasurable firework generating, consuming itself. With what phases, to what extent, with what results it will burn off, philosophy and perspicacity conjecture in vain. Man, as has been written, is forever interesting to man. Nay, properly, there is nothing else interesting. In which light also may we not discern why most battles have become so wearisome. Battles in these ages are transacted by mechanism, with the slightest possible development of human individuality or spontaneity. Men now even die and kill one another in an artificial manner. Battles ever since Homer's time, when they were fighting mobs, have mostly ceased to be worth looking at, worth reading of or remembering. How many wearisome bloody battles does history strive to represent, or even in a husky way to sing, and she would omit or carelessly slur over this one insurrection of women? A thought, or dim, raw material of a thought, was fermenting all night, universally in the female head, and might explode. In squalid garret, on Monday morning, maternity awakes to hear children weeping for bread. Maternity must forth to the streets, to the herb markets and bakers. Cues meets there with hunger-stricken maternity, sympathetic, exasperative. Oh, we unhappy women! But instead of bakers' cues, why not to aristocrats' palaces, the root of the matter? Allons, let us assemble to the Hôtel de Ville, to Versailles, 
to the lantern. In one of the guardhouses of the Quartier saint Dustache, a young woman seizes a drum. For how shall National Guards give fire on women, on a young woman? The young woman seizes the drum, sets forth, beating it, uttering cries relative to the dearth of grains. Descend, O mothers, descend, ye Judiths, to food and revenge. All women gather and go. Crowds storm all stairs, force out all women. The female insurrectionary force, according to Camilla, resembles the English naval one. There is a universal press of women. Robust dames of the Hall, slim mantua makers, assiduous, risen from the dawn, ancient virginity tripping to matins, the housemaid with early broom, all must go. Rouse ye, O women, the laggard men will not act. They say, we ourselves may act. And so, like snowbreak from the mountains, for every staircase is a melted brook, it storms, tumultuous, wild shrilling, towards the Hôtel de Ville. Tumultuous, with or without drum music, for the Faubourg Saint-Antoine also has tucked up its gown, and with besom staves, fire irons, and even rusty pistols, void of ammunition, is flowing on. Sound of it flies with the velocity of sound to the utmost barriers. By seven o'clock, on this raw October morning, fifth of the month, the town hall will see wonders. Nay, as chance would have it, a male party are already there, clustering tumultuously round some national patrol and a baker who has been seized with short weights. They are there and have even lowered the rope of the lantern, so that the official persons have to smuggle forth the short-weighing baker by back doors and even send to all the districts for more force. Grand it was, says Camilla, to see so many Judiths, from eight to ten thousand of them in all, rushing out to search into the root of the matter. Not unfrightful it must have been, ludicro, terrific and most unmanageable. At such hour the overwatched three hundred are not yet stirring. None but some clerks, a company of National Guards, and Monsieur de Gouvion, the Major General. Gouvion has fought in America for the cause of civil liberty, a man of no inconsiderable heart, but deficient in head. He is, for the moment, in his back apartment, assuaging Ashamayad, the Bastille sergeant, who has come, as too many do, with representations. The assuagement is still incomplete when our Judiths arrive. The National Guards form on the outer stairs with levelled bayonets. The ten thousand Judiths press up, resistless, with obtestations, with outspread hands, merely to speak to the mayor. The rear forces them. Nay, from male hands in the rear, stones already fly. The National Guards must do one of two things. Sweep the plaster grave with cannon, or else open to right and left. They open. The living deluge rushes in through all rooms and cabinets, upwards to the topmost belfry, ravenous, seeking arms, seeking mares, seeking justice, while again the better crest, dressed, speak kindly to the clerks, point out the misery of these poor women, also their ailments, some even of an interesting sort. Poor Monsieur de Gouvion is shiftless in this extremity, a man shiftless, perturbed, who will one day commit suicide. How happy for him that Ashamayad, the shifty, was there at the moment, though making representations. Fly back, thou shifty, my yard. Seek the Bastille company, and, oh, return fast with it, above all, with thy own shifty head. For, behold, the Judiths can find no mayor or municipal. Scarcely in the topmost belfry can they find poor Abbe Lefebvre, the powder distributor. Him, for want of a better, they suspend there, in the pale morning light, over the top of all Paris, which swims in one's failing eyes. A horrible end? Nay, the rope broke, as French ropes often did, or else an Amazon cut it. Abbe Lefebvre falls some twenty feet, rattling among the leads, and lives long years after, though always with a tremblement in the limbs. And now doors fly under hatchets. The Judiths have broken the armoury, have seized guns and cannons, three money bags, paper heaps, torches flare. In few minutes our brave Hôtel de Ville, which dates from the fourth Henry, will, with all that it holds, be in flames. End of Book 7, Chapter 4
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 7, The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 5, Usher Maillard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 5, Usher Maillard. In flames, truly, were it not that Usher Maillard, swift of foot, shifty of head, has returned. Maillard, of his own motion, for Gouvion or the rest would not even sanction him, snatches a drum, descends the porch stairs, rent and beating sharp with loud rolls his robes march, to Versailles, allons, à Versailles! As men beat on kettle or warming pan when angry she-bees, or, say, flying desperate wasps, are to be hived, and the desperate insects hear it and cluster round it, simply as round a guidance where there was none, so now these menads round shifty Maillard, riding usher of the Chatelet. The axe pauses uplifted. Abbe Lefebvre is left half hanged from the belfry downwards, all vomits itself. What rubber dub is that? Stanislav Maillard, Bastille hero, will lead us to Versailles? Joy to thee, Maillard, blessed art thou above riding ushers. Away then, away! The seized cannon are yoked with seized cart horses. Brown locked Demoiselle Terogne, with pike and helmet, sits there as gunneress, with haughty eye and serene fair countenance, comparable, some think, to the maid of Orleans, or even recalling the idea of Pallas Athene. Maillard, for his drum still rolls on, is by heaven rending acclamation admitted general. Maillard hastens the languid march, Maillard, beating rhythmic with sharp rant-tan all along the keys, leads forward with difficulty his menadic host. Such a host marched not in silence, the bargeman pauses on the river. All wagoners and coach-drivers fly, men peer from windows, not women, lest they be pressed. Sight of sights, bacantes in these ultimate formalised ages, Bronze Henri looks on from his Pont Neuf, the monarchic Louvre, Medician Tuileries see a day not theretofore seen. And now Maillard has his menads in the Champs Elysees, Fields Tartarian rather, and the Hotel de Ville has suffered comparatively nothing. Broken doors, an Abbe Lefebvre who shall never more distribute powder, three sacks of money, most part of which, for sans calotism, though famishing, is not without honour, shall be returned. This is all the damage. Great Maillard. A small nucleus of order is round his drum, but his outskirts fluctuate like the mad ocean, for rascality male and female is flowing in on him from the four winds. Guidance there is none but in his single head and two drumsticks. Oh, Maillard, when, since war first was, had General of Force such a task before him as they are this day? Walter the penniless still touches the feeling heart, but then Walter had sanction, had space to turn in, and also his crusaders were of the male sex. Thou, this day, disowned of heaven and earth, art general of menads. Their inarticulate frenzy thou must, on the spur of the instant, render into articulate words, into actions that are not frantic. Fail in it, this way or that. Pragmatical officiality, with its penalties and law books, waits before thee. Menard storm behind. If such hewed off the melodious head of Orpheus and hurled it into the penious waters, what may they not make of thee? Thee rhythmic merely, with no music but a sheepskin drum. Maillard did not fail. Remarkable Maillard, if fame were not an accident and history a distillation of rumour, how remarkable wert thou! On the Elysian fields there is pause and fluctuation, but for Maillard, no return. He persuades his menads, clamorous for arms and the arsenal, that no arms are in the arsenal, that an unarmed attitude and petition to a national assembly will be the best. He hastily nominates or sanctions generalesses, captains of tens and fifties, and so, in loosest flowing order to the rhythm of some eight drums, having laid aside his own, with the Bastille volunteers bringing up his rear, once more takes the road. Chaillot, which will promptly yield baked loaves, is not plundered, nor are the Sèvres potteries broken. 
The old arches of Sevres Bridge echo under monadic feet. Seine River gushes on with his perpetual murmur, and Paris flings after us the boom of toxin and alarm drum, inaudible for the present amid shrill-sounding hosts and the splash of rainy weather. To Meudon, to Saint-Cloud, on both hands, the report of them is gone abroad, and hearths this evening will have a topic. The press of women still continues, for it is the cause of all Eve's daughters, mothers that are or that hope to be. No carriage lady were it with never such hysterics, but must dismount in the mud roads in her silk shoes and walk. In this manner, amid wild October weather, they, a wild, unwinged stork flight, through the astonished country, wend their way. Travellers of all sorts they stop, especially travellers or couriers from Paris. Deputy Le Chapelier, in his elegant vesture, from his elegant vehicle, looks forth amazed through his spectacles, apprehensive for life, states eagerly that he is a patriot deputy, Le Chapelier, and even old president Le Chapelier, who presided on the night of Pentecost and is original member of the Breton Club. Thereupon rises huge shout of Vive Le Palier, and several armed persons spring up behind and before to escort him. Nevertheless, news, dispatches from Lafayette or vague noise of rumour have pierced through by side roads. In the National Assembly, while all is busy discussing the order of the day, regretting that there should be anti-national repasts in opera halls, that His Majesty should still hesitate about accepting the rights of man and hang conditions and peradventures on them, Mirabeau steps up to the President, experienced Mounier as it chanced to be, and articulates in bass undertone, Monia Paris marche sur noir. Paris is marching on us. Maybe. Je n'en sais rien. Believe it or disbelieve it, that is not my concern, but Paris, I say, is marching on us. Fall suddenly unwell. Go over to the chateau. Tell them this. There is not a moment to lose. Paris, marching on us, responds Mounier with an atrabiliar accent. Well, so much the better. We shall the sooner be a republic. Mirabeau quits him as one quits an experienced president getting blindfold into deep waters, and the order of the day continues as before. Yes, Paris is marching on us, and more than the women of Paris. Scarcely was Maillard gone when Monsieur de Gouvion's message to all the districts and such toxin and drumming of the General began to take effect. Armed National Guards from every district, especially the Grenadiers of the Centre, who are our old Guard Francais, arrive in quick sequence on the Place de Grève. An immense people is there, Saint Antoine with pike and rusty fire like us all crowding thither, be it welcome or unwelcome. The Centre Grenadiers are received with cheering. It is not cheers that we want, answer they gloomily. The nation has been insulted. To arms and come with us for orders. Ha! Sits the wind so. Patriotism and patrolatism are now one. The three hundred have assembled. All the committees are in activity. Lafayette is dictating dispatches for Versailles when a deputation of the Centre Grenadiers introduces itself to him. The deputation makes military obeisance and speaks not without a kind of thought in it. Mon général, we are deputed for the six companies of Grenadiers. We do not think you a traitor but we think the government betrays you. It is time that this end. We cannot turn our bayonets against women crying to us for bread. The people are miserable. The source of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go seek the king and bring him to Paris. We must exterminate, exterminate, the regiment of Flandre and the garde du corps who have dared to trample on the national cockade. If the king be too weak to wear his crown, let him lay it down. You will crown his son. You will name a council of regency and all will go better. Reproachful astonishment paints itself on the face of Lafayette, speaks itself from his eloquent, chivalrous lips in vain. My general, we would shed the last drop of our blood for you, but the root of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go and bring the king to Paris. All the people wish it. To le peuple, le veu. My general descends to the outer staircase and harangues once more in vain. To Versailles, to Versailles. 
Mayor Bailly is sent for through floods of sanscolotism, attempts academic oratory from his gilt state coach, realises nothing but infinite hoarse cries of bread to Versailles, and gladly shrinks within doors. Lafayette mounts the white charger and again harangues and re-harangues with eloquence, with firmness, indignant demonstration, with all things but persuasion. To Versailles, to Versailles! So lasts it hour after hour for the space of half a day. The great Scipio Americanus can do nothing, not so much as escape. Morbleau, mon général, cry the grenadiers, serrying their ranks as the white charger makes a motion that way. You will not leave us. You will abide with us. A perilous juncture. Mayor Bailly and the municipal sit quaking within doors. My general is prisoner without. The Place de Grave, with its 30,000 regulars, its whole irregular Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau, is one minatory mass of clear or rusty steel, all heart set with a moody fixedness on one object. Moody fixed are all hearts, tranquil is no heart, if it be not that of the white charger who pours there with arched neck, composedly champing his bit, as if no world with its dynasties and eras were now rushing down. The drizzling day tends westward. The cry is still, To Versailles! Nay, now, born from afar, come quite sinister cries, hoarse reverberating in long-drawn hollow murmurs, with syllables too like those of a lantern. Or else irregular sense colotism may be marching off, of itself, with pikes, nay, with cannon. The inflexible Scipio does at length, by aide-de-camp, ask of the municipals whether or not he may go. A letter is handed out to him over armed heads. Sixty thousand faces flash fixedly on his. There is stillness and no bosom breathes till he have read. By heaven he grows suddenly pale. Do the municipals permit? Permit and even order, since he can no other. Clangor of approval rends the welkin. To your ranks, then, let us march. It is, as we compute, towards three in the afternoon. Indignant National Guards may dine for once from their haversack. Dined or undined, they march with one heart. Paris flings up her windows, claps hands as the Avengers with their shrilling drums and shams tramp by. She will then sit pensive, apprehensive, and pass rather a sleepless night. On the white charger, Lafayette, in the slowest possible manner, going and coming and eloquently haranguing among the ranks, rolls onward with his thirty thousand. Saint Antoine, with pike and cannons, has preceded him, a mixed multitude of all and of no arms, hovers on his flanks and skirts, the country once more pauses agape. Paris marche sur nous. End of Book 7, Chapter 5The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 7, The Insurrection of Women, Chapter 6, to Versailles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 6, to Versailles. For indeed, about this same moment, Maillard has halted his draggled menads on the last hilltop, and now Versailles and the chateau of Versailles, and far and wide the inheritance of royalty, opens to the wondering eye. From far on the right of Amali and Saint-Germain-en-Laye, round towards Rambouillet on the left, beautiful all, softly embosomed, as if in sadness in the dim, moist weather. And near before us is Versailles, new and old, with that broad frondent avenue de Versailles between, stately frondent, broad, three hundred feet as men reckon, with four rows of elms, and then the Chateau de Versailles, ending in royal parks and pleasances, gleaming lakelets, arbours, labyrinths, the menagerie, and great and little Trianon. High towered dwellings, leafy pleasant places, where the gods of this lower world abide. Whence, nevertheless, black care cannot be excluded. Whither monadic hunger is even now advancing, armed with pike thoracy. 
Yes, yonder, mesdames, where our straight Fronden Avenue, joined, as you note, by two Fronden Brother Avenues from this hand and from that, spreads out into Place Royale and Palace Forecourt, yonder is the Salle des Menus. Yonder, an august assembly sits regenerating France. Forecourt, Grand Court, Court of Marble, Court narrowing into Court, you may discern next or fancy, on the extreme verge of which that glass dome, visibly glittering like a star of hope, is the Oeil de Boeuf. Yonder, or nowhere in the world, is bread baked for us. But, uh, oh, my dames, were not one thing good, that our cannons, with Demoiselle Terania and all show of war, be put to the rear? Submission beseems petitioners of a national assembly. We are strangers in Versailles, whence, too audibly, there comes even now sound as of tocsin and a general. Also, to put on, if possible, a cheerful countenance, hiding our sorrows, and even to sing? Sorrow, pitied of the heavens, is hateful, suspicious to the earth. So counsels Shifty my yard, haranguing his menads on the heights near Versailles. Cunning my yard's dispositions are obeyed. The draggled insurrectionists advance up the avenue, in three columns, among the four elm rows, singing Henri Quatre with what melody they can, and shouting Vive le Roi! Versailles, though the elm rows are dripping wet, crowds from both sides with Vivons non Parisiennes, our Paris ones forever. Prickers, scouts, have been out towards Paris as the rumour deepened, whereby His Majesty, gone to shoot in the woods of Meudon, has been happily discovered and got home, and the General and Toxin set a sounding. The bodyguards are already drawn up in front of the palace grates and look down the avenue de Versailles, sulky in wet buckskins. Flandre, too, is there, repentant of the opera repast. Also dragoons dismounted are there. Finally, Major Lacointre and what he can gather of the Versailles National Guard, though it is to be observed our colonel, that same sleepless Count d'Estaing, giving neither order nor ammunition, has vanished most improperly, one supposes, into the Oeil de Boeuf. Red-coated Swiss stand within the grates, under arms. There likewise, in their inner room, all the ministers, Saint-Priest, Lamentation Pompignon and the rest, are assembled with Monsieur Necker. They sit with him there, blank, expecting what the hour will bring. Monsieur Mounier, though he answered Mirabeau with a ton mieux and affected to slight the matter, had his own forebodings. Surely for these four weary hours he has reclined not on roses. The order of the day is getting forward. A deputation to His Majesty seems proper that it might please him to grant acceptance pure and simple to those Constitution articles of ours. The mixed qualified acceptance with its per adventures is satisfactory to neither gods nor men. So much is clear, and yet there is more which no man speaks, which all men now vaguely understand. Disquietude, absence of mind is on every face. Members whisper, uneasily come and go. The order of the day is evidently not the day's want. Till at length, from the outer gates, is heard a rustling and justling, shrill uproar and squabbling, muffled by walls, which testifies that the hour is come. Rushing and crushing one hears now, then enter ushered my yard, with a deputation of fifteen muddy, dripping women, having, by incredible industry and aid of all the maces, persuaded the rest to wait out of doors. National Assembly shall now, therefore, look its august task directly in the face. Regenerative constitutionalism has an unregenerate sans collotism bodily in front of it, crying, Bread! Bread! Shifty Maillard, translating frenzy into articulation, repressive with the one hand, expostulative with the other, does his best, and really, though not read to public speaking, manages rather well. In the present dreadful rarity of grains, a deputation of female citizens has, as the august assembly can discern, come out from Paris to petition. 
Plots of aristocrats are too evident in the matter. For example, one miller has been bribed by a banknote of 200 livres not to grind. Name unknown to the usher, but fact provable, at least indubitable. Further, it seems, the national cockade has been trampled on. Also, there are black cockades, or were. All which things will not an august national assembly, the hope of France, take into its wise immediate consideration? And menadic hunger, irrepressible, crying black cockades, crying bread, bread, adds after such fashion, will it not? Yes, messieurs, if a deputation to his majesty for the acceptance pure and simple seems proper, how much more now for the afflicting situation of Paris, for the calming of this effervescence? President Mounier, with a speedy deputation, among whom we notice the respectable figure of Dr. Guillotin, gets himself forthwith on march. Vice-President shall continue the order of the day. Usher Mayard shall stay by him to repress the women. It is four o'clock of the miserablest afternoon when Mounier steps out. Oh, experienced Mounier, what an afternoon! The last of thy political existence! Better had it been to fall suddenly unwell while it was yet time. For behold, the esplanade, over all its spacious expanse, is covered with groups of squalid, dripping women, of lank-haired male rascality armed with axes, rusty pikes, old muskets, iron-shod clubs, Baton ferre, which end in knives or sword blades, a kind of extempore billhook, looking nothing but hungry revolt. The rain pours. Garde du corps go caracoling through the groups amid hisses, irritating and agitating what is but dispersed here to reunite there. Innumerable squalid women beleaguer the president and deputation, insist on going with him. Has not his majesty himself, looking from the window, sent out to ask what we wanted? Bread and speech with the king. Du pain et parle et roi. That was the answer. Twelve women are clamorously added to the deputation and march with it across the esplanade through dissipated groups, caracoling bodyguards and the pouring rain. Monsieur Mounier, unexpectedly augmented by twelve women, copiously escorted by hunger and rascality, is himself mistaken for a group. Himself and his women are dispersed by caracolas, rally again with difficulty among the mud. Finally, the grates are opened. The deputation gets access, with the twelve women too in it, of which latter five shall even see the face of His Majesty. Let wet menadism in the best spirits it can expect their return. End of Book 7, Chapter 6《The French Revolution A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 7, The Insurrection of Women, Chapter 7, At Versailles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 7, At Versailles. But already Pallas Athene, in the shape of Demoiselle Terogne, is busy with Flandre and the dismounted dragoons. She and such women as are fittest go through the ranks, speak with an earnest jocosity, clasp rough troopers to their patriot bosom, crush down spontoons and musketoons with soft arms. Can a man that were worthy of the name of man attack famishing patriot women? One reads that Terania had bags of money which he distributed over Flandre. Furnished by whom? Alas, with money bags one seldom sits on insurrectionary cannon. Calumnious royalism, Terania had only the limited earnings of her profession of unfortunate female. Money she had not, but brown locks, the figure of a heathen goddess, and an eloquent tongue and heart. Meanwhile, Saint-Antoine, in groups and troops, is continually arriving, wetted, sulky, with pikes and impromptu billhooks, driven thus far by popular fixed idea. So many hirsute figures driven hither in that manner, figures that have come to do they know not what, figures that have come to see it done. Distinguished among all figures, who is this of gaunt stature with leaden breastplate, though a small one, bushy in red grizzled locks, nay, with long tile beard? 
It is your Dan, unjust dealer in mules, a dealer no longer, but a painter's lay figure, playing truant this day. From the necessities of art comes his long tile beard, whence his leaden breastplate, unless indeed he were some hawker licensed by leaden badge, may have come, will perhaps remain forever a historical problem. Another Saul among the people we discern, Pear Adam, Father Adam, as the groups name him, to us better known as bull-voiced Marquis saint Rouge, hero of the Vito, a man that has had losses and deserved them. The tall Marquis, omitted some days ago from Nimbo, looks peripatetically on this scene from under his umbrella, not without interest. All which persons and things hold together as we see. Pallas Athene, busy with Flandre, patriotic Versailles National Guard, short of ammunition, and deserted by Destang, their colonel, and commanded by Le Quintre, their major. Then caracoling bodyguards, sour, dispirited, with their buckskins wet, and finally this flowing sea of indignant squalor. May they not give rise to occurrences? Behold, however, the twelve she-deputies return from the chateau, without President Mounier, indeed, but radiant with joy, shouting, Life to the king and his house! Apparently the news are good, mesdames. News of the best. Five of us were admitted to the internal splendours, to the royal presence. This slim damoiselle, Louise en Chabray, worker in sculpture, aged only seventeen, as being of the best looks and address, her we appointed speaker. On whom, and indeed on all of us, His Majesty looked nothing but graciousness. Nay, when Louis on addressing him was like to faint, he took her in his royal arms and said gallantly, It was well worth while. Elle valu bien la peine. Consider, O women, what a king! His words were of comfort, and that only. There shall be provision sent to Paris, if provision is in the world. Grain shall circulate free as air. Millers shall grind, or do worse, while their millstones endure, and nothing be left wrong which a restorer of French liberty can write. Good news, these, but to wet menads all too incredible. There seems no proof, then. Words of comfort are words only which will feed nothing. O miserable people, betrayed by aristocrats who corrupt thy very messengers, in his royal arms, Mademoiselle Louison, in his arms? Thou shameless minx, worthy of a name, that shall be nameless. Yes, thy soft is soft, ours is rough with hardship, and well wetted, waiting here in the rain. No children hast thou hungry at home, only alabaster dolls that weep not. The traitress to the lantern! And so, poor Louise en Chabri, no asservation or shrieks availing her, fair slim damsel, late in the arms of royalty, has a garter round her neck, and furibund Amazon at each end is about to perish so, when two bodyguards gallop up indignantly dissipating and rescue her. The miscredited twelve hasten back to the chateau for an answer in writing. Nay, behold, a new flight of menads with Monsieur Bruno Bastille volunteer as impressed commandant at the head of it. These also will advance to the great of the Grand Court and see what is toward. Human patience in wet buckskins has its limits. Bodyguard Lieutenant Monsieur de Savonnier for one moment lets his temper, long provoked, long pent, give way. He not only dissipates these latter menads, but caracoles and cuts and indignantly flourishes at Monsieur Bruno, the impressed commandant, and finding great relief in it, even chases him, Bruno flying nimbly, though in a pirouette manner, and now with sword also drawn. At which sight of wrath and victory two other bodyguards, for wrath is contagious, and to bent bodyguards is so solacing, do likewise give way, give chase with brandished sabre, and in the air make horrid circles, so that poor Bruno has nothing for it but to retreat with accelerated nimbleness through rank after rank, Parthian-like fencing as he flies, above all shouting lustily, On nous laisse assassiner! They are getting us assassinated! Shameful! Three against one! Growls come from the Lacuantrian ranks, bellowings, lastly shots! 
Savonnier's arm is raised to strike. The bullet of a Lacontrian musket shatters it. The brandished sabre jingles down harmless. Bruneau has escaped. This duel well ended. But the wild howl of war is everywhere beginning to pipe. The Amazons recoil. Saint Antoine has its cannon pointed, full of grape shot. Thrice supplies the lit flambeau, which thrice refuses to catch. The touch holes are so wetted. And voices cry, Arrête, il n'est pas tombe encore. Stop, it is not yet time. Messieurs of the garde du corps, ye had orders not to fire. Nevertheless, two of ye limp dismounted, and one war horse lies slain. Were it not well to draw back out of shot range, finally to file off into the interior? If in so filing off there did a musketoon or two discharge itself at these armed shopkeepers hooting and crowing, could man wonder? Draggled a or white cockades of an enormous size, would to heaven they were got exchanged for tricolor ones. Your buckskins are wet, your hearts heavy. Go, and return not. The bodyguards file off as we hint, giving and receiving shots, drawing no lifeblood, leaving boundless indignation. Some three times in the thickening dusk a glimpse of them is seen at this or the other portal, saluted always with execrations, with a hue of lead. Let but a bodyguard show face, he is hunted by rascality. For instance, poor Monsieur de Moucheton of the Scotch Company, owner of the slain war horse, and has to be smuggled off by Versailles captains. Or rusty firelocks belch after him, shivering asunder his hat. In the end, by superior order, the bodyguards, all but the few on immediate duty, disappear, or, as it were, abscond and march under cloud of night to Rambouillet. We remark also that the Versailles have now got ammunition. All afternoon the official person could find none, till in these so critical moments a patriotic sub-lieutenant set a pistol to his ear, and would thank him to find some, which he thereupon succeeded in doing. Likewise, that Frondre, disarmed by Pallas Athene, says openly it will not fight with citizens, and for token of peace has exchanged cartridges with the Versailles. Since Colotism is now among mere friends, and can circulate freely, indignant at bodyguards, complaining also considerably of hunger. End of Book 7, Chapter 7《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7 — The Insurrection of Women Chapter 8 — The Equal Diet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7 — Chapter 8 — The Equal Diet But why lingers Mounier, returns not with his deputation? It is six, it is seven o'clock, and still no Mounier. No acceptance pure and simple. And behold, the dripping meanheads, not now in deputation but in mass, have penetrated into the assembly, to the shamefullest interruption of public speaking and order of the day. Neither Maillard nor Vice-President can restrain them except within wide limits. Not even, except for minutes, can the lion voice of Mirabeau, though they applaud it, but ever and anon they break in upon the regeneration of France with cries of bread, not so much discoursing, du pain, partant du long discours. So insensible were these poor creatures to bursts of parliamentary eloquence. One learns also that the royal carriages are getting yoked as if for Metz carriages, royal or not, have verily showed themselves at the back gates. They even produced, or quoted, a written order from our Versailles municipality, which is a monarchic, not a democratic one. However, Versailles patrols drove them in again, as the vigilant Lacointre had strictly charged them to do. A busy man, truly, is Major Lacointre in these hours, for Colonel Destang loiters invisible in the Oye de Boeuf, Invisible, or still more questionably visible, for instance. Then also a too loyal municipality requires supervision. No order, civil or military, taken about any of these thousand things. La Quintre is at the Versailles Town Hall. He is at the Great of the Grand Court, communing with Swiss and bodyguards. 
He is in the ranks of Flandre. He is here, he is there, studious to prevent bloodshed, to prevent the royal family from flying to Metz, the Menads from plundering Versailles. At the fall of night we behold him advance to those armed groups of Saint Antoine hovering all too grim near the Salle de Menu. They receive him in a half circle, twelve speakers behind cannons, with lighted torches in hand, the cannon mouth towards La Cointre, a picture for Salvatore. He asks in temperate but courageous language what they, by this their journey to Versailles, do specially want. The twelve speakers reply in few words inclusive of much. Bread and the end of these brabbles. Du pain à la fin des affaires. When the affairs will end, no major la Cointre, nor no mortal can say. But as to bread, he inquires, how many are you? Learns that they are six hundred, that a loaf each will suffice, and rides off to the municipality to get six hundred loaves. Which loaves, however, a municipality of monarchic temper will not give. It will give two tons of rice, rather, could you but know whether it should be boiled or raw. Nay, when this too is accepted, the municipals have disappeared, ducked under as the six-and-twenty long gowned of Paris did, and leaving not the smallest vestige of rice in the boiled or raw state, they there vanish from history. Rice comes not. One's hope of food is balked, even one's hope of vengeance. Is not Monsieur de Moucheton of the Scotch Company, as we said, deceitfully smuggled off? Failing all which, behold only Monsieur de Moucheton's slain war-horse lying on the esplanade there. Saint Antoine, balked, desurient, pounces on the slain war-horse, flays it, roasts it with such fuel of paling gates, portable timber as can be come at, not without shouting. And after the manner of ancient Greek heroes, they lifted their hands to the daintily readied repast, such as it might be. Other rascality prowls discursive, seeking what it may devour. Flandre will retire to its barracks. Le Cointre also with his Versailles, all but the vigilant patrols charged to be doubly vigilant. So sink the shadows of night, blustering, rainy, and all paths grow dark. Strangest night ever seen in these regions, perhaps since the Bartholomew night, when Versailles, as Poisson Pierre writes of it, was a chetif chateau. Oh, for the lyre of some Orpheus to constrain, with touch of melodious strings, these mad masses into order! For here all seems fallen asunder in wide yawning dislocation. The highest, as in downrushing of a world, is come in contact with the lowest. The rascality of France beleaguering the royalty of France. Iron-shod batons lifted round the diadem, not to guard it. With denunciations of bloodthirsty anti-national bodyguards are heard dark growlings against a queenly name. The court sits tremulous, powerless varies with the varying temper of the esplanade, with the varying colour of the rumours from Paris. Thick coming rumours, now of peace, now of war. Necker and all the ministers consult with a blank issue. The Oi de Boeuf has one tempest of whispers. We will fly to Metz, we will not fly. The royal carriages again attempt egress, though for trial merely they are again driven in by La Cointre's patrols. In six hours, Nothing has been resolved on, not even the acceptance pure and simple. In six hours? Alas, he who in such circumstances cannot resolve in six minutes may give up the enterprise. Him fate has already resolved for. And Menadism, meanwhile, and Sanscolotism takes counsel with the National Assembly, grows more and more tumultuous there. Mounier returns not. Authority nowhere shows itself. The authority of France lies for the present with La Cointre and Usher Maillard. This, then, is the abomination of desolation. Come suddenly, though long foreshadowed, as inevitable. For to the blind all things are sudden. Misery, which through long ages had no spokesman, no helper, will now be its own helper and speak for itself. The dialect, one of the rudest, is what it could be, this... At eight o'clock there returns to our assembly not the deputation, but Dr. Guillotine, announcing that it will return, also that there is hope of the acceptance pure and simple. He himself has brought a royal letter, authorising and commanding the freest circulation of grains. 
which royal letter meanism with its whole heart applauds, conformably to which the assembly forthwith passes a decree also received with rapturous meanatic plaudits. Only could not an august assembly contrive further to fix the price of bread at eight sous the half quarter, butcher's meat at six sous the pound, which seem fair rates? Such motion do a multitude of men and women, irrepressible by Asher Mayard, now make, does an august assembly here made. Asher Mayard himself is not always perfectly measured in speech, but if rebuked he can justly excuse himself by the peculiarity of the circumstances. But finally, this decree well passed and the disorder continuing and members melting away and no President Mounier returning, what can the Vice-President do but also melt away. The assembly melts under such pressure into deliquium, or, as it is officially called, adjourns. Maillard is dispatched to Paris with the decree concerning grains in his pocket, he and some women in carriages belonging to the king. Thitherward, slim Louison Chabray has already set forth with that written answer which the twelve she-deputies returned in to seek. Slim sylph she has set forth through the black, muddy country. She has much to tell, her poor nerves so flurried, and travels, as indeed today on this road all persons do, with extreme slowness. President Mounier has not come, nor the acceptance pure and simple. Those six hours with their events have come, though courier on courier reports that Lafayette is coming. Coming with war or with peace? It is time that the chateau also should determine on one thing or another, that the chateau also should show itself alive if it would continue living. Victorious, joyful after such delay, Mounier does arrive at last, and the hard-earned acceptance with him, which now, alas, is of small value. Fancy Mounier's surprise to find his senate, whom he hoped to charm by the acceptance pure and simple, all gone and in its stead a senate of menads. For, as Erasmus's ape mimicked, say with wooden splint, Erasmus shaving, so do these Amazons hold in mock majesty some confused parody of national assembly. They make motions, deliver speeches, pass enactments, productive at least of loud laughter. All galleries and benches are filled, a strong dame of the market is in Munier's chair, Not without difficulty, Mounier, by aid of maces and persuasive speaking, makes his way to the female president. The strong dame, before abdicating, signifies that for one thing, she and indeed her whole senate, male and female, for what was one roasted warhorse among so many, are suffering very considerably from hunger. Experienced Mounier in these circumstances takes a twofold resolution to reconvoke his assembly members by sound of drum, also to procure a supply of food. Swift messengers fly to all bakers, cooks, pastry cooks, vintners, restorers, drums beat, accompanied with shrill vocal proclamation through all streets. They come, the assembly members come. What is still better, the provisions come. On tray and barrow come these latter, loaves, wine, great store of sausages. The nourishing baskets circulate harmoniously along the benches, nor, according to the father of epics, did any soul lack a fair share of victual, dieto an equal diet, highly desirable at the moment. Gradually, some hundred or so of assembly members get edged in, Methodism making way a little round Mounier's chair, Listen to the acceptance pure and simple, and begin, what is the order of the night, discussion of the penal code. All benches are crowded. In the dusky galleries, duskier with unwashed heads, is a strange coruscation of impromptu billhooks. It is exactly five months this day since these same galleries were filled with high-plumed jewelled beauty, raining bright influences, and now... To such length have we got in regenerating France. Methinks the travail throws are of the sharpest. Menadism will not be restrained from occasional remarks. Asks, what is the use of the penal code? The thing we want is bread. Mirabeau turns round with lion-voiced rebuke. Menadism applauds him, but recommences. Thus they, chewing tough sausages, discussing the penal code, make night hideous. What the issue will be? 
Lafayette with his thirty thousand must arrive first. Him who cannot now be distant, all men expect as the messenger of destiny. End of Book 7, Chapter 8《The French Revolution and History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 7, The Insurrection of Women Chapter 9, Lafayette This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 7, Chapter 9, Lafayette Towards midnight, lights flare on the hill. Lafayette's lights. The roll of his drums comes up the Avenue de Versailles. With peace or with war? Patience, friends, with neither. Lafayette is come, but not yet the catastrophe. He has halted and harangued so often on the march, spent nine hours on four leagues of road. At Montreuil, close on Versailles, the whole host had to pause, and with uplifted right hand in the murk of night to these pouring skies, swear solemnly to respect the king's dwelling, to be faithful to king and national assembly. Rage is driven down out of sight by the laggard march, the thirst of vengeance slaked in weariness and soaking clothes. Flandre is again drawn out under arms, but Flandre, grown so patriotic, now needs no exterminating. The way-worn battalions halt in the avenue. They have for the present no wish so pressing as that of shelter and rest. Anxious sits President Mounier, anxious the chateau. There is a message coming from the chateau that Monsieur Mounier would please return thither with a fresh deputation, swiftly, and so at least unite our two anxieties. Anxious Mounier does of himself send, meanwhile, to apprise the general that His Majesty has been so gracious as to grant us the acceptance pure and simple. The general, with a small advance column, makes answer in passing, speaks vaguely some smooth words to the national president, glances only with the eye at that so mixtiform national assembly, then fares forward towards the chateau. There are with him two Paris municipals. They were chosen from the three hundred for that errand. He gets admittance through the locked and padlocked grates, through sentries and ushers, to the royal halls. The court, male and female, crowds on his passage to read their doom on his face, which exhibits, say historians, a mixture of sorrow, of fervour, of valour, singular to behold. The king, with monsieur, with ministers and marshals, is waiting to receive him. He is come, in his high-flown chivalrous way, to offer his head for the safety of his majesties. The two municipals state the wish of Paris, four things of quite pacific tenor. First, that the honour of guarding his sacred person be conferred on patriot national guards, say the Centre Grenadiers, who, as Guard Francaise, were wont to have that privilege. Second, that provisions be got, if possible. Third, that the prisons, all crowded with political delinquents, may have judges sent them. Fourth, that it would please His Majesty to come and live in Paris. To all which four wishes except the fourth, His Majesty answers readily, yes, or indeed may almost say that he has already answered it. To the fourth he can answer only, yes or no, would so gladly answer yes and no. But in any case, are not their dispositions, thank heaven, so entirely pacific? There is time for deliberation. The brunt of the danger seems past. Lafayette and Destang settle the watchers. Centre grenadiers are to take the guard room they of old occupied as guard Francaise, for indeed the guard du corps, its late ill advised occupants, are gone mostly to Rambouillet. That is the order of this night, sufficient for the night is the evil thereof. Whereupon Lafayette and the two municipals, with high flown chivalry, take their leave. So brief has the interview been, Mounier and his deputation were not yet got up. So brief and satisfactory. A stone is rolled from every heart. The fair palace dames publicly declare that this Lafayette, detestable though he be, is their saviour for once. 
Even the ancient Venegris Tunt admitted the king's aunt's ancient grey and sisterhood known to us of old. Queen Marie Antoinette has been heard often say the like. She alone, among all women and all men, wore a face of courage, of lofty calmness and resolve this day. She alone saw clearly what she meant to do, and Theresa's daughter dares do what she means were all France threatening her. Abide where her children are, where her husband is. Towards three in the morning all things are settled. The watchers set, the centre grenadiers put into their old guard room and harangued, the Swiss and few remaining bodyguards harangued. The way-worn Paris battalions consigned to the hospitality of Versailles lie dormant in spare beds, spare barracks, coffee houses, empty churches. A troop of them on their way to the church of St. Louis awoke poor Weber, dreaming troublous in the Rue Satori. Weber has had his waistcoat pocket full of balls all day, two hundred balls and two pairs of powder. For waistcoats were waistcoats then and had flaps down to mid-thigh. So many balls he has had all day, but no opportunity of using them. He turns over now, execrating disloyal bandits, swears a prayer or two, and straight to sleep again. Finally, the National Assembly is harangued, which thereupon, on motion of Mirabeau, discontinues the penal code and dismisses for this night. Menadism, sans calottism, has cowered into guardhouses, barracks of Flandre, to the light of cheerful fire, failing that to churches, office houses, sentry boxes, wheresoever wretchedness can find a lair. The troublous day has brawled itself to rest, no lives yet lost but that of one war horse. Insurrectionary chaos lies slumbering round the palace like ocean round a diving bell. No crevice yet disclosing itself. Deep sleep has fallen promiscuously on the high and on the low, suspending most things, even wrath and famine. Darkness covers the earth, but far on the northeast, Paris flings up her great yellow gleam far into the wet black night. For all is illuminated there as in the old July nights, the streets deserted for alarm of war, the municipals all wakeful, patrols hailing with their horse who goes. There, as we discover, our poor slim Louison Chabray, her poor nerves all fluttered, is arriving about this very hour. Their Usher Maillard will arrive about an hour hence towards four in the morning. They report successively to a wakeful Hôtel de Ville what comfort they can report, which again, with early dawn, large comfortable placards shall impart to all men. Lafayette in the Hôtel de Noailles, not far from the chateau, having now finished haranguing, sits with his officers consulting. At five o'clock the unanimous best counsel is that a man so tossed and toiled for twenty-four hours and more fling himself on a bed and... Seek some rest. Thus then has ended the first act of the insurrection of women. How will it turn on the morrow? The morrow, as always, is with the fates. But His Majesty, one may hope, will consent to come honourably to Paris. At all events, he can visit Paris. Anti-national bodyguards, here and elsewhere, must take the national oath, make reparation to the trick colour. Flandre will swear... There may be much swearing, much public speaking, there will infallibly be, and so with harangues and vows may the matter in some handsome way wind itself up. Or alas, may it not be all otherwise, unhandsome, the consent not honourable, but extorted, ignominious. Boundless chaos of insurrection presses slumbering round the palace like ocean round a diving bell, and may penetrate at any crevice. Let but that accumulated insurrectionary mass find entrance. Like the infinite inburst of water, or say rather of inflammable self-igniting fluid, for example turpentine and phosphorus oil, fluid known to Spinola Santerre. End of Book 7, Chapter 9《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1. Book 7. The Insurrection of Women. Chapter 10. The Grand Entries. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. 
Book 7, Chapter 10, The Grand Entries The dull dawn of a new morning, drizzly and chill, had but broken over Versailles when it pleased destiny that a bodyguard should look out of the window on the right wing of the chateau to see what prospect there was in heaven and in earth. Rascality, male and female, is prowling in view of him. His fasting stomach is, with good cause, sour. He perhaps cannot forbear a passing malice on, on them, least of all can he forbear answering such. Ill words breed worse, till the worst word came, and then the ill deed. Did the maledecent bodyguard, getting, as was too inevitable, better malediction than he gave, load his musketoon and threaten to fire, and actually fire? Were wise who wist, it stands asserted, to us not credibly. Be this as it may, menaced rascality in whinnying scorn is shaking at all greats. The fastening of one, some write it was a chain merely, gives way. Rascality is in the grand court, whinnying louder still. The maledecent bodyguard, more bodyguards than he, do now give fire. A man's arm is shattered. La Cointre will depose that the Sieur Cardin, a national guard without arms, was stabbed. But see, sure enough, poor Jérôme Leretier, an unarmed national guard, he too cabinet-maker, a saddler's son of Paris, with the down of youthhood still on his chin, he reels death-stricken, rushes to the pavement, scattering it with his blood and brains. Allelu! Wilder than Irish wakes rises the howl of pity, of infinite revenge. In few moments, the great of the inner and inmost court, which they name Court of Marble, this too is forced or surprised and burst open. The Court of Marble too is overflowed. Up the grand staircase, up all stairs and entrances, rushes the living deluge. Deschutes and Varigny, the two sentry bodyguards, are trodden down, are massacred with a hundred pikes. Women snatch their cutlasses or any weapon and storm in, monadic. Other women lift the corpse of shot Jerome, lay it down on the marble steps. There shall the livid face and smashed head, dumb forever, speak. Woe now to all bodyguards. Mercy is none for them. Miomandre de Saint-Marie pleads with soft words on the grand staircase, descending four steps to the roaring tornado. His comrades snatch him up by the skirts and belts, literally from the jaws of destruction, and slam to their door. This also will stand few instants, the panels shivering in like potsherds. Barricading serves not. Fly fast, ye bodyguards, rabid insurrection like the hellhound chase, up roaring at your heels. The terror-struck bodyguards fly, bolting and barricading. It follows witherward through hall on hall. Woe now towards the Queen's suite of rooms, in the furthest room of which the Queen is now asleep. Five sentinels rush through that long suite. They are in the anteroom, knocking loud. Save the Queen! Trembling women fall at their feet with tears, are answered, Yes, we will die. Save ye the Queen! Tremble not, women, but haste, for lo, another voice shouts far through the outermost door, Save the Queen! and the door shut. It is brave Miomandra's voice that shouts this second warning. He has stormed across imminent death to do it, fronts imminent death having done it. Brave Tardive du Repair, bent on the same desperate service, was borne down with pikes. His comrades hardly snatched him in again alive. Miamondra and Tardive, let the names of these two bodyguards as the names of brave men should live long. Trembling maids of honour, one of whom from afar caught glimpse of Miamondra as well as heard him, hastily wrap the queen, not in robes of state. She flies for her life across the Oi de Boeuf against the main door of which two insurrection batters. She is in the king's apartment, in the king's arms. She clasps her children amid a faithful few. The imperial-hearted bursts into mother's tears. Oh, my friend, save me and my children. Oh, mes amis, sauvez-moi et mes enfants. The battering of insurrectionary axes clangs audible across the Oeil de Boeuf. What an hour. Yes, friends, a hideous, fearful hour, shameful alike to governed and governor, wherein governed and governor ignominiously testify that their relation is at an end. Rage which had brewed itself in twenty thousand hearts for the last four and twenty hours has taken fire. Jerome's brained corpse lies there as live coal. 
It is, as we said, the infinite element bursting in, wild surging through all corridors and conduits. Meanwhile, the poor bodyguards have got hunted mostly into the oil de berth. They may die there at the king's threshold. They can do little to defend it. They are heaping tabourets, stools of honour, benches and all movables against the door at which the axe of insurrection thunders. But did brave Miomondra perish then at the queen's door? No, he was fractured, slashed, lacerated, left for dead. He has nevertheless crawled hither and shall live honoured of loyal France. Remark also, in flat contradiction to much which has been said and sung, that insurrection did not burst that door he had defended, but hurried elsewhere, seeking new bodyguards. Poor bodyguards with their Thyestes opera repast. Well for them, that insurrection has only pikes and axes, no right sieging tools. It shakes and thunders. Must they all perish miserably and royalty with them? Deschutes and Varigny, massacred at the first inbreak, have been beheaded in the marble court, a sacrifice to Jerome's Marnes. Jourdain with the tile beard did that duty willingly and asked if there were any more. Another captive they are leading round the corpse with howl chauntings. May not Jourdain again tuck up his sleeves? And louder and louder rages insurrection within, plundering if it cannot kill. Louder and louder it thunders at the oil de berth. What can now hinder its bursting in? On a sudden it ceases. The battering has ceased. Wild rushing, the cries grow fainter. There is silence, or the tramp of regular steps. Then a friendly knocking. We are the centre grenadiers, old garde Francaise. Open to us, monsieur of the garde du corps. We have not forgotten how you saved us at Fontenoy. The door is opened. Enter Captain Gondron and the centre grenadiers. There are military embracings. There is sudden deliverance from death into life. Strange sons of Adam, it was to exterminate these garde du corps that the centre grenadiers left home, and now they have rushed to save them from extermination. The memory of common peril, of old help, melts the rough heart. Bosom is clasped to bosom, not in war. The king shows himself one moment through the door of his apartment with, Do not hurt my guards! Soyons frères, let us be brothers! cries Captain Gondron, and again dashes off with levelled bayonets to sweep the palace clear. Now to Lafayette, suddenly roused, not from sleep, for his eyes had not yet closed, arrives with passionate popular eloquence, with prompt military word of command. National guards, suddenly roused by sound of trumpet and alarm drum, are all arriving. The death melee ceases. The first sky-lambent blaze of insurrection is got damped down. It burns now, if unextinguished, yet flameless, as charred coals do, and not inextinguishable. The king's apartments are safe. Ministers, officials and even some loyal national deputies are assembling round their majesties. The consternation will, with sobs and confusion, settle down gradually into plan and counsel, better or worse. But glance now for a moment from the royal windows. A roaring sea of human heads inundating both courts, billowing against all passages, monadic women, infuriated men, mad with revenge, with love of mischief, love of plunder. Rascality has slipped its muzzle, and now bays three-throated like the dog of Erebus. Fourteen bodyguards are wounded, two massacred, and as we saw, beheaded. Jourdain asking, was it worth while to come so far for two? Hapless Deschutes and Varigny, their fate surely was sad. Well down so suddenly to the abyss as men are suddenly from the wide thunder of the mountain avalanche, awakened not by them, awakened far off by others. When the chateau clock last struck, they too were pacing languid with poised musketoon, anxious mainly that the next hour would strike. It has struck, to them inaudible. Their trunks lie mangled. Their heads parade on pikes twelve feet long through the streets of Versailles and shall, about noon, reach the barriers of Paris, a too ghastly contradiction to the large, comfortable placards that have been posted there. The other captive bodyguard is still circling the corpse of Jerome amid Indian war-whooping, bloody tile beard with tucked sleeves brandishing his bloody axe when Gondron and the grenadiers come in sight. Comrades, will you see a man massacred in cold blood? Off butchers, answer they, and the poor bodyguard is free. B. 
busy runs Gondron, busy runs guard and captains, scouring at all corridors, dispersing rascality and robbery, sweeping the palace clear. The mangled carnage is removed. Jerome's body to the town hall for inquest. The fire of insurrection gets damped more and more into measurable, manageable heat. Transcendent things of all sorts, as in the general outburst of multitudinous passion, are huddled together, the ludicrous, nay, the ridiculous, with the horrible. Far over the billowy sea of heads may be seen rascality, caprioling on horses from the royal stud. The spoilers, these, for patriotism is always infected so with a proportion of mere thieves and scoundrels. Gondron snatched their prey from them in the chateau, whereupon they hurried to the stables and took horses there. But the generous Diomedes' steeds, according to Weber, disdained such scoundrel burden, and flinging up their royal heels did soon project most of it in parabolic curves to a distance amid peals of laughter, and were caught. Mounted National Guard secured the rest. Now too is witnessed the touching last flicker of etiquette which sinks not here in the Sumerian world wreckage without a sign, as the house cricket might still chirp in the pealing of a trump of doom. Monsieur, said some master of ceremonies, one hope it might be de Breze, as Lafayette in these fearful moments was rushing towards the inner royal apartment. Monsieur le rat vous accorde les grandes entrées, monsieur. The king grants you the grand entries, not finding it convenient to refuse them. End of Book 7, Chapter 10